Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1, Prologue How long has it been? Sometimes my consciousness is blurred, as if I were in a half-asleep state. I feel like I have memories that are mine, but they are not at the same time. Knowledge that I never heard appears in my mind, as familiar as it is unknown. I am a spectator in the sad life of a child who is not loved by anyone. But it's not always the child, sometimes I also see a woman cry. A woman who, despite having things that everyone else fervently desires, feels empty and looks for a way to fill that void. It's weird, I feel like I'm connected to both, but I'm neither of them. I can't move and I can't even open my eyes, I should feel frustrated and helpless in my state. But what I feel is very different. I feel safe, here nothing can harm me. I feel warm, comforting and cozy. I feel love, vast and deep as the sea. I feel the pulse of something inside me, powerful and ancient. I feel the desire to stay like this forever, but I also feel the desire to get out. And Rob. That person said something, what were his words? I remember tears along with a deep sadness and sorrow in his voice, did she apologize? Why should I do it? Oh, my desire to sleep is coming back once more. Rob, it's such a strange name. I wonder if I have a name too. My name yes, I remember someone gave me a name. My name is ZZZ. Chapter 2, The Letter. 13, Great Mint Street. Also known as the house with the most beautiful garden in the entire village of Lackock, in the south of England. A two-story house painted sky blue where in one of its rooms, one of its residents is waking up right now to welcome a very special day that will change his life from that moment on. Should I arrive today? He wondered as he got up from the bed and put his feet in the slippers. But when he was about to put his right foot in, he felt something blocking his path and looked down. A small, black-eyed creature that had dark, fluffy, silky fur with a characteristic platypus snout looked up from him and began to groan at being woken up so abruptly. Rada. I have told you many times not to sleep in my slippers. Don't we prepare you a nice and comfortable nest in the garden? But the niffler began to move its claws and arms expressively as she gave it an answer. Okay, okay. How about you come down to see what's for breakfast? Rada interrupted her speech at the mention of food, standing still for a moment before nodding and leaving the room under the door, as if her extreme narrowness was no problem for her. The boy laughed at the predictable behavior of his friend's Niffler. Maybe it was because of all the time they had been together, but he was the only one in the whole house who was able to understand what Rada was saying. He went to the bathroom to clear his head and wash his face with cold water, after which she stared at her reflection for a moment. I think I'll go with brown hair today, she murmured. With a thought, her black hair changed its color to auburn and even shortened its length by a couple of fingers. Ever since her family explained to her that she had a talent similar to something called a metamorphmagus, but different, she liked to make minor changes to her hair. She saved herself a fortune with avoided visits to the hair salon. She examined her new appearance as she changed her clothes. Short neat brown hair, light brown eyes with almost imperceptible lines of light deep within, a body of golden proportions resulting from her balanced diet and accompanying her family on her morning exercises. If she had to point out a single flaw, it was that she was a bit shorter compared to the other kids her age. And though he could change that with his talent, he didn't. If she started making too many changes, maybe the day would come when she didn't remember what her original appearance was. Changing into comfortable clothes, he headed downstairs through the book-lined halls and was greeted with a breakfast of fruit, cereal, orange juice, and a squirrel-shaped piece of dark chocolate. Rada, who was eating her exclusive berries in a beautiful golden bowl, waved her hand in greeting. Good morning mom, he greeted before sitting down and beginning to eat calmly. The woman who looked to be in her thirties, with sculpted, stocky, and strong arms, short hair dyed dark green, and dark eyes, turned around and gave him a motherly smile. Good morning son. Do you have brown hair today? I've always liked this option, she replied as she approached him and gave him a kiss on the forehead, before continuing to prepare the rest of the breakfast for the family. 
Her name was Inta and her biggest hobbies were exercising with music, cooking and gardening. Everyone in the house ate the special diet that she prepared, the reason for her excellent health and good physical condition. From time to time they also ate the odd sweet, like a cake, but it is usually reserved for a special occasion, which, in her opinion, makes it taste better. Did anyone order fresh strawberries? Another woman came into the kitchen with a basket of strawberries from the garden and set them down beside Inta. Good morning mom. Good morning son. And returned the greeting to her son before looking at Inta and sharing a quick kiss on her lips. Good morning sweetheart. The boy at the breakfast table couldn't help but roll his eyes at the display of love that his two mothers repeat every morning in front of him. How is the birthday boy feeling this morning? She asked after sitting down next to her. And was half a head taller than Inta, she had long braided dark blue hair along with a softer, fuller build. She practiced as a lawyer and thanks to her, money was never a problem it's not every day you turn eleven. A little nervous, the boy admitted after finishing drinking the orange juice. Hasn't it arrived yet? He asked as he looked out the window. Anne's smile dimmed a bit at the question, but she quickly flashed back. Don't worry, it's still early. Even owls have to eat before taking flight, he soothed as he exchanged glances with his partner, glances of discreet concern. Inta and Anne were what were known as squibs, they were born into a wizarding family but couldn't use magic which earned them a pretty hard life. They had access to everything wonderful in the wizarding world, but they couldn't use much of it and were long since disowned by their families for their condition. They suffered three attempts to clean the family even. Just when they were at the lowest point of their lives, his son arrived unexpectedly in the middle of an explosion of green flames in the fireplace of their home. And though they loved their son as their own, they still doubted in their hearts whether the Hogwarts acceptance pen would deign to write the name of a child whose guardians were squibs. But if muggle-born wizards get the letter, there shouldn't be a problem, right? They weren't worried that the boy was one of them, he had proven long ago that magic was something within his grasp. In fact, the garden on his property was born as a result of a magical accident when his son was younger. One day, and Ella returned home devastated to lose a case she had put a lot of effort into due to a legal loophole. She sat alone in the back of her because she didn't want anyone to see her crying out of sheer frustration, but her son found her and saw her. To cheer him up, he grew beautiful flowers all over the garden, their colors so vivid and scents so delicate that and couldn't help but hug him as she cried, but this time, they were tears of happiness. She was moved by the love of her son and when Inta found out what had happened, they decided to take care of the garden as one of her greatest treasures. Is here. Inta yelled in a high-pitched voice and pointed excitedly to the window. There, a golden-eyed brown owl watched them in silence, with a letter in its talons sealed with wax and a very recognizable mark. And was even faster and she flung open the window, forgetting that she was only opening to the outside and knocking the owl to the ground with a thud. She stared frozen at the unconscious owl on the grass. Radha jumped out of the window and took the letter, before jumping back and handing it to the boy. Thank you, Radha. The boy caressed the niffler and carefully read the letter while his mother rushed behind him and read too. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Witchcraft Director, Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore Dear Sir, Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valris Aulis. We are pleased to inform you that you have a place at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please note the list of necessary equipment and books. Classes begin on September 1st. We hope to see your owl before July 31st. Very cordially. Minerva McGonagall, Vice Principal. P.S. A list with all the necessary school supplies is attached. They all yelled, scaring Rada in the process and causing her to almost fall off the table, which she clung to tightly and managed to get back on. Do you know what it means? Inta asked. We're going shopping in Diagon Alley. X2. Chapter 3, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Are you sure it's this place? Soizen asked doubtfully, seeing the leaky cauldron. Don't worry, we know what we're doing, and assured her. Come on. The smell inside was even worse, the tables were not clean and the floor was sticky. If Soizen had to do a hygiene inspection at the site, she would have given him a fail by now. 
Was that mold on the bread? Mr. Tom. And called. Welcome. A man came up behind the bar and when he saw Soizen, he seemed to understand the situation. New student at Hogwarts. Seeing their nod, he gestured for them to follow him. Don't worry, this isn't the first time muggles have come to Diagon Alley. Follow me. The family of three said nothing to correct Tom. It was better that they were mistaken for muggles, that people would realize that two of them are squibs. Tom led them to a brick wall next to a rubbish bin, tapped on the wall and the bricks fell open to reveal the largest wizarding market in all of Britain. Welcome to Diagon Alley. Tom declared proudly. He always loved saying that phrase to first-time visitors. Before you go shopping, I suggest going to Gringotts, the wizarding bank, to exchange muggle money for wizarding money. Just follow the path until you see a large white building guarded by goblins. Good luck. After the wall returned to normal after crossing it, the three of them stood looking around curiously. Shall we go to Gringotts then? Soizen asked. It's not necessary, we've brought some galleons with us, Inka replied, tapping her bag with confidence. We're going to buy you everything you need. And so, for the next two hours, they asked for directions and got just about everything on the list with no problem. Well, we're only missing two things, Inka said after going over what they had with them. The pet and the wand, and declared. I'm taking Rada with me to Hogwarts, Soizen said, dismissing the pet issue. They suggest it be a cat, a toad, or a rat. But I've read the letter several times and it doesn't say anything about not being able to bring another creature. I just can't have my own broom. Rada is already trained and I don't think anyone in her right mind has a pet toad or frog, which is literally just more work for nothing. Also, imagine the chaos that will ensue if someone brings in a pet cat. We should still buy an owl for ourselves, we haven't had one since we separated from our families and otherwise you won't be able to write to us every week. I know Hogwarts has a public olary you could use, but I'd feel more comfortable if it was a family owl. Also, so you could write to your friends during the summer or answer any other magical correspondence. Do I have to write you a letter a week? Soizen asked surprised, but before the powerful looks of her two mothers, she could only give in yes, ladies. I'll go, Inkta said. And, you and Soizen go to Ollivander's. We'll meet there when we're done. After reaching an agreement, they parted ways and then took Soizen to the famous wand shop. Entering, Soizen frowned. Although it was cleaner than the leaky cauldron, the amount of dust on top of the wand boxes was unpleasant. Welcome. Oh. Soizen was startled and unconsciously released a wave of magic to defend himself as he threw the old man who appeared behind him through the glass sideboard, landing on the street to the shock of many passing wizards. Mr. Ollivander. And recognized the old man and hurried to help him up. Are you all right? That? Ollivander was a bit dazed and disoriented at the sudden attack. Oh, of course. I think it was my fault, don't worry he said as he took out his wand and in one movement, the sideboard was restored as if nothing had happened I'm getting too old, I should correct this habit of mine he murmured. I'm sorry, Mr. Ollivander, Soizen apologized. It's nothing, it's nothing, Ollivander looked at him with interest. I don't remember you, which means you're here for your first wand, right? Soizen nodded. Which is your dominant arm? I'm ambidextrous. Ollivander was left for a moment not knowing how to react and after coming out of his daze, he began to measure with the tape and did not try to remember Anne's wand, because he had no recollection of having sold any. Next, he must be a wizard child born into a muggle family. Ollivander soon returned with some boxes. Unusual measurements. Try this, sir. Soizen, Soizen Gale Gold. Suddenly, the boxes throughout the store began to shake for a few moments before going limp again. Strange, Ollivander murmured, never seeing such a reaction before. As I was saying, Mr. Galegold, try this one. Thirteen inches, black walnut wood and dragon heartstring, a bit stiff and good for enchanting. He barely reached his fingers for the wand, Ollivander pushed it away decisively. Not bad. He put it away resolutely. Try this one, twelve and a half inches, rowan wood and unicorn hair, 
supple and decent for defensive magic. Soizen didn't even touch her wand before Ollivander pulled it away from her as well. Not. Not. Neither is this. Perhaps this will be more suitable, 12 inches, willow wood and phoenix feather, slightly flexible, ideal for exerting healing powers. This time Ollivander didn't withdraw his wand and Soizen was able to touch the first wand from her. The wood was well polished and the texture was smooth. Come on, what are you waiting for? Shake it. Ollivander urged. Oh, sure. Soizen waved his wand to the side slightly. Kaboom. Passers-by passing the famous wand shop again saw the shop owner bolt back into the street, the sparse hair on his head burning with purple fire. Not. Clearly I'm wrong somewhere, he muttered as he rose to his feet with a frown, annoyed with himself for failing to hit the right wand. Try this one, English oak wood and phoenix feather. Kaboom. It's fine. Let's try this one, pear wood and dragon heartstring. Kaboom. Perhaps something less orthodox. Olive wood and unicorn hair. Hornwood and. Maybe we need to expand the catalog a bit. Dogwood wood and thunderbird feather. I think I found it. Cherrywood wampus cat hair. Hazelwood and coral core I stammer. Kaboom. 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 That's all. Ollivander said tearfully with wounded pride, looking at the pile of shards of wood that were perfectly usable ones this morning before they exploded at the hands of his newest customer. I'm sorry, Mr. Gale Gold, but I don't think I can provide you with a wand. None of my wands can handle channeling his magic and I don't understand why. All Ollivander understood was because the wands trembled a while ago. They were afraid of ending up in the boy's hands. Um both N and Soizen were puzzled and embarrassed as they looked at the shattered wands, Mr. Ollivander, how much do we owe you for the damaged wands? Must? Nothing. He said suddenly excited with fire in his eyes and clenching his fist in the air I thought I had reached the top in the path of wand making, but Mr. Galegold has taught me a lesson in humility. There is still much to discover in this wonderful art. And what do I do then? Soizen asked depressed as he stared at his hands. I can't go to Hogwarts without a wand, right? Mr. Galegold, although I am reluctant to give you this suggestion perhaps you should try trying the alternative forms. Staves, grimoires, or even wandless magic, Ollivander suggested with a sad face. Unfortunately, the art of creating grimoires was lost years ago to the disdain of tradition, and only a few remain changing hands in the world. Staves could be helpful, but they cast magic in completely different motions than a wand and can cause him damage with one wrong gesture, which would be detrimental to his studies and his health. So it remains only to try magic without a wand. But that requires excellent magic control along with strong magic. Soizen is just a boy, and said worriedly. I can assure you from my own experience that Mr. Galegold has more than enough magic to meet the second requirement. Ollivander pointed bitterly at the broken wands and his damaged shop. As for control, it only takes will to exert it. While it is true that a young wizard's mind is restless, I may suggest that he practice acclimacy and in a few months, he should gain a decent level of control. Oh, that won't be a problem, and commented, letting out a sigh of relief. Soizen is a natural acclumnant. Chapter 4, Platform 9 and 34 Are you sure you have everything? Inta asked for the fourteenth time. Yes mom, I've checked the trunk several times. Everything is in its place and I'm not missing anything, answered Soizen helplessly as he put the owl in his cage. Come on Inta, stop worrying, and came to Soizen's rescue. Even if he forgets something, we can owl him now, she said, pointing to the new familiar silver gray owl. But. Come on, come on, and pushed. We have to get him to the platform early so he can take the express to Hogwarts. You don't want me to be late, do you? It's fine. After checking that no one was paying attention to them, they took the cart and ran against the wall between platforms 9 and 10, disappearing behind the bricks. Yes, this seems to be more magical Soizen commented jokingly when he saw many people dressed in bright colors and which hats nothing like a wizard's fashion to be discreet and not attract attention. 
Come on, go put the trunk down and find a place to sit down. Inta An and hugged him goodbye, if we don't get our weekly letter, get ready to get a howler, from each of us. They whispered to him. After Soizen managed to escape from the hugs, threats and kisses, he got on the train. He found an empty carriage and went inside, setting the trunk on top and sitting down, waiting for it to start while he opened his book of incantations that he had already read several times. Well, here I am, he whispered as he looked out the window as other families said goodbye, in another world, ready to learn magic and in a school that is anything but safe. Soizen had a secret that not even his family knew, he was a transmigrator. Or at least, that was what the memories that appeared in his head over time said. He knew some people, the events that should happen in a few years, he seemed to have some advantages and more information. But everything seemed to be a bit off from what he knew, so he just took those memories with a grain of salt. He diligently studied his muggle and wizarding studies, having a much deeper base of knowledge than most of his age. His talent for shifting and being a natural acclimate were part of the advantages he got according to his memories, but it wasn't all. It was too bad he didn't know that he could use magic without a wand, otherwise he would have been able to practice for a few years and not just a few weeks at home. Also, he had to wait until he returned from the first year of Hogwarts to start acting within the wizarding community. The door opened and a green-eyed boy looked at Soizen. Harry Potter. The name flashed through his mind, recognizing the boy who survived a killing curse thanks to his mother's sacrifice of love. Excuse me, is this seat free? He asked politely. Sure, sit down. Soizen held out his hand inviting him to sit down as he turned his gaze to the spellbook. Thank you. He put the trunk on top with an effort and sat down. Harry called me, Harry Potter. Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valrus Aulus, Soizen replied politely, looking up and frowning at the state of her glasses. She made him nervous. Allow me, Oculus repaired. He snapped his fingers and Harry's glasses were as good as new. Better. Soizen nodded satisfied to see that practicing wandless magic at home gave very good results and returned to reading from him. Thank you. Harry was still a bit surprised by the sudden magic, but he was grateful. You don't have to give them to me, I recommend you find some potion to cure your eyes and stop wearing glasses, Soizen commented as his eyes moved from left to right on the pages. Wait, are there potions to cure the eyes? Harry asked surprised. Well, Soizen looked up again as he mentally counted, there are potions to get through fire without taking damage, potions to grow bones, to tell the truth, and even to bring luck. If no one has researched making eye-curing potions, I would find it immensely stupid, he replied, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Maybe I can make it my summer project, I'll save you a vial if I'm successful. Really? Thanks. Glasses weren't cheap like a lot of people thought and if I could do without them that would be great. Again, you're welcome. The train started and they left the station. The rattle of the tracks and the green landscape together with the comfortable seats induced many to fall asleep during the journey. Before long, the door was suddenly flung open and a redhead poked his head out. Do you mind if I sit here? The rest of the sights are full. Sure, sit down, Harry invited. Soizen just nodded, implying that he didn't care. Thanks, Ron Weasley called, he introduced himself after putting down his trunk and taking a rat out of his pocket. Harry Potter. It's you. Ron exclaimed. So is it true? About he stammered trying not to be obvious and failing spectacularly in the attempt. Which? The scar. Oh yes. Harry lifted his hair to show off his lightning mark. Cool. Soizen mentally rolled his eyes. Yes, apparently a mark left by the sacrifice of a mother is cool. And who is he? Ron asked rudely, pointing a finger at Soizen. Soizen Harry tried to think of the whole name, but only stuck with the first part. Who has so many last names to begin with? Oh wait, the director in the letter he received seems to have them. Maybe it's a wizarding world custom. Soizen is fine, he said dryly, don't point at me, please, he's rude. And be careful with the rat, I don't want it to bite anything. Sorry, Ron said, pulling his finger away, suddenly aware of what he had just done. 
There was a knock at the door and a smiling old woman revealed a candy cart. Would you like something to eat, children? No thanks, I've got mine already. Ron pulled out some squashed sandwiches reluctantly. Soizen looked in surprise at the size of the crushed package, how could her family afford to feed such a glutton on the meager family income? I'll let Harry choose first, Soizen commented, knowing what was going to happen and saving money along the way. Give us everything, Harry declared in a display of his recent financial power and lack of thought for the other people on the train, whom he left without sweets for the rest of the journey and had to starve. Monster. As Ron munched on sweets like a pig, his rat munched on some dragées, and Harry feasted on his first magical treats like the chocolate frog, Soizen settled for a couple of cauldrons of chocolate before stopping, cleaning his hands on a small bottle of gel. Hydroalcoholic and continue reading. She didn't want her mother to scold her for gaining unhealthy weight. Why are you reading the books already? Ron asked with his mouth full. We won't start classes yet until after the grand selection. Whatever I learn now, I'll avoid having to spend time learning it in the future. Soizen didn't want to start a conversation with the two of them in order to continue reading, so I try to give a conclusive answer. A raven claw, for sure, Ron muttered. My brothers taught me a color-changing spell on my rat, Scabbers. Do you want to see it? Clear. Harry was interested in seeing more magic. As Ron settled the rat and took out his wand, the door was flung open and a wild-haired girl looked inside quickly before asking. Have any of you seen a toad? A freshman boy has lost it. Ron shook his head in puzzlement as did Harry. How was a toad even going to sneak in with them if the door was closed? What's it called? Soizen asked, tired of the interruptions. Neville. Curious name for a toad. Oh, I thought you meant the student. Hermione's cheeks flushed a little at the confusion and she corrected her answer, the toad's name is Trevor. Accio Trevor. Soizen snapped his fingers and a white spark came from the friction as he held out his hand. A few moments of silence later, a toad floating upside down and confused as to why the world had turned upside down reached Soizen, who, without actually touching the dirt-covered toad, offered it to Hermione while she floated in the palm of his hand. Her. There you go. Chapter 5, An Unforgettable Ceremony Snapping your fingers isn't actually necessary to perform wandless magic, waving your index finger like a wand was more than enough, but Soizen loved doing it. She gave him something no wand could match, style and cool. After shooing the very excited Hermione away with the excuse that they had to put on their uniforms, they got off the train and met up with Hagrid. All the first years, this way. The half-giant yelled. Hello, Harry, all right? Great, follow me and don't get separated. They followed the keeper of the keys into the darkness while only seeing the lantern in the distance, causing many newcomers to trip over protruding roots. Soizen is in the lead with the golden trio, being able to see where she steps. Get into the boats, but no more than four to a boat. After passing the lake and admiring the visual spectacle that is Hogwarts when they first arrive, they were led by Hagrid until Professor McGonagall took over. Is it true that we will have to fight a troll? My sister told me it's a dance contest. Silly stuff. Clearly we will have to solve some puzzles. After Malfoy and Harry's meeting, to which Soizen didn't intervene because she didn't want to and had nothing to do with him, they all entered the Great Hall under the gaze of the second year and up students and the teachers. At least Neville was spared the embarrassment of finding his toad in front of all the newcomers and didn't receive a stern look from Minerva. The sky isn't like that, it's enchanted to look like the outside, Hermione whispered to the girl next to her. I read about it in the Hogwarts story. Hey, are you okay? Harry asked when he noticed that Soizen was looking everywhere. Hey. Oh sure. Just excited for what will happen next, she replied. There was so much concentrated magic in the air. If outside the magic concentration was one, by now it should almost reach a solid five. Although blown candles weren't the best idea, Soizen was worried that he would be faced with a shower of hot wax. It wouldn't be nice in any way, whether it fell into him or into his food. Whose stupid idea was it? Spells like Lumos and the like fulfilled the same function perfectly without the danger of burns or choking. 
Wait here, please. Before starting, the director will say a few words. The old man with the long beard and gold half-moon glasses rose and glanced at the new arrivals before beginning. I'd like to remember a few things. Everyone must remember that students are not allowed to enter the Forbidden Forest under any circumstances. And our guard, Mr. Filch, asked me to remind you that the corridor on the third floor, on the right side, is off-limits to all those who do not wish the most painful of deaths. Soizen couldn't help but mentally clap. They have just arrived and Dumbledore already states in detail that there is an area in the castle that can kill students, that's how safe Hogwarts is. When I say your name, they'll come closer, I'll put the sorting hat on their heads and they'll know which is your house. He held up a dusty hat to show it, then looked at the scroll in his other hand for a moment and called the first name, Hermione. Granger. Gryffindor. I always thought the hat was wrong on Hermione no matter where you look at it. It is true that she has great value, but she is a clear Ravenclaw. Draco Malfoy. Slytherin. Yes, a very accurate judgment. He had nothing to say about it. Susan Bones. Hufflepuff. How curious that no one paid attention to him at the beginning, when his aunt turns out to be the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, Amelia Bones. Maybe it was because she was mixed blood, but she was a good political connection. Wait, his aunt didn't die later. Ronald Weasley. Gryffindor. Another hat mistake, Ron would definitely be a Hufflepuff with everything he eats and how he eats it. In fact, where does all the nutrition he acquires go? It is clear that not at his head. Harry Potter. Everyone in the large dining room fell silent and stared, including the director. After exposing Slytherin and earning the enmity of the house for not being able to use thoughts instead of whispering. Gryffindor. Soizen wasn't sure if Harry was put into Gryffindor on his own merit or through Dumbledore's intervention. But he certainly wouldn't fit into Slytherin or Ravenclaw. He was either a Gryffindor or a Hufflepuff. We have Potter. We have Potter. The selection continued once they finished praising Harry and the last turn was for the Soizen, which left Professor McGonagall a bit perplexed due to her long name. Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valris Aulis. He walked over to the stool and let them put the hat on his head. Let's see, where should he? The sorting hat looked into his mind and was perplexed by the familiar sensation that he hadn't felt since the founders of the school once again, what was your name? My name is Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valris Aulis, heir to House Gale Gold. You are a Gale Gold. He hadn't seen one since Syrah. So, after almost a millennium and when he believed that there were no more possibilities, the moment finally arrived. The hat murmured excitedly. Should I make it official, Gale Gold heir? Go ahead, Soizen replied with a smile. Gale Gold. Exclaimed the hat in the loudest voice of the entire meeting, with an almost ecstatic tone, to the complete bewilderment of those present. Even Dumbledore didn't know why the castle suddenly seemed to respond to the Sorting Hat's declaration and began to shake, pure waves of joy and powerful ancient magic running through the walls, floor, and ceiling. The magic concentration in the school skyrocketed from five to eight. It's alive. Sinan mentally shouted, unable to contain himself before the ideal occasion to use the well-known phrase. Behold! yelled a Hufflepuff student. What's that? People looked in the direction indicated and had the impulse to rub their eyes, because where before there were four clocks that counted the points of the four houses. Now there were five. Chapter 6, Hogwarts' Fifth House Established The new watch was filled with amethysts, had a purple and gold flag depicting the Akami and the Niffler in a Inyang pattern. And at the top you could read, Gale Gold. I challenge you to design and show the new Gale Gold House flag. The Great Hall trembled again, and to everyone's surprise, it expanded enough to add a fifth table that popped up from somewhere, between the Gryffindor table and the Hufflepuff table, exactly like the rest of the four present and to the left. Same distance as the rest. The calm night sky on the roof was punctuated by purple and gold fireworks that assumed the forms of the creatures from the new house, dancing all over the place. And while all this was going on, Soizen took off his hat and put it on the stool, while he calmly walked to the new table under everyone's gaze. In the few steps he took to reach her, 
his tie and tunic had changed to represent the insignia and colors of the Gale Gold House. As he faced the gaping gaze of everyone sitting at the table, he asked. Is now when we eat? He he was very curious to see if the food prepared by the house elves was comparable to his mother's. Even Dumbledore, who was as stunned as the rest, came to his senses when he heard the question. Indeed, I can say that we could all use a sumptuous meal. Let's get started. Forgetting to even say the usual nonsense words of each year. Food appeared on the tables and at the enticing smell of hot food, they all came to the unanimous decision that they could be wowed later. Now is the time to fill your stomach. Soizen enjoyed roast beef with mashed potatoes and cranberry sauce, accompanied by a cucumber, tomato and carrot salad. The honey buckwheat bread went a long way in cleaning up any leftover sauce. But he didn't touch the pumpkin juice, that stuff was disgusting and he never liked anything made with pumpkin. In fact, no one in the family liked it, even though they had a fairly wide and varied diet. They didn't even buy them to decorate for Halloween. Change my pumpkin juice to apple juice, thanks, he tapped on the table and ordered. The change happened almost instantly and he was able to enjoy a wonderful meal. At the end of dinner, the prefects ushered the excited newcomers into their common rooms and Soizen rose to do the same, but he was intercepted by the gentle and manipulative headmaster, Albus Dumbledore, and his entourage. Mr. Galegold, I must say that you left us a lasting surprise at our first meeting, he commented with a friendly old man's laugh. Do you mind if we accompany you? We are curious about some details. Of course headmaster. Soizen smiled politely and left the great hall followed by Dumbledore, McGonagall, Snape, Pomona and Flittick. Tell me, Mr. Galegold, how come the school now has five houses? McGonagall asked the question that was on the minds of the teachers and the headmaster. There were so many things to do now because of it. Discover a new part of the school's history, organize the class schedule, find a home tutor, etc. Because my biological mother is one of the five founders of the school, Syrah Galegold, Soizen explained. The world only knows of four founders because my mother was in search of something more important to her and for the reason that outside, it seems the other founders found it unnecessary to reveal their merit. Something that I intend to correct with my time. How is that possible? If the founder was her biological mother, then your age should be Pomona questioned. Old, very old magic. To be precise, that magic was already ancient even before Hogwarts opened its doors for the first time she explained as she began to climb the stairs you can understand that I was asleep, until someone woke me up and took me to the current world. However, due to an incident, I was sent to live with my current family. But during my sleep, I inherited the necessary knowledge of who I am along with everything else. The only pity was the special family spells that would only be revealed once she came of age. And what has caused the change around us? Asked Flittick trying to match everyone's pace. I feel like Hogwarts has changed, but it's still the same. Hogwarts was never complete, Professor. The magic within its walls would only become complete when the five founders established their houses, a condition unfulfilled to this day. More taking into account that the castle will be my property when I reach adulthood. Impossible. Severus intervened at that moment. The castle was donated by Salazar Slytherin. Even if there was a title deed, it should go to his descendants. Correction, it belonged to Salazar Slytherin's father, Soizen pointed out, not seeming bothered by the interruption. The Salazar family owed debts to the Galegolds, so they transferred ownership of the castle to my family to pay them off. Although it is true that it was Salazar who suggested to my mother to use the castle for school. Should we be concerned about the closure of the school, Mr. Gale Gold? Asked Dumbledore sharply. Soizen was sure that if he answered in the affirmative, perhaps Dumbledore would have to take steps to prevent it. And such measures might not be from the path of light. For the greater good, of course. No, a magical pact was made at the time, Rowena Ravenclaw's suggestion to avoid that possible scenario and I have no intention of doing so either. We arrived. Here it is, Galegold's common room. Soizen stopped in front of the statue of a half-moon bespectacled Niffler holding a scroll and quill. I've always wondered why this statue wasn't moving, Pomona said. How does access to the common room work? He asked curiously, 
passwords. Questions. A dance, perhaps. What kind of obsession do magicians these days have with dancing? No, it's much simpler than that. He looked at the statue and said, he declared, today I have established a new house at Hogwarts. The statue came to life and pretended to carefully write down Soizen's statement, nodded in satisfaction, and spread his arms wide. From his stomach pocket, a tiny alchemy peeked out and grew to gape, revealing the entrance to the common room. A member of the Gale Gold House who wants to enter the common room must declare a change, which can be in the form of a gain or a loss. He can declare that he has lost points, gained knowledge, learned a cooking recipe, anything goes as long as he doesn't come back the same way he left. And each statement is only valid once. And can those who don't belong to the house come in? Of course, but unlike the previous example, they must donate something of value. It can be money, spell books, jokes, wool socks, dragon dung, etc. Anything suitable with value is welcome. However, it also has its limits. For example, he won't accept spell notes if he's already accepted them in the past, unless they are more detailed and useful. What is the motto of House Gale Gold? Asked Dumbledore. We have the house of courage, intelligence, loyalty, and cunning. What ideals are here? Change, innovation, wealth and adaptation. Those selected for this house are the inventors, the curious, the merchants, the explorers and those who are capable of seeing beyond he explained as he invited them into the common room in other words. The people who are content with the status quo, that they are too rigid or do not want anything to change and everything to remain stagnant, they will never come to this house. The style of the common room was something none of the teachers expected, as it had a strong mechanical steampunk atmosphere with vats of bubbling fluorescent purple liquid, pipes, futuristic gold metal designs, and a marketplace setting. If anyone has seen Wakfu, you may think Sophokia steampunk style. In the central part, there was a fountain with a silver egg. What is this egg? An alchemy egg, or an imitation to be more precise, Soizen explained. Each year, the egg will hatch when the house gets its first points, and the alchemy golem that hatches from the egg will grow and shrink as the number of points increases. Of the house change. The largest size reached will even be noted below to try to beat it another year. Fascinating method of reflecting the growth of the house, Flittick commented, marveling at the idea. The bedrooms are individual, but up to four of them can be combined in case you want to share the space with friends. By the way, each dormitory is limited to its residence. Just like boys can't go into the female dormitory, girls can't go into the male one. At the Gale Gold House we believe in equality, whether in rights or restrictions he remarked lastly, we have the warehouse, the potions laboratories, the alchemy workshops. The indoor pool, the den of the nifflers, the quidditch field, the library, the kitchens, the bathrooms, the orchards, the gym, the practice room. One second, Mr. Gale Gold, Professor McGonagall interrupted. Did you say Quidditch pitch? Labs? Snape asked raising an eyebrow. Orchards? Pomona asked, her eyes lighting up. Library? Asked Flittick, puzzled. Indoor pool? Dumbledore asked, rubbing his beard with interest. Sure, after all, there's no reason not to apply various undetectable extension spells, right? The Gale Gold House is the largest of all, as there is literally no common room more complete and larger than ours, Soizen proclaimed proudly. Chapter 7, Gale Gold The teachers left their quarters discouraged after finishing talking with Soizen about how their house will work for the moment. Which it was decided that they would do the same hours as the Gryffindor students until the number of students will increase in the next few years. Professor McGonagall was envious that Gale Gold had their own private Quidditch pitch to practice on. Not only was it covered, but the weather could be modified to practice in all kinds of conditions. Professor Flittick passed by the Ravenclaw common room and stared at the small library before leaving with a sigh. It wasn't even a tenth the size of the Gale Gold Library. It might be empty now, but in a few years it would be a sight to behold and study as visitors donated spellbooks. Pomona was excited about the gardens and orchards. There was so much surface area to take advantage of, 
tools that took care of the plants, and I could even adjust details like temperature, light, and humidity. She then looked at the little plants here and there in the Hufflepuff common room and felt that they weren't so lush. Severus looked into his dark lab and narrowed his eyes. Galegold's facilities were not only much more advanced and organized, but the security measures in the lab were several layers higher. They could save so much labor and effort in capable hands. Dumbledore left pensive and with a new title on his shoulders, the head of the temporary Gale Gold House. At least, until he finds a teacher who can take over for a long time and is able to fulfill his duties. They couldn't give the position to someone like the Dada teacher who changes every year. Or a certain divination teacher, who might be scaring the students in the house with continual premonitions of sudden death. This year Soizen was the only member of the household, so she was not burdened by it, and Minerva graciously agreed to carry out much of the duties for her. Soizen sighed in relief once everyone had left and he opened his robes to let out Rada, who had almost fallen asleep from waiting so long. She got very excited seeing the sparkling surroundings and the big silver egg, but she behaved herself. She was a niffler who understood the value of trade, so he had a whole college to trade shiny things with. Soizen took the first room he found in the men's dormitory and settled in quickly, before changing and going to sleep. He slept comfortably in the bed and got up early with the idea of going downstairs for breakfast. It was then that he remembered that he was at Hogwarts and had to wait for breakfast to be served in the Great Hall. Or he could visit the kitchens, he just had to find the picture of the pair and do some tickling. Looking at the clock full of gears on the wall of the common room, he decided to locate the classrooms before going to get something to eat. After all, this was Hogwarts and getting lost on his first day would be the norm. One hour later. That's all. Soizen was perplexed. Who said Hogwarts would make you lose? Every time Sinan had a destination in mind, a few steps ahead some secret passage would reveal itself to him, which turned out to be a shortcut to his goal. Paintings that open, statues that move away, etc. Was the castle pampering him because of his identity as heir? Thank you, I guess, he said aloud as he turned around, walking to the great dining room. A little early still, but I should be serving food by now. And sure enough, the big doors were open and some teachers were eating. Hardly any of the students were awake yet, so his arrival earned a few additional glances of interest. A glass of strawberry juice, some whole grain cereal, a buttered French muffin, and a piece of dark chocolate, please, I request after rapping twice on the table. A few moments later, the order was in front of him and he began to eat. The teachers were a little speechless at this preferential treatment. While the food was always varied, delicious, and charming, the house elves in the kitchen often had some fixed patrons, and even the manager accepted the food they offered each day without complaint. The only time there was any discrepancy was when some hungry students sneaked into the kitchens, but they always served him something simple to happily satiate him. Since when can students request what they want to eat? What the professors seem to forget, is that house elves are not loyal to Dumbledore, but to Hogwarts. And since Soizen is an heir to a founder and even the direct son of one, he has more authority in his eyes than the director himself. So preparing for him a special or off-the-charts meal was a great honor and pleasure for them. As Soizen munched on the soft French muffin, his new owl swept in from the top of the large dining room and approached him with a rolled-up piece of paper in his talons. Soizen gave him a few crumbs from his bun and began reading the Daily Prophet, which he subscribed to when he went to Diagon Alley to keep up with the trends in the wizarding world. Sure, the paper was politically controlled and took bribes, not to mention most of it was exaggeration and lies, but he could always glean some useful information between the lines. Also, the headline was interesting. A new house is rising at Hogwarts. What is the origin of Galegold? Oh my gosh, it looks like the news has leaked almost as fast as Ron can put food in his mouth. In fact, Soizen suddenly wondered what would have happened if he was at another wizarding school. Becoming the male idol of Beau's Batons. There is so much love in the air. Study dark magic in Durmstrang. It wouldn't be evil, there it is legal. Being a magical otaku in Mahutakoro. He could bring girls to life in 2D. Wait. What if he founded his own school of magic? With a futuristic style. 
Hogwarts holds the title of the best wizarding school in Britain, which is rather empty in his opinion, when in fact it is the only one. Hmm, actually the idea of founding a school might be interesting. His mother founded a school, he can do it too, right? But in Britain? The laws and the local ministry are too terrible, biased and narrow-minded, I would need to find a nice place for that. When summer arrives, I should go to Gringotts to request a blood lineage test and verify the finances and property of the Gale Gold family. If your memories are correct, you should have a small fortune at your disposal among other things. She should also inspect the castle for a few more days, looking for the caches her mother left with some treasures. Hello, Hermione. Soizen looked up from the journal to see the young Gryffindor staring at him with dark bags under her eyes. A bad sleepless night. Emm, mm, that reminded her that she had to check if there was a potion to cure her eyesight. It was a business with potential, and it had an excellent potions master to consult, not to mention a certain potions book with his personal notes in it, access to a fully equipped laboratory, red-headed twins who would be happy to supply him with some ingredients. Oh, another idea. Games. Perhaps he could turn some muggle games into a magical version to earn more money. For example. Who is Syra Galegold? Hermione asked, interrupting the other party's thoughts as she sat across from him at the table and stared at him. I've spent the morning in the library looking for information on the Gale Gold family and I could barely find a name in a book from 1813. That would be my biological mother. As for finding information on my family, you would have me floored if you could have checked out the entire school library in a single morning, Soizen replied with a shrug as he took a sip of his juice. He banged on the table twice and another breakfast identical to his appeared in front of Hermione. How did you do that? She asked pleasantly surprised. I'll tell you a secret. She looked around carefully and leaned in to whisper softly so no one else would hear, I happen to be a magician. Let Hermione discover house elves in her first year. No, thanks. Chapter 8, Niffler Business Hermione was just the appetizer, soon a wave of Ravenclaws and other students approached the table of the Gale Gold House and began to question Soizen without giving him time to breathe. After half an hour, he managed to escape from the curious witches and wizards, sent the prophet's copy to his mothers along with a letter to tell them what happened and that he was fine, and took a walk through the Hogwarts gardens enjoying the peace and quiet. Although these gardens are not as beautiful as the one at my house, she declared confidently. Really? Professor Sprout suddenly appeared from somewhere and Sojan almost sent her flying like Ollivander did, but she caught herself in time me and Hagrid have put in a bit of effort and I can say that the Hogwarts gardens are at an acceptable low level. Our care. Do you still stand by that statement, Mr. Gale Gold? Absolutely, she answered immediately without hesitating for a second. That only arouses my curiosity more. Pomona narrowed her eyes with interest as she smiled. Maybe I'll pay you a visit this summer, to see that garden of yours with my own eyes. Every garden tells a lot about its caretakers. It's fine. Sojin had a feeling that she might have defied her pride as a botanist. Soizen continued with her walk and visited the Black Lake without the luck of being able to see the giant squid and she even went to the vicinity of the Forbidden Forest to look at it from afar. One would hope that since the students can't go there, there would be some kind of protective barrier or blocking the passage in both directions, but no, not even a sad poorly made wooden fence or broken sign was present. Again, another basic security bug. These things wouldn't have happened if the other four founders had taken to heart the suggestions Syrah left for them before she left. Proud idiots. What if one day the Acromantulas decide to attack Hogwarts to feast on human flesh and blood? Note to self, exterminate the nest of Acromantulas. She until she found Hagrid's hut with his pumpkin patch. She always wondered why after her wand was broken, she didn't think to study druidic magic with her fondness for magical, potentially lethal animals and her creativity in making cross species that were very well against nature. I declare, today I discovered the location of the classrooms for the lessons. Returning to her common room, she discovered that there were some Ravenclaw students studying the surroundings and some other students, like Hermione, were looking with interest at the unopened Akami egg in the middle. She went to the warehouse to see that they had donated to enter. Someone tried to follow him, 
but was thrown out the door by a strong gust of wind, as the warehouse is restricted access. Only he and the director can access this place. And there was a magically automatic log to record if someone had a drink and when. Basic spell books, chocolate frogs, a silver bracelet, some bronze nuts. It seems that everyone roughly understands the operation of the entrance to the house. He took a couple of chocolate frogs to satisfy his hunger after the walk, he placed the new books in the library of the house and after seeing that everything was fine. He took Radha on his shoulder and went to the library to look for the book guide to the art of making potions for beginners and encyclopedia of the world's potions. After spending several minutes flipping through the pages and reading the existing potions, he discovered that there were potions to change eye color, give eagle vision, cure temporary blindness, etc. But there was not a single one that served to cure myopia, farsightedness, etc. Having confirmed that, he returned the book to his place and while with one hand he stroked Radha's back to her delight, with the other he studied the book to increase his knowledge of the subtle art of potions. Or to be more exact, what not to do to survive his first attempts and not make the cauldron explode or the mixture result in a powerful poisonous acid. After a few hours, he felt hungry and got up to go to dinner. He took the sleeping Radha with him, without first returning the book to her place, to the satisfaction of the librarian. Now could those hooligans learn from this good boy? Radha woke up as soon as he smelled the food, and when she saw her approaching the large dining room, she rubbed her hands together impatiently. Businesses were coming. As Soizen entered with the niffler on his shoulder, the student stared at the creature. The boys had no idea what it was and the girls didn't care, it was just too adorable. Only a few children of wizards knew of the nifflers. Hardly had he sat down and left Radha at the table than they tried to come closer to caress the niffler. He held up his hand to stop them with a look of authority and extended his other hand toward them, fingers curling inward. The question marks above the heads of those concerned were almost palpable and they turned to Soizen for translation. It's Radha, my little niffler, Soizen introduced as he pricked a cod fritter with his fork. He's trained and very intelligent. He doesn't mind if you caress him a little carefully and with clean hands, but if you want to do it, you should give him something nice and shiny in return. He took a silver sickle from his pocket as a demonstration and gave it to Radha, who after taking it turning it over, sniffing and shaking it, he nodded in satisfaction and put it back in his bag while looking from left to right. The students were stunned. Was the Niffler doing business with his cuteness? This will be a resounding success. Intelligent without a doubt. Can we hug him? Asked a third-year Ravenclaw girl who was holding back at such a cute and sweet thing. Soizen looked at Radha, who thought about it for a moment and she grunted in response as she mimed. He says he'll take it as long as you don't push him and pay him enough. At least three shiny coins. She then she crouched down to the students to advise them actually, you can, for example, clean some nuts well until they shine and I'll happily take them like a sickle. It doesn't even have to be real money, like I said, something nice and shiny like a shiny button is enough to satisfy Radha. Just don't spend too much time, she gets impatient fast. Would you accept some food? Someone asked. Some rock pies, perhaps? No, Hagrid, he won't accept rock pies. Soizen smiled and looked at the half-giant who practically charged at the students when he saw the Niffler, his face flushed red with emotion. Teach not to accept food or treats from strangers. Very well done. Hagrid nodded, happy that someone else knows what it's like to take care of his pet. You two stop by my cabin sometime, I think Fong would like to meet a new playmate. Sure, he agreed before resuming his meal as his Niffle began his business empire of cuteness and low prices. The students took turns playing with Radha, which turned out to be a great way to manage their stress and distract themselves. Even Professor McGonagall and Professor Sprout couldn't help but drop by towards the end of dinner to try. Pomona gave him the shell of what looked like a shiny hollow walnut and McGonagall a silver needle with a blunt tip. After Radha filled her bag with new treasures and Soizen's stomach with food from her, the two said their goodbyes and returned to the Gale Gold Common Room content. They went to bed in a good mood and sleep soon claimed them in a quiet night. And at dawn, their first magic lessons would officially begin. Chapter 9, Needles and Lights 
Soizen awoke the next morning when the alarm clock next to her let out a soft chime and released a billow of purple cloud with a faint scent of lavender, a pleasant way to start the day. Heading towards the exit of the common room, she looked at the pure silver egg in the center and made up her mind to get the first house story points from her to hatch on the first day of lessons. One detail she didn't notice yesterday was that there were miniature doors at the height of her feet, perfect for Rada and any future nifflers or cats to wander through the castle. After a hearty breakfast, her first lesson was in the Transfiguration classroom with Professor McGonagall, whom she found in her cat form watching the students come through the door. She nodded as she gave him a knowing smile and sat down at an empty desk while she pulled out a book and waited for the performance to start. His action caused the cat to look at him intrigued, but he soon looked away and continued to watch the students coming through the door, silently judging his behavior. How was I going to spoil the surprise? Sure enough, it didn't take long for her to hear Harry and Ron snuffling in hurried footsteps. When Professor McGonagall revealed herself to everyone in her human form, people looked down in embarrassment for trying to pet the cat or promise her some fish later. Nothing was quite as amusing as Ron and Harry's red and white expression though. Mr. Gale Gold, Minerva said as she looked away from the troublesome duo and approached him, I'm curious as to how he managed to recognize me, unlike the rest of his companions. It's simple, Professor, I've never seen a cat before that had spectacle markings around its eyes, too similar to the ones you're wearing right now, Soizen explained, pointing to himself and his eyes, as if he's wearing some kind of invisible glasses. Minerva nodded in understanding, being able to pay attention to the smallest details was a necessary trait for proper learning of the transfiguration. After giving the warning that they must take their class seriously or never come back, she began to explain the basic theory of operation and the laws of transfiguration while noting the main points on the blackboard behind her with a wave of her wand. Lastly, you will apply what you have learned and try to turn the matches in front of you into metal needles by the end of the class. Now get out your wands and remember the focus. The students took their wands out of their sleeves or pockets and began to wave it as per her instructions. Boom! Mr. Finnegan. He is okay. Minerva was startled when she heard an explosion and saw one of her students covered in splinters of wood be more subtle and patient. Fortunately, she did not affect her companions. Go to the infirmary and Mrs. Poppy will have you good as new in no time. Keep trying, Mr. Longbottom, she encouraged when she saw that his face was flushed with concentration. And remember to breathe. Excellent, Miss Granger. Her, she clapped as she saw that the transformation was halfway done. Mr. Gale Gold, where is your wand? She she asked after examining most of the students and noticing that one of them had not followed her instructions. It's a bit complicated, Professor, but simply put, I don't have a wand. Although Soizen's tone was normal, her statement caused everyone's concentration to break and they turned to look in surprise. Don't you have a wand? Minerva was puzzled. And how do you intend to follow the school curriculum without a wand? This way, Professor, Soizen said before snapping his fingers, producing white sparks. Under everyone's gaze, the match slimmed down as its surface began to glow. Once the spire assumed its most basic shape, carvings of an alchemy began to appear surrounding the spire while ending with its beak as the sharp part of the spire. The silver base together with the tiny sapphires that acted as eyes and the colors of the fascinating creature, resulted in a wonderfully detailed work of art on a small surface. The students gaped at the change and unconsciously compared their poor work with Soizen's, feeling that something was not right. Were they learning the same thing? Why was the difference so big? Marvelous! Minerva acknowledged the cast of wandless magic and the excellent result. Few have such firm and delicate control of their magic at their age, Mr. Gale Gold. He seems like he has a talent for transformation. Fifteen points for Gale Gold. She announced happily, if you don't mind, I'd like to keep the needle, I have the hobby of collecting the best transformations of my students. Of course, Professor, it would be an honor. Soizen generously handed over her work. After all, she had already done it once and she could do it again if she wanted to. Also, she didn't know the spell to make the transformation permanent. Perhaps she should find Minerva later to see if she could teach her. 
She just thought about it for a moment, she could buy a box of 100 matches, transform them and apply the permanent spell to them and then sell the finished products for a few sickles of silver. They would sell like hot cakes. Her next lesson was charms with Professor Flittick, who needed to climb on a pile of stacked books as long as the students could see him clearly to hear the lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to learn two basic, very simple and useful charms, Flittick declared. The first is the light-producing charm, Lumos. Have seen, a single gesture and clear pronunciation. Now try it yourselves. Given the ease of the incantation, most of the students got it right on the first try and those who didn't only took less than five repetitions. An excellent example, Miss Granger. Five points for Gryffindor, Flittick nodded happily as he continued to look at the rest and suddenly his eyes widened. By Merlin's beards. Soizen's finger was lit up in true E.T. fashion, as the light turned a fluorescent green, spread out to cover her palm, and began to float and split like tiny fireflies. Like aces hit Aruma in one piece. Amazing! A perfectly executed variation of the Lumos incantation and masterful control that excellently imitates the movement of fireflies Flittick clapped so enthusiastically that he almost slipped off the book he was standing on twenty points to Gale Gold. Soizen felt a glare of fire and saw Hermione staring at him. He couldn't help but laugh and wink, he wasn't going to let her get points so easily. Furthermore, the application of the incantation was not his idea, but rather she took it from a series of his memories. Since you've all managed to successfully cast Lumos, let's move on to the next incantation, one of the most basic of all wizards, the levitation charm. Flittick explained. Now repeat after me, shake and hit. Wingar, Leviosa Winger Boem. Mr. Finnegan. He is okay. I think we'll need another quill, Professor, Harry commented, one side of his face covered in soot. Didn't he learn in the previous lesson not to sit next to the boy with the explosions? Chapter 10, Don't Fly. How did you do that? Harry asked as they waited for her teacher to arrive on the castle grounds to attend his first flying class. The fact that? Be more specific, I do many things every day of my life. How did you get Professor Flittick to fly across the classroom standing on his book? It's like he's muggle surfing. Ron yelled after him, waving his arms in disbelief. Besides, I can't believe I gave another twenty points for that. Wait, do you know what surfing is? Soizen gave Ron a strange look. My father told me and my brothers. It's when a muggle stands in a doorway above the sea, right? Sure, let's get to that. Soizen didn't want to have to clear up every muggle thing that happened, so he left Ron with that idea. Good morning students. Professor Hooch greeted all the students as she adjusted her gloves and went to her favorite position to give the lesson, having everyone in her field of vision. Good morning, Mrs. Hooch. Each student stood with a standard school-issued broom to her right. Following the instructions, everyone yelled up. To get the broom up, albeit with varying degrees of success. Potter and Malfoy got it right the first time, Hermione's broom seemed to doubt her and Ron's broom hit him on the nose, resulting in laughter from everyone. Soizen achieved success from him the first time. Following Neville's disastrous handling that nearly resulted in disgrace, Professor Hooch warned that no one touched the broomsticks as she accompanied the unfortunate Neville to see Poppy in the hospital wing. Wow, what do we have here? Malfoy retrieved Neville's rememberer from the lawn. Give it back Malfoy. Harry couldn't help but jump forward, making demands. What if I don't? He he hit the ground and came up with the broom in the air as he tossed the rememberal up and down I'd better set it down somewhere safe, like the top of a tree. Harry jumped on the broom and rose up, ready to give chase. Before Malfoy could firmly grasp the rememberal that was falling into his hand, it flew out and landed in Soizen's palm to everyone's bewilderment. That? Soizen looked at the students who were looking at him wondering how he had done it. We are wizards and in case you forgot, we just had a lesson on the levitation charm. Am I really the only one who came up with it? He looked around with an expression of disbelief. Don't tell me you left your wands in your common rooms and didn't think you could break each other's necks in this dispute. The Gryffindor students looked at each other awkwardly and the Slytherins finally understood what had happened. 
The truth is that everyone wanted to see the show and no one thought of intervening to mediate. What is happening here? Professor Hooch glared at the two students who were in the air, just as she had forbidden them. Hermione stepped forward to clarify the situation and after confirming the version of the story with those present, the professor deducted twenty points from Slytherin for ignoring her order and another twenty from Gryffindor for her recklessness. As for you, Hooch looked at Soizen with appreciation in his eyes, since you've managed to prevent these two from possibly killing each other from a bad fall, forty points to Gale Gold. Thank you, Professor Hooch, she thanked without showing much emotion. Her points were completely irrelevant to her, since they do not give any kind of real benefit and are just a way of encouraging competition between houses, bringing her animosity to the extreme on several occasions. Furthermore, Dumbledore's blatant manipulation to hand out points like Lemon Drops and Snape's obsession with taking points away from any Gryffindor of his class, took the fun out of the supposedly fair competition between houses. The House Cup Since she couldn't take her to his own house and was only showing off, she was as good as nothing in her eyes. Thanks Soizen, Harry could have hurt himself chasing Malfoy, Hermione walked up to him and thanked, I could have waited and told the professor, but no. It doesn't matter Hermione, children are children for a reason, she replied. Soizen couldn't care less about the fact that Harry's talents with the broomstick won't be revealed and he won't be joining the Gryffindor Quidditch team this year. What she was going to do was stupid with a capital letter and she had barely exchanged a few words with the boy, they couldn't even be considered friends. Why did you do that? Ron walked over with an embarrassed Harry and gave Soizen a disgruntled look. He was just a Slytherin about to kiss the mud, Harry had it all under control. Really? Soizen looked at him with a questioning expression. Then tell me, shouldn't I have intervened in the event that a child fell from a broom several feet above the ground, most likely ending up with a broken neck in instant death? That no medicine in the castle could prevent? He asked because it's clear that apart from me, everyone seemed to have forgotten the levitation charm. Harry blanched a bit as he heard the vivid and very possible repercussion of his impulsive actions. Was flying so dangerous? But before he felt some kind of emotion when he was rising from the ground on the bro omit couldn't be that bad, right? Ron held up his hand, finger outstretched, and tried to refute, but after several seconds of trying, he only yelled in exasperation and spun around red-faced as Harry gave him what he could deduce was a look of thanks for the help before following him. Malfoy was about to approach Soizen with his two thugs to teach him a lesson, but seeing Harry and Ron walking off like that after exchanging words with him, he realized that he wasn't helping Potter, he was simply caring. That both sides really hurt each other. So in his infinite generosity, he let the matter drop and turned around, leaving Crab and Goyle wondering why they were going back without doing anything. Where were the promised blows? Chapter 11, Ancient Letter What happened in the flight field spread among students and teachers in less than half an hour. Many said that Soizen should not have intervened between the two houses, while others praised him for his insight and understanding of the situation. The teachers were delighted to see that not all first years were impulsive and there was someone responsible, but not as rigid as Miss Granger. The culprit of the news was currently in the library consulting the books related to potions. Since in an hour they had their first lesson with Snape and if he was going to follow the original plot, he would ask more advanced questions about potions to those who are calling. The attention, which originally would only have been Harry, but Soizen suspected it might extend to him due to the hubbub of establishing a new house. There wasn't just one new celebrity this year. Oh, that reminded him that he had to stop by the common room so he could see the hatch alchemy and pick up a letter meant for the potions master before the lesson, a letter he had been carrying the day he showed up at his mother's house in the middle of the day. Of a flare of flu powders. Which was strange, since until then their mothers were unaware that the fireplace in their home was connected to the flu network. Maybe the previous owner was a wizard and forgot about it or didn't know about it either. They had to close it later for security reasons. Later, in the dungeons. Everyone looked around the potions classroom to shudder at the sinister potion ingredients on the shelves around them, some of which were still moving. Snape stormed into the classroom and after his bottling glory and avoiding death speech, asked Harry the three questions, who had no idea why he was asking such questions when they were having their first class at that very moment. What the hell was a bezoar? Finishing ridiculing Potter and ignoring Hermione, 
Snape turned to look at Soizen, though unlike with Harry, his gaze held slight interest rather than spite and anger. Tell me, Mr. Gale Gold. What is the most common use of the Lethe River water? It is used for the preparation of the forgetfulness potion, Professor. Soizen was glad to be on his guard. What could we use the ground fairy wings for? For potions like the invigorating potion or the beautifying potion. What potion could you brew if one of the ingredients had to be bat spleen? The enlargement solution. Snape nodded, giving no praise and turned to Harry. See, Potter. There's a reason you're being asked to buy a book, it's called reading. Snape turned and looked at the rest of the class. Why aren't you taking notes on everything? He asked them with an annoyed look. Five points for Gale Gold, he murmured between the sound of the feathers against the parchment. Soizen doubted if Snape's attitude towards him and the points given was because he was genuinely pleased with the answers he gave him and helping him humiliate Potter or for saving Lily's son's life on the flying field. But if he wants tips for the eye potion, he prefers this attitude to that of a cold-eyed scorpion. After class ended, almost everyone ran out of the classroom hoping not to spend a single second more than necessary in the sinister place. Everyone except Soizen, who walked over to Snape. Excuse me professor, this is for you. He pulled an old-looking letter from his student robes and held it out to her. Snape gave him a cursory glance and his pupils contracted. Snatching the letter away so quickly that Soizen couldn't react, he held it close to his face and examined it better in the candlelight. For Severus Snape by Lily Evans. He would be able to recognize Lily's handwriting anywhere and anytime, what he didn't understand was why this kid had such a letter and it seemed to be so old. Where did you get them? Snape paid full attention at that moment. She was with me when my mother's adopted me Soizen answered him honestly as for who left her, I can only assume that she was that Lily. When were you adopted? It should be October 31, 1981. Snape was silent, that was the same date as Lily's death and when Voldemort fell due to his own spell. The darkest day of her life, when he couldn't protect her and Dumbledore didn't keep his promise to her. If you don't have any more questions, Professor, I'll go. Oh, and if he deems it appropriate, I would like to know the contents of the letter later as well. After all, I've been with her for eleven years and it's normal for me to be curious about it. Soizen left and Snape stared at the letter with misty eyes, reminiscing for a few minutes. Lily. And to think that everything went wrong that day, for a moment of anger caused by damned James Potter. Snape took a deep breath and carefully opened the letter's envelope, intending to keep it for himself later as a keepsake. He took out the letter and unfolded it, to reveal a blank scroll. He fixed his attention to a rune at the top and completed it according to methods known only to Lily and him, a little secret before breaking him to exchange secret cards as a game. Hello Severus. I know you must have many questions. Chapter 12, A Thousand-Year-Old Baby Hello Severus. I know you must have many questions and I don't know where to start. Do you remember that day when James almost killed you and in the rage of the moment you called me a mudblood? I guess it all started around that time frame. You know me, Severus, didn't you find it strange that our relationship suddenly got so cold? Sure, I felt very hurt by your words, but I also know that you didn't mean it. I would come to forgive you in time, you know. I was tricked, victim of an Amortentia potion supplied by James Potter with the help of his friends, Lupin, Sirius and Peter. And under the effects of the potion, I was influenced to sign a magical contract that avoided revealing what happened and with which James had power over me. He was obsessed with me and made sure to put a lot of restrictions. I'm sorry to say that when I'm writing this letter, too many years have passed since then, only recently did I find a way to bypass the magical restrictions. It all started after giving birth to my son, Harry. James was stressed with the screaming and constant attention the baby demanded and decided it would be nice to get away for a couple of weeks while we left the boy with our neighbor. To do this, we used a port key that was in the attic, quite old. But during the trip, the port key cracked and we were taken to some unknown place, which we later identified as Albania. At that point, we realized that we couldn't apparate and disoriented, we could only search the surroundings. What I did not expect was that during our search, we would find an ancient temple. 
You know I've always had an interest in these things and it was the only place we could take cover, so I managed to convince James to go in despite his reluctance. There we found a type of mysterious writing, hieroglyphics that James made no sense of, but I was able to read. The reason? It was a temple to motherhood. So I deduced that only mothers were capable of understanding what was on the walls and there was a phrase that was constantly repeated. All new life is protected within these walls, where death cannot reach it. As we carefully explored the place, I found the counterspells that allowed me to not only free myself from James's magical restraints on me, but also found an ancient type of spell that uses love as protection, which I plan to use on my son Harry. If things go wrong at some point in the future. I hate James for what he did to me, but Harry is not James. But that's not the most surprising of all. We found the body of Syra Gale Gold. Snape frowned at his last name, he was familiar with the outstanding and pure-blood wizards of the last two hundred years, but he knew nothing of House Gale Gold until Soizen came to Hogwarts. The only knowledge of him was obtained by the boy himself, where he revealed the existence of a fifth founder. He didn't know anything else. He went back to read the rest of the contents of the letter. The most surprising thing is that the body was not only preserved as if it had just died, but the swollen belly was held. She was pregnant. Syra was a woman who could never have a descendant due to the attack of a magical creature that she suffered as a child due to the conspiracy of malicious people, but she traveled the world looking for a way and it seems that she found it. I wonder who the father will be and how she did it. Maybe the temple had something to do with it. What a scare we got when the corpse began to give birth to a live and healthy baby when we got close enough to it. It was then that I remembered the phrase on the walls. At first I thought it was just a temple so I could pray for a safe delivery, but the temple actually managed to keep the baby alive. The baby was held by some ancient magic unleashed by his mother's love for nearly a thousand years. How much love must Syra Galegold have had for her heir? James wanted to give up the baby, he had enough with Harry and I refused. From what little I know of Syra, she was desperate to be a mother and abandoning her child after so many centuries of waiting seemed like a monstrosity to me. So for the first time in years, I threatened James and made it clear that at the very least, we should put the baby in an orphanage. Though furious about it, I eventually forced him to relent because she was willing to suffer any backlash from the restraints and it scared him enough to shut up. What James doesn't know is that when I went to drop the baby off at the orphanage, I actually magically adopted it into my family through rituals. Not the Potter family, but the Evans family. In the magic's eyes, the baby was mine and Syrah's equally, so she kept all her rights and gifts as well as getting some of mine. Later, I returned to the orphanage and took the baby with me to hide it in a secret room that I prepared in my house, one that only I had access to and was magically isolated. I'm sorry to have to ask you this after so many years, Severus, but you're one of the few people I can still trust even to this day. If something were to happen to me, please help me take care of the child. I'm sure Dumbledore and Sirius cared for Harry for a variety of reasons, but this boy has no one but me to trust. I even secretly found a place to flew him, with a cute couple there who will surely be able to take care of him in case the worst happens. Who knows what James would be capable of when he found out about my adoption and that I escaped from his control. I wish things had turned out completely differently, but there's no use complaining at this point. Thank you, Severus. Hugs, Lily Evans. Snape quickly pushed the letter aside so it wouldn't be stained by his tears. Knowing that Lily forgave him was as if she could see the colors of the world again and the emptiness in her soul disappeared. But when he remembered that James used Amortentia and manipulated Lily to this extent. If it wasn't for his enormous acclumency mastery, he might have started screaming in fury and blowing up the dungeons. But now he found some meaning in the full name of the Gale Gold heir. Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valris Aulis. The Evans name was right under his nose all this time, how could he not have realized? He suspended the remaining class for the afternoon with an excuse and it took him all night to collect her thoughts, he didn't even show up for dinner in the Great Hall. Chapter 13, School Rhythm A few weeks passed and soon Soizen got used to the school routine. Get up early, get some exercise out of habit, eat, attend lessons, hand in homework, explore the castle for clues about the treasures, write home, play with Rada, etc. 
he immediately stood out among the students with an absurdly monstrous talent in subjects like transfiguration, potions, charms, and herbology. There wasn't much to say, they were subjects not only very useful that aroused his interest, but also had something in common that resonated with his gale gold blood, change. Professor McGonagall couldn't contain herself and recommended him advanced transfiguration books in his fifth class, seeing that he was bored while the rest of his classmates struggled to finish changing the match for a needle. Except for a few cases like Hermione, who had managed to make the needle but was determined to make it as or more detailed than what Soizen showed. Professor Flittick was impressed by his creativity in adapting or modifying the spells and often awarded him points because he helped his classmates correct their wand swing mistakes. He practically became the professor's assistant and the professor in return revealed to him some little-known applications of some enchantments. He had to put a little more effort into herbology, thanks to his experience helping to take care of the garden at home, he was quite good at treating plants and did not make basic mistakes, but his knowledge of magical plants was on the same level as anyone. It took him a few visits to the library and some intense private debates with Neville before he could begin to become one of the most knowledgeable of his year, with the young Longbottom hot on his heels. As for potions, Snape's treatment of him changed radically and while he still attacked Harry like an eagle of prey, he often gave him advice and explanations when preparing the lesson potion and even awarded him points when he did an excellent job. The fact that he didn't have to repeat the warnings and that Soizen didn't make the same mistake twice helped a lot. The Griffinders stared speechlessly at their potions master and the Slytherins doubted his life, believing for a moment that Soizen was one of their own hiding in another house to receive such treatment. But wait a minute, none of them seemed to get such a good deal. When Soizen inquired about the contents of the letter, Snape told him that he would show it to him during his second year and now he should focus on having a good foundation of magical knowledge, theories, and practices. On the other hand, when he pitched his idea of creating and marketing a vision potion to him, Snape applauded his enthusiasm for potions and suggested several books that could help him compose the basic formula of the potion. He found the books in the library and after reading them, he did what probably no student at Hogwarts had ever done before. He went down to the school infirmary and asked Madame Pomfrey her opinion on the matter. Since he had a medical connoisseur nearby, he saw no reason not to use her savvy experience to her advantage. It should be noted that Poppy was surprised that a healthy student would want something from her, but after hearing the reason, she was delighted to help and contribute her grain of sand to the project. Then it was just a matter of finding his way to stock up on ingredients and get started. And just like that, Soizen was creating his first original potion under suggestions from the school nurse, corrections from the potion's master, and smuggling ingredients from the Weasley twins. The results came out in a month, it was all I needed to be able to have an acceptable potion with the desired effect without repercussions from which I should start the modifications to find more affordable ingredients, simplify the steps for its production, etc. It was a most stimulating and enriching process unlike other disciplines. He didn't learn anything in Quirrell's dada when she assisted with a bubblehead charm to ward off the strong smell of garlic. The history of magic was boring and outdated, because the ghostly teacher only repeated what was written in the textbooks and seemed to ignore any changes or corrections made after his death. He learned more from self-study than from what was taught. Even the flight classes were mere routine and he just followed the instructions as if he were learning to ride a bicycle. The only subject where he performed normally was astronomy, to which he paid attention due to the variable effects that celestial movements could cause to potions, some enchantments, and magical plants. One morning, as the rest of the four houses stared blankly at the point clocks in the great hall and saw with their own eyes how the new house with only one student had more points than any of them, Soizen was given a copy of the Daily Prophet. With an interesting headline while having a tasty and nutritious breakfast. Assault Gringotts. That reminded him of the existence of the Philosopher's Stone, at some point he should look for Ariste's mirror to take a look at it. And maybe visit Fluffy. Perhaps the time had come for him and Rada to pay Hagrid the promised visit, after all, at some point he would have to get the dragon egg and he had other thoughts to exchange with the good-hearted but ill-judged half-giant. After finding free time and leaving the castle, Soizen walked Rada over her right shoulder to the Hogwarts keykeeper's cabin and pounded on the door several times. The door opened and a large dog peeked out, tail wagging joyfully. Soizen. Hagrid looked with unexpected joy at his surprise visitor. Oh, 
I see you've brought Radha. Enters. I just made some tea and rock cakes. It was funny to watch as Hagrid poured a delicate china cup of tea while he drank what looked like a wooden beer mug filled to the brim with the dark liquid. If you don't mind Hagrid, I'll take the rock pies back, I just had breakfast and my mum would be furious if she knew I ate too much. I'm on a strict diet and your sweets will be a secret. Of course. The half-giant nodded, satisfied that his famous dish was appreciated did I hear from Pomona that you are good at plants. Well, I have a garden at home and I help take care of it sometimes. Soizen shrugged as he sipped his tea, still too hot, actually, I wanted to talk to you about magical creatures. I have some ideas in mind and I'm told they were one of the most knowledgeable on the subject in the castle. I only know for nonsense about it, it's a bit my passion. Hagrid immediately became sheepish. How about this? Tell me all about your adorable little Niffler and I'll help you in any way I can. Sure Soizen took a moment to summarize her story I met Radha when she was five years old and she was taking care of a tree in the garden. I dropped a piece of candy in a shiny gold wrapper on the floor and saw a shadow rush to take it. The story wasn't really that long. Her mothers found them fighting over the candy and after reaching an agreement where Soizen kept the candy and Radha the shiny wrapper, the Niffler began to visit the family often and eventually joined it. Touching. Hagrid was blowing his nose into a rag the size of a kitchen apron. A true tale of friendship between man and magical creature, it's really like a fairy tale. I suppose so Soizen watched as Radha fooled a disoriented Fong while they were playing and nodded as for what I want to talk to you about, I understand that from time to time, you try to cross some species of magical creatures, with interesting results. Well, I admit it's a little tricky sometimes. Some creatures don't get along and I have to spend a lot of time convincing them to open up to new possibilities, Hagrid explained. New possibilities, of course. You see, Hagrid, I recently thought. Hagrid listened with interest, and as Soizen outlined the thought of him, his eyes sparkled with interest. A revolutionary idea. He said enthusiastically before frowning. Hmm, but it's going to be hard to combine those features and I'll need a lot of inspiration to think about the combinations. It's not something we can achieve in a short time, although I suppose we could try starting with the Streeler as a base. Perhaps this book can help. Soizen took a book from his robe and presented it to Hagrid, who read, On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Chapter 14, Magic Soap Soizen returned to the castle after a fruitful chat with the enthusiastic guardian. His idea wasn't something that could be accomplished in less than a year or two, so he convinced Hagrid to take on the project and help him out. He just had to stop by every once in a while for tea and see how she was progressing. As for the rock cakes he carried with him, they could always be turned into deadly projectiles. And speaking of deadly things, at the end of the month it would be Halloween at Hogwarts and Quirrell would have to release the troll in the castle. Maybe he would need to take some measures to stop two idiots from trying to kill each other while rescuing a girl who was her fault in the first place that she is hiding crying due to the hurtful words used. How about we put on a show? Soizen. A voice took him out of his thoughts why are you smiling as if you were a novel villain? It's nothing, Sylvia, I was just thinking about the Halloween party, Soizen answered when he recognized the person who approached him by his voice. How is our soap project going? Sylvia, a muggle-born witch and first-year Hufflepuff who Soizen bonded with during one of his herbology classes, when he saved her from turning into a hedgehog. She was somewhat plump, with thick glasses, shorter even than Soizen, brown-eyed, she had chocolate-brown skin and her red hair cascaded straight down to her waist. She was particularly fond of anything that made life in general more pleasant and comfortable, with a happy but somewhat shy attitude. She only started acting confident after they met several times in the greenhouses. I have tried some combinations with the essential oil of the flowers and fruits that you suggested and the girls of my house gave it the go-ahead with stars in their eyes. Pleasant aroma, persistent and relaxing. We only need to give them the shape, the enchantments, and we can start selling them. Good job. Soizen hoped she'll still need another week at least. Prepare, say, fifteen samples for me to examine and bring them with you when we meet after the charms lesson. I'll give them the go-ahead, after which we sign the papers and I'll put the finishing touches on it. Clear. 
See you in two days Sylvia said goodbye with a smile and hurried towards her common room. Hmm, I should send my moms a couple of samples, Soizen murmured as she walked away. I think they'll like it a lot. He jokingly mentioned an idea to create animated bars of soap with pleasant scents during one of his conversations with Sylvia, and it just so happened that she learned how to make homemade soap as a child. Combining her knowledge of plants, crafting skills, and some magic, Sylvia successfully created a nice, scented soap. Now all that remained was to shape them into adorable and harmless shapes like cats or mermaids and enchant them to keep their shape as they get smaller from wear and tear and help wash the skin. Once the product is finished, they will sell it for two silver sickles a pill, each making half of the profit. It may seem small, but the profit with the numbers is actually terrifying. The cost to create a bar of soap is only 10 nuts, so they're selling it for almost five times the cost and even if they split that profit, they'll still make more than double its cost in profit. If they sell a total of 100 bars of soap, that's already a little over 11 galleons. The frequency of purchase of the soap, its variety, its convenient storage, the simple enchantments, its necessity. Once the papers are submitted, approved, and they get the patent, even if someone starts selling their product, they will owe him and Sylvia 40% of the net profits they make. Free money. Two days later, under the interested eye of Professor Flittick, the soaps were transformed into simple but attractive shapes and enchanted with a simple symbiotic combination of three basic charms, whose function was animation, keeping shape and collaboration. A very well thought out and safe application of the essential charms, Flittick congratulated as he took a closer look at the sample he was given in the form of an owl scented with wild berries. Learned so early, many students do not consider these things until their fifth year. 10 points to Hufflepuff and Gale Gold. Sylvia and Soizen exchanged glances and smiled. By the way, Flittick looked away from the soap owl and looked at them. I would advise you give Professor McGonagall a sample as well, perhaps as a surprise. Don't worry, Professor, we already thought about that Sylvia raised a soap in the shape of a lazy cat and smelling of vanilla we were thinking of sending her by owl with a note to see her reaction discreetly from the tables of the Great Hall. Oh, wow. Interesting idea, now I'm also interested in seeing her expression when she receives the mystery package. Flittick winked in understanding and laughed. After Soizen set aside three samples two for her mother's and one for the magical patent office and Sylvia took two more for herself and a friend, they signed the relevant legal documents and sent them off with Soizen's owl. They should get a response the next morning due to the simplicity of your product. How do we use the remaining eight samples? Sylvia asked. Let's do a raffle so that two different people from Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Slytherin, and Ravenclaw can get them, Soizen suggested. And how do we do the draw? Let's ask two questions, different for each house so they don't cheat and the first two to answer correctly get the samples. I like it, leave the questions to me, I have some ideas. Chapter 15, Security at Hogwarts After receiving the patent approval the next day without problems and strangely without the need for the signature of a responsible adult magical laws. Ladies and gentlemen, Sylvia spread the rumors of the raffle and the questions appeared on the bulletin board of every common room except the Gale Gold House. When Soizen heard about the questions, she couldn't stop laughing for several minutes. In Slytherin the questions were related to muggle knowledge so elementary and common sense, that only those born into non-wizard families could answer them. In Ravenclaw they had to find two tokens hidden in their common room, forcing them not to sit down and do physical exercise. In Gryffindor, Riddles taken from an ancient book were used, so it was necessary to have a great intellect to find the correct answer. In Hufflepuff they had to go to the kitchens and ask for the name of the correct dish if they were able to tell what it was based on a list of ingredients that made it up. Favoritism Sure, Sylvia made it easy enough for her house, but Soizen didn't care, after all, the four houses would still have two magic soaps each at the end of the day. The Slytherin winners were Daphne Greengrass and Pansy Parkinson. In Gryffindor it was Hermione Granger and Lavender Brown. In Hufflepuff Susan Bones and Wayne Hopkins won. Lastly, the Ravenclaw winners were Terry Boot and Padma Patil. As for whether they thought or achieved the answer on their own or helped them, it was irrelevant. The soaps were circulating and once Sylvia finished another batch, 
they would start selling them in true Weasley style. While a fashion for hygiene and good sense was brewing at Hogwarts, unknowingly, the Halloween party came quietly but not discreetly. When the Great Hall is suddenly filled with magically suspended pumpkins, one can't help but be suspicious. Shit. Soizen looked over at the Gryffindor table and didn't see Hermione. Harry was eating with a happy expression while Ron kept saying how annoying Miss Smarty was, while doing lousy impressions of Hermione giving advice. Would it really be a crime to sew a zipper to that mouth? Hmm, actually the idea of the zipper is not good, I would still be able to open my mouth. Maybe sew it on. That seemed more appropriate. Ron suddenly flinched and looked around suspiciously. Were the twins nearby? The great doors to the great hall were flung open and Quirrell rushed inside. Why the hell were they closed during dinner to begin with? Troll. She yelled. There's a troll in the dungeons. Then he staggered and before passing out he added I already said it. After a few seconds of silence, everyone began to scream as if they were drowning. Silence. Dumbledore used a sonorous spell and amplified his voice to calm all the students have the prefects escort their members to their respective common rooms. Headmaster Soizen couldn't help but raise his voice as everyone was about to take a step to leave with all due respect, that's a terrible idea considering that two of the houses have their common room in or near the dungeons. Where the troll is supposedly then he added it would be like sending food to the room. Professor McGonagall and company blanched as they realized her mistake. I suggest that if you want to keep your plan, you move Slytherin House to Ravenclaw House and send the Hufflepuffs to the Gryffinders. All together and away from the dungeons. An excellent point, Mr. Galegold, agreed Dumbledore. You will be following Gryffindor, it is not a good idea for you to return alone at this time. In that case, let's follow that plan and the teachers will come with me to deal with the problem. Following a logical plan of action, they all moved, and halfway through, Soizen saw Ron and Harry slip away. Percy. Soizen yelled at the Gryffindor prefect as he rushed past everyone. Ron and Harry just snuck out running to find the troll. That? After a quick look and mental count, Percy saw that both Harry and his little brother were really missing damn reckless. Get everyone safely to the common room, then alert a teacher. I'll try to drag them back. Having said this, he escaped without expecting a very possible refusal from the prefect. After running to the bathroom, he heard the screams of a girl along with a loud bang. The troll was trying to hit Hermione with the club and Harry and Ron looked around her not knowing what to do. Why the hell are you here? The sudden voice behind them made them jump. Hermione. Soizen, we have to help her. Harry yelled. Well, I don't see you doing anything. Soizen pushed them away annoyed at wasting time while Hermione was terrified and with her life at stake Aguamenti. Soizen conjured a stream of water from her hands and gathered it around the troll's head as a bubble, which he then maintained with the small-scale aqua volatem charm. The troll suddenly dropped his club and tried to tear off the strange mask that suddenly fell on his head. But no matter how much I tried to hold on, the water slipped through his fingers and held his place. After two minutes of fighting, the troll lost consciousness and crumpled to the ground at the wizard's feet. We did it. Ron yelled suddenly, breaking Soizen's concentration and the aqua volatem charm began to disintegrate. Now Soizen felt the urge to repeat his action with Ron. He wanted to keep the water longer and make sure that the troll would never wake up again, but the loudmouth on duty not only interrupted him, but even took some of the credit for some incomprehensible reason. Perhaps Harry saw the implicit threat in his eyes, grabbed Ron's robes to signal him to shut up, but didn't take it for granted. We've defeated a troll. My brothers will be speechless when they find out, he said with a smug face. Soizen held back from casting a Petrificus Totalus at him and shifted the focus from him to Hermione. He levitated her up to them so she wouldn't have to go near the troll and gently lowered her. You are well. He he asked as he examined her for injuries. What is happening here? Before the young witch could reply, McGonagall, Snape, Dumbledore, and Quirrell appeared to see the unconscious troll, the vandalized toilets, and four first years. Chapter 16, Almost Clear Evidence In the name of Merlin, what is going on here? 
McGonagall watched them like a hawk. Can someone tell me what happened? Excuse me, Professor, but before any explanation, Hermione has been attacked by the troll and urgently needs to visit the hospital wing, Soizen said earnestly as he took the dazed witch's hand and walked past the startled teachers. We can talk later when the troll has been dealt with and the threat has passed. Mr. Gale Gold. McGonagall said in surprise. Priorities, Professor, Soizen's voice trailed off. If you're in such a rush for an explanation, ask Potter, he'll be a truer version than any other witness among those left in the bathroom. The teachers unconsciously looked at Ron in unison and nodded at the same time, they understood what Soizen meant. Minerva, please escort the young lions back to their common room, the headmaster requested, rubbing the bridge of his nose wearily. Severus, if you would be so kind as to escort Miss Granger and Mr. Galegold to the nursing. And Quirrell, I'll have to pester you to take care of the troll. On the way to the infirmary. Hermione finally managed to process everything that had just happened and snap out of her stunned state. Thank you for saving me, she thanked. But what were you doing there? I'm wondering the same thing. Snape caught up with them and matched his pace. Explain yourself, Soizen. After correcting the headmaster's nonsense order with all due respect and following the Gryffindor prefect into his common room, I noticed Potter and Ron sneaking out. Initially I thought they were reckless who wanted to fight the troll, so I informed the prefect before trying to catch up with them and take them back, she recounted in a clear voice. Only after seeing Hermione present did I understand, one, the prefect didn't bother to check that everyone in your household was present before you left, which is a serious mistake during this emergency. Two, the reason they ran away from her was to warn her of the troll. Go on. Snape raised an eyebrow with a slight note of interest. After finding them, they were idly watching and panicking as the troll had already started attacking Hermione. I simply got fed up with her doubts when there was a life in danger, pushed them aside and took steps to ensure as much as possible Hermione's safety despite my meager strength. Given the characteristics of a troll, I decided to render him unconscious due to lack of air by drowning him in a bubble of water. A creative approach, the power requirement is weak but effective for the situation, Snape nodded approvingly. What doesn't enter my head is how a 20-foot-tall troll has managed not only to get through the school's defenses, but has managed to end up in the bathroom when it was supposed to be in the dungeons. He commented with an annoying tone the distance between the two is not something that a huge troll can cover in a few minutes, let alone whether the moving stairs can support his weight or he is able to pass through the stone arches with his size. Also, I doubt there are secret passageways in the castle that I could fit through or know how to use. Certainly Snape narrowed his eyes. When Madame Pomfrey found out that Hermione was attacked by the troll, she gave her a full diagnosis, the results of which were only minor bruises from her fall and stress. She smeared him with a potion, gave him a piece of chocolate, and ordered him to stay in the infirmary until morning. Without discussion. Snape escorted Soizen to the Gale Gold common room after leaving the infirmary at her request. The last thing he wanted right now was to have to face two packed and excited houses for what will no doubt be a Weasley brand theater. Professor, he called, is Quirrell to be trusted? What's with that question? Snape stopped and looked at him carefully. Honestly? After seeing how Snape nodded, he continued, first, as a teacher he is pathetic. I don't mean the stutter of it, but it teaches nothing but theory that I could read myself in the book in a classroom full of garlic to hide a strange smell of decay coming from it. I noticed it in the first lesson and since then, I have used a bubblehead spell to be able to tolerate it. Second, what kind of data master meets a troll in the castle and doesn't take care of it? Instead, he ran into the great hall and instead of approaching the staff table and reporting so as not to set off a panic through the side door, he makes his way as conspicuously as possible through the large doors, yells that there's a troll. In the dungeons and faints. Third, it turns out that the troll was not in the dungeons and by chance appeared near a student who was alone, isolated and knew nothing of the danger he kept a moment of silence and continued that mistake could have cost Hermione her life, Professor. It's not a small mistake and it seems almost deliberate. Snape was speechless at Soizen's analysis in one fell swoop. He would doubt anyone knowing these facts and would suspect if he is smart enough, but the question now was how to answer. 
The director's plan was halfway and he couldn't expose it. He could lie, but he knew the boy wouldn't fall for a piece of nonsense out of his sleeve without thinking. I'll tell the director your suspicions, he said simply. It was the truth, without further details. Albus needed to know that the Dark Lord's cover was nearly blown by a first-year student and he had to decide what to do to calm the student down. One who is also a natural occlumant, so he won't be able to perform his usual tricks and he won't allow him to do anything beyond Lily's adoptive son. I understand, Professor. Good night. It was only when Soizen was left alone with Rada and was stretched out on the bed with his mind relaxing, that a fleeting thought appeared in his head. What if Dumbledore's command wasn't actually wrong in the Great Hall? Because he knew the troll wasn't in the dungeons, so there was no danger to the students. No student except. Hermione. They came to the exact spot just seconds after the troll's defeat. That means. This is worrying, very worrying. The famous and well-known great magician of light seemed to have a long shadow behind him. Chapter 17, Good View Potion The next morning, everyone was talking about at least six different versions of the story of what happened to the troll in the Great Hall, all wrong and far from reality. I can't believe Harry and Ron got points! exclaimed shocked Hermione, who, for reasons unknown, was sitting at the Gale Gold table instead of the Gryffindor one. While I appreciate you coming to find me, you did absolutely nothing while I was being attacked. She, she complained, you were the one who brought down the troll and they awarded you less points than those two. Welcome to reality, where you discover that the points have no real value, Soizen told her, burning an expression from the girl as if she had just told her that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Apparently, the event that should trigger the birth of the Golden Trio went downhill due to her intervention. As a result, Hermione remains angry with Harry and Ron, which will deprive them of 99% brainpower in future adventures, while being saved in a life-or-death situation has brought her closer to Soizen. Meh, one more friend can't hurt. Good morning, Soizen. You are well. Good morning, Sylvia. All right he returned the greeting and introduced the girl Sylvia, this is Hermione and vice versa. I'd love to, Sylvia replied as she shook Hermione's hand. Oh my god! Hermione exclaimed. You're the soap girl. I love the vanilla-scented version of the cat. Thank you, Sylvia and Soizen responded at the same time, to the bewilderment of the witch. We both did the business Sylvia clarified I make the soaps. Then I loved them Soizen continued. And then we sell them. X2. As the three of them discussed which scent went best with which shape and defended the reasons while striking down the opposing reasoning, the Weasley twins approached the table. Mr. Gale Gold. Our favorite returning customer. We've heard the news. And we're grateful to you for saving little Ronnie. Besides not hitting him. How about a 10% discount on the next order to celebrate? Soizen suggested. Thanks are great, but practical is useful. Fred and George looked at each other and shared a moment of intensive exchange of micro-gestures of their exclusive language as twins. Deal. They agreed. I won't be polite then, next time bring me three times as much. I'm close to something important and I need to calibrate the proportions. Noted. See you on Saturday for the delivery. What are you all talking about? Hermione asked interestedly as Sylvia turned around, expressing the same question with her gaze. I'm optimizing a potion and the twins kindly act as go-betweens supplying me with the ingredients. It's almost ready. But for potions you have to follow the recipe to the letter. Well, since I'm creating a completely new potion, there's no recipe to consult. Don't worry. I have professionals supervising my work. Hermione and Sylvia gasped. How long had they been in school learning potions? Two months. And here thinking that the enchanted soap was already an incredible project. Wait, you said you were optimizing it Sylvia paid attention to the detail. Oh, it already has the desired final effect, but it is not a pleasant process and it needs to improve some details. The Buena Vista potion, as he called it, when drunk, destroyed the defective eyeballs like a punctured balloon and made new, healthy ones grow. 
she was now experimenting so that instead of that extreme process, she simply readjusted the defects of the eye. After all, a smooth and less unpleasant process will be useful when it comes to selling the potion, right? By the way, there's a Quidditch match next week said Sylvia which team are you going to support? I'm not going, I don't like Quidditch, Soizen dismissed without a second thought. The danger and rules of the game were ridiculous and a waste of time. You have to know that the longest game recorded is three months because the searchers could not find the snitch. Nobody thought, this is getting out of hand, we better use common sense and stop. The only thing he will do related to that magic sport is bet when Ireland and Bulgaria meet, since he knew the result. He'd rather spend the day looking for the treasures at Hogwarts than see that. Also, Potter didn't make the team because of his intervention in flight class and Quirrell won't try to kill him with the Texas Rodeo curse. Where will the fun part be? Chapter 18, Guardian Totem The week passed and while almost the entire castle attended the match including Quirrell, he secretly checked, Soizen finally found one of Syrah's hiding places. He turned out to be behind a painting on the fourth floor where he is painted a homeless man begging and is ignored by two wizards who drink wine from a boot and a hat. All he had to do was pull his wand out of her and trace a coin into her outstretched hand to make her move away from her. The room closed behind him and he discovered that it contained three items, an intricate magic circle on the floor, a bubbling blue potion, and a golden dagger. He spent twenty minutes going through everything before finding the related memories in her head and understanding what each thing was used for. The magic circle was a combination of summoning magic, sacrificial conversion, and rituals used to bind totem guardians. The potion was an ancient recipe for altering traits such as bloodlines, curses, gifts, and talents to a more desirable or useful alternate version. And the famous silver objects made by leprechauns? Well, his mother managed to create a version that used gold instead of silver, a feat that the goblins are still unable to replicate. She was sorry that due to the cumbersome process, she only made enough to make a small dagger. The function of the room was clear, to provide Sojin with a guardian totem for his safety. As for what he would get, there was only one way to find out. He approached the gold dagger that rested on a purple silk cushion and after a nasty bite on his own hand, he dropped a few drops of blood to be recognized as his owner. The dagger was an artifact capable of cutting through almost anything, but it couldn't harm its owner even if Soizen held it by the blade instead of the handle. Why in all those series and movies does it seem that biting and drawing blood is something easy and painless? Damn scammers! He moved past the potion and dropped more drops of blood into the marks on the floor as he muttered the magic circle's activation words and with a wave of his good hand, he used a simple spell to heal the little girl. Wound. The markings on the ground writhed like leeches and spread, forming a second ring in which a barrier was generated before the original circle began to glow red light. With a bang reminiscent of the apparition, something fell into the magic circle. A boa constrictor. No, that shape it should be a snake. The snake looked around in confusion, and Soizen had the feeling he had seen the creature before which was weird because he wasn't a big fan of snakes. The zoo snake that Harry released. No, that was a boa constrictor. It could be. Nagini. I ask. The snake suddenly turned around, and from what Soizen could tell, he wore a surprised expression. It was hard to tell, really, but his sixth sense told him that it must be Voldemort's famous snake, which in the future would become a horcrux. Nagini began to hiss frantically, but Soizen had no idea what she was saying. I can't speak parcel tongue, but we can try to communicate in a more basic way, Soizen explained through the barrier. Nod if you understand me. Nagini nodded. Do you have any idea how you ended up here? Nagini shook her head. Has your curse become permanent? Nagini looked at him silently for a moment, asking how he knew about his condition, but he still responded with a nod. Soizen fell silent and thought for a minute before speaking again. Okay, this will sound a little crazy to you, but remember that we are in the magical world, okay? After seeing her nod again, she began to explain we are in Great Britain, in a hidden room at Hogwarts to be more specific. I found one of my mother's heirlooms in the castle and activated the magic circle where, for whatever reason, you appeared due to summoning magic. 
He gave her a moment to process the information, then pointed the potion vial to her. His side if my theory is true, then this potion should remove your maledictus condition and allow you to be human again. Nagini straightened up further upon hearing that. I'm not done, let me say it all before you get excited. The circle you are in is for vesting totem guardians. Do you know what they are? Nagini shook her head. They are something like bodyguards, servants, assistants, etc. I don't know how to express it with a more appropriate term, but the point is that they are tied to a lord for life in exchange for a grace. Not as slaves, but more as an oath of unbreakable loyalty. She looked away from the circle on the ground and back at her. Now, here's the crux of the matter. For the potion to work, it must be used in combination with the magic circle as a sacrifice to invest a totem ward. You understand? Nagini tilted her head and shook it. He had retained much of his intelligence in his cursed form, but he couldn't follow the complex intricacies of human thought like before. It was difficult for him. In short, you have two options right now, Soizen tried to explain as simply as possible, first, I can use the magic circle again and it will return you to where you were, as if nothing had happened. Or I can use the ritual with the potion, which will make you human again, but you will be bound as my totem guardian. And I also don't know if there will be any additional side effects. So what do you decide? Nagini curled up and placed her head on her body, thinking. Soizen did not rush his decision. In fact, the magic circle could force the summoned party to obey as long as he used the potion as a sacrifice, but if the summoned was willing of his own free will, he would not only receive more benefits but they could have a better relationship. In other words, a symbiotic choice was more beneficial to all involved than an imposed obligation. He doesn't know how much time passed, it could have been a minute like twenty, but Nagini seemed to have made up her mind. Did you decide? Nagini nodded and hissed again. Wait wait. Let's do this, nod if you agree to be my totem guardian. Deny if you want me to send you back. Nagini looked at him and nodded. Okay, but I'm warning you, it will only activate the ritual. I don't know if it will hurt or what will be the exact process we will go through, so, anyway, you better get mentalized just in case. Soizen took the potion and returned to the circle, ready to go when he remembered something else. By the way, do you have a thing against squibs? Nagini shook her head. Okay, let's get started. Chapter 19, Mirror of Ereast That was Soizen searched for the right word for the situation once he finished the totem guardian ritual. Unexpected? Said a female voice. Yes, that would be the best definition, she agreed, I didn't expect the potion to overwrite your blood curse by changing your snake form into an alchemy form, that being your new animagus form permanently apparently. Not to mention your unexpected rejuvenation, it seems that you are barely, how old? She tried to estimate herself tentatively. 25. My body has returned to the age of 20, Nagini replied with quite certainty in her statement. And luckily for both of them, when he returned to her human form she still had clothes with her, in very bad shape, with cuts and serious wear, but it was enough. Did you always have electric blue hair? My hair was originally a common black color, another effect of the potion or the ritual, I guess Nagini answered with a smile, looking down at her hands, showing no displeasure for her new look so what's the plan now, master? Nagini, treat me informally, you don't have to call me master or master, I don't feel comfortable with those titles he waved his hands nervously and I'm sure you don't find it pleasant either because of your past in the Arcana Circus. Now you are my people, not my property. If others will listen to it, there could be a lot of misunderstanding. Perhaps now she looked like a malnourished beggar, but once she was able to take a long bath, eat properly for a few weeks with the odd potion to help her recover, and somehow get new clothes for herself, Nagini would become a beautiful woman of ancestry. East Asian as she was in her day, only now she'll be sporting a new hair look. Oh, and he has to get her a wand at some point. Okay, Soiz and Nagini visibly relaxed again. What do we do now? And how do you know about me and my past? I ask interested. The Quidditch match must be almost over, if it hasn't already, so I can give you a quick and brief answer now or I can explain it to you at length later. I'll even do a QA session. 
I'll wait, then, Nagini agreed, she still needed time to consider her new situation. The fact that she managed to become human again and escape from her maledictus condition was something that at this point she only considered a dream and how are we going. I don't think if a stranger looking like me shows up at the castle, people won't notice. And I'd rather not meet Dumbledore. Same thought here. Take your form as Akami and shrink to hide in my hair until I return to the Gale Gold Common Room Soizen changed her hair at the moment and made it longer and more colorful to make it difficult to see her. Metamorphmagus. Nagini raised a curious eyebrow. And since when did Hogwarts have a house called Gale Gold? Again, there are two ways to respond. Nagini rolled her eyes, unable to contain the smile that crept across her lips and she transformed into Akami to hide. At the very least her hair is clean, Nagini thought as she felt the smoothness without grease around her. Several days passed. After introducing Nagini to Radha, answering her questions as much as possible, and letting her clean up before eating human food again, Nagini was happy. She currently had to stay in the female dormitories most of the day, but since no one was there, she could catch up on copies of the Daily Prophet or she could read a book with her hands. Later, when Soizen would go for a walk around the castle, she would hide in her hair again and look around her with interest. She had fingers again. Since she missed the thumbs, they were so useful. On his side, Soizen intensified his research on the Buena Vista potion to patent it and put it on sale as soon as possible. He needed a good handful of galleons to get a briefcase like Newt's commanders, but cheaper, just big and portable enough to get Nagini out of school by the end of the school year without the danger of bumping into certain people. He wasn't worried that Dumbledore would use his headmaster privileges and find Nagini. In the eyes of the castle, she had been invited by the Gale Gold heir, so there was no trespasser to notify. Two weeks before Christmas, the potion passed its final review and was praised by Snape, approved by Madame Pomfrey, and put to the test with flying colors. The vial he owed Potter. Technically the potion was already a success, Harry's not knowing it was the human experiment to confirm its intended effects was irrelevant and not mentioned. He thanked Soizen and did not refuse to help him promote the enchanted soap. Even the Weasley twins bought a pair to send to their mother and his little sister. The strange thing is that even after all the ones that were sold, he never saw Ron get one for himself. During one of his many searches for the rest of the treasures in the school, he came across a familiar place and soon recognized it as the area where the Mirror of Ariste was located before being moved to the rooms below the three-headed dog. Which, by the way, he decided not to visit in the end. Not for him, but for Rada. The Niffler would get very scared when he got close to his place. Go alone. Now Fluffy bit Snape unceremoniously, Soizen would be swallowed straight up in one bite. And carrying an instrument there would be suspicious, to say the least. Finding the room with the mirror, she stood in front of it and stared at the reflection. Wow, no wonder people get so excited when they see what he shows Soizen was impressed with himself in the reflection, very accurate let's see, the trick was. He closed his eyes and thought about getting the Philosopher's Stone, but not to use it. He felt a small weight in his pocket and as he reached in, he pulled out a ruby-like stone. In his other hand, an inconspicuous ring of common iron transformed into the golden dagger and struck the stone. It worked. Soizen was just trying, he didn't really expect him to be able to cut a piece. Although the piece was not even a third of the philosopher's stone, it was more than enough for him. He stuffed the rest of the stone back into the mirror, returning it to his pocket as his reflection took it and walked out in an excellent mood. Oops, I almost forgot. With a wave of his hand, the alert spells that Dumbledore placed at the entrance to the room went back to working without problems. It turns out that the level of these spells are only as advanced as the difficult obstacles that Harry and Ron will have to overcome if they get past Fluffy. Even a first-year wizard who pays attention to his surroundings will notice the anomaly. Too much confidence is bad. Chapter 20, Gale Gold's Fall Dumbledore appeared two minutes later in the hallway in front of the door and surveyed the area. The alert spells he put in advance seemed to have malfunctioned for a moment before flowing smoothly again, perhaps he was just getting too old, but what was here was too important and it was better to be safe. He walked over to the mirror and touched it with the palm of his hand, feeling if the stone was still there. 
He only breathed easy once he confirmed that he had not left. A false alarm. It seems that the nerves were playing a trick on him. After failing his chess game with Tom using the token known as Hermione, Snape informed him that the situation had all but been revealed by the strange boy, Soizen, Galegold's heir. After what happened during the house ceremony, he used his contacts to investigate the Gale Gold family and found very little. Someone or several people had worked very hard to erase the information of that family from the books for centuries, but there were still traces and some memories that his friend Flamel remembered from his youth came to the fore when he mentioned the last name. The Gale Gold family was founded by their ancestor, Suramon Gale Gold, even before the Sacred Twenty-Eight were established, a renowned family that had only two passions, magic research and trade, whose profits they invested in their security and research. It is said that 20% of the magic known in the entire wizarding world 1800 years ago came from that family, which was ahead of any other family by 200 years. They also had a keen eye for trade, making trades that were lucrative and fair for all, but they did not tolerate deception or swindling. He even discovered that there was a saying. If you value your life, never break a deal with a gale gold. But such an outstanding family would naturally arouse envy, despair, jealousy, and greed. Due to a vast conspiracy at some confusing point in wizarding history, over 90% of its members died, leaving only a few survivors behind. What no one expected is that the family, cornered and desperate, went to extreme measures and used their deaths, accumulated knowledge, and almost all the wealth as a huge sacrificial ritual to cast a single magic. He made all the magical beasts in the world tremble before they fainted from shock. It is said that after successfully casting the magic, even the heavens shed tears of blood for seven days and seven nights. Just thinking about the amount of magic required for such a phenomenon to be unleashed made goosebumps rise on his skin and his hands shake. Scariest of all. No one knew what magic they cast. Their enemies ran out of loot to claim, the main reason for their movement and they felt lost. Dealing with the Gale Golds only resulted in massive losses. Time passed and the Gale Gold family tried to recover, but they encountered constant obstacles and their numbers dwindled further. The time came when it was believed that the lineage died with Syra Gale Gold and they disappeared into the river of time. And then Soizen appeared, almost a thousand years later, the last seed of the lineage. Establishing a new house at Hogwarts, gaining ownership of the castle at the age of majority and who knows what else he had in his possession or right. By the lemon drops, even his authority over the house elves in the castle was superior to that of the headmaster. And now he had to figure out how to go through with his plan with Harry without him messing it up. I'm too old for this shit she muttered to herself as he rubbed the bridge of his nose. He was just an old man who wanted to fix some of the mistakes he made in the past before he died. For the greater good. Two months later. Hagrid. Soizen was surprised to find the half-giant in the library. Only after seeing the books did she remember what the reason could be. How to identify a dragon egg. By Balthazar Vix. How to feed and care for a baby dragon. By Fan Kirtan. Soizen. Hagrid hid the books in his mole clothes in surprise. He just found some stories to read to Fawn. You know, so that she sleeps better. He's been having insomnia for a few days and I thought it would be a good idea. I see Soizen smiled and didn't give it away although I don't know what stories Fawn likes, I don't recommend those. I have read them and while they are informative, they are not so perfect, so perhaps you should look for others. Really? Hagrid didn't expect to find someone knowledgeable on the subject. If I described an egg to you, would you be able to identify it? You do not believe me? Sure, he accepted the challenge. After a rather clumsy explanation from Hagrid. It's a Norwegian Ridgeback egg, no doubt about it. A Norwegian Ridgeback, of course. Hagrid searched the book to check and nodded thoughtfully. You should feed him a mixture of chicken blood and fire whiskey when he hatches, Soizen added. How long before that, by the way? She still has a couple of days left, from what I just read, she has to absorb more heat, Hagrid replied as he wrote down the food suggestion and suddenly froze. I shouldn't have said that. Come on, Hagrid, were you really going to hide such an incredible event as the hatching of a dragon egg from me? Soizen pretended to look downcast and betrayed. 
It's just that I Hagrid hesitated and felt a little guilty. Soizen was one of the few people who came to visit his cabin apart from the teachers and the principal, but having a dragon was a touchy thing to begin with and even he knew better than to openly brag about it. Chapter 21, Is It Biologically Possible? Another Failure Soizen couldn't help but complain after failing so many times. After convincing Hagrid to watch the egg hatch and letting him know she would be going with two friends, Soizen went back to the common room and talked to Nagini. They were getting to know each other more each day, she needed to talk to a person and she was able to learn some things that Hogwarts would not teach its students, knowledge of the magical world only perceived by some less than honest people. And it was only then that she remembered how dark the magical world can be. In the wake of that reminder, he made a note to remember to look up some spells to protect himself in case of trouble. But as he waited for time to pass and a time for the dragon's birth to approach, he went to find Professor McGonagall to ask her about the permanent transformation. Even with her obvious talent in the area, Minerva hesitated because it was even more advanced theory from the books she had previously recommended and she didn't want it to divide her attention too much. In the end, she only reluctantly agreed when Soizen swore to her that she would only study it during her free time, without committing her time to homework or preparing for exams. And after more than twenty attempts, he still hadn't succeeded and had a headache from the excessive use of the required magic. If you keep this up, you can't succeed, commented Nagini who was watching him beside him for entertainment, you focus too much on trying to get results quickly and you're stressing yourself out. While striving for improvement is good, too much will only backfire. You're right, Soizen sighed wearily and sat down next to him. Stop trying for a few days, do something else to relax and then when you try again your mind will be clearer and more perceptive, Nagini stretched his back as he spoke. Too many people don't end up realizing that their effort and hard work turns into an unhealthy obsession, he added with a sad tone. Soizen nodded without question and thought about what else he could do. Since coming to Hogwarts, his focus had been, making money, inventing or learning, searching for his birth mother's treasures, and avoiding trouble. He hadn't even tried to use the Philosopher's Stone Shard because of his distrust of Dumbledore. He would only try to study it when he returned home in the summer. Nagini, Soizen called suddenly, do you know the Fidelius charm? When he thought of home, he immediately associated the dangers of the magical world he had just pondered with discrimination against squibs and suddenly became anxious. Muggle parents are minimally protected by the Ministry of Magic and its laws, but according to his studies in the library, squibs fell into a loophole that left them very vulnerable except in ridiculously specific situations. He hadn't expected wizards to take their intimidation of squibs this far. I know the charm, but I can't cast it in my current state and without a wand, Nagini answered him. She was regaining weight and strength during this time, but she had not yet reached her peak. Soizen cunningly took her one night, barely avoiding Mrs. Norris, to the menagerie, which turned out to be a great sewing room, and was able to get some clothes for her. But the wand would take longer before she could get one. Soizen didn't even have one to lend her. It's okay, Soizen sighed in relief. The Fidelius charm was the best solution that crossed his mind when it came to protection for his family, he didn't have a place like the black house full of dense layers of defenses and curses, this summer. When we get back to my house, we'll go to Diagon Alley to get you a new wand and after that, I want you to become the secret keeper of my house. I'm already a totem keeper, another similar title is no big deal, Nagini laughed as she understood Soizen's concern when she remembered the two mothers she had. If you combine your status as a totem guardian along with secret guardian, there is simply no chance of escapes or betrayal. After all, look what happened to Harry's parents, great protection but the wrong guardian and wham, dead. So letting Nagini take on the role, was the smart thing to do. She couldn't betray Soizen, she couldn't be coerced by magical methods like Veritasarum, Imperius Curse or Legilimency. Even the people she revealed the secret to couldn't say anything without her explicit permission. You're going to see the dragon's egg this afternoon, aren't you? Nagini asked interestedly, can I come with you? Even I haven't seen a dragon hatch from its egg. No problem, Soizen nodded, but if you get caught, you'll have to pretend to be like Rada, is that all right with you? Nagini would naturally follow him in her Akami form hidden in Soizen, 
so if others know about her, she would have to act like a magical creature so they wouldn't suspect that she was an animagus, even though animagus forms of magical beings are extremely rare. I have a bit of experience in pretending to look like an animal, Nagini sarcastically teased, a sudden, fixed warning look, puppy dog eyes, purring, etc. I know all the tricks in the arsenal, just keep them from trying to feed me insects or I'll peck them. Soizen didn't know what to say. He understands the former because of the snake shape, but what the heck were the latter two? Does a snake know how to make puppy eyes? Was it even biologically possible for a snake to purr? Feeling his train of thought going off the rails, he shook his head and tried to focus on something different. What do you want to learn permanent transformation for anyway? Nagini asked, most mages use the temporary transformation because it's convenient and less magic consuming, rarely does anyone use a permanent transformation. Soizen explained his plan to sell transformed products. I see, Nagini put his index finger to his lips as he thought, did you think about learning the duplication charm, Gemini? I thought about it, but it's not convenient when it comes to business, Soizen shook his head. If he could use permanent transformation and duplication without a problem, one could imagine what a tremendous bug it would be to make money. The problem lies in the fact that items duplicated from an original, degrade much faster and wizards have ways of knowing if what they are buying is a magical duplication, which is essentially worthless. Then, it could be useful for copying and sharing notes, making some extra chairs if they are missing for the table, etc. But for selling? I was afraid of being labeled a scammer. Chapter 22, Notes for the Summer Soizen spent several days working on new products to earn money and to his surprise, Hermione decided to join him as a paid assistant. According to her, it was a good way to practice spells and charms while earning some money to buy more books. Since they both knew the muggle world, they took some common entertainment items and made their magical version without too much effort. For example, the magical Rubik's Cube. If someone completed the red face they would start to get hot, if it was the yellow face they would get tickled fingers, etc. Only when completing all the faces did the cube turn golden, as if it were a trophy. Dangerous? The young wizards played with a frisbee with teeth and chess pieces that killed each other. Some burns and cramps weren't even considered dangerous. What's more, the Weasley twins approached Soizen about supplying them with a few to sell as intermediates. Your pranks are great, too, Soizen told them. Have you thought about opening a joke store after graduation? Let me know if you do, I'll invest in it. The twins left quite interested. Soizen knew of their future plan, so investing a few galleons early in exchange for a return continued was perfectly acceptable. Looking at his savings at the castle, he was already very close to being able to buy that basic trunk with undetectable extension he needed and he also obtained the patent for his Buena Vista potion. In less than a month, over 70% of the students with glasses stopped wearing them after drinking the potion and curing their eyes. It couldn't be helped, the potion was a bit expensive, but since it only had to be taken once in a lifetime, many people were in no hurry and saved slowly. Although some friends and business associates, like Sylvia, received a discount when they showed interest in the potion. When word got out, any oculist in the magical world would try to strangle Soizen for taking their bread. It was like the sugar industry, they would do whatever they could to prevent people from knowing about Stevia, because it would threaten their profits. So you managed to get Norberta to the Tower of Hockeridge at night and didn't get caught? Soizen looked with interest at the duo finishing their homework as they ate in the great dining hall. We were careful. Harry didn't want to tell too many people about his invisibility cloak, Filch only managed to give us a scare. Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, I just find it odd to see you without your glasses, Soizen downplayed the matter to hide his true thoughts. The cloak was quite useful and unlike Demiguy's cloaks, it didn't lose its concealment ability over time. Giving something that good to someone like Harry. Let's be honest, he didn't deserve it. As much as Dumbledore said it was a family heirloom, who knows who James or his ancestors stole it from. Changing hands again shouldn't be a problem, should it? Harry shrugged and turned his attention back to the parchment in front of his nose, Professor McGonagall's task for once was quite understandable to him and he wanted to finish it in one go. Ron stared at the parchment, as if he expected the task to do itself without his intervention. 
His aimless gaze, the still quill and the unused ink gave Soizen an idea. He took a scroll and wrote a letter. Two days later. After finishing the piece of rhubarb pie for breakfast, he was about to get up when his owl dropped a melon-sized package on his desk. If someone were to pick up the box, they would notice that despite its bulk, it was incredibly light. He gave her some cake crumbs and happily left for the common room, where he opened the box and took out its contents. Pens. More specifically, automatic writing pens. Not only were they tremendously useful for speeding up the completion of homework, but they had other uses that Soizen intended to take advantage of. He set two aside for future tasks and took the rest with him to the library along with a large stack of parchment. He looked for an unoccupied table, placed several stacks of scrolls with a quill per stack and then looked for books he was interested in reading, but knew he would not have time to study in depth as needed. Turn happiness into a shield, theory and application of the Patronus. Creative uses of Lumos and Sonoras, from a mute and colorblind bard. Intelligent potions, how to distill and convince to be drunk. Essential Dualists Handbook, Volume 1 of 32. Study on life, death and non-being. Solutions for pests, kill them before they eat your pumpkins. The ways of the animagus and its possible uses. Advanced applications of magic without a wand. Dark magic, how to contain and destroy it. Once he found the books he was most interested in, he placed one next to each feather and after making sure to cast a silencing spell on the table, he made several hand gestures. The books opened and the quills came to life, flew to examine the page and then began to copy their contents. Each time a scroll was filled, another scroll moved on top of it and the pages of the books turned at the feather's signal. The magic printer. Or at least it was a makeshift version, it was nothing as over the top as the printing press in the prophet, but he could copy a bunch of books simultaneously and then take the notes home with him to peruse over the summer. She just had to supervise from time to time to keep the pens from loafing, and since there was no noise, the librarian couldn't complain. She's not even touching the books. Too bad she only got the idea now, she could have copied many books during the time she had already spent in the library. Nagini will also be able to entertain herself a little more, he thought. The poor girl had been hiding in the girl's dormitory for the whole school year and she was starting to get more than bored. Now to kill time she was exploring the small doors at ground level for scarabs and cats in their akami form, which she thought led to different parts of the castle. As I was checking the feather work, I try to think if there was anything else to keep in mind for this year. The dragon was born. Harry will encounter the Dark Lord in the Forbidden Forest, at night, unprotected, separated from his watcher and with the corpse of a unicorn. Then he'll go down to stop Snape from stealing the stone. Yeah, it seems like there really isn't much else he cares about. Oh wait, will he be able to get through the fire conundrum without Hermione? Meh, I'm sure Dumbledore will pull something out of his sleeve to justify the fire suddenly going out for no obvious reason. Like. Ran out of oil. Chapter 23, Objection. It has been two months since Ron and company's punishment to the Forbidden Forest and Soizen was finally able to order a trunk with an undetectable extension charm. Because he was limited by the money he had at Hogwarts, he could only order a trunk with three compartments that were a storage room and two rooms with basic facilities. It was enough for his immediate need and he could get a better one in the future. Nagini was excited to finally be about to leave confinement in the female dormitories and already made plans with Soizen to visit Diagon Alley soon after returning. They also discussed how to present the situation to their mothers and not get the wrong idea, believing that their son was precocious and had other thoughts. Sylvia had proven to be an excellent friend and business partner, perhaps it was for making so much soap or helping with the other products. But she seemed to have sparked an interest in magical crafts, which Soizen supported her deepening by providing materials to practice. Hermione, on the other hand, although she has helped with research and implementation of ideas, her true potential emerged when Soizen suggested she take a part-time job as his secretary. Thanks to her passion for scheduling, note-taking and planning, the little witch had a blast while earning even more money than she did as an assistant. She also insisted that it was never too early to start accumulating work experience to add to her resume. As for Soizen, due to Snape's strange insistence, she started working on a new potion based from a much more complicated idea. 
but his work was going very slowly, as the materials were quickly consumed and not at all cheap. He had no hope of getting results until at least mid-second year, and that's being optimistic. The Weasley twins joined him as distributors throughout Hogwarts for a fee per product sold, not to mention their own prank business, of course. They also seemed to have noticed that Soizen didn't particularly like Ron, which to the twins' dismay, they fully understood why. Table manners aside, anyone would be upset when they take their accomplishment of defeating a troll and proclaim it as their own, altering the story beyond belief. You know the funniest thing? Soizen could see Harry and Ron looking at books in the library about who Nicholas Flamel was and after an hour without getting the answer they were looking for. They gave up without hesitation or embarrassment and went to meet Hermione to use their knowledge to their advantage. Maybe and just maybe, Soizen may have been pointing out some facts, showing details and evidence with Hermione so that she would better understand her situation in Gryffindor House. Because when they both asked her about it in the great dining hall, Hermione just shook her head to the side as she snorted and walked away from them. Harry was speechless and it took Ron a few seconds to understand what happened and he started using swear words again, or would have if it wasn't for his lips suddenly being stuck together in an inexplicable and mysterious way. McGonagall gave Soizen a hard look from the teacher's table because she recognized the movement of his hands, which he responded to with eyes of innocent and utter bewilderment, but it didn't remove the little curse that would dissipate on its own in a few hours. The little wizard needed a lesson in manners. That's right, Soizen got Hermione to overcome her impulses to not only try to impose her views on the other lions most of the time, but also that she wouldn't do other people's jobs for nothing. It turned out that he liked getting paid for a job well done, so why invest time and effort in ungrateful people who would only give him a perfunctory thank you? Just look at the situation now. It was only when Soizen discovered the two's inability to question teachers or look at a book for more than an hour, that as the end of the year approached. He accidentally dropped a Nicholas Flamel chocolate frog chrome by Nicholas Flamel right in front of Ron and Harry's eyes. Who after reading the card, didn't even give it back to Soizen. Damn them. Several days later, Ron and Harry showed up in the infirmary wing and everyone was talking about their late night adventure. Ron only received some minor bruises and contusions, as a result of failing to keep his cool when they encountered the devil's snare. Luckily for him, Harry somehow managed to remember the Lumos Solemn spell taught by Professor Sprout and saved him. Harry was in slightly worse shape. It turned out that during the fire riddle, he made a mistake and drank nettle wine, which caused the hair on his head to burn off completely, along with one eyebrow. Only on the second attempt did he manage to get the potion right and confront the possessed quarrel. The next thing he remembers is waking up in the infirmary. Neither of them thought about how they knew they were there that night. After taking a hair growth potion and some ointments, the two appeared at dinner in the great dining hall. There, Albus used his famous magic to pull points out of the sleeves, so that Gryffindor would take enough points to get the house cup. Only this time, he had to give more points than in the original story to do so. After all, Hermione didn't help Harry and Ron, so her points went to Neville. Soizen was quite, no, he was quite angry at the headmaster's manipulation. Although the points were nothing to him and he didn't care about the cup, it was a fact that he alone had collected enough points honestly to eclipse the other four houses, pulling out a narrow ten-point lead with Slytherin coming in second place. He would have loved for the same year that Gale Gold House appears, to win said cup as a historic achievement to be remembered in the future. This was about honor. And now, if my calculations don't fail me. No, I was not going to allow that. Objection. Soizen stood up decisively and interrupted the headmaster of Hogwarts under the incredulous gaze of everyone present, Headmaster Dumbledore, he said loud enough for everyone to hear, I don't find the points you just handed out appropriate. Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff started muttering amongst themselves out of surprise, they did not expect at all that anyone would actually dare to act at that moment. Slytherin nodded in agreement with Soizen's words, although it was somewhat humiliating to lose to a house with only one member, the loss happened by a narrow margin and they were in a better position than the rest of the other houses. And if they had to choose between Gale Gold or Gryffindor taking the cup, they would back the former without hesitation. Gryffindor stopped moving with glee and looked at Soizen with annoyance, as if they had swallowed a fly. 
Only a few lions like Hermione were too embarrassed at the blatant surge of points and were not happy to tarnish the competition in this way. The teachers were just as surprised, but even Professor McGonagall was silent. She wasn't against handing out some points to recognize achievement, but the amounts were too blatant for her liking. As long as Gryffindor didn't end up as the last house in the rankings, it was good enough for her. Would you like to state the reason for that, Mr. Gale Gold? Dumbledore looked patiently at the student. Headmaster, I have nothing against the points awarded to Neville for bravery. It is a fact that it takes a lot of courage to stand up to friends, Soizen clarified first, earning many heads nodding in approval all around. But Ron and Potter's actions don't deserve to be rewarded, it's already a good enough fact that they are still alive if the story is as rumored. Ron turned red with anger and tried to get up to refute, but the twins stopped him by holding him by the shoulders and Hermione with a hidden wand movement, sealed Ron's lips with the curse Soizen taught him. Although the twins were somewhat dissatisfied with Soizen now, they also understood that the situation was not as simple as it seemed and it was best to let him finish speaking. I'm not going to deny the efforts of both of them in discovering Professor Quirrell's secret plan either, but ultimately, what they did in the end is practically suicide in every sense of the word. How does it seem remotely logical that two first-year students think they have the capabilities to stop an adult wizard with evil intentions? That's not courage, that's recklessness and lack of reality, he questioned as he looked around, from what I understand, their suspicions were originally and mistakenly focused on Professor Snape. As an outstanding potions master, money is not something that can attract him and there are potions to enhance and extend life to some extent. Harry felt the blood rush to his face as he realized that Soizen was right. How could they not realize that? But it is an undeniable fact that they foiled Professor Quirrell's plan, Dumbledore commented with a skin thicker than the castle walls. That brings me to another point. If whatever it was that the professor was trying to take needed to be guarded with force, how did two first-year students manage to get past the defenses so easily? Soizen raised an eyebrow without backing down, the three-headed dog. Okay, appropriate. Devil's snare. Okay, let's say it works, he nodded, but a giant chess set. Catching a flying key. An explosive spell for the former and a free spell for the latter and that's it, Soizen didn't mention the fire barrier with the riddle because he found it unnecessary at this point. Harry dropped his head on the table. Why didn't they think of that? Oh, wait. I didn't know any of those spells. So headmaster, in the interests of fairness and to demonstrate that points are only earned for appropriate actions. I ask on behalf of everyone here that the points you just handed out to Potter and Ron be cancelled so that in the future there will be no people who mimic your actions, said Soizen before adding as if casually, for the greater good. Chapter 24, Bets that was crazy. Said Sylvia to Soizen as they were taking the walk to the station together from Hogwarts with Hermione at their side, I can't believe you finally got the cup to go to your house. As it should have been, Soizen nodded without the slightest regret. Did you see the headmaster's expression? Hermione asked worried about the possible reaction, you won't get in trouble for what you did. What's the worst he can do to me? That's what Soizen wanted to say, but knowing that was a danger flag he chose to say something different. Nothing will happen, Hermione, Soizen assured her, letting the headmaster get away with it was about as right, as believing that Gilderoy Lockhart's books are real or inspiring experiences. What does that name ring a bell? I think I've seen my aunt reading those books and she seems to like them a lot. I was planning to read her books this summer. Hermione added her two cents to the conversation and turned to look at Soizen doubtfully, what do you mean, her books? It's about something I discovered by chance while studying some magic books for self-defense, she made up, Gilderoy Lockhart uses his appearance and literary talent to gain fame and fortune. But his stories are not his own experiences as he claims and as a wizard, he's worse than us students who have only studied magic for a year. In fact, he seems to have attention deficit disorder. So it's a scam? Hermione asked in surprise. Sure. Soizen looked around looking frightened, don't ever say that in public. Why? Sylvia was intrigued. Shouldn't we explain it? Lockhart's fans, Soizen visibly shudder just thinking about it, I don't know if his books, which by the way are tremendously expensive I'm told. 
have a curse on them or what happened to them, but their IQ seems to drop or disappear when they talk about him and defend him. Do you know what a fanboy is? The two witches nodded, well double it and square it, they're just not reasonable. No offense to your aunt. Sylvia nodded as she inwardly let out a sigh of relief as she remembered how she forgot to read the book her aunt gave her, hoping to join her book club about Lockhart. When she gets home, the first thing she'll do is burn it. Are they that expensive? Hermione was still thinking about getting even one, but from Soizen's description, it seems it would be wiser to buy the other books she wants to read. Thanks to her hard work, she could buy half a dozen intermediate books and a few advanced ones. Very expensive, Soizen remarked, so expensive, that if Lockhart became our Dada teacher next year and demanded that we buy his books. I'd go to Hogwarts empty-handed without hesitation, he shook his head with a look of utter contempt, it's just throwing money down the drain. I don't think anything like that would happen. Hermione vehemently denied the possibility of such a person becoming a teacher. It's true that we'll have to look for a replacement for next year, but I think there should be many better candidates. Sylvia also shook her head even if they don't find anyone, they can ask someone from abroad to come and teach. Do you want to bet? Soizen mentioned it casually. What conditions? Sylvia and Hermione looked at each other before asking. Since I've set the example, my bet will be that that poser becomes our teacher next year. Until that happens, you win. And what are the stakes? Hermione asked. What would you like? Soizen asked first. A basket of your mother's brownies each, said Sylvia without even hesitating, they're the best I've ever tasted in my life. She almost started salivating remembering the first time she offered them one. And you, Hermione? Soizen nodded in agreement and turned to look at her. You said you were learning self-defense magic, I want you to teach that to both of us, it was hard for her to find partners to practice spells with, so with this she could improve a lot in her studies. And with this year's Dada lessons. Soizen looked at them in surprise. When did they become such good friends? Only you're missing, what will you want if you win? Sylvia could almost taste those brownies. Since I'll be making two different things for both of them and I know my chances are nil, I'll be a little greedy and ask for two things as well, she explained with a defeated smile. After seeing the nod from both of them, he set his wager. First, if Hogwarts ever holds a couple's dance, I want you both to take that role, he said, so we don't have to worry about the business of finding a partner. I will be a gentleman and dance with both of you. But please, I ask you to avoid wearing something like a pink dress worn by muggle dolls. You deserve something more elegant than that. The two looked at him stunned for a moment and burst into tears of laughter before agreeing to the crazy request. It's not like it's going to happen, so what does it matter? Second, once we graduate, I will most likely decide to set up a business or businesses. So I want you to give me priority to hire you first. That could be fun, Sylvia and Hermione nodded in agreement. Soizen proved to have a nose for business and they wouldn't mind giving him a chance to work together. Even without the bet, they'd probably do it anyway. Great. Let's get on the train fast, I don't want to run into Ron and ruin this moment of connection and friendship, Soizen sped up and hurried them to find an empty carriage. By the way, Soizen, Sylvia noticed a small detail, is your trunk new? Yes, I had a little unexpected accident with the previous one, so I asked for another one. What happened? Hermione asked interested did one of your potions fall on it? No, my handling and my potions are perfect as you know. Rada threw a tantrum, let's leave it at that, Soizen didn't hesitate for a second to blame her pet Scarbato, who was currently stretched out comfortably inside the extended trunk. How much money has Rada earned from all this? Not much, barely half a dozen galleons Soizen played it down because if the two witches knew the true figure, they would jump out of their seats. The power of a beetle's tenderness cannot be underestimated at all. Will you be writing this summer? Hermione asked. Of course. Sylvia promised to write every week. We can try to meet up sometime this summer and go somewhere, suggested Soizen, let's exchange details by letter. Deal. X2. Chapter 25, Hasty Conclusions. 
Soizen said goodbye to his two friends at the station and after searching around the entrance a bit, found his mothers waiting to smother him in their arms with a simultaneous hug. We've missed you so much. And rubbed her cheek against Soizen's cheek. Mom. Soizen protested weakly. She doesn't mind being shown affection, but still in public it's embarrassing. Let her be, and has been looking like she's been drinking a pot of extra strong coffee all week, Inta said as she stroked Soizen's hair, since when do you wear your hair like you've been applying dye? Believe me, it's quite a story, said the boy as he pushed his trunk. What happened to the trunk you left with? Asked Inta, curious about the change of luggage. I'll tell you all about it when we get home, promised Soizen, we need to have a long talk. And then Inta looked at each other and shrugged. Back to their home in the village of Lakak. The first thing Soizen did was to release Rada, who was happy to be back and ran to check the garden. When their mothers noticed the ample space inside the trunk, their eyes widened in surprise. How did you get the money to buy an extendable trunk? They're not cheap and I'm sure you didn't ask us for money. I started some business with magic soap, invented a potion for the eyes, some entertainment games, etc. I already sent you some samples by Owl, remember? Besides, it's a pretty small trunk, it's not as expensive as you may be thinking, Soizen expressly reduced the circumstances. My enterprising little wizard, Igta gave him a smile, I really like the strawberry scented soap you sent, do you have some more in there? I have something else, but not soap, Soizen smiled back a little uncomfortably, but don't jump to conclusions, okay? Everything has an explanation. Soizen, what have you done? Inta looked at him for a long time and then joined in the stare. They knew their son very well, those micro gestures betrayed nerves. Well, I think I should introduce you to someone first. Nagini, come on up. When a beautiful young woman from East Asia revealed herself, and then Inta's expressions were. Anyway, the same expressions any mother would put on when her child goes away for almost a year and returns with a young girl in the suitcase. And the fact that Nagini seemed a bit nervous about meeting them didn't help the whole situation, rather it skewed reality even more. By Merlin's beard. And covered her mouth with her hand when she reacted, are we going to be grandmas? What? No. Soizen jumped decisively to cut off that train of thought before it rolled downhill with a snowball effect, unstoppable and dangerous what part of not jumping to conclusions did you not understand? He said in exasperation as he pointed to himself, think about my age. Besides, am I that kind of person in your eyes? I had just finished my first year at Hogwarts and I was barely twelve. She's right, sweetheart, Inta conned her partner while holding her by the shoulder, you know how our son is, he wouldn't commit such irresponsibility. Still. And you think he could only get one girl with how handsome he's growing up? Yeah, I guess we'll have to wait until he finishes fifth grade at least, and sighed with relief and sadness at the same time. Exactly. Soizen nodded gratefully that the misunderstanding was cleared up quickly, before frowning a few seconds later. Why does something feel wrong? Are you not going to introduce us yet? Inta interrupted her son's musing, waiting to meet the newcomer. Soizen introduced Nagini and explained that she was now his totem guardian, what that meant, how it happened, her intention to put under Fidelius the house, etc. He then went on to explain his entire year at Hogwarts, omitting small details such as the confrontation with the troll or an out-of-control Dumbledore. So you established a new house at Hogwarts, gaining ownership of the castle when you come of age. Yes. You got top marks for your year, and you single-handedly against the rest of the houses collected enough points to win the house cup. Amem. All that while simultaneously doing several businesses while creating an entirely new potion. Of course. You also made some friends and watched a little dragon hatch from its egg. It was actually a female dragon, and I still have the eggshells. Your herbology teacher can visit us this summer to see the garden. I think she felt challenged when I made it clear that Hogwarts gardens were not up to par with our garden, that's a fact. And I don't hear a negative. And your dada teacher, who taught you all year, turned out to be possessed by the greatest dark wizard after Grindelwald. That's crazy, isn't it? I think Dumbledore is starting to lose his faculties, they should find a new headmaster for Hogwarts. 
one who doesn't repeat for the greater good every three lines of dialogue. Well, it's clear that your first year has been anything but boring, and sighed as she took a sip of tea. The conversation had taken longer than expected and they were sitting in the dining room with drink and cookies. Do you still want to go back to a place like this next year? Inkta asked, I know it's like your birth mother's inheritance, but from what you've told us, they don't even have a fence to block the passage to the forbidden forest, he shook his head, the school's administration leaves a lot to be desired on several fronts. Angta is right, son, and looked worriedly at Soizen, wouldn't you rather we transferred you to Bozbatons? Although the ratio of males to females is 1 to 10, all the girls there are pretty and polite. Soizen frowned sharply at the last piece of information. Do you care about my magical training or the date of birth of your grandchildren? And his French was very rusty. Too much female presence might be unhealthy for him years from now, when puberty hit him with its hormonal bath. Besides, from what he understood, the French community was too uptight and still strongly advocated monogamy. Maybe for the last few years I considered something like that, I still want to take out all the inheritance my mother left there before anything else Soizen shook his head, it was something to think about down the road. Wait, because he feels like his train of thought has strayed at some point. Mmm, these cookies are great. Tangerine, maybe. Chapter 26, Lineage Test in the end, their mothers agreed to Nagini starting to live in their home and also agreed to the subsequent placement of Fidelius. They understood that Nagini was essentially something of a bodyguard for their son and after seeing Soizen's concern for his safety, how could they deny him that? It wasn't like they had many visitors to begin with either. It only took Nagini a few days to get over her initial discomfort and integrate into the family rhythm and she was performing as if she were a maid rather than another member of the family. And then Inta urged her to make herself comfortable, but Nagini couldn't resist, because she felt uneasy if she didn't do her bit and help with the chores. She also saw the family garden for the first time and agreed with Soizen, maybe there were no magical plants, but it was certainly the most beautiful garden she had ever seen in her long life. Soizen wrote to Sylvia and Hermione and while waiting for a reply, he proposed to Nagini to go get his wand from Diagon Alley. He also wanted to stop by Gringotts to check a few things and maybe buy some books or stock up on potion ingredients. Do you want to go today? Sure, shake my hand and I'll meet you there. Should we get you a costume or something? Soizen asked as he held out his hand. No need, most of the people who know me are either dead of age or half a foot in a grave, not to mention we're a long way from where I used to live. As long as I don't run into people like Dumbledore or Scamander, no one will have any idea who I am, Nagini explained to him, showing off a bit of her renewed youthful appearance, and if someone stops me and wants to know who I am, why should I answer them? The two disappeared into an abandoned Lackic alley and their figures emerged from another alley three streets away from the leaky cauldron. They entered and walked past the dingy bar, attracting several stairs due to Nagini's attractiveness, and exited through the back door that led to the brick wall. I don't know if it will work. Soizen muttered as he tapped the bricks in order with his finger while channeling magic. He didn't have a wand to begin with and it would be very annoying to have to ask Tom to open the way each time in case he failed. But to his luck, it seems that the premise for the path to open is to simply tap with magic, the wand is just the most convenient thing to use. After entering through the open bricks and looking around to get their bearings, they delved deeper into the streets and their first stop was Ollivander. The wand would cost seven galleons and Soizen still had twenty galleons in his pockets after buying the enchanted trunk. Welcome. The old man came out from the back of the tent, how can I? His joy was muted when he saw Soizen. Although it was comforting to see that he had corrected his bad habit. Or maybe it was just coincidence that he was caught busy in the back room. Easy, Mr. Ollivander, I'm not the customer this time. Soizen laughed at the old man's reaction and pointed to Nagini behind him, she's the one who needs a new wand. Thanks to Merlin's underpants. Ollivander muttered, sighing in relief, the black mark Soizen left on his record was a nightmare that haunted him for three months, in that case, let's get started. What is your dominant arm? Ollivander took the measurements quickly and was even more reassured to see that there was nothing out of the ordinary, he almost suspected that Soizen brought another person like him. The wand tests took no more than seven tries to find the most suitable one for Nagini. 
chestnut wood, 12 and a half inches, moderately flexible and with an Akami feather core. A curious combination, this type of wand is usually preferred by wizards and witches going through big changes in their lives, Ollivander nodded satisfied that nothing strange happened and returned to his beloved routine. The only difference with the previous wand is that it used phoenix feather as a core, but it seems that Miss Nagini has a greater harmony with Akami feather. I have no doubt about it, Nagini felt a delighted connection with her new wand. Having fingers again and all that felt good, but she couldn't use most of her magic without having a wand unlike Soizen. That'll be seven galleons. Would you like to get a wand maintenance kit for the wand in passing? It will only be two extra sickles and wand maintenance is an important thing that any self-respecting wizard or witch should be sure to do. Add one, please, Soizen nodded in agreement, handed him the shiny coins and after Ollivander dismissed them from the store, they went for ice cream before reporting to Gringotts. What do you want to do here? Nagini asked as she read the famous warning to thieves, your mothers don't have a camera if I remember correctly, most of the money they use from the magical world they keep at home. That's true, but maybe I have a vault in my name and I don't know it, Soizen explained as they entered, I want the elves to check their records with a proof of lineage. And if there is nothing, maybe I will open a chamber for myself to keep my money in. The elves were at their lecterns, some weighing precious metals, others examining gems with an eye-magnifying glass, handling small amounts of carefully stacked coins or attending to customers. Good morning, sir. Gornick, said Soizen after he could see the elf's nameplate in front of him, I would like to request a lineage test. Gornick looked up from the ledger in front of him and looked at Soizen for a second, before speaking. The proof is eight galleons, he said as he pushed a small plate for the young wizard in front of him to deposit the money. Soizen grimaced because he did not expect to have to pay, but still deposited the required amount on the plate. Follow me, please, Gornick's attitude improved a little when he saw the payment and felt satisfied. He stepped down from the lectern and escorted them to a nearby, more private room. He left them waiting for a few minutes before returning with a small knife and a book with a brass cover. Hand, please, Gornick opened the book on the table in front of Soizen and held out his hand while the other held the knife. I'll do it, Soizen took under Gornick's annoyed gaze the knife and made a quick cut on his palm, the blood fell on the pages of the book and the wound disappeared as if it had never existed. He handed the knife back to the goblin, but not before removing the remaining blood on it with a wave of his hand, which earned him a sly smile from the goblin. Blood was a powerful medium and strongly linked to magic, he couldn't take the chance that someone could use his blood without his permission. That's why he didn't allow the elf to make the cut or take the knife with the blood, because it would be considered willingly given blood and there are too many things that can be used without his consent with it. This was something he didn't know, Nagini told him when she told him of her intention to take a lineage test at Gringotts and he was grateful for it. Let's see, Gornek turned the book which soaked up the blood like a sponge and began to show different comparisons to well-known, not so well-known and almost forgotten houses. Naturally, most of them said, no property or rights. The ink kept dancing and changing until it found a match, Gale Gold. Gale Gold? Gornick frowned not only because the name sounded vaguely familiar, but because instead of detailing the information he needed to continue, it specified that he should call one of his superiors immediately. Wait here a moment, he asked the wizard and his witch companion. Ten minutes later, a groomed elf burst into the room and Gornick followed him as his subordinate. I am Ragnuk, the seventh, he introduced himself as he alternated his gaze between Nagini and Soizen before at last stopping on the ladder, are you the esteemed heir Gale Gold? Yes, allow me to introduce myself, Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valrus Aulis, he confirmed as he watched the newly arrived elf with interest. May I ask, was your ancestor the famous Ragnuk, the first, who forged the sword that Godric Gryffindor requested and subsequently stole? That's right. Nodded Ragnuk angrily for remembering the great rogue and pleased at the same time to see that Soizen not only remembered his ancestor, but did not alter what happened as most wizards did. And if there was one thing the elves hated, it was thieves. I'm glad to see that the last Gale Gold heir is someone knowledgeable and wise. Do you know much about my family? Soizen asked interested. His memories and magic inherited from Syra are numerous but he does not have a complete set of the family past that is detailed. You don't know. 
Ragnarok looked at Soizen in surprise with wide eyes, the Gringotts Bank was founded by goblins, but your family had a lot to do with it. Chapter 27, Substantial Inheritance Did my family have anything to do with the founding of Gringotts? Now that was interesting. Ragnarok was going to continue, but he looked at Nagini and Soizen understood what he meant. It's my totem guardian. I understand, Ragnarok nodded, knowing the term, and continued, Wizards believe it was Gringotts the Goblin who founded the bank in 1474, but they only know part of the true story. The truth is that many years before that according to our records, although we don't have the exact date there was a serious confrontation between the wizards and the goblins that if it had run its course, would have caused a terrible amount of deaths on both sides. Just before it reached the point of no return, one of your ancestors, Fyra Galegold, was sent to the goblins to try to avert the conflict in a last token attempt. No one expected her to succeed and many wished the goblins would kill her. And I understand that she succeeded, to everyone's surprise, said Soizen. Yes, the wizards only know that she paid a great price for stopping the confrontation, but they didn't even thank her for her efforts. Ragnuck shook his head with obvious disdain for the ungrateful wizards, the reason the goblins agreed to stop was because of this, he spread his hands around, pointing to the entire bench. I don't understand. Fyra provided the goblins with a plan to guarantee their survival in the future, to guarantee having a territory and power that no one wanted to face. All aligned with the goblins' interest. We spent years with a low profile to reduce the guard of the British wizards and when the time was enough, the bank opened its doors. We followed your ancestors' plan and collaborated with the ministry until 1865, when due to a bribe here and there, they decided to leave control of the bank in the hands of the goblins. You mean Fyra gave the goblins a plan that would be implemented for over 400 years? Even with the madness that was going on in the magical world, this was hard to take in. Is it so surprising? Ragnuck showed his sharp teeth with a cruel smile now all the money in the British magical community is in the hands of the goblins, and what can today's wizards do without the motivation of money? Even the Dark Lord needed money to maintain his power. Now no one can repeat the confrontation of the past against the goblins, because if they do, Gringotts can block the entire economic flow in less than two minutes. Even the oldest, noblest and richest houses would become hobos overnight. And the British magicians never noticed anything? Noticed? Please, you must have seen the magical side for at least a year. Does it seem to you that wizards are looking for anything more than comfort and routine? Even the most exceptional, but occasional, have their sights set on other goals just look at how the Weasley family has declined in the last 200 years. Frankly, almost every other magical community in the world is more savvy than the local one. And that's why Gringotts hasn't been able to open branches there. And what did my family gain from the plan? Oh, there's the Gale Gold lineage coming into play. Ragnuck gestured and the elf at his side handed him a scroll, which he unfolded to read, in fact, Chamber number one was not only the first to be opened, but it is the exclusive chamber belonging to the Gale Golds, bound by blood and countless protections. If I have a chamber, does that mean I must have some inheritance? Inheritance? You could say yes. Gringotts takes a commission on every transaction within its walls, and 2% of each and every one of those commissions goes to the Gale Gold chamber. After all these years, the sum from this morning to 8 o'clock this morning amounts to about, Ragnuck turned the parchment over and showed the amount to Soizen. 10, 100, 1000, 10,000. Mm, what is the figure called when it has so many numbers in a row? Wait, why did you specify the time? The number will have grown since then, naturally. I love my ancestors, I really do. Besides the money in the vault, there are also a few properties and contracts that need your immediate review. Anything else? Soizen nodded in understanding as he took in the situation. In fact, it should interest you to know that it was thanks to us that you were able to have a quiet first year at Hogwarts. Soizen raised an eyebrow and put on an expression that demanded more details. There are still some old families and learned people who remembered the name Gale Gold or tried to pull information from any remnants and records. Fyra's name led them to Gringotts and we had to give them some crumbs of information, nothing sensitive but enough to fill their stomachs. Who wanted to know? 
Nagini asked, wanting to know who was investigating Soizen. Most were just unimportant gossips, then came some of the Holy Twenty-Eight like the Greengra, Malfoy, Longbottom and Carol. Some members of the ministry in Dumbledore were also asking questions. I can understand the ministry and I even expected it from Dumbledore, but why do these families want to know about me? Soizen asked, puzzled. The Longbottoms and the Malfoys have a considerable monetary debt to settle with the Gale Golds. The Caros and Greengra, on the other hand, have debts as well, but they are old debts of compromise. Compromise? Are you interested? Let me see. If the Gale Gold heir decided to collect them at this time, the Caros would have no choice but to offer the twins Flora and Hestia Caro. In the case of Greengrass, sisters Daphne and Astoria would be the ones to assume that responsibility. And that wouldn't even collect all the family's debts. Nagini held back the laughter she was fighting with all her might to escape. She listened as Anne and Inkta talked to Soizen about this matter and still found it funny. Just. Leave it for later, Soizen felt his head throbbing from thinking about it, you said there was property? Yes, just a moment, Ragnuk took another scroll and read it, I found it. There are four properties in total. Hogwarts Castle, a vast tract of land in Snowdonia located in Wales, a medium-sized shop in Diagon Alley, and a house. Hogwarts shouldn't even be counted, Rowena made sure it couldn't stop being a school, Soizen shook his head. Who told you that? Syra Galegold added a clause to the contract that if for 600 years no one from her family set foot in Hogwarts, she could claim the castle back as a personal property. Rowena believed that would never happen, so she agreed. Soizen was confused why he didn't have that information from his mother's inherited knowledge. Perhaps there was more he didn't know because it didn't come to him. What about the house and the premises? Chapter 28, A Long List Soizen and Nagini left Gringotts much later. Ragnuk wanted to see them off, but he refused because he didn't want to attract any more attention for now. When have wizards ever seen a goblin politely dismiss one of their own? He was provided with a Gringotts bag with which he could take the money out of Chamber 1 whenever he wanted and it had all the known anti-theft measures, plus some additional ones thanks to his illustrious identity. You could say that instead of the common bag that all rich and noble families receive, he got the super deluxe version. He asked if he could go down to the Gale Gold Chamber, but after discovering that he would need a two-hour ride in the goblin carriages to reach the depth he was at and pass all the security measures. He shook his head and decided to visit the chamber later, perhaps next year. As for the house and the premises, Ragnuk had different levels of information at his disposal. In fact, the premises were on the road they took to get to Gringotts, it's just that they didn't notice it until now because of how quirky the street was. Soizen updated the property in his name and obtained the key to the premises, which he intended to visit when he left Diagon Alley today. As for the house, all he could tell her was that she needed to visit Chamber 1 to learn more about it. This piqued her curiosity, but pushed it to the back of her mind. There would be time in the future. What do we do now? Nagini asked once they were a couple of blocks away from the bank, still somewhat surprised that her master's family was a beneficiary of the goblins. Let's go get some books and a few more things, Soizen stated. Now that he had substantial capital, he wanted to get some items and products to be better stocked. He also wanted to find out when Lockhart's book signing would be, because he had to be there that day so he could steal the diary before Ron's little sister unleashed a thousand-year-old basilisk on the school. His school. Yes, he was in a very good mood to discover that the wily and clever Rowena Ravenclaw had been tricked back by a seemingly impossible clause. In a few years, the castle would be her property and she could decide what to do with it without Dumbledore, the school board, or even the ministry being able to interfere. It would be private property after all. Now, he had no intention of updating the headmaster on the situation, lest he suffer some sort of accident due to his plans for the greater good. His first stop was to get something better than his current trunk, which he intended to gift to his mothers for their convenience and as a portable home in case of travel. After finding out the location of the best store in that business, he discovered that they sold not only trunks, but trunks, tents like Quidditch Cup tents, etc. He asked to see the manager for an order to his exact requirements and specifications. 
he considered this on his way from the elves' bench and ordered a total of three items. The first thing he wanted to order was a necklace for Nagini, similar to a locket with the Gale Gold family crest on it. Due to her condition, it was similar to giving her a nameplate so she could act as his representative. But Nagini intervened and said that instead of a necklace, she preferred a choker. It was in essence a large storage and at the same time, a transporter in case of emergency with a built-in emergency shield enchantment along with some additional convenience enchantments, such as temperature control, self-cleaning and magical return to her master. While Nagini could apparate, should she be injured and not have enough strength, she could save the mage's life unexpectedly in front of her assailant thanks to being in direct contact with her skin. Soizen wanted to ensure the life of her totem guardian, so in the end she ended up ordering the choker with Akami's design. The manager was a bit puzzled, as the transfers were usually things like broken boots or glass bottles, but he made sure to write everything down. It was the customer who paid after all, and very generously. He did stranger things in his youth. He still remembered how a customer once asked to turn a grain of sand into a shuttle. Soizen requested for him a common-looking ring with similar functions, it was terribly inconvenient to carry cauldrons, ingredients, flasks, and more with him up and down during his Hogwarts days and having something like an interspatial ring was very convenient. Finally, he asked for a suitcase of the finest dragon hide and a common leather cloak over it to conceal it with all the defensive options at his disposal and also asked for some rooms and facilities he knew he might need. Potions lab, temperature controlled rooms, kitchen, shower, dormitory with king size bed, etc. At Hogwarts, inside his house he had all the facilities he needed, but once he returned home to Lackock, he had none of that, so he wanted to turn that suitcase into his own portable home with private study. He didn't forget to add a resize function so he could carry it with him at all times as if it were a fanny pack in its shrunken mode tucked in his back and under his tunic. The manager was sweating as with the movement of the quill the list on the parchment got longer and longer, feeling a mixture of joy and horror. He would get a payment equivalent to working five years at once, but the amount of work was not small and the details were very precise. I would need to consult some old books again to get up to speed and perhaps contact some former colleagues. You could say it was going to be the best and most strenuous job of his life. Anything else, Mr. Soizen? Although the manager was making an effort to smile, Nagini could see his gaze tremble as he saw that the parchment had hit the floor at some point in the number of specifications Soizen named. Anyone looking at the list would think that instead of wanting to have convenient luggage with him, he was preparing a self-sufficient bunker for a long-term war. Good boy. You seem to be an honest little wizard, shouldn't you be playing gobstones and looking at Quidditch magazines? Eating some chocolate frogs, doing some summer sightseeing, you know, kid stuff. Even my house doesn't have these over-the-top features and defenses. That should be enough for the basics, Soizen thought and couldn't think of anything else at the moment, feel free to add more stuff if you think I've left out something essential. How long will you need to finish my order? The basics? The manager wanted to say a few good words to him, but his years in the industry endowed him with a unique resistance to unique customers. He took a deep breath and mapped out a workable plan in his mind before answering, the choker and ring can be ready in two weeks. As for the latter. He wanted to give her an estimate, he really wanted to, but he didn't dare, it will take some more time, I'll send her an owl when it's ready. But it won't be soon. Soizen nodded, really what he needed most was the ring, he could get by during the summer with some simple instruments since his time would be limited. In that case, we'll stop by in two weeks in the afternoon to pick up the two items. Here is the advance you asked for, Soizen pulled out a small mountain of galleons, which the manager quickly put away while making sure no one was spying on them through the store window. Thank you for your trust, see you in two weeks. Only after making sure Soizen and Nagini left, he hurried to the door and flipped the sign from open to closed. Margaret! shouted the manager as he hurried to the storeroom, send a letter to Angus, one to Sir Anna and one to Orel. We have a special order and we need the old team if we are to fulfill it. Soizen visited the bookstore where Lockhart would be doing the book signing and after learning the exact date, wandered around the store a bit selecting and setting aside books of interest to study. 
He went through the potions ingredient store and other places in a flurry of shopping and also set everything aside to pick up in two weeks when they had the ring and choker to take everything with them. Did we forget anything? Soizen asked as they walked down the street. We have yet to visit your family's place, Nagini reminded him. Right. Soizen rubbed his chin thoughtfully, let's go then, I've already invested a lot for today and I'm starting to get hungry. After we take a look around, we'll head back home for a family meal. Nagini nodded with a smile and accompanied him to the address provided by the elf. Chapter 29, The First Store It wasn't complicated at all to find the place, since it was the only store that was closed in the whole street. It was in a three-story building, between a broom store and a store selling flu powder. Right in front of a branch of Honey Dukes. The first floor and second floor were for shelving and window displays, while the top floor was a mix of office and warehouse. It looks like it will need a coat of paint, Soizen commented as he saw the dust inside through the glass. They entered with the key and Nagini verified that the structure had been preserved with magic using runes, but most of the furniture was rotten and some small creatures had formed nests in various parts. Yeah, I'm not going to go deeper until someone properly disinfects the whole place, Soizen nodded as he looked around, he almost expected to run into some devil's snares if he took a few more steps. The positive part is that it looks pretty big, if after the cleaning and refurbishment it looks presentable, I can make it the first official store in my name. The initial investment won't be small, but that's not a problem for you, commented Nagini while she covered her nose with her hand, let's go out, the air is too stale and it's not good for our health. When they came out and closed, some nearby owners looked at them curiously, as the premises had been abandoned even before they opened or took over the business of their stores. Several people over the years had been interested in taking over the premises, but no one knew who owned it. Although I know you want to find someone to clean the place now, your mother should already be waiting for us at home to eat. We can come back tomorrow without haste, after all, one more day won't change anything. Soizen stopped his steps and thought that what Nagini said made sense, so they left Diagon Alley. The next day, they returned and managed to find someone willing to take the job. The bad news? To get rid of the pests, clean, etc. All in a proper way would take all summer. Including fixing the minor flaws. So he would not be able to open his store until at least the Christmas vacations, when he could leave Hogwarts Castle and inspect the work. Then he would need to decorate and furnish the shop in his own style, stock up on products, hire sales clerks, and so on. Or instead, he could delegate the job to Nagini. They would only need to exchange letters by Owl and she could still make the decisions without much work, but it wasn't the same as being present and seeing things for her own eyes. I think instead, you could start thinking about the details now and then I could take care of most things with a clear direction of work when you start second year. Nagini opined when he brought it up to her, after Fidelius is established, the house will be protected and I won't have much to do while you're at Hogwarts, it'll be very boring. So let me take care of the store for the time being, it'll be a good distraction and help me get acquainted with the administration. Soizen smacked his forehead, it was clear he hadn't thought of that angle. A week later, Nagini managed to get not only fit enough, but also used to her new wand and performed the Fidelius ritual. It was a peculiar feeling to forget for a moment the place where she grew up before Nagini made her remember. He also had to remind Radha and his owl of the place. It will take me a few days to get used to it, and commented as she looked around her house, the feeling inside was still the same but on the outside it was different. Don't worry, everyone finds it strange the first few days, Nagini soothed, downplaying the matter, over the next few days, I will also set up some additional protections, alarms and guards that I know of. Is it necessary to add more? I mean, Fidelius is already an ancient and quite powerful magic as I recall. Maybe, but what can I do if your son insists on protecting his family so fiercely? Nagini shrugged, making it clear that she also considered him somewhat paranoid. She would be entertained for a few days and Soizen would be calmer. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that their squib conditions prevented them from activating magical artifacts, Soizen would have ordered some additional protective accessories for their mothers. Perhaps he should start researching something that acted as a magical battery. And Aninka could only exchange glances with a thinly veiled smile, 
it seemed their son couldn't help but care for them after studying the threats in the magical world. Soizen didn't care what they would think, he would rather have a stronghold of his own and have his mind at ease, than rely on the ministry or the order of the phoenix. The former proved to be quite useless over the next few years, preferring to have an illusion of peace rather than prepare for what was to come. The order, on the other hand, had a philosophy of never causing casualties on the Death Eater side. That was a tremendously childish and hypocritical thing to do. Why on earth were Death Eaters not afraid to be vicious? Because they knew that no one on Dumbledore's side dared to kill them. They would lock them up and in a while, they could get out and go about their business. Just to think of the number of lives that could have been saved if they had acted like responsible, mature people. But no, they had to take heed of someone who surely knows as much or even more dark magic than Voldemort and Grindelwald, only he knows how to act better in the public eye. He still remembered how Hermione had been used for Dumbledore's plan, due to the inaction of the boy who survived, maybe she would have ended up being sacrificed for the greater good and then look for someone else to help Harry. As if it would have been inevitable. That's why she only used her memories as a reference and didn't rely on them as fact, she would act as she saw fit. And if that bothered Dumbledore, he could eat his beard. Soizen, are you all right? And asked worriedly when she saw her son frowning. It's nothing, Mum, Soizen put his thoughts away and smiled, I was just thinking about where I could meet up with some friends over the summer, you know, for a few days of fun. Chapter 30, Exclusive Plans It was a busy summer for Soizen. Thanks to the protection provided by Fidelius along with the fact that he didn't have or need a wand marked with the trace from the ministry. Nagini was able to teach him a few combat spells while his main research was almost at a standstill due to the lack of specialized facilities. But despite her desire to learn, in her situation she couldn't ask for too much. He had no training room to safely practice in, so he couldn't gain any real experience facing off in an intense simulated duel with Nagini, he had to settle for practicing casting with some transformed dummies in an empty space in the garden that acted as a target. Nagini was aware of this, so what she asked Soizen to do was to focus on increasing throwing speed, power and accuracy. At first it was. Embarrassing, yes, that would be the word she would use. He missed half the time at first because he wasn't used to it, he usually took his time exercising spells, but Nagini wanted to correct that bad habit he unknowingly developed. When she started to get it right most of the time, she had to get used to alternating between different spells so as not to be predictable. Expelliarmus, Levi Corpus, Apunio, Petrificus Totalus, Stupefy, Incarcerus, Impedimenta, Palolingua, Suplo, Tarantaligra, Confundus. Were it not for the fact that their mothers were present, he even wanted to practice some somewhat less conventional spells. Like Snape Sectum Sempra, which can bleed the opponent. But he didn't remember the counterspell, so better not to mess with it. Or Lockhart's Brachium Amendi, to make bones disappear. But dummies had no bones, and I didn't want to go through the experience of drinking Skilgo. Even combinations like Incendio and Engorjo would result in an attack equivalent to a dragon flare. But Nagini made it clear to him that until he mastered the basics, don't even think of trying to combine spells in combat. And his instincts prompted him to agree with her. He didn't want to have an accident like Luna's mother. I mean, with the versatility of magic, only a fool would use a disarming charm in each and every situation. There were hundreds if not thousands of ideal alternatives depending on the circumstances, so why limit themselves so much? For defense spells, they had to use the excuse of going to Diagon Alley to apparate to a desolate place and have Soizen defend against Nagini's multiple and flexible spells. Doing it at home was not smart, because their mothers would be too worried to see their child being attacked with even the most basic spells and they would have an emergency kit by their side every time. Soizen loved N and Inka dearly, but he wasn't going to lower the intensity of the training just to put his mothers at ease, so he could only resort to benevolent deception to get around the situation. Out of sight, out of mind. Nagini would make sure that when they were done practicing, there wasn't a single hair out of place so they wouldn't suspect a thing. She even used a few wand movements to wipe the clothes and wipe away the sweat. Seeing how practical that was, Soizen immediately requested to learn them. And what an experience! A simple household spell made him cleaner than taking a shower. 
so he included one day a week to learn convenient household spells. Oh, he also received a letter from Pomona asking when it would be possible to visit the garden he heard Soizen brag so much about. Apparently she was waiting for a plant with an impossible to pronounce name to bear fruit and had a few days off, so she remembered her statement and wrote. They agreed to meet at a plant store in Diagon Alley, where Soizen picked her up and using the Nighthawk bus which he paid for both of them, as a courtesy they quickly arrived at the entrance to the town. They chatted briefly along the way and when they arrived near the house, Soizen whistled loudly. To Professor Sprout's complete surprise, an Akami which turned out to be Nagini in her animagus form approached them and handed a note with the address to the herbology teacher at Hogwarts. After that, it walked away and disappeared. Fulfilled the condition of the Fidelius charm, the visitor was able to enter the Soizen house without further inconvenience. Moreover, because she became a secondary guardian by default, there was also no risk of her spreading anything she knew even if she showed her memory to someone with a pensive in her hands. Nagini greeted them in her human form and invited the teacher in, Soizen then introduced her to Inkta and Anne, with whom Pomona became fast friends, especially Inkta, as she was primarily responsible for tending the garden and they had several issues in common. She was a bit surprised to discover their squib status, but she didn't mind at all, she didn't discriminate against anyone as long as they weren't bad people. Soizen was relieved, although he couldn't hide that forever, he preferred to delay it as long as possible until he found a cure or was powerful enough that no one would try to get ideas. After a lovely chat over a cup of tea and brownies, Inta led Pomona out into the garden. By Morgana's bra. Pomona exclaimed when she saw the garden, I've never seen plants like this before. That got everyone's attention. Upon closer examination, the herbology teacher confirmed that almost all the plants in the garden were totally unknown and unregistered. When she asked the origin of the seeds, there was no choice but to explain the history of the garden. I see. Said Pomona after serious reflection, if I am not mistaken, Soizen's childish magic created these plants and they are unique in the world. There have been cases of children growing roses or tulips, of course, but there has never been a known case where such a thing happened. Professor. We're not at Hogwarts, you can call me Pomona, she quickly corrected him. Okay, Pomona, Soizen nodded as he proposed an idea that had just occurred to him, would you be interested in participating in a project with these plants? I'm all ears, Pomona opened her eyes in interest. Soizen's proposal was simple. Since these plants were completely new, it meant that no one knew about their properties, attributes, possible uses in potions or medicines, etc. So Soizen asked her if she was interested in growing and seriously studying them privately. He would provide her with the seeds, bulbs and grafts needed to multiply them outside the garden so that she could use his expertise to compile their details, even help her turn her discoveries into a book. In return, he asked her not to circulate anything she grew, because he intended that once the study of these plants was finished and something useful came out. Perhaps open some greenhouses with strong security measures to have a monopoly on them and sell them in the future in his store as something exclusive. All this backed up and detailed by a magically binding contract, of course. Pomona thought for a long time and ended up agreeing. The magical plants were mostly studied by now and with her duties she didn't have time to search for and breed new varieties. But Soizen's proposal was feasible and would make her one of the two people who discovered the plants, etching her name in the history of her field. The fact that Soizen promised that a portion of the profits would go to Hogwarts, specifically the herbology department, was the icing on the cake. Thanks to all of you who have joined my Patreon so far. It's a great help, really. Chapter 31, End of Summer The rest of the summer passed without incident. After obtaining the choker and ring along with his reserves, Soizen was prepared for many situations. His training also paid off and he met Sylvia and Hermione three times during the summer. The first time was in Diagon Alley. Sylvia and Hermione had only been to this place once for their Hogwarts shopping, as they were both muggle-born witches. Their meeting was decided because they still had the money they saved working for Soizen and wanted to visit the stores, so it didn't take long for them to meet and Soizen acted as a guide due to his repeated visits to the place. Should we get the second-year books while we're here? 
Hermione proposed, an older student gave me the list of books and it hasn't changed in the last five years. The only question is the data books. Of course, Sylvia agreed and Soizen didn't refuse. I think I'll buy the usual second year data ones too, for extra reading, better to have real books for second year than Lockhart's books. What a good idea. I'll get them too, Hermione commented interestedly. It's great to have so much pocket money. You really are nerds, but who told me to be one too? Sylvia laughed and joined in the group's decision. An extra book wouldn't hurt. In the end, Hermione had to be dragged out of the bookstore. The same happened with Sylvia when they visited a magical material store and it would have happened again with Soizen if it wasn't because Hermione and Sylvia didn't have enough strength to drag him away from the potions store. Why are you so strong? You're a wizard. Sylvia exclaimed indignantly at the immovable Soizen. Hermione beside her was huffing and puffing trying to catch her breath while her face was red from exertion. Soizen kept silent and simply looked at her raising an eyebrow, if he had learned anything living with Anne and Inta, it was that he couldn't reason with people who were upset. Silence was always a wise choice in these cases. After having an ice cream to end their meeting, they all returned to their homes. Soizen didn't say anything about his future store or show them around, because it was still being renovated. Their second meeting was at a little-known muggle beach, where they were alone most of the day except for the occasional pensioner who went to sunbathe. They swam a bit, played with an inflatable ball, had a sandcastle contest, etc. How did you do this? Asked Sylvia, looking at an exact replica of Hogwarts made of sand and water. This way, Soizen waved his hand and a miniature sand version of the two girls with a waving pose and smiling expressions took shape. Soizen. Hermione shouted in outrage as she looked around worriedly, you can't use magic outside of school. Why not? There are no muggles now. Hermione was about to remind him of the wand ban, but then remembered that Soizen never used one. Mm -hmm, so that meant there was no problem as long as no muggles saw him. It's so unfair, Hermione declared as she repeatedly stomped her feet in the sand in obvious frustration. Yes, Soizen, using magic to compete isn't fair, Sylvia added. I don't remember any rules being said about it, Soizen laughed, which earned him a splash of salt water in the face. You didn't do that. You bet I did, Hermione said with a satisfied expression. Ladies, this is war. They ended the day completely exhausted, but thanks to the domestic spells Soizen learned, neither had to suffer the discomfort of having sand in uncomfortable places until they got home. The third and last meeting was when they visited Diagon Alley again after receiving the owl with the second year shopping list. There were only two changes, which was the Book of Charms and Lockhart. I can't believe they're asking us to buy their books, Hermione looked at the list with such intensity that if it had been an anime, the parchment would have started burning by now. That means that the bet. Sylvia was in a trance, she couldn't believe what she was reading either. Let's not jump to conclusions, maybe the new professor is too much of a Lockhart fan, but it doesn't imply that he is the new professor, does it? You're right. Sylvia clutched the straw of hope tightly. She researched Lockhart over the summer and as Soizen said, he was highly suspicious and inconsistent with his accomplishments. But it's so expensive, Hermione complained. Don't buy it, said Soizen, they're not books containing valid or useful information to begin with, they're just meaningless fantasy. It's better to keep and take the data books we bought last time. Hermione hesitated, but ended up agreeing. If the books weren't so expensive, maybe she would have insisted because the school asked for them, but knowing that their usefulness went no further than holding up a lame table, she preferred to save the money for something useful. Speaking of useful things, didn't you think about getting a pet? Well, I wanted to buy one after saving a bit until before starting third year, but now that you mention it, I still have money, maybe we could take advantage and visit the pet store. I think a cat would be nice, Hermione commented. Wouldn't you consider getting an easel? Soizen suggested. No way, Sylvia shook her head, the easel is a XX creature and you need a license to keep it as a pet. They are also not cheap because of what they are capable of. Does that apply to half-breeds? I understand there are some half-measle cats. Mm. 
No, hybrids don't ask for a license since their abilities are strongly diminished, Sylvia answered after a moment's thought, I agree with Soizen, if you prefer a cat, one that has nasal blood would be a better choice, Hermione. Hermione thought that made sense. She was thinking like a muggle, but now she was a witch. Nasals are very intelligent, have the ability to detect untrustworthy individuals, are quite independent and capable of protecting houses. A hybrid that has those qualities, however diluted, is much better than an ordinary cat. It looks like Crookshanks will be able to join Hermione a year early. Soizen caught a glimpse of someone in the street and stopped. I forgot to pick up a book I ordered, she said as she made an expression as if she had suddenly remembered, would you two like to go get Hermione's pet and meet me in front of the robe store later? The two witches nodded and left. Soizen, for her part, walked quickly to the bookstore. She had just seen Malfoy father and son. Chapter 32, What a Coincidence Soizen followed the duo into the bookstore, where he could see their confrontation with the Weasleys. After Lockhart's inevitable proclamation happened, Harry escaped their clutches as best he could and Soizen prepared to act. Fred. George. He called to the Weasley twins, who, upon hearing the familiar voice, turned around with the rest of the family. Fred, do you know this boy? Mrs. Weasley asked, as she was unaware of her twins' recent friendship. Mom, I'm George. He's Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valris Aulis, our friend. The one who made the fifth house of Hogwarts appear. Our best client. The knight who defeated a troll without a wand. The creator of magic soap. And the Bonavista potion. Enough. You drive me mad every time you do that, Mrs. Weasley rubbed her head in anguish. And this lovely little witch must be Ginny, the twins keep bragging about having the best little sister in the world. Fred and George shared a look after hearing that. Did they? Why don't they remember? Well, they weren't going to say no to earning some plus points. Oh, you're very polite, Mrs. Weasley thanked as Ginny looked around somewhat nervously. What mother doesn't want to brag about her children? Did you also come for Lockhart's books? No, in fact there were so many people in the bookstore now that I got pushed, stumbled and dropped a little black book I bought. When I dropped it, I heard a metallic sound and then I saw you standing next to me. Is it possible that the book fell into one of the cauldrons where you carry the books? The twins checked their cauldrons and shook their heads. Ah! Ginny's little scream caught everyone's attention and they saw that she was holding a book exactly like the one described by Soizen, but Mrs. Weasley knew they didn't buy anything like it. It seems that it really did fall into her youngest daughter's cauldron by accident. Thank you very much, Ginny, Soizen took the book casually and pretended to tuck it under her robe, when in fact she kept it in her ring, as an apology for the inconvenience, I'll give you some magical soaps. Do you have any preference for scent or shape? Seeing that Mrs. Weasley was going to refuse, Soizen raised his voice a little to be more convincing. Lime-scented soaps are good, Ginny said quietly. Well, the lilac-scented one the twins sent me was very nice, Mrs. Weasley commented. Could I have some in the shape of muggle toasters? Mr. Weasley spoke for the first time and Soizen was not surprised by his request. Soizen pulled out a small piece of parchment and a self-writing quill that took note of everything and promised to send them the soap as soon as it was ready. He exchanged a few more words with the family and took his leave, explaining that he was expected elsewhere. What a good boy, praised Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, so enterprising, so well behaved, you could learn something from him. Harry and Ron watched the interaction from start to finish and, for some reason, felt they were deliberately ignored. He didn't even look in their direction once, as if they were invisible. Soizen acted that way on purpose, he wasn't close friends with Harry as they barely interacted at school and he didn't like Ron, so it was best to act decisively and say goodbye quickly. Hello girls, did you wait for a long time? He asked Sylvia and Hermione when he found them at the agreed place. We have just arrived, Hermione has taken her time to choose, replied Sylvia. This is Crookshanks. Hermione introduced him with a triumphant smile. Not only is he half measle as we talked about, but he had been in the store for a long time without anyone paying attention to him. When I saw him, I felt an immediate connection. It was curious. 
Fate rather, Soizen commented as he examined the hybrid with interest, nice to meet you, Crookshanks, let's get along well in the future. The cat looked at him curiously, taking it as a return greeting. I think it's the first time I've seen someone be so polite to a cat, Sylvia couldn't help but laugh a little at Soizen's behavior. I remember you tried to bribe Rada with some treats when you first met her. That's something completely different, Sylvia coughed in embarrassment at being reminded of that moment. Well, we've got it all. Should we call it a day? Didn't you say you had to check something at the end? I almost forgot. Soizen smacked his forehead with the palm of his hand. Thank you, Sylvia. What would I do without you? Dedicate yourself to the collectible needle business, said Sylvia in a joking tone. Maybe. Shall we accompany you? Hermione asked. Sure, follow me. Soizen led them to the store where she asked them to prepare her trunk. He had waited all summer, but hadn't received an owl that they had finished his order. She needed to know if she should use the old trunk for another year or could she count on the new one and take it to Hogwarts. Didn't you buy a trunk at the end of our first year? Hermione asked. My mothers liked the trunk and didn't have one like it, so I thought I'd give it to them for their birthday, Soizen explained. Didn't they have a trunk in the whole house? Hermione asked quizzically. Their extended trunks, Hermione, reminded Sylvia as she pointed to the labels. Extended? Hermione was not yet familiar with extension charms, so after Sylvia explained how it worked, she was very surprised. Both because of its practicality and its price. She had saved up some during her time helping Soizen during the first year, but she would need more than that to buy something like this. Before either which asked another question, they saw the receptionist writing something on the table and when he looked up after the doorbell rang, he smiled. Mr. Soizen. I was just writing a letter to let you know, we finished your order just a few minutes ago. Would you like to review it? Yes, Soizen nodded and prepared to follow the manager into the back room to check that everything was as he requested. Sylvia wanted to see what Soizen ordered but after listening to him, she decided to stay and explain to Hermione some more things she knew about the other products in the store. Fifteen minutes later, Soizen came out with a satisfied expression followed by the manager with a huge smile impossible to hide. In order not to alarm the two witches, he paid the rest of the price in the back room, which left the manager almost dazzled by the amount of coins in front of him. Currently, the suitcase was shrunken and looked like a fanny pack on his back, hidden from view by his robe. Ready to go back to Hogwarts. Chapter 33, Back to Hogwarts. Soizen prepared to arrive early at the Nine and Station. This year unfortunately, An and Inta were busy with their work and could not accompany him, so it was Nagini who escorted him to the station. You know, Nagini, I just had a random thought, said Soizen as he contemplated the wall in front of him, which in a few moments he should cross to get to the other side and board the Hogwarts Express, what should he do if someone blocked the entrance to the station? What would you do? I would use the flu network, of course, Soizen commented without hesitation, he remembered that there were some points in Hogsmeade that he could use if necessary, but others might think of something crazier and less responsible. For example, Nagini knew why Soizen brought up the subject out of the blue, but after living with him for so long, she had already started to get used to his way of acting. Remember Potter? After seeing his totem guardian nod, he continued, his friend Ron's father, Arthur Weasley, has a flying magical modified car. I'm sure his first thought would be to take the car to fly to Hogwarts. That would be immensely stupid, Nagini said after a few moments of silence. Did they even have a driver's license? Well, it's about Ron. Soizen shook his head it would also be very dangerous for Potter, he'd be safer if someone took the engine out of the car he looked at the clock on the platform and decided that was enough let's go, I want to find a comfortable carriage. They went through the wall and arrived at the station, where there weren't many wizards yet due to the early hour. You knew there was a house elf spying on us, didn't you? Said Nagini. His name is Dobby, the Malfoy house elf. A bit paranoid, but he's nice, unlike his owners, said Soizen. Should I ask him the reason for his spying? Nagini didn't even ask how he knew the listener's identity. It's not necessary, maybe he was just waiting for someone and overheard us. In fact, 
that is a possibility, Nagini nodded reflexively and changed the subject, I will follow the instructions you left when they finish cleaning the premises and will consult you by owl if I have any questions that need your answer or decision. And Soizen. Yes. He turned to look at her. Remember to write to your mothers every week or you will end up with howlers at breakfast, the ladies were very clear about that, he said with a serious expression while trying to contain his laughter. I understand, Soizen wiped the imaginary sweat from his brow, I've left some funds in the trunk at home, where you know. Use it if any unforeseen or necessary expenses arise that we don't consider. Take care, Nagini dismissed him with a little surprise hug, but to which Soizen did not refuse. Soizen got on the express and didn't even bother to take the suitcase off his waist, it was so small he could just move it to the side of his waist and sit comfortably. Besides, that thing cost a small fortune and he preferred to have it with him at all times. Now, what will happen during this year? With his intervention, the basilisk would not be released into the school and would continue to sleep in its depths. He also spoke carelessly about Mr. Weasley's flying car, because he was curious about what Harry and Ron would do when they saw that they could neither enter the station nor use the flying car. He wasn't worried about them being expelled, it wouldn't happen with the headmaster's support. After all, Dobby doesn't know he has the diary and believes Harry is still in danger. Now the problem was how to get rid of the diary permanently. According to his memories, it is not enough to just split or crush a horcrux, it has to be so damaged that it cannot even be repaired by magic. His known options were Basilisk Poison Godric Sword Evil Fire Killing Curse The curse can be ruled out because it only works if the Horcrux is a living being like Harry or Nagini was going to be, he can't kill a newspaper with that curse and he doesn't want to be corrupted by dark magic. Evil Fire is something extremely dangerous and requiring control that he most certainly does not have, so he will not risk incinerating himself. The fact that he doesn't know that magic either is also a bit of a drawback. Godric's sword. Forget it, I seriously doubted he could get his hands on it. That just leaves Basilisk Venom. If he were someone like Ron, he would surely think of having no choice but to do something to the Basilisk under Hogwarts to get its venom, putting his life at risk for absurd reasons like saving the world because it was his duty. But fortunately for Soizen, he was someone with a higher IQ and therefore the solution was also much simpler. Just by the poison. Basilisk breeding was forbidden by the ministry and if something is forbidden, it will naturally appear as a black market product. Maybe getting something like eyes would be tremendously complicated, but poison? Just say how many liters you can afford. He didn't know how long he remained in his thoughts, but he was snapped out of them when the compartment door was suddenly opened. I knew you'd be early. Hermione affirmed as she gave a glance to Sylvia, who was standing next to her. All right, I'll buy you something from the candy cart later, Sylvia admitted in what appeared to be a bet on when Soizen would arrive, one that, moreover, she lost. The two witches entered and settled on the vacant left side of the compartment, leaving their luggage on the top and began to talk while Soizen occasionally joined in the conversation. Sylvia and Hermione weren't bothered by that, most likely Soizen had started thinking about some new product, an experiment for a potion or something crazy with magic. The express pulled out of the station shortly after and another person knocked on the door. Hello, do you mind if I sit with you? Asked the newcomer, who was a witch who was undoubtedly going to start this year. Perhaps the two witches didn't know who she was, but Soizen recognized her immediately. Luna Lovegood. Her father was the director and owner of the Quisqualoso, a friend of Neville and Ginny and much bullied by her Ravenclaw housemates because of her unique personality and made-up creatures. Subsequent to the end of Voldemort, she became a reputable magizoologist, which revealed that her creatures were not as imaginary as people thought. Sure, go ahead. Chapter 34, Additional Perspectives POV Nagini as she watched the express leave the station with Soizen on board, she couldn't help but put a hand to her cheek and ask herself. Perhaps I was too hasty in giving him that hug. Looking at his behavior over the summer, I think Soizen only has a very superficial understanding of the relationship a totem guardian has with his master. Perhaps he only thinks I'm something like a loyal servant with the skills of a bodyguard, but that's far from my true status. 
I appreciate that he didn't limit my freedom of movement, it was very convenient to investigate what I got involved in out of the sheer desperation of my condition. When a person becomes what I am, it is similar to consecrating yourself to a god, your everything is only for the purpose of supporting its master. The potion he gave me was much more difficult to research, I got almost nothing useful out of what he explained to me and I am confident in finding information. It removed my maledictus state and rejuvenated me to an almost adolescent state, but I think it has also had a partial rejuvenation effect on my mind as I could not avoid some thoughts that even surprised myself. I know he's still too young for it, but if you were to ask me in the future, I wouldn't be against becoming a lover of his, I think he will grow into someone amazing and his personality is very much to my liking. And from the attitude of his mothers, it seems that they are not against polygamy. Although I must admit that he knows how to surprise people. Leaving aside his monstrous talent in potion research and his creativity in transformations, I have never seen a young wizard with so many magical reserves. During exercises and training behind his family's back, he never once had a headache or showed any other symptoms of magical power depletion. Perhaps this is a trait of his family lineage. From what I heard so far while accompanying him, the Gale Golds are a pretty impressive magical family, too bad what happened to them. But the real shock for me was when he pulled out a jewel and explained that it was a piece of the Philosopher's Stone. Yes, the same one that produces the elixir of life, transforms metal into gold and many other properties I don't know about. Although such a powerful object is not easy to handle, after all the summer, he barely understood how to drip some elixir of life, which he very generously shared with me and secretly slipped into his mother's food. If before I had a twenty-year appearance, after taking the elixir I rejuvenated another couple of years, perhaps active remnants of the potion in my body, I do not know for sure. The parents at the station started to leave and their movements managed to bring me out of my thoughts. I think it's time for me to go back too, I have a lot to do. POV Snape This year at Hogwarts has been both emotionally frustrating and enriching. After coming face to face with Potter, I saw that he inherited Lily's eyes and nothing else. Despite growing up in the muggle world, he shows no interest or respect for magic beyond the lessons and assignments teachers give him. He spends most of his free time playing with the biggest waste of the Weasley family and has revealed no talent in any of the fields. In fact, it is shameful that Lily's son has such dismal grades and makes no efforts to change the situation. It seems that James' blood has poisoned whatever usefulness there was. Is this supposed to be the child who will take on Voldemort? In my opinion, there's a better chance that the Dark Lord will choke on a potato and die of asphyxiation. Now, Soizen's unexpected arrival and backstory was. Nice. He may be Lily's adopted son, but he has proven to act with much more sense and skill than Potter. It's a shame he didn't go to Slytherin, but founding a new house is quite meritorious. More so considering he took the house cup when he is the only member competing with the other four. After receiving the letter he gave me, I didn't mention anything to the headmaster and wanted to see his performance. I feared he would include it in his plans for the greater good, which have become a bit murky this year. Since when would he use a student as bait? A controlled risk, he called it. It was amazing, his learning ability was through the roof. The theory classes were no challenge for him and his understanding of magic was flexible, but spot on. I found his skill with potions especially striking, he has been the best student I have come across in my entire career. He even created a new potion in his first year. Granted, he asked me and Poppy for advice, but that only makes him even wiser and more knowledgeable about his own limits. He's been the only one in his year who hasn't had the cauldron explode once. Or melted. Looking at Potter and then at Soizen, I really doubt who Lily's real son was. At least he didn't think I was going to steal the Philosopher's Stone. In fact, I was surprised that he stood up, confronted Dumbledore, and defended me in public at dinner at the end of the year, when the headmaster started handing out points for his protege like lemon drops. Under the gaze of the entire school, Dumbledore gave in to reasoning, but I could tell the signs, he was not happy with the way things were unfolding. Later, I learned that his mood was not good from the beginning because he quarreled with Flamel, although the exact reason escapes my comprehension and I refrain from probing further. It was only when all the students left Hogwarts and I was in my office that a thought crossed my mind. Should I? 
adopt Soizen. It would be like Lily and I having a child together. As part of the school, I had access to student information, so I couldn't help but do a little research and discovered two things that left me speechless. The first was that both of his current adoptive mothers were squibs, although their status is irrelevant to me, the contrast is too stark. The second, I discovered that her home information was magically protected and I recognized the properties at a glance. It was all too familiar. Fidelius. But that left me with other unknowns. Who could and did put such an ancient and complex protection enchantment in place? Who was the secret keeper? Did it have something to do with the Gale Gold? Chapter 35, Breaking with Tradition After getting to know each other a little better with a simple presentation, Sylvia and Soizen were currently watching the debate taking place between Hermione and Luna with amusement. On one side, there was Hermione who only believed in proven, logical and evidenced facts. On the opposite, Luna was explaining theories and the existence of unconfirmed creatures. At least, not yet, but that would change in the future. Soizen had to intervene a couple of times, but overall the discussion only brought Luna and Hermione closer together. You don't really believe that, do you, Soizen? Hermione asked him when they were close to arriving at Hogwarts. Luna turned and looked at him with her usual self-absorbed expression. I think it's perfectly reasonable to consider that we haven't discovered all the magical creatures that exist and we should be open-minded in that regard. You've read a few books on magizoology, Hermione, before you discovered you were a witch, did you think the existence of fire crabs was even possible? They are creatures that spit fire out of their butts, literally. The argument presented caused Hermione to stop her stubborn counterargument and reflect. In fact, she couldn't claim that there would be no magical creatures left to discover. And Luna, I would suggest you write a notebook of notes about those creatures you mention. After all, it seems that no one else has been able to see them and they could help you look for them if they are interested. Sure, that would be fun. Luna responded somewhat more cheerfully, as usually the others categorically denied her explanations. Soizen instead went ahead and gave her a chance. By the way, which house do you think you'll end up in? Asked Sylvia to Luna. And then Luna pondered for a few moments while looking at the roof, which apparently had something interesting that no one else saw, if it had been last year, I would have said Ravenclaw, but things change, so I'm not sure. Soizen raised an eyebrow, understanding that the change was due to the appearance of Gale Gold House. I think we should change, we're about to arrive, Soizen got up and left the compartment to give the witches privacy. Only when they were all done, they changed their positions and waited for their arrival at the station. This year they were not too lucky and when they got off the express, a rainstorm made an almost instantaneous appearance. The silver lining was that since they were not first years, there was no need for them to use the rafts, so they walked to the carriages prepared by the school waiting near them. Luna had no choice but to follow with the first years. Are the wheels of the carriages enchanted? Hermione asked interested as she watched the vehicle move forward with no apparent traction force. No, Soizen denied as he looked out the window at the figures in front of the carriage, were being pulled by Thestrals. What are Thestrals? I don't see anything there. They are creatures that can only be seen by those who have witnessed and accepted death, Soizen replied, they have long been feared for their appearance and bad reputation, much misunderstood in fact. What do they look like? Sylvia asked with interest, since she couldn't see them either. Imagine very thin black horses, to the point that they are almost skeletal and with huge murcielago wings attached to their backs. Soizen, Hermione called with an uncomfortable expression, can you see them? Yes, though I wonder why, she said honestly with no intention of hiding it. Which death was it that made him able to see them? Syrah? Lily? The question intrigued him a little, but he knew there was no way to know the correct answer. If I'm not mistaken, they are carnivores and are attracted to blood. But these Thestrals must be the ones Hagrid looks after, so they must be friendlier to people, I think he once told me about one called Tenebris during one of my visits. Hermione and Sylvia for their part, felt uncomfortable that an invisible, flesh-eating creature was near them. The description they heard didn't calm them down much either, so when the carriages stopped in front of the castle, they left in a bit of a hurry towards the great dining hall, leaving Soizen behind. 
Soizen approached and carefully examining the creature's attitude, he was able after a little patience to stroke the thestral and it was a curious sensation. Its skin was smooth, but soft and slightly elastic. The others looked at him strangely, since from their point of view he was waving his hands in the air without meaning. You really seem to be a misunderstood creature, he muttered under his breath. He felt no threat from the Thestral, who was looking at him almost as curiously as he himself was. Only when everyone got off the carriages did Soizen step aside to let the Thestrals leave and seeing the first years approaching, he headed for the great dining hall as well. Another advantage of being first in your house was that you didn't have to compete for seats at your assigned table. Although it was a bit comical that only he was seated at a table as big as the others, while the others were nearly full. Wait, if he was the only senior in the house, would that make him prefect and delegate by default? Wow, it didn't dawn on him until now. Maybe no one else thought of it, since he didn't get any letters with the appropriate insignia. Heh, looks like Dumbledore isn't fulfilling his responsibilities properly as head of house, thought Soizen somewhat amused, I have to nominate someone else. Perhaps Professor Sinistra. As a teacher of astrology, she has a reputation for being somewhat strict, but she is intelligent and highly regarded. I think she could fill the role quite well. His thoughts were interrupted as he saw the doors to the great dining hall open and the first-year students entered following Professor McGonagall like disoriented ducklings to the mother duck. He was intrigued, how many new students would his house have? When I call your names, you must come forward and the sorting hat will place you in one of the four. Five houses, the force of habit was still strong in Minerva and if it weren't for the fact that she saw Soizen out of the corner of her eye, she would have actually been embarrassed to forget the new house. Luna loved good. The little witch walked happily to the stool and after the hat was placed on her head, it only took a few seconds before the result was known. Gale Gold Soizen started clapping calmly, in fact, he suspected that Luna might go home, but he wasn't 100% sure. Luna's robe colors changed to those of the fifth house and she happily approached the table, sitting right next to him. The selection went on and only two more people were mentioned for Gale Gold, which wasn't surprising, most no doubt preferred to go to the familiar houses and didn't understand how great their house was. Just when I was thinking that was it. Ginny Weasley. Gail Gold. The expressions on Percy, Fred and George's faces when they heard the hat were priceless. Chapter 36, Prefect Gail Gold. Ginny walked red-faced to the table and sat down next to us but with her back to the Gryffindor table, I think she was too embarrassed to look at her older siblings. And I think she did well, because they were looking at her with such intensity that I don't think she would have put up with much otherwise. Hmm, maybe it was karma. He saved her from being possessed by a Dark Lord's soul fragment and in return she joined his house, fair enough. But clearly that wasn't what happened. According to her memories, in the original story she should have joined Gryffindor house along with her siblings, but that was no longer the case now. After thinking about it carefully while eating and trying to get to know the new members of his house, Soizen thought he had a rough idea of what happened. One of the traits of her house is change. Ginny has grown up in a household with little economic power where most things, including clothes, are inherited and she has had to face her six siblings alone for most of her life. One could imagine the expectations her mother had of her going to Hogwarts. That would prove to be quite stifling, so perhaps deep inside her, a part that even she didn't know, was screaming at her not to do that and make her own decisions. To change the situation for the better instead of just conforming as the rest of her family seemed to do to her utter frustration. The hat surely saw that and decided to indulge her, even if she herself didn't realize it yet. Soizen had no problem with Ginny, the girl was tough, quite witty and energetic. Besides, since she was a good friend and neighbor of Luna's, she could accompany her and spend time together away from the intrusion of her older siblings. The only perhaps annoying part is her current affection for Potter, but given that she would no longer be rescued by the reckless wizard from a thousand-year-old basilisk, it is possible that this affection will end in a mere platonic love of youth. All remains to be seen. Speaking of Potter, neither he nor Ron have arrived yet and dinner is almost over. Perhaps he overreacted by reminding Dobby about Mr. Weasley's flying car. Nah, at most they'll miss the meal. 
Mr. Gale Gold, Professor McGonagall came over as everyone finished eating and was leaving, I'll have to trouble you and ask you to act as prefect since you are the only senior member of your house who can lead your juniors. I'll hand you the badge later to take on that role officially. No problem, teacher. I'm sure the prefect's toilet should be fantastic, Soizen nodded, he was going to do it anyway, by the way, if it hasn't been decided who will take over as head of house yet, I would like to suggest Professor Sinistra for the position. I understand she could do a great job, but I don't know what she would think about it. Aurora? Minerva understood that he was referring to the astronomy teacher, actually, I also think she would be a good candidate. I will raise the possibility with her and she will inform you in case she takes the position, she nodded before saying goodbye and leaving the great dining hall. Soizen looked at his house group, which consisted of himself, Ginny and Luna along with two other students, whose names were Delphi and Syra. Come on, I'll show you where our common room is and some tips you should know about Hogwarts, he explained to them as he walked away and with a wave of his hand invited them to follow him. The first year students knew that the school is huge, so they hurried to follow Soizen so as not to get lost. My first tip, watch out for the moving stairs. Most people think they move randomly and there are even some that like to make jokes, but the reality is that they all have a constant pattern. You don't have to worry about them moving suddenly and you falling down, there is an enchantment set by one of the founders that acts as a shock absorber for the fall, he explained as they all climbed up a ladder that approached them, are we all here? Good, he tapped the railing twice and the ladder climbed straight up to the exit and the library floor. Can we control the stairs? Luna asked. No, it's something only I can do, said Soizen as he went downstairs and continued on his way, if you are afraid of stairs, I will show you some secret passages we have near the common room to travel freely between floors. If you have doubts about your homework, you can easily access the school library, the one in our common room or visit Ravenclaw's as long as you get the riddle of the bronze eagle right at its entrance. He explained while pointing out several pictures and paths, since we are still few in the house, we must support each other, so you can also look for me if you have any doubts about where to be somewhere or have not been able to find help with the homework. He explained the facilities in a common room, leaving them surprised to learn that they have their own Quidditch pitch and showed them the Scarb statue, how to access their common room and the surroundings. What is that egg? Delphi asked, pointing to the egg in the middle of the room. An Akami egg, when our house gets the first points, it will hatch and grow or shrink depending on our score. It is purely motivational. The number you can see below is the current record I set last year when I won the house cup. My brother said that last year Gryffindor should have won, Ginny commented without realizing it, only understanding what he said after a few seconds. Ron. She asked to confirm that it wasn't Percy and when she saw the redhead nod, she asked her, you know him better than me, Ginny, do you think he was right? Then he changed his expression and looked at her carefully, wait, before answering, did he tell you the truth or one of his versions? His versions? Sira asked without understanding. It's nothing, I found out last year after facing the troll, that Ron can be. Very creative imagination, emphasizing the last words. Ginny looked aside discreetly, knowing what Soizen was referring to. Fred and George explained to her the truth of what happened at the burrow with Harry's confirmation and she couldn't help but feel embarrassed at this point as she remembered Ron trying to take some of the credit for something like this by doing nothing more than being present. What's that? Luna pointed as she saw something moving across the floor. Oh, right, how could I forget about something like that? Soizen took advantage of the not at all discreet way to change the subject, may I introduce Rada, my Scarbato. After finishing the introductions and clearing up any doubts they had, he let them explore the common room at their leisure and then they all went to sleep in their respective dormitories. But not before Soizen reminded them that in the morning they had to wake up so that he could show them around the castle and so they wouldn't get lost during their first classes. Ginny, come here for a moment, please, Soizen called to her. What's wrong? The redhead approached calmly, now they had interacted a bit and she wasn't so withdrawn. Added to Soizen's impression of the twins, she already had some familiarity. I saw the look on your brother's faces in the great dining hall and I think I have a slight idea of what might happen next. If during these days you need someone to vent to or just talk to, you can look me up and I'll help you however I can. The same goes for Luna and the others. 
Here you have my backing whatever happens. Chapter 37, Sinistra and Lockhart Soizen was busy the next day acting as a guide for his juniors, it was only at this time that he remembered that Lockhart must have been introduced as the new data master. Which he didn't really care too much about during the banquet as he was more interested in seeing who was joining his house. How would Hermione and Sylvia have taken it? He must have looked down at their tables, they must have had an amused expression for sure. Oh, but he was going to give them a basket of brownies anyway, they could consider it a consolation for losing. In fact, before going to bed, he wrote home to explain his theoretical appointment as prefect and his request for urgent brownies. After helping familiarize himself with the castle and introducing the secret passages to the first years, he finally had time to himself and resumed his research thanks to the common room facilities. A few hours later, he went outside to get some air and clear his mind and heard of Potter and Ron's arrival. It turns out that they still tried to take the flying car, but whatever Dobby did, it caused the car to start losing altitude over time and the invisibility field stopped working as soon as they left the city. Maybe he simply drained the magic gasoline or something. Anyway, in the end Arthur located his stolen car and after finding his son and his friend tired, hungry, and cold inside it, he hurried to take them to the borough and write to Dumbledore to allow them to use the castle's flu network to send them off. Soizen couldn't help but click his tongue, he didn't understand why the student still had to use the express after so many years. The flu network was much more convenient and faster. The look on Ron's face when he learned that his little sister ended up in a house other than Gryffindor was to make her into a magical portrait. Maybe I should study making one for myself. In the evening, Professor Sinistra appeared in the common room when everyone was present after dinner and announced that she officially took over as head of house, which last year Dumbledore had to hold despite it being Professor McGonagall who did everything. Some habits never seem to change. Aurora Sinistra was a tall woman with dark eyes, skin and hair. She usually wore olive green clothing and a matching peaked hat. Strict, but she got along well with everyone once we threw her a small welcome party with which the elves in the kitchens gladly cooperated. When she found out we had our own private observatory with the innovations of the last five years, she practically moved in. Well, I explained to him that we had a little bit of everything, he just found it hard to believe at first. Professor Sinistra also gave me my golden badge that acted as prefect and delegate, so now I had some responsibilities and powers. The negative part was that I would have to use some of my time in fulfilling my duties, the good part was that there were so few students in the house that the workload was negligible and by the time they grew up in a year or two, I could appoint some additional prefects to help me, as each house can have up to six at a time. Also, I can now take points off those who step out of line or send them to Dumbledore if they dare to use words like dirty blood. On a side note, Minerva managed to rearrange the classes to accommodate the fifth house over the course of the summer, so sometimes we have the lesson shared with one or two houses depending on the day. Of course, I'm still the only sophomore from Gale Gold House, so for me it really didn't make too much difference compared to last year, it just really affected my juniors. Today I have Dada lesson with Gryffindor and Hufflepuff, so I sat in the classroom with Hermione and Sylvia on either side of me, both of whom looked like they wanted to dig a hole and hide in it. Relax, Soizen comforted them in a low voice to avoid the wrath of the brainless ones. While I'm as surprised as you are that the best and only school in Britain chose that guy as a teacher, I remind you that the bet is still only valid in a purely hypothetical situation. I asked an older student yesterday and he said that there hasn't been a prom at the school in years, meaning it's much more likely that we'll graduate and you won't have to do anything. Looked at that way, it seems I didn't really think it through. Hearing that, the two witches visibly relaxed but also felt a little bad for Soizen. After all, he won the bet fairly against all logic and didn't really get anything. By the way, I've already written to my mothers to send me some brownies for you. And Hermione, if what I think will happen in this class happens, believe me, I'll be happy to teach you some private lessons, Soizen added, but he felt that his last words didn't seem quite right, he didn't know why. Okay, now the two witches felt worse about themselves. Welcome to Defense Against the Dark Arts. I'm Gilderoy Lockhart, that's right, winner of. Soizen disconnected almost instantly, rummaged through his robes for two copies of parchment he'd gotten during lunch and discreetly handed to the witches at his side. 
They opened it and saw all sorts of information about Lockhart. His favorite food, favorite color, etc. They looked at him with questioning eyes and he motioned for them to wait. But enough about me. Lockhart pulled out a stack of papers and began to distribute them, I think it is necessary to have an assessment of your current knowledge, so please complete this test to the best of your ability. The students were nervous, because Quirrell wasn't the best teacher and they weren't expecting a test on the first day. But after a closer look, their bewilderment only grew. What is Gilderoy Lockhart's favorite color? How did Gilderoy Lockhart defeat the Banshee? What brand of shampoo does Gilderoy Lockhart use? Which Gilderoy Lockhart book did you find most inspiring? Soizen wasted no time, pulled out his own copy and began filling out the test while consulting the information. Hermione and Sylvia looked at him dumbfounded, but soon began to imitate him, although Hermione found it difficult to cheat during the test. Only when she managed to convince herself that it wasn't a real test and Soizen told her he had a good reason for it did she begin to fill out the sheet. Lockhart quickly skimmed the papers as he collected them one by one and commented at the same time. Magnificent. He said as he collected the answers from Soizen and company, the most complete answers I've seen in the whole class, 15 points for each of the three of you. The other students looked at them in two ways. With envy at their idol's praise or as if they had suddenly discovered a new continent. As Lockhart showered the three with praise, he pulled out a covered cage that rattled when he poked it with his wand. Knowing it was going to happen, Soizen held up his hands and prepared to cast some spells. Let's see you take care of the Cornish sprites. Lockhart shouted before opening the Pandora's box and releasing those little blue devils. Shield enchantments appeared simultaneously covering Soizen, Sylvia and Hermione. At the same time, some other students with whom Soizen got along better were also locked in magical shields, like Neville. Lockhart ran to hide in his office and Soizen pondered whether to use the same solution Hermione used in the original story or think of a new approach. Better to be somewhat creative. He stopped Hermione who wanted to cast a mobilis and with a few gestures, generated a small typhoon in the classroom, which sucked up all the sprites like a vacuum cleaner and slithered into the cage, which closed with a snap. The creatures were tremendously dizzy and disoriented, unable to continue laughing as before. With another casual gesture, he tidied up the mess in the classroom, including the dragon skeleton that had fallen from the ceiling when Lockhart's wand was stolen. The shields vanished and perhaps because he no longer heard commotion, the teacher appeared again with a smile. That's just what I was looking for to happen. An excellent way to deal with these little pranksters and you have been very thoughtful in offering to tidy up the ruckus. Which you deliberately cause, of course, he said as he took the cage and looked closely at the creatures with a sneer, 30 points for Gale Gold. The best part of the lesson. When the Cornish sprites couldn't take it anymore and vomited all over Lockhart, covering him in a mixture of green and purple. Soizen had to hold back a lot to avoid saying one of the best phrases for the occasion. Constant Vigilance Chapter 38, Restarting After Lockhart's obvious incompetence in the data class, Hermione couldn't contain herself and as soon as they left the classroom, she turned to Soizen. When can we start? Asked the witch, referring to the useful lesson Soizen promised. Wait a moment, Soizen held Hermione and Sylvia back while he waited for all the students to leave Harry came out embarrassed because he was forced to use the books as if it were a club, forgetting once again what it was like to be a wizard. Ron for his part, gave him a look that didn't bode kind words before following his friend. At least Neville and the others he helped thanked him politely. Then, to the witch's surprise, he returned to the classroom and approached Lockhart. Professor Lockhart, may I have a minute of your valuable time? Huh? Oh. Of course, I always have time for my fans, he exclaims, wearing his characteristic, not at all pleasant smile. How on earth did he win that award of yours five times? Bribes? Vera, Professor, I was discussing with my two friends, he pointed to Hermione and Sylvia, during the last two weeks regarding your confrontation with the Banshee, since according to Figarm Capulos based on the theory approved in 1354 by Gust Mortlin. Soizen started to spit out all kinds of technicalities, mysticisms, laws and any nonsense that could seem remotely truthful and logical, making sure only to stop when he saw the expression that Lockhart. 
EXE has stopped working. So as you understand, I wanted to ask you about my many complex doubts. But I consider that you have always followed the path of self-discovery, so you would refuse to give us an answer in such a simple way. This led us to investigate in the library, but unfortunately, the books needed to clarify our doubts are in the forbidden section. Could you provide us with three passes so that we can resolve this without damaging the friendship we have been building for years, for the sake of the pursuit of knowledge and the gratification of a work that bears fruit? Lockhart. EXE is restarting, please wait. No doubt. He replied when he finally came back to reality. Although confused as never before in his entire life, he was able to pick up on the subtle key points of the conversation. He was great. He was too wise. He was the only one who could help them and save their lifelong friendship. He was. The one. Just the way he liked it best. Soizen came out two minutes later, with three passes in their names with year-long access to the forbidden section of the library. When he showed it to the two witches, Hermione couldn't help but give him a hug out of excitement, while Sylvia examined her pass curiously. Why do we want passes to go there? Sylvia asked. Believe me, if I'm going to teach you personally, there are some things we'll need to learn from there, she winked. The disillusionment charm and the Patronus, among others, were stored in the forbidden section. One would be useful when they needed to move discreetly while the other could protect them from Dementors next year, if all went as it should. Besides, perhaps he could find another hiding place left behind by Syra. Although he examined the entire library under Mrs. Pants's gaze, that part was unmapped. What's our next lesson? You have transformations with McGonagall, see you later in potions. Said Sylvia as she left for her charms lesson. Did you manage to master the permanent transformation over the summer? Hermione asked as they headed to the designated classroom. Not yet, Soizen replied resignedly, I was hoping to consult Professor McGonagall later, I'm not able to identify which part is at fault. I'm hoping to learn it during the first semester at the latest. Hermione rolled her eyes at her friend's comment. Only a fraction of the fifth-year students had mastered the permanent transformation, but Soizen wanted to be three years ahead. If she wasn't aware of his abilities herself, she would have teased him a bit to get him to touch his feet on the ground. You still want to use the enchantment to sell, don't you? Hermione looked at him with a blank expression. Of course. Soizen didn't even deny it. Just think, if he could permanently transform things, then he could take a tree trunk and turn it into pure silver to work with. After all, the difference between a match to needle up there was almost negligible. The transformation lesson was boring, for Soizen at least. He did what Professor McGonagall asked on his first try and after getting a few points, he couldn't ask her about the details of the permanent transformation because she was supervising the other students. With nothing else to do and with Minerva's tacit consent, he pulled out a piece of parchment and put down some specialized ideas about the Lumos and Sonora's enchantment that he had been mulling over during the summer. He really had a busy summer, it went by like nothing else. Professor McGonagall walked by behind him and gave a passing glance, but gave an imperceptible gasp when she saw the amount of magical formulae densely stacked and overlapping each other. Which included fourth-year knowledge in transformations and enchantment among other things were something called photons of light, decibel transmission in the gaseous atmosphere, etc. Were mentioned. Should I invite him to the transformations club now? Minerva was helpless in the face of Soizen's talent. The contrast between him and the rest of the students in the same year was so great that they didn't look the same age at all. Wait, technically he's like a thousand years old. He urgently needed to talk to Flittick, Snape and the other teachers. At this rate, by the time Soizen reached his fourth year at Hogwarts there would be nothing left for them to teach him, which would be terribly embarrassing and unfair for someone so studious. Later, when he saw her approach him to clarify doubts about the permanent transformation, he felt that he still underestimated her talent. Forget about the fourth year. He didn't even know if next year would have anything left to show at this rate. They had to think of something quickly. Didn't you think the teacher was looking at you strangely? Hermione asked before breaking off for the next lesson. Did she? Soizen was so deep in his calculations that he didn't pay much attention. Maybe it's just my imagination, 
Hermione was also a little doubtful. All right, I'll see you at dinner. I don't want to be late for Snape's lesson. She needed to ask about some unusual ingredients for her research on the potion she was conducting. He wanted to finish it before the end of the term and focus on a new project. Even the Weasley twins would have a hard time getting some things for him, they didn't have the same channels as a reputable potions master. Chapter 39, New Understanding The first potions class with second-year Professor Snape turned out exactly what you would expect, perhaps even light. Because the first thing he did was to check that everyone still remembered the basic steps to make a potion without immolating themselves in the attempt. A couple of girls ended up crying, a cauldron melted, and some apparently living slime tried to eat the shoes of a boy with slow reflexes as they escaped their birthplace. Good thing they didn't go for his face, because they were evidently acidic. Perhaps even poisonous because of their color. Being honest it was more of a lesson to protect himself from the mistakes of others and while everyone cleaned up their messes, Soizen took the liberty of consulting a certain potions book with additional notes he found in a cabinet for upper years. How come Snape lets you read during his lesson? Complained Sylvia, making sure no one else could hear her as she tried to remove her potion, which, due to a momentary oversight, turned into some sort of cement mixture. It was moments away from being completely solid. I delivered what you asked for twenty minutes ago and I've already cleaned everything up properly. Wouldn't you expect me to sit idle for the rest of the class? Soizen replied without looking away from the half-breed prince's notes, interested in the modifications and trying to understand the logic behind them. Normally they would pair up for Snape's lesson when they matched, but today, like the first day. The professor assigned them all randomly and since one student is absent due to illness, Soizen was left without a partner and made his potion on his own and finished in record time. Sylvia snorted and ignored him, she was actually a bit frustrated because due to the change of partners she let her guard down and made a mistake. If it wasn't because she knew about Soizen's potion's talent, she would question him about why he is reading a book that doesn't belong to his year. The twenty minutes were enough time for Soizen to read and make copies with an automatic writing pen of the scribbles in the book, but he hesitated to return it to its place. Mr. Galegold, stay after the lesson, he heard Snape say. Yes, Professor, he turned and tucked the book under his robe with a discreet movement, deciding that there was no harm in keeping it. He could donate a few identical copies to make up for it if necessary, it was a waste to leave this information in the cabinet. Too bad about the notes he took, but he could share them later with Hermione and Sylvia. Though he didn't know if Hermione would dare make changes to the highly precise and clearly outdated instructions in her year's potions books. The moment the lesson was over, the students left the dungeons as if fleeing a stink bomb. Only Soizen stayed behind as per Snape's request. Soizen, Snape called him by name in private, you have proven to have a head and established a proper foundation as a wizard, therefore, I consider it pertinent to keep my word, he carefully pulled a letter from his black robes and held it out to Soizen. He recognized it as the letter he had given him last year and took it to read its contents. This was different from what he knew. Lily was the one who had rescued and adopted him. So James was nothing but a bloody manipulator and Sirius, Lupin and Peter were his accomplices. So he was something like a stepbrother to Harry Potter. Snape was a bit worried about Soizen's reaction, he didn't want him to damage the letter by a violent fluctuation of emotions, so he used a bit of shallow legimency so he could react in time and save Lily's letter if necessary. But the moment he started to use it, he pulled back almost instantly. It was as if Soizen's mind was deep in the sun itself. Just surface thoughts had already dazzled him and made him feel very uncomfortable, like when someone stares at the sun for a long time in the sky. If he had tried to enter. The mental damage of being exposed to something like that could leave most mages a vegetable. Was it some sort of lineage protection? After all, no young wizard could build such strong defenses. As Snape pondered, Soizen tried to come to terms with the situation and what to do with his new understanding. Revenge for his first foster mother. Peter was within reach, Sirius was in Azkaban and Lupin would be teaching next year. What would happen if he acted immediately? If he exposed Peter after investigating for a few days, Sirius could be released free of charges and attention would be paid to the fact that the black heir did not get a fair trial. 
As for Lupin, I doubted he would run away and hide, but I didn't know how he would react to the unfolding of subsequent events. He would need to get hold of the Marauder's map and consider how his intervention would affect the unfolding of the story. Although given what had happened so far, he really cared rather little. There was a prophecy after all. Let the plot armor kick in. Besides, Sirius would receive Dumbledore's protection once free and end up involving Harry once it's revealed that he's his godfather. If they find out about Lily's adoption. Professor, Soizen held up the letter and looked Snape in the eye, does anyone else know about this? The implications of his words are clear. Is Dumbledore aware of these facts? He doubted it, because he did not seem to have been included in another plot involving Potter, but he needed to be sure. No one else, Snape asserted as he took the letter from Soizen's hands and folded it up to tuck it carefully into his robes, I suppose you will have questions. He proceeded to tell her what he knew about James and his three friends to give her a general idea of the situation. He emphasized many times how nasty they were, evidencing the grudge he still held against them. Does that mean Potter is my half-brother? He asked with a tone of disgust that could not be completely concealed. Not exactly, Snape denied when he understood the confusion, you were not adopted by both of them, only by Lily and by a completely different process. You are an Evans and not a Potter. According to magic and wizarding law, you are entitled to a share of Lily's inheritance. This includes the money in the Gringotts vault and the magical tome she owns stored there, which if removed, Potter cannot take or demand their return. I understand. Professor Snape, let me ask you a hypothetical question, Snape raised an eyebrow, but did not interrupt him, if you had those three people in front of you and away from prying eyes. What would you do with them? I don't think it would be appropriate to give a description of it to a second-year student, Snape replied, but the intention behind those words was clear. Now. Should he be patient and wait a year before closing the network? Or act now? Chapter 40, Rat in a Can Dinner in the great dining hall was subdued, everyone could see that his mood was diminished after leaving potions. His new situation left him upset and he ended up making a decision before going to bed later that day. Right after he wrote Nagini to remove Lily's money and magical tomes from the potter's chamber on his behalf and store them in his house, something he could do thanks to his magical right and contact with Ranguk. For a small fee, of course. He would not wait until the following year. His thought process was simple. Sirius is now self-pitying himself in Azkaban on his own because he believes Peter is dead, and it is only later upon seeing the photo that he discovers he is alive, which causes his escape from Azkaban. Then, don't let him find out so he has no reason to run away from his dictated and self-imposed sentence. Although that would prevent Soizen from getting to him because he was being protected in Azkaban, he deserves what he is suffering for what he did to Lily. As for being Harry's godfather? Well, he hasn't cared about him all these years, Soizen doubts he suddenly wants to take any responsibility and maybe by the time Harry knows he has a godfather, Sirius will have gotten a kiss from a Dementor. Lupin is a werewolf and his kind are closely watched, if he asks Nagini to hire some rats to find him, it shouldn't be too hard to locate him. As for Peter. It was simple, but complicated at the same time. He doesn't want to get his hands dirty, nor does he feel he's ready to kill another human. Now, if he could just catch him and reveal his accidental discovery to Snape alone. The point was, Snape was no fool, he needed a reasonable chain of events. In fact, remembering something that happened during first year, maybe he didn't really need the Marauder's map. He spent several days researching the incident with Sylvia and Mrs. Pants's help, to find the newspaper clippings of the event. Hermione, for her part, helped him with his curiosity about Animagi and asked Professor McGonagall several questions. One of which revealed that there was a spell to forcibly remove Animagus status. Not that Soizen distrusted Hermione, but if he casually commented or showed interest now while in the Gryffindor common room, Peter might accidentally overhear something and become suspicious. And the day came for him to perform, the day of tryouts for the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Ron and Harry were in attendance to try to earn a spot on the team and it is during their absence that Soizen managed to get his hands on Scabbers. Of course, he made sure that the Weasley twins knew about their little brother's attempt and went to cheer him on, followed by Percy who didn't want the tryouts interrupted, worried about a tip-off he received. 
As for how. Convince a first-year student who wants to play a prank and give him a galleon for his trouble catching a rat. Before he knew it, Peter was in a cage being carried by a stranger. There you are, scabbers. Soizen smiled as he looked at Peter, who reflected his confusion with his behavior, I didn't expect Ginny to think of playing a prank on Ron, asking me to take you with her. I think the twins are starting to influence her, he commented perfunctorily before tossing a piece of cheesecake into the cage, I don't know what prank she's planning on playing on him, but she told me I should keep you three hours away from the Gryffindor common room. You might get hungry, so I'll leave this for you while you wait. Just don't make any noise, okay? I still have to finish my transformation homework. Peter understood the situation after Soizen's monologue and let his guard down. So Ginny finally fell under the twins' influence, what a pity, she was such a potential little witch, Peter thought, calming himself as his gaze was drawn to what from his perspective. Was a huge piece of cheesecake, no wonder he's the heir to one of the Hogwarts houses, how thoughtful and generous he is. Just thinking about the scraps Ron was feeding him, she couldn't help but groan. Soizen found an empty classroom and set the cage aside as he sat down and pulled out quill and parchment to begin writing. After a few minutes and seeing that he had no intention of disturbing him, Peter approached and began to eat his treat with delight. How long had it been since he had eaten something so good? After eating a large portion, his stomach swelled and he felt drowsy. The cage was next to a window, so the sun's rays felt comfortable and the draft was soothing. Taking another look at Soizen and seeing that he was still busy, he decided to let sleep overcome him. By the time he awoke, he would surely be back with Ron. Five minutes later, Soizen stopped the pen and looked at Peter. It seems to have worked, he commented, satisfied with his work. What Peter ate was a piece of cake with an additional secret ingredient, a diluted and tasteless version of the living dead filter that he successfully brewed despite it being a potion learned in sixth year. Powerful enough to knock him out for two days, but without the need for a Wiganweld potion to wake him up. And with the Half-Blood Prince's notes, it was child's play. He altered the cage and made it into a small tin can with holes for his prisoner to breathe, easier to carry and conceal in a tunic pocket. After making sure everything was in place, he went down to the dungeons, where he knew Snape at this hour was assessing assignments. Knock, knock. Come in, Snape's voice answered through the wood of the door. Snape looked away from the disappointing potion's homework on his desk and glared at the one who dared to interrupt his work. Soizen. Professor, I have something important to talk to you about, Soizen said as he closed the door behind him and approached him, it concerns my first foster mother. What is it about? Snape turned his attention to Lily. What I'm about to tell you is the truth, but you'll probably find it hard to believe. Snape watched as Soizen earnestly pulled a can from his student robes and set it down on the table. Was the conversation so long that he brought him some Macedonian? Chapter 41, Lethal Sleep Snape stared in disbelief at the short, fat man who appeared before him and snored loudly. After hearing Soizen's explanation, he cast the forced reversal spell himself and froze as he recognized Peter. How? Snape looked at Soizen with an expression that was hard to describe. He had only shown him the letter a few days ago and the young wizard stood before him with a dead man who shouldn't exist, sedated and helpless. Last year I noticed something peculiar during my first transformations class, a cat on Professor McGonagall's desk. I had a strange feeling when I saw it and only a few moments later I understood that it was an animagus form. The funny thing is that I felt something similar when I saw Ron Weasley's rat, but at the time I simply thought it was a magical rat, I didn't know the animagus concept. Soizen lied, after reading the letter you showed me, I reviewed the incident and discovered that they only found one of Peter's fingers. But the finger shown in the clipping photo was strange, because the wound appeared to have been caused by a cut and not torn off by an explosion. And then I connected dots. Scabbers is missing the same toe on one of the paws, something I noticed odd, but initially attributed to a fight with a cat or something. But then I asked around and found out that the very moment Peter died coincided with the adoption of the Weasley family's more than long-lived pet. Snape was truly speechless. The line of thought is clear, the irrefutable evidence and details were in front of him, it was unquestionable. And why didn't you take him to the headmaster, but to me? 
he asked suddenly. He was not worried about someone breaking into his office, he raised the defenses and Soizen also made active some functions of the castle. Not even Dumbledore could know that Peter was here. And get Sirius Black out of Azkaban? No, Professor. Not after reading the letter, Soizen shook his head determinately, now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go pick up a rat I ordered by Owl and cut off a finger. I don't want my own Owl to find out the contents of the package and eat it, Soizen turned away and before closing the door, oh, and Professor. See to it that you clean up after I finish whatever it is you do. After all, as I said, I am a second-year student and it is not right for me to see what will happen next. Snape looked at him out of the corner of his eye and nodded. 200 points to Gale Gold 4. Helping to catch a plague in the school, he muttered, but Soizen heard him and shrugged before closing the door. The points were irrelevant really, but it would be interesting to see everyone's reaction when their house hourglass changed so much in a single day. Snape's gaze refocused on Peter and his eyes gradually became bloodshot before he advanced towards him, falling on the unconscious wizard like Batman on the Joker. Soizen never saw Peter again after that. After ascertaining that the rat he obtained was identical to Peter's animagus form, he cut off the same finger as quickly and painlessly as possible and asked the same student to return Scabbers to his place for another galleon along with his silence. Then he went on with his life. Later, during lunch he overheard Ron complain that Scabbers behaved as if he didn't recognize him and was an ungrateful rat. Ironic, considering that with so many years with the Weasleys, Ron was unable to notice the change. Simultaneously, everyone was pleasantly surprised when Dumbledore announced that for one week potions lessons would be theory only, as Professor Snape had to leave Hogwarts due to a family emergency. The headmaster himself seemed puzzled at the strange behavior of his confidant. Family emergency? He really could have thought of something better to have alone time with his old friend Peter. But as long as he left no trace, it was all good. As for why he substituted the rat, well, imagine the same thing happening in third year but instead of the big reveal, Sirius accuses a rat who really was a rat of being Peter. It would prove he was completely insane beyond redemption and he'd be sentenced to the Dementor's kiss. He didn't even have to act, the Ministry would step forward eager to act. As for the Dementors, due to his move to the forbidden section of the library, he already learned the Patronus charm and how it worked. He just needed to practice it and be able to employ it skillfully before taking the express in his third year. Professor Flittick, may I speak with you for a moment? After lunch, Soizen approached the charms teacher. Oh. How can I help you, Mr. Gale Gold? Flittick asked as he remembered that Minerva was looking for him later to discuss a matter related to this very student in front of him. I understand that you are responsible for the Toad Choir. Indeed I am. Would you be interested in joining? I didn't know you liked to sing. Actually, I was hoping you could give me some advice about music and solve some doubts I have about some ideas I have in mind related to Sonorous. I'm working on a project that I think you might find very interesting. Well, you have managed to arouse my curiosity and interest, Flittick looked at him animatedly, let's go to my office and talk while we drink some tea, it will help with digestion. He followed the professor and as he left the great dining hall, he heard someone congratulate Potter on becoming a seeker for the Gryffindor team. It seems that the scene of the Dementors invading the Quidditch Stadium will occur unchanged next year, including Potter's fainting spell. I would offer you one of my famous cupcakes to go with your tea, but I saw that you already had a good slice of cheesecake and it's not good to overindulge in sweets, explained Flittick when they were settled in his office, all right, shoot. What doubts torment your privileged mind? Soizen took out the parchment with the formulas he had prepared in transformations class and handed it to Flittick, who took it and examined it with increasing interest as he understood what Soizen's goal was. Amazing, he muttered, for he could find no mistakes anywhere and the only thing that prevented what was in his hands from being finished were the blanks that had a critical function in its activation. Do you think you could help me with the missing part? Flittick looked away from the parchment and looked at Soizen seriously. I'm sorry to tell you that while I know what you are missing, I cannot provide you with the proper explanation you need because it requires a deep understanding and is not my field of expertise. He replied with a sigh before his eyes lit up, but I have something in mind. 
Give me a few days and I think I can think of a way for you to continue working on it. Soizen would be lying if he said he wasn't disappointed, but seeing that the professor seemed to have an alternative idea, he decided to nod and wait for news. He stayed a few more minutes in the office and then took his leave with the intention of visiting Hagrid, to see what progress the project had made since he proposed it last year. What a monster! Flittick commented as he wiped the sweat from his brow, no wonder Minerva has such urgency to conduct a meeting, I'll need to write to a friend of mine. Chapter 42, Drink Without Borders He was in Hagrid's hut, drinking tea for the second time, as he considered it impolite for the half-giant to refuse when he was so enthusiastic. So, how is our project coming along? Hagrid immediately became excited and began to explain all the steps he had accomplished so far. It wasn't easy to get the demiguys to show some love to the fire snail, but the results have certainly been excellent. I think with a few additional crosses and a few generations, it should be enough to accomplish what you said. I already have a few pairs prepared. In fact, the book you gave me has been inspiring and has helped me a lot to speed things up, he took a sip of tea and muttered under his breath although there are still some things I don't understand. There's no downside. Soizen raised his eyebrows somewhat suspiciously. Actually, I may need a bit more money than expected, Hagrid admitted somewhat sheepishly, some of the creatures have been fighting with each other and, well, they won't be able to play their part anymore. We need to replace them and they eat quite a lot. No problem, I'll send you a bag of galleons soon so you can sort it out, Soizen was willing to invest because he knew how lucrative it would be once it came to fruition. Actually, there is one other thing. I did the best I could, but in my experience, the most appropriate, nutritious and cheapest thing to do would be to adapt the digestive system to eat firebush seeds. Anything else and they won't be able to do what you asked me to do, as the characteristics of the creature's conflict. Firebush seeds? Soizen reflected, that's good enough. It was a common ingredient in some potions like fire breath potion or antidote for rare poisons, so there would definitely be demand for it after the fact. When Pomona finished researching the properties of the plants she gave her, she could include some firebush cultivars in the greenhouses she bought. They spent another half hour talking and Soizen left after assuring Hagrid that he was still interested in the project, maintaining his funding. Hagrid assured him that by the summer he should be able to have everything in place. Soizen. On his way to the castle, he heard someone call out to him and after looking around, he saw that it was Hermione, who seemed to have run into Potter and Ron. When he saw his friend, he pushed the two of them away and walked over happy to be able to run away from the ambush he received. You saved me. What happened? He asked intrigued. The Golden Trio no longer existed since their intervention in the troll attack and Hermione was no longer pushing other Griffinders to do homework, so her contact with the other two was almost non-existent apart from sharing a class and meeting in the common room. They've been trying to convince me to give them a hand with their transformation homework for ten minutes. I told them that instead of wasting time on Quidditch, they should spend it on homework if they need it so badly. But it's like trying to reason with a wall. Wait, Ron made the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Not at all, his broomstick flying leaves a lot to be desired, only Harry made it. But Ron attends every practice to watch from the stands, so it doesn't make much difference. I see. I was on my way to the library, do you want to come with me? Are you still looking for information about Animagi? Professor McGonagall already warned us that the process is complicated and dangerous. If you want to try to become one, you should wait a couple of years and you have to register with the ministry, Hermione reminded him. I'm not going to try to become an animagus, Hermione, Soizen told her, today I will explore the forbidden section looking for something interesting, nothing else. Trying would mean he could fail. He was going to make it when he considered himself ready and got advice from Nagini, as for registering with the ministry as an animagus once he succeeded. Not going to happen, not when the list of animagi was public. He preferred to keep an ace up his sleeve, even if it meant that being discovered could land him in Azkaban for a short period of time. As long as he didn't run into Aurors like Moody, he was confident in taking them down and removing recent memories of the incident. As soon as he learned the memory spell, he had checked the relevant laws and found the ministry's authority almost laughable in that regard. 
Besides, he was curious as to what his animagus form would be, the same curiosity regarding the corporeal form of his Patronus. In short, getting some mandrake leaves and the necessary potion during the summer wasn't going to give him much of a headache. The only thing he couldn't control was the thunderstorm, but he could always look up on the weather map where one was brewing and go there with Nagini's apparition. He wasn't going to wait for the perfect storm every month, that would be stupid. The Forbidden Section I'm in. Hermione was interested in the hard-to-get books and had been reading several since Soizen got each of the three of them a pass. What are you reading today? I want to finish the tome on countercurses for blood curses, Hermione replied, by the way, when do you plan to start the training you told us about? I don't want to spend the rest of the year dealing only with Lockhart's problems. I need to learn something useful from Dada. You know I'm busy, but I don't think it will take too long. Even though Lockhart would open a dueling club, the experience they could get there was limited and simply couldn't compare to the intensity with which he practiced with Nagini. He would give it a try, but he didn't hold out much hope for her. What are you planning this time? Hermione straightened up and slipped into her secretary mode without realizing it, carried away by last year's habit. Butterbeer. Soizen. Hermione exclaimed, we're minors, we can't drink. It's not what you think, Soizen looked at her amused, tell me, did you hear about butterbeer when you were still in the muggle bubble? Of course not, adults only have regular beers. There you go, he pointed. You mean. Hermione's eyes widened as she understood what he wanted to do. Yes, let's make a muggle version of butterbeer. Without alcohol, of course. But. We don't know what it tastes like. And the ministry won't give us any trouble. We're not using magical ingredients and we're making a normal drink. Which part can give them problems? They're not breaking the statute of secrecy or anything like that. Hermione reflected and realized that they weren't really breaking any kind of magical law, what's more, since they would be making a version with their own recipe, they didn't even need to pay royalties. What about the taste? He asked doubtfully. The flavor will be a mixture of caramel and vanilla, we are still fighting with the proportions. Not only that, but to prevent people from avoiding it to avoid getting fat, no sugar will be used, but stevia. Stevia? Hermione didn't remember the plant being mentioned in Herbology. Known as sweet grass, it is a powerful sweetener 300 times sweeter than sugar, and despite its incredible sweetness, it doesn't have a single calorie. What's more, it doesn't even cause tooth decay. If it's so good, why do we still use sugar in the muggle world? The sugar mafia, of course. Stevia has no addictive traits like sugar and they make sure to discredit it, spread false rumors and do whatever they can to increase its cost of production. How do you know all this? My mother, Soizen looked sideways at her, I think I already told you that she controls the family diet at home, she likes to use stevia most of the time. She only uses sugar or honey in specific recipes and they are rare to see. Does she use them in brownies? Hermione asked sharply. Who knows? Soizen smiled mysteriously as he walked into the library. Remember that you can read caps of my fanfics in advance and its original version in my Patreon. Your support will help me to publish more official books. Chapter 43, Superior Animago It should be noted that many books in the Forbidden section are so obscure, they should not even be in a school with impressionable students. They are the kind of book that only when one has established a clear path in life and needs specific knowledge, should one consider consulting very carefully. But because of the common sense of wizards, it is difficult to distinguish them. Soizen accompanied Hermione to take out the book he had to finish and then, he carefully explored the forbidden section. Volumes on necromancy, blood magic, curses, poisons, etc. Could be useful in broadening his perspectives, but it didn't spark an immediate desire in him. After two hours of searching, the only thing he found that really came in handy was a volume devoted to the lesser-known special processing of some potion ingredients. He discovered that leech juice could acquire one of the properties he had failed to obtain, but the mode of obtaining it was very tedious. The leeches needed to be fed for thirteen days on the blood of the one who drank the potion, then they need to be squeezed in a mill made of moonstone that has been submerged in a deep water river for three days, deep enough for the sun's rays not to reach. 
and he may need some house elf tears, which wouldn't be hard to come by thanks to his authority over those who work in the castle kitchens. He would give them some recipe books of the world in return, all would be fair. After quietly taking note of everything, he was about to put the volume of potions back in its place again, but noticed that in the empty slot the book had left, on the wall behind the bottomless bookshelf, there was a mark that looked familiar. He pulled all the books off the shelf of the bookcase and revealed a small puzzle with square stone pieces on a magically patterned square. So this is where it was, Soizen thought as he realized he had found another of his mother's treasures. There were no other people in this part of the forbidden section, but he still threw up a field of silence and illusion so that no one would secretly snoop around. He carefully examined the stone pieces and began to move them in a specific pattern. One piece was missing, he frowned when he realized that everything was in place, but one of the pieces seemed to be missing, one that could be translated as blood or life. Is it possible? Soizen made a small cut on the pad of his right index finger and drew the remaining part with his blood. The drawing emitted a faint reddish light, before the blood was absorbed by the stone and the shelf split in half, revealing a passage. Clever, Soizen smiled. Even if someone found the puzzle before he did, they would be searching the entire forbidden section for the missing piece. Even if they thought to use her blood as he did, she would likely not be recognized if she didn't belong to the Gale Gold bloodline. He entered and after walking down a short hallway, he came to a small room where there was only a book on an oak pedestal. The Higher Forms of Animagus, by Frustran Gale Gold. Soizen opened the book and as he imagined from the title, it explained how someone could become an animagus, which wasn't very revealing to him at this point. He flipped through the pages and stopped when he came to a page that contained divergent knowledge from what he knew. Animagi will assume animal form based on their traits, personality, and other factors. Those who manage to obtain a transformation into a magical creature are so rare, there are only records of three of them. And I, Frustran Gale Gold, have discovered the factor behind this anomaly. He went on to explain how it was necessary to change the dew of the Animagus potion, alter the chant when the wand is against the heart and other additional steps. Over twenty wizards in the family followed the steps and all had a successful transformation with no accidents, so he put his new method up for sale. There was also an entry with a much later date where he complained that no one wanted to follow his new method apart from the family. Because they did not trust the changes and considered that the form of a common animal was more useful to go unnoticed and not attract attention. It's a good thing I wasn't in such a hurry to become an animagus, Soizen was both interested and conflicted at the possibility in front of him. Indeed, ordinary animals were useful for going unnoticed, but it was all in the circumstances. If a wizard transformed into a gazelle in the middle of Ireland, it would certainly attract attention. There were powerful magical creatures, such as the Nundu, but there were also those that no one wished to transform into, such as the fire crab. But no matter how you look at it, a magical creature would certainly be more useful, Soizen concluded. If his transformation wasn't something to his liking. He could always pretend he wasn't an animagus and discreetly set that ability aside, too bad that despite having figured out how to make this version of a superior animagus, he hadn't made a list of possible transformations. The randomness of the transformation was annoying. He took the book and put it straight into his magical fanny pack, he could consult it in depth over the summer when he wants to become an animagus. He left the room the way he came and once he was out, the bookshelf returned to its original state and the puzzle turned to dust. As to whether it had just been permanently locked or the room had been destroyed, he had no idea. He removed the magic that was still active and exited the forbidden section, where he ran into Hermione. Hermione, have you seen the Weasley twins? He asked quietly in her ear so Mrs. Pants wouldn't shoo them away. I think I saw them sneaking off with a sack towards the Quidditch pitch, the witch replied, do you need me to ask them for anything for you? I'll need some leeches, she told her some of the ingredients she needed to finish her potion. As for the Moonstone Mill, he would ask Sylvia to make one for him. I'll tell her when I see them in the Gryffindor common room, Hermione nodded. Thank you, see you later, she said goodbye to the witch and left the library. She intended to go to the kitchens and ask for the house elf tears, she just needed to remember where the picture with the pear to tickle was. Soizen, he bumped into Sylvia, which wasn't too surprising considering the Hufflepuff common room was next to the kitchens, 
Headmaster Dumbledore has asked me if I see you to tell you to come to his office when you can. The password in Peppermint Cockroaches. The Headmaster. Soizen wanted to confirm, and when he saw Sylvia nod, he was puzzled. Did he find out what happened with Peter? No, I don't think Snape said anything. Did he say why he was looking for me? He asked. No, but he was accompanied by McGonagall, Flittick, Sprout and Sinistra, answered Sylvia as she looked at him carefully, be honest, what mess have you gotten yourself into? Come on, am I that kind of person? Right, Sylvia started to walk away and then remembered, tomorrow I'll send you the new sample of butterbeer you asked for. Chapter 44, School Exchange Are you kicking me out of Hogwarts? Soizen's eyes widened in disbelief. After getting the tears in the kitchens, he rushed to visit the headmaster to avoid any misunderstandings, but he hadn't expected almost all the rest of the teachers who taught him subjects to be present as well. Even Lockhart was there. We are not dismissing you, McGonagall quickly clarified, giving Dumbledore a hard look for expressing the matter in the wrong words. Your performance during our lessons is more than outstanding and we are very happy about that, but your classmates are starting to lose confidence because of the noticeable difference. So we would like to propose something that may benefit you more on a personal level during this period of time, said Pomona. An inter-school exchange. I wrote to a friend of mine, who teaches charms at Beaux Batons and after a few letters, she suggested the possibility that, after Christmas, you could spend the rest of the school year attending Beaux Batons. You could get a new perspective on magic, make friends somewhere else and she could help you with that interesting project you showed me. It's been almost 40 years since Hogwarts has done a student exchange between the other schools, but the premise for it to happen, of course, is that you are willing to do it. We can't force you, as you well understand, Sinistra argued, besides, since your status as an exchange student has been something that has arisen during the school year. Bose Batons will provide the necessary teaching materials and they will only ask you to acquire a male uniform to help you integrate. You don't have to worry about speaking French either, Dumbledore took over the conversation again, I happen to have a small accessory that has the convenient ability to translate languages. The others will hear you in perfect French and you will understand everything they say or write. Soizen was a bit speechless, were they really sending him to another magic school because the other students felt mediocre when compared to him? Then don't let them. Have a little more confidence in yourselves. How is it his fault that half of them possess the intellectual capacity of a stone? His hard-won pass to the forbidden section of the library would lose half its value and he would not be able to look after the juniors in his house, who are now his responsibility as delegate and sole prefect. It would also make it difficult to be in contact with Hermione and Sylvia to move forward with new projects and follow up on progress with Hagrid. Pomona's research would still take some time, so it was no problem in that area. He wouldn't be able to keep his promise to train the two witches. Though come to think of it, he could not only complete the project he taught Flittick, but he could also learn real Dada for almost half a year without having to put up with Lockhart and his nonsense. A decent Dada after two almost empty years. I could also get some books that have not been tampered with or restricted by the British Ministry and unusual potion ingredients. Bose Batons also has something of a reputation for its expertise in transformations. Wait, was this Dumbledore's plan to keep him away from the castle? He still remembered how Potter and Ron approached Hermione out of the blue, asking them to help them with their homework. What prompted them to do that? Was it because they were among the depressed that this happened? Is Dumbledore still acting behind the scenes to see if he can form the Golden Trio in their absence? It would weaken his presence in the school, he could influence the new generation in his house, he could manipulate points so that Gryffindor would win unlike last year? Too many possibilities. Or maybe he was thinking too much. If Snape wasn't absent because of the family emergency, he could ask him if the old headmaster was having any underhanded plans. I can't answer that proposal right now, I need to think about it and consult with my family first, he replied after a few seconds in silence. He needed time to weigh the pros and cons. Naturally, Sinistra nodded, understanding the logic behind his actions, but remember that we need an answer at the latest two weeks before Christmas, so that the other side can prepare and find a student for the exchange. I will provide an answer as soon as possible, Soizen promised before leaving the director's office. 
Albus, do you think we are really doing the right thing? Asked Minerva hesitantly when only she and the headmaster were left. This year they were sending an outstanding exchange student, but what would they do for the remaining five years? She couldn't send Soizen to a different school every year with the same idea and excuse. His social life and contacts would become too confusing. Even his studies would suffer. Of course. We just have to try a little harder during his absence so that the other students regain their confidence and avoid feeling like this in the future. This has been a wake-up call for everyone and we must take it seriously, Dumbledore reassured the deputy headmistress. I remember Gilderoy suggested opening a bereavement club, we can proceed with that for the time being so that the students can handle the stress for the time being. But there has to be someone responsible in charge, we can't leave it in the hands of. Gilderoy, headmaster, Minerva didn't trust the abilities of this year's data teacher. I'll discuss it with Flittick, he was a former dueling champion and I'm sure he'll show interest in teaching some of his tricks to the students. But it's too much work for them alone, Severus will be involved as well. I'll convince him when he returns. All right, Albus, I'll trust you, said Minerva before leaving the office and leaving the headmaster alone with his portraits, sweets and phoenix. Now that I think about it. I didn't offer him a lemon drop, Dumbledore contemplated the sweets on the table, oh, good. More for me, he said as he took one and tossed it into his mouth happily. Chapter 45, Pidiendo de Tales Soizen wrote home to tell his mothers about what had been discussed in the headmaster's office and spent the whole week mulling over the proposal to be sent to Bozbatons. Were it not for the fact that he understood after the fact that the person who proposed the idea was Minerva, not Dumbledore, he would most likely have refused almost on the spot. He thought about it so much that he even temporarily paused his research on reflection. His mothers replied in a letter that they had no objection to him going for half a term at Bozbatons, after all, the language problem would be solved and would only happen after he returned home for Christmas. They even joked with him that it was the perfect opportunity to have a foreign romance. When she asked her two friends their opinion, Sylvia said it could be an interesting experience while Hermione made clear her envy at being able to attend two different magic schools. On the plus side, she didn't reproach her for not being able to train them. But she insisted that she had to bring him a copy of her syllabus as a souvenir. Sinan only vaguely knew of the existence of Fleur Delacour, her sister Gabrielle and the half-giant headmistress, Maxime, from memories of the Triwizard Tournament. Oh, and the Abraxan horses that are fed malt whiskey. How do they have the nerve to make them fly, pulling the carriage with the students inside? Could it be that they have some magical trait that keeps them from getting drunk? So to help him decide, he asked for more details about the school, which Professor Flittick explained to him over tea and dancing cupcakes. For starters, the name of the professor's friend, who served as Bozbaden's charms teacher and would be responsible for looking after him if he accepted the exchange, was Chloe Du Bois. She was already very interested in Soizen's project when Flittick gave her an outline and hoped she could help him succeed in his final step. As for Bozbaton's palace, according to the explanation she received, it was a castle surrounded by majestic gardens and fountains magically created out of the mountainous landscape and has been standing for over 700 years. In the dining hall, would nymphs serenade students as they eat. The caliber of education at the school is similar to Hogwarts, with the difference being that they take their equivalent of Timo during their sixth year, rather than their fifth as is customary at Hogwarts. It was rumored that the grounds and castle of the prestigious school were in part funded with alchemists gold, as both Nicholas and Pernell Flamel met there during their youth. In fact, a fountain located in the center of the school's park, believed to have healing and beautifying powers, bears his name. Maybe that's why all the students there say they are attractive. That's cheating. Maybe he had to think about installing something like that in the garden at home. Speaking of the students, the majority of their population is female and they have hardly any male students, the opposite of Durmstrang School. As for the uniform, they are known for wearing pale blue robes made of fine silk. So when Soizen bought her uniform, at the very least she is clear that it will be comfortable. Although unlike the female uniform, the male uniform does not have a matching hat and replaces the small blue cape at the shoulders with a grey knight's cloak sporting a silver chain. And how would my stay there be handled? Soizen asked after taking a bite of the second muffin, 
would I need to be sorted into one of your three houses? Since the exchange will only last half a term and you cannot be awarded points, you will be exempted from the need to be sorted into the House of Dewey, Supple or Vanterg. This is also in consideration of giving you greater freedom and no barriers to meet all the students, Flittick explained to him after taking a sip of tea, while you will be required not to leave the palace as if you were at Hogwarts. Chloe has very kindly suggested that she will accompany you once a month so that you can go out and do some sightseeing and some shopping, as it would be a shame in her opinion not to show you the local market equivalent of Diagon Alley and the beautiful scenery in the surrounding area. You should know that Miss Chloe is a very busy lady, so remember to thank her appropriately for that. And how would you travel there? I understand that shuttles and apparitions are restricted between countries. According to Chloe, you would initially be asked to travel in the normal way to France and from there, she will pick you up personally. But after speaking with Headmistress Maxime, she agreed to momentarily connect the Hogwarts flu network to the nearest town to Bosbatons to make your journey easier. No wonder, actually, this school has always had a warm relationship with the others and their attitude shows that care. Didn't the French ministry give them trouble for that? Problems? Flittick laughed, not at all, we are doing an exchange between schools to maintain or even improve international relations. They would rather ask you if you needed anything else. He raised his hands theatrically. What about the curriculum? Soizen came to the critical part of the question, if I'm going to receive the same lessons as at Hogwarts, it doesn't make much sense for me to leave temporarily so that the other students can be encouraged. I think you are well aware of that, Professor. About that. Flittick coughed somewhat embarrassedly, it really did seem like he was being held back for being too outstanding. But the sad truth, was that the contrast was too great, Headmistress Maxime is aware of the situation and you will be tested in every subject when you get to Bosbatons. Once you are finished with her, your curriculum will be adjusted accordingly so that your potential can be stimulated. You won't suffer any loss, you don't have to worry about that. Soizen narrowed his eyes and looked at Flittick, who lowered his head to look at the remains of the teacup, as if he were making a very interesting divination. Why did he have the feeling that he was missing something? All right, I'll participate in the exchange with Bosbatons. Chapter 46, Duties for Others Can you repeat it again? Said Sylvia, thinking she had misheard. The three of them were currently standing on the shore of the Black Lake, while Soizen was throwing large loaves of bread towards the giant squid, who was in a good mood because of the goodies the students gave him. You heard me, I agreed to do the exchange and I have until Christmas to make some preparations. I will need to stock up on magic soap and our other products to introduce to Bosbatons, anything that is focused on the female clientele. I will also give you some duties while I am away that I want you to fulfill. What kind of duties? Hermione asked intrigued as she handed him a two-kilo loaf of whole wheat bread. First, I will help you learn the spell of disillusionment, said Soizen as he took a run and then threw the whole wheat bread hard. Once you are proficient in the spell, I will show you a magical place in the true sense of the word, so magical, it's unbelievable that it exists at Hogwarts. Really? Is it better than the prefect's bathroom? They don't even have a comparable spot, laughed Soizen. And why do we need to be proficient in the disillusionment spell to know where it is? Hermione asked. Because I don't want anyone, and I mean anyone. She raised her voice to emphasize the matter seriously, know the place for a long time apart from us and I think if we know anything, it's that at Hogwarts secrets are the hardest thing to keep. All it takes is for one gossipy person to know about it and everything will be ruined forever. Soizen intended to show the two witches the room of the masters, and given the practicality, he preferred to monopolize the place for as long as possible. Soizen said, aren't you worried we'll tell someone after you show us around? No, I think we have enough trust in each other to be confident that you won't betray me behind my back. Soizen matter-of-factly laid out the trust she had in them and made sure at the same time to use the word betrayal to once again emphasize the seriousness of the matter. And by the looks of joy and nerves of the two witches, it seems that the effect she was looking for was achieved with great success. That place is perfect for both of them, Soizen explained, it could be a magical craft workshop, Sylvia's eyes lit up, a library with hidden books, Hermione opened her eyes wide, or a perfect place to practice dueling spells in a relatively safe and private environment. 
And the disillusionment spell is so they won't follow us, right? Knowing you, you'll even tell us to use the silencing spell to mute our footsteps. Exactly. Surely after I show you around, someone starts to notice your escapades and decides to follow you to find out what you're hiding. But with these countermeasures, unless it's a teacher, I doubt anyone has the magical abilities and skills among the students to follow your path. Do you really think anyone would do something that creepy? Hermione asked with obvious distaste. You'd be surprised what some students can do, Soizen assured her as he collected some squid ink, which he very kindly exchanged for a few dozen loaves of bread. Just look at Potter and his invisibility cloak along with Ron's unhealthy curiosity about matters that don't concern him. Soizen was sure they would be among the first to try to find out where Hermione will go, when he leaves during the school exchange. And so, Soizen spent the next few days teaching Sylvia and Hermione not only the anti-spying spells he knew, but also warned them of certain tricks they might try to play to get information out of them unwittingly. He even set them the task of starting to practice acclimacy under the guise of keeping trade secrets. Needless to say, when the two learned that the ability to read the minds of others existed, they took the privacy of their minds very seriously, which saved Soizen the trouble of convincing them. That's right, he was training them to develop resistance to the dark spell, talk no jutsu. He also asked Hermione to take Rada to the Gryffindor common room for a few days and look after her scarf while she was in a delicate phase of her research. The redhead was delighted to do her the favor and Rada was enthusiastically welcomed by the lions. Three days later, the Scarbaid infiltrated the Weasley twins' room when they were out for a prank and searched for his target, a blank piece of parchment, but one that was folded into several creases. After rummaging through a few things, he found what Soizen asked for and despite it not being shiny, he tucked it away in his bag. That same day Hermione rushed to Soizen with Rada, because he had suddenly started acting sick. Soizen gave Rada some medicine that was actually his Scarbate's favorite honey and let him rest in his room. He soothed Hermione's somewhat guilty conscience and assured her that this happened every year and was no big deal, in two days Rada would be as good as new. He couldn't help it, Hermione changed a lot compared to her original counterpart, but she was still too innocent and he wouldn't know how to explain to her how she knew about the existence of the Marauder's Map. Moreover, knowing her, perhaps she would burn it for being an invasion of other people's private lives. Good job, Rada. After dismissing the witch, Soizen met her pet in her room and gave her some shiny coins for her good performance. After receiving the blank paper and saying the words that acted as a password, he tapped his wand and the marauder's map officially appeared in front of him. Although I feel a little bad for the twins, they simply don't understand the potential of this artifact. The map is not the key, but the ability to locate everyone within these walls. Soizen wasn't sure if the Weasley twins would also be curious about the escapades of the two witches, so he made sure to take hold of the best means of espionage they had at their disposal. After adding a few extra protection spells to it, he stowed it safely in his trunk. If only he could replace Potter's cloak with a demiguy's cloak. He had tried to use Accio to get the cloak during one night when he was walking under the spell of disillusionment and discovered the surviving boy walking down one of the corridors without much care to speak of. But it seems that the cloak was either protected against this kind of magic or Potter held it very tightly. He wasn't sure which of the two situations it was. As he expected, during dinner on the same day he obtained the map, the twins were not displaying a fun and unrestrained attitude, but instead were looking around nervously, something that caught the attention of many. Their conclusion? Perhaps the twins went overboard with one of their recent pranks and were vigilant not to fall for the prankster's revenge. They even began to place bets on when it would happen. Soizen even approached and asked them if everything was all right with a worried expression or if they needed help, which moved the twins a little. How would they connect Rada's arrival and their convenient illness at the same time their most precious treasure disappeared? They were not at all suspicious of their good friend. Chapter 47, The Minister's Room On the seventh floor, right in front of a tapestry of Barnabas the Nutcase, Soizen waited patiently with Hermione for the arrival of Sylvia, who should have just finished her transformation lesson, the last one of the day. Welcome, Sylvia, said Soizen as he interrupted his conversation with Hermione and looked to his right, which was empty. How did you know? Sylvia cancelled her spell of disillusionment and looked at Soizen with a puzzled expression. 
invisibility, muffling sound, hiding scent, etc. The tapestry swayed as you walked past, most likely running, since walking you wouldn't have been able to generate the draft needed to make it happen. We are in a place without air currents, the rest is logic. Hermione looked at Sylvia in surprise, because she didn't notice such a small detail. Forget it, you're the great genius Gale Gold. Sylvia raised her hands with frustration and some humor mixed in, so, where is this magical place you were saying? She commented as she looked around. She had passed this corridor several times last year when she was lost at Hogwarts and apart from the funny tapestry, there was nothing really outstanding. Bear with me and imitate exactly what I'm doing, don't speak until I'm done, Soizen walked past the clear wall thinking what he wanted with strong concentration. The two witches followed him without asking too many questions, though they looked at each other quizzically as they walked through the same spot twice more, making no apparent sense. Hermione was about to ask if he was pulling their leg, but no sooner had she parted her lips than she saw grooves begin to appear in the wall where there was nothing, and a large door began to take shape. Let's go in, Soizen said as he sped up. Once the trio entered through the door and it closed behind them, it vanished and before long a Ravenclaw student peeked into the hallway. Strange, I could have sworn I heard someone's footsteps in here. Meanwhile, inside the Hall of Ministers, Soizen looked around contentedly while Sylvia and Hermione had their mouths wide open. The circular room was divided into parts. On the right, there were three tall shelves with flying books whose titles Hermione never saw. And she had access to the forbidden section of the library. To the left, a workbench with simple but well-kept tools. Several boxes with wood, bones, and other simple practice materials were neatly deposited beside it. The front area had several dummies for practicing dueling spells, targets that floated in a random order to improve aim, iron boards for harder spells, and some other data practice props. And in the central part, a big table with all kinds of fruits and drinks next to different armchairs that screamed uncomfortable. Just by looking at them. What do you think? Soizen asked, even though the expressions said it all, interesting. Just. How come no one knows about a place like this? Hermione shouted after her brain rebooted. That's not all. What do you mean by that? Asked Sylvia, she was already surprised enough. What more could they need? I'd like to practice some simple potions in that free corner, she said aloud. And to the complete shock of the two witches, several crucibles, potion tables, knives, vials, and in short, everything they would need to prepare some basic potions began to appear. Some seemed to grow out of nowhere, others fell from the roof and there were also those that rose from the ground. The only difference was that compared to the crafting workshop, there were almost no ingredients at her disposal, but that was never a problem for Soizen as she carried the trunk with her. Sylvia and Hermione looked away from the potion's equipment and looked at Soizen with an expression that betrayed the common question they wanted to ask him. Welcome, both of you, to the Hall of Ministers, Soizen announced as he raised his arms to his sides and lifted his chin in a dramatic pose, a place that helps within its means those with strong needs. Do you want a place to read in peace? It will become a nice private library. To be able to practice your art without distractions. You have the tools at your disposal. Fortify yourself away from prying eyes. The mannequins are really sturdy. Love to swim but feel shy. A temperature-controlled pool will be here for you. It's almost like the Gale Gold House, Hermione murmured. Not quite, Soizen shook his head, while it is true that my house is very well equipped compared to the other four, the minister's hall could be considered semi-conscious to a certain extent. You need only express your need and it will try to satisfy you. Of course, it is not omnipotent. As you may have gathered, things like basic equipment she has no problem supplying, but you can't ask her for something like a steady stream of phoenix feathers. I want some sewing tools, said Sylvia suddenly. On the craft table, several needles fell from the ceiling with different sizes and materials. At the same time, the floor opened like a drawer and revealed some watermelon-sized balls of different colored wool. Several books of sewing patterns were spit off the walls and landed neatly on the table. Sewing for Beginners, by Flitty Koss How to Avoid Turning Your Fingers into a Pincushion, by Cornered Cece Colors and Their Magic Combinations, by Gullier Fadaru 
Now, do you understand what all the secrecy is about? Soizen asked. Sylvia and Hermione nodded like woodpeckers. Sylvia tried the tools and was delighted. Hermione tried to find the boundaries of the Great Hall and Soizen took a quill and parchment and began to write down the plan he had in mind. Come closer, Soizen pulled the two witches out of their worlds, these, he showed them a parchment that with a flick of his fingers. Split into two identical copies, these are the homework I'm going to give you and I want it completed before the summer, when you won't be able to practice magic freely unlike me. A clemency. Hermione began to read, Protego, Expelliarmus. Incendio, Aguamenti, Palalingua. Patronus. Patronus, Soizen nodded, it's not necessary to become a body, many don't make it that far, casting a mist stream is enough. It's not like we're going to face Dementors. But it's always good to know more spells than less. I also wanted to add other things, but then it would affect your studies when I'm gone. What he gave them could be considered the short and very reduced version of what Nagini helps you learn and practice, but it was enough for two students who wouldn't be able to hold a protective shield for more than a few seconds. I understand why I learn most, but don't you think Palalingua is very childish? Childish? Think about it, for some strange reason, someone suddenly attacks you and casts this glued tongue curse on you. How will you defend yourself if you can't utter any spells? Seeing his expression change, he nodded slowly, exactly, unless you can cast magic without words, you are simply defenseless. But don't think too much, focus on learning what's on the list according to the instructions and next year you can try to learn to cast magic non-vocally. Like you. Hermione never saw Soizen pronounce the spells they learned, except for the first few times, is that why your eyes turn gold when you do magic like this? Yes, like me, Soizen nodded and his head suddenly froze, what did you just say? Now he was the one who was confused. Chapter 48, Golden Eyes Do my eyes change when I do magic? He asked to confirm if he heard correctly, surprised by that fact that he was completely unaware of. Yes. Didn't you know that? Hermione and Sylvia didn't expect that their friend didn't know that trait of his, they thought he did it to be cooler. Which worked. Since when? Soizen asked, raising his voice without realizing it. He was truly speechless, he never looked in the mirror when he wielded magic and his minor changes, such as hair color, was something that stemmed from his natural ability as a shapeshifter. Since the first day. Sylvia tried to remember, but in her memory, it really had been a fact since they met. Like the snapping of fingers. Besides, it seems like the harder you try, the more they change to a shiny gold, Hermione added as she noticed, remember our first flight class. You took Neville's reminder from Malfoy and your eyes barely changed. But during one of the transformation lessons, where Professor McGonagall asked you to do a more complex transformation than the rest of the class, your eyes turned gold all over. You really didn't know that? Why didn't anyone tell me about it? Soizen asked himself in confusion as he put his hand to his head. Maybe they thought you were doing it on purpose, commented Sylvia, we thought so. While it may seem very cool that your eyes turn golden when you do magic, they also completely mess up your attempts to do magic silently or secretly. No, you have to check if you can control those changes or find some solution like wearing enchanted glasses or something. Which was very ironic, considering he invented a potion so people wouldn't need to wear glasses for their eyesight. Was it the karma of opticians? You don't have to take it like that, it's a bit like. Harry's scar. Yeah, no, I don't want to have anything remotely resembling a mark left by a killing curse. Besides, I never understood why she doesn't use a little makeup to cover up the scar if it bothers her so much that it attracts attention. Maybe the dark magic keeps it from healing, but I doubt she'd do anything to be constantly visible, even letting her hair grow a little longer would do the trick. From Soizen's point of view, both Harry and Dumbledore were not the brightest in using the conditions they had. For example, Harry's condition for Lily's protection to be effective. No matter how they wanted to deceive others, the real condition was to be close to his mother's blood, I. Aunt Petunia's blood. Harry had to go through what he went through, when he only needed Petunia to donate a little blood every year, keep it in an enchanted vial and hang it around his neck. And presto. 
ancestral protection for another year while she does what she wants and goes where she wants. No abusive family, enjoying a magical upbringing with responsible people, etc. They say wizards are wise and cunning, but there are times when even a child is smarter about certain matters. One of the walls of the Hall of Ministers began to change and a large full-length mirror emerged, where Soizen saw for himself that he was not being taken for a ride. As he looked at himself in the reflection, he pointed his hand at one of the boxes of materials in the crafting workshop and levitated it. Yes, the eyes changed vaguely. He was casually doing magic, but the change was definitely there. Stand behind me, I want to try something, he asked the two witches. Once he was sure they were both in a safe place, he moved to the training area and expanding the mirror to see himself clearly, he recited aloud. Fire. Continuous tongues of fire erupted from his right hand and choked the mannequin, which was bent backward by the power of the flames. Turning his head, he saw that the gold in his eyes became more intense and as he increased the output of magical power and concentrated the flames with force, his eyes even began to emit particles of golden light. He stopped channeling magic and walked to one of the seats and plopped down on it, feeling mentally tired all of a sudden. Soizen, are you all right? Sylvia asked carefully. Hermione stared at the pile of ashes that had previously been the dummy. In class, the incendio spell was shown to light a candle or start a bonfire, so the emphasis was more on control than power. Now I understood why it was included in the list they were given, clearly they did not understand the potential of the spell. I'm fine. I just need some time to digest this, several of his future plans went down the drain because of this seemingly insignificant revelation, so he needed to perform a readjustment in his mindset, let me explain in more detail how each spell needs to be practiced. Sinan needed to distract himself for the moment and he managed to do so as he explained the approach they needed to use with each spell, the proper safety measures, etc. No problem if we want to come here even if it's not for this, right? Hermione asked. As long as you make sure to take the countermeasures I told you about, I don't see why not. I mean, it's not like this place is mine. At least not yet, Soizen thought. After introducing them to the functions of the minister's room and clearing up any doubts about the proposed training, he talked about the business focus he hopes to develop during the half-year he'll be away after Christmas. Protective Gloves and Hats the Weasley twins were supposed to create something like that in the future and it was so useful that the ministry placed large orders. Soizen would take the lead, which would force the twins to borrow more money from him and he could get a bigger stake in their future prank business. The work was divided as follows, Sylvia needed to find the material for the gloves that would be comfortable, durable enough, but would be destroyed after all her defensive incantations were exhausted. This would turn the equipment into a type of high turnover consumable. Hermione needed to research runes and find a combination strong enough to be worth its price, but weak enough that it could be produced without requiring large amounts of time or specialists. Also, it should not be able to be repaired once damaged. Then there was Soizen, who would combine the two results, set up production lines, invest in advertising and contacts for sales. Naturally, the profits were divided and Soizen would retain 90% of the profits, leaving 5% each. After all, the idea came from Soizen and both Sylvia and Hermione understood that they only made contributions to speed up the process of creating the product. Besides, initially they only wanted to receive a few galleons for their efforts, but it was Soizen who convinced them that getting a percentage would be much more profitable for them in the long run. Perhaps he should have kept quiet and agreed to give them the galleons, but he knew that after seeing the profits, their friendship could be greatly affected. They simply did not understand the sales potential of these items and would thank Soizen in the future for changing their minds. Of course, Soizen made sure to sign some contracts to give them a legitimate guarantee, a contract that contained discrete clauses, such as that they could not transfer their rights to a third party. They were only hypothetical situations that the young witches found nothing wrong with, but it was still much more lax than the contract he had Hagrid sign at the beginning of their combined project. Why else would Dumbledore still be in the dark? Well, among other things, he told Hagrid that he wanted it to be a big surprise. Chapter 49, Love, Reason and Horns Soizen was eating in the great dining hall, letting her mind wander as she finished waking up. 
They didn't have any classes today and Snape was due back this afternoon, so he intended to talk to him. Why are you in such a good mood this morning? Asked Ginny, who was sitting in front of him as he buttered a piece of toast. Next to him, Luna was gazing with fascination at a bunch of grapes and the other members of the Gale Gold household were painting a scene of indescribable harmony. Because of Soizen's friendly attitude, the help he provided to all the first years, how he defended them from bullies and that there weren't too many people in his house, they all got along very well and became fast friends. The prefects in the other houses didn't do their duties as well and that earned Soizen their respect as well. Even a bit of hidden admiration. Also, the fact that the inevitable feud of Percy and Ron confronting Ginny for breaking family tradition finally happened, meant that Ginny will need to cling more than ever on the trustworthy people around her. The Weasley twins and Soizen acted as buffers for both sides. While Fred and George took it upon themselves to teach Percy and Ron a lesson for being insensitive loudmouths, it was Soizen who along with Luna comforted the tearful Ginny. He rarely argued this hard with anyone in his family and being blamed for the situation didn't make it any more bearable. In the end, Soizen even wrote to Mr. Weasley to explain what had happened and both Percy and Ron received howlers the next day. Only then did they start to behave themselves. As a result of the situation, a fine crack seemed to be realized in the relationship Ginny had with her two older brothers, while she became much closer to the twins, Luna and Soizen. An unexpected friendship born out of tragedy, one that even Soizen had not expected to establish. Oh, I remembered something very pleasant, Soizen answered her honestly. It was a detail he had missed until now. Given that he had to go to Beau's Batons after Christmas, he wouldn't have to put up with Lockhart's Valentine. In fact, she didn't pay much attention to last year's Valentine's Day because she was too young and preferred to spend the day doing something productive. He only remembered that the order for heart-shaped, rose-scented magic soap skyrocketed during those dates. And after reading Lily's letter this year, she felt a strong revulsion for Amortentia. How could something so dangerous not be strongly restricted? She had plans to leave a stern warning before she left, hanging in the common room so that her juniors would be very careful with that love potion. He would leave instructions on how he could check if a food was adulterated, how to counteract perfumes with traces of the potion, etc. In fact, why not create an antidote? Soizen's eyes lit up at the sudden inspiration. He could call it a filter of reason. He just needed it to act not only to eliminate those effects, but once ingested its properties would last for several days as an additional safety measure. That way, if someone were to give him Amortentia the day after drinking filter of reason, he would still be unaffected by its effects. Snape would no doubt gladly help him create such a potion for before he had to leave, and he could prepare a large cauldron of the same potion to be handed out preemptively to teachers, making sure he could administer it to those he suspected were being tampered with. Perhaps Soizen would earn bad looks from the young women in love by creating such a potion, but if they had to resort to something so fake that it only generates obsession and not true love, they clearly had a problem. What is it about? Asked the young Weasley girl intrigued. Well, I told you I'll have to go to Beau's Batons after Christmas. I understand that the wood nymphs there have a very nice song. The food at Hogwarts is good, but I think nourishing our spirits should also be important. Is that why you suggested we all have a hobby? Delphi asked from his side. Yes, Soizen suggested to each member of his house to pursue some kind of hobby. It could be painting, tending plants, composing music, cooking, knitting, reading, etc. Luna, for example, began writing short stories and Ginny demonstrated a knack for painting landscapes without using a shred of magic, just with brush and a palette of colors. She even learned to make her own colors by combining pigments in new ways. Hogwarts can put a lot of pressure with their education and fostering an additional talent that gives peace of mind was certainly a great idea. That Soizen would provide them with basic tools to get them started with their hobby was certainly motivating. What no one expected, not even Soizen, was that this would become one of the various traditions of House Gale Gold in the future. You can say that, Soizen laughed. Do you think you could bring me a blue-eyed Hoffurin horn when you return from Beau's Batons? Luna asked in her sleepy tone as she looked away from the grapes, I understand they only live near large concentrations of beautiful young girls, feeding on the eyelashes they drop. 
Their horns are transparent as crystal and shine like dew during the night of the new moon. How can I meet one, what do they look like and how can I get hold of their horn? Soizen didn't know if Luna's creature was one of the real ones recorded in the future or one of her creations, but if she had the time, she had no problem trying. Who knows, it could be fun and all. They like to spy on wood nymphs as they sunbathe in the morning. They look like yellow-skinned fairies with two little horns poking out of their shoulders and purple-blue wings. Just give them a spoonful of tangerine marmalade and they will happily shed their horns for you instantly, Luna explained generously without feeling the need to hide this important information. Anything else I should know? They like to move in groups of three, so you'll need three spoonfuls of tangerine marmalade if you want them to agree to shed their horns, as they are very social. I just want a set to make me some earrings. What properties do their horns have? Luna looked around carefully and crouched down while lowering the tone of her voice so that only Soizen could hear it. They clear the mind, increase strength passively over time and increase your affinity for some magics, but each pair of Hofjorn horns is different and only work if both from the same source are present. I see, I can't promise you anything Luna, but I'll try. The little witch smiled and reached into her pocket, pulling out a jar of homemade tangerine jam. Even accustomed to her unexpected turns, no one expected that. Take it, it's the least I can do for bothering you. You'll need it if you find them, and you can eat something delicious if you don't, said Luna as she held out the jar. Soizen took it unconsciously and from the temperature of the jar along with the faint aroma still lingering, he could be sure that the jam had been made recently. Almost certainly by the witch herself. Could it be that Luna really does have some prophetic gifts? Chapter 50, Let the Doo Doo Duel Begin Just as Soizen expected, Snape immediately took an interest in his idea of the filter of reason and they inadvertently entered into a deep academic exchange to quickly deduce what the approximate formula of the potion would be. Even shouting at each other with reddened faces about whether the water from the Lethe River should be used while cold or needed to be heated to maximize its effects. Students passing nearby were stunned to hear the shouting and with pale faces, they hurriedly fled the scene. The rumors began to spread like wildfire minutes later and Sinistra ran down to the dungeons when she heard them. By Merlin's knickers. She burst into Snape's office and looked at the two present who turned in her direction red-faced, snorting and with bloodshot eyes, what's going on here? He demanded to know. Sinistra had never seen Snape so. Excited? After learning that they were only discussing a countermeasure for Amortentia, Sinistra kept silent and sat in a corner, watching them without another word. She had a suspicion that with such a friendly exchange of words, they might get their wands out if they got too excited. As for what happened to Peter? Looking at Snape's excellent mood, Soizen needn't ask anything. A month later. Soizen emerged satisfied from the dungeons and examined the vial in his hand, where his filter of reason had been successfully distilled. The characteristic mark of the potion was that there were traces of three different colors in it and they all had a perfect geometric shape even in motion. He stopped when he noticed several students, who were huddled together excitedly as they talked amongst themselves, apparently about one of the new announcements that was on the student board. He patted the shoulders of one of them and asked what was going on. Lockhart is opening a dueling club. The Hufflepuff sophomore said excitedly. Don't tell me. Soizen felt a smile grow on his face. It could be decent practice for Sylvia and Hermione. And maybe he could show off a little. Or should he go unnoticed? Honestly, after his training with Nagini over the summer, he doubted any wizard from fourth year down would be his opponent. The two witches' training had been interesting. Sylvia had adapted very well and could move with relative familiarity in a duel. She focused more on distracting and defending than attacking, but it was working for her at the moment. Hermione, on the other hand, had too rigid a demeanor at the start and Soizen had to, as she said, play dirty to get her to understand that her opponent would not follow the rules if she didn't want to. He faced the two witches seventy times and they had yet to add a victory to their side. Sylvia and Hermione also practiced against each other and Sylvia won most of them, which awakened Hermione's competitive spirit in a positive way. And just as she expected, the duo went looking for him as soon as he finished eating the last bite and left the great dining hall. Are you going to join the dueling club? Hermione asked him. 
No, I'm going to Bose Baton soon, remember? I'm not going to join something only to leave a few weeks later, that would be rude. Will you be going to the demonstration this afternoon? Sylvia was feeling a little excited. Sure, Soizen nodded. Miss Potter's meeting with Malfoy? No way. When Soizen and company later joined the dueling demonstration in which Snape and Lockhart were present, everything happened just as expected. Lockhart was thrilled to be the center of attention and requested a figurative duel of nothing with the potion's master, who ended up giving him a one-sided beating. Saving his face, he explained that this was how they were not supposed to act and asked Ron and Potter to come up on stage. I believe Mr. Weasley's wand is not in optimal condition and could pose a danger to others. Or to himself, for that matter. Yes, during one of Ron's races to avoid being late for class, even though he knew the paths from last year, he tripped while descending the grand staircase and ended up falling on his own wand. A bit of magic tape and presto, we have a wand that fails two times out of three and emits a rotten egg smell. I think Mr. Potter could do with a more competent opponent. Soizen, perhaps. Snape turned and pointed at him, signaling for him to come up immediately. Wait, shouldn't he have chosen Malfoy? It only took Soizen to see the sneer Snape made discreetly. That was his revenge because he was right and the Lethe River water had to be used cold. Looks like he'll have to ask the twins to give Snape a portion of extra large dung bombs when he leaves for France. All right, Soizen narrowed his eyes, stepped forward and up onto the dueling platform. Well, an excellent choice, Severus. Lockhart said, not missing an opportunity to intervene, you saw the protocol. Raise your wand's end. Where is your wand, Mr. Gale Gold? Lockhart immediately felt the looks around him become strange. Even the first years know by now that Soizen, who established Hogwarts' fifth house last year, is an out-of-the-ordinary student who never uses a wand and does not possess one of his own. Moreover, he performs better than his peers who do have one. Everyone knows this, but no one is willing to admit it out loud. Since Lockhart didn't seem to realize his mistake, Soizen merely raised his right index finger on the outside of his robes, as if pointing to the sky. Reverence, Snape said dryly in the audience, growing impatient. Huh. Lockhart still didn't know what happened, but since everyone didn't show any surprise he decided to go with the flow. Take a bow, all right, and now turn around and ten paces away. Potter and Soizen followed protocol and after counting the tenth step, they turned around. Ready? Lockhart alternated between the two duelists, on the count of three, you may begin and remember, we only want to disarm the opponent. We don't want any accidents. One, two. Three. Chapter 51, Roast Suckling Pig. As Lockhart counted down, Potter assumes a very ridiculous dueling stance that is more reminiscent of a pose a bodybuilder would strike shirtless than one a wizard would actually use. Soizen for his part, looks at his opponent while holding his hands clasped in front of his chest, waiting with a bored look for the duel to begin. Now that I think about it, in the Malfoy vs. Potter duel, they used the Restless Feet spell and the Tickle spell before moving on to the snake, but it's as if in both cases they used Expel in varying degrees of strength. Is that considered a major mistake in the movie? Soizen mentally reflected. 3. Lockhart shouted. Rick de Sempra. Harry shouted, and after two seconds, the process of the wand tip lighting up and the spell rushing towards Soizen, who, with a gesture similar to swatting a fly away, deflected it towards the ceiling. He did not even move from the spot. Soizen raised his hand and slowly pointing a finger at Potter, which was a clear friendly warning to defend himself in everyone's eyes, began to expel a large amount of oil. Potter stared blankly at the substance that came over him like a wave and landed on him, leaving him soaked and slippery. EXP. Harry felt quite embarrassed and annoyed, so he tried to use the disarming spell on instinct. But before he could finish he saw golden eyes, another spell hit him and stuck his tongue to the roof of his mouth, leaving him unable to pronounce any spell clearly. And even before he realized what was happening, several ropes bound him and dangled horizontally as he levitated inches above the ground. An apple embedded itself in his mouth and a flaming hoop emerged beneath him. Then, he began to spin around on himself, like someone who wants to roast a suckling pig over a slow fire. 
This may seem long, but it happened in an instant and when the spectators registered what had happened, Soizen had Potter's wand floating in the palm of his hand as he made an expression that everyone could identify as a restrained yawn. As for the floating wand, well, Soizen doesn't want the twin wands to explode in his hands, so he keeps it weightless. Suddenly there was enthusiastic applause, especially to those first years in the same house as Soizen, who began to look around proudly. That was their delegate. He cheated. Ron suddenly shouted as he came out of his stupefied state, it wasn't his turn and he hit again. That's how it works, Snape cut him off sharply as he held back what looked like laughter in his expression at the sight of Potter's state, both sides face off in a competition of knowledge, skill and reflexes. Only the best remains. In fact, here my colleague Severus is absolutely right Lockhart jumped onto the stage and after seeing that everyone was looking at him, he smiled and explained, Mr. Galegold's performance has been excellent and he was under no obligation to wait for Harry to perform. First, he obstructed the movements using oil. Then, he skillfully avoided the counterattack and ended up rendering his opponent helpless without hurting him. He deserves twenty points. The other students looked at Harry, who was still spinning for some reason, and broke out in a cold sweat. True, he's not hurt in the least physically. But this humiliation. No one wants to go through something similar. Besides, it seems that Soizen did it all very casually. And again, everyone remembered that he wasn't even using a wand. Oh, it looks like Malfoy is immensely amused. Hermione and Sylvia are red in the face trying to contain their laughter at Potter's poor performance, which is normal, who just stands there watching a wave of oil just cover him. A simple protego would have saved him. So, is the match considered over? Soizen asked, and when he saw Snape nod, he extinguished the fire, faded the ropes, and after evaporating the oil, lowered Potter to the ground, after which he returned his wand to him. He didn't take the apple from his mouth, he left it for him as a consolation prize. I'd say it was a good try, but to lie so blatantly would be completely disrespectful, he nodded to the astonished boy, who was escorted downstairs by Lockhart trying to cheer him up and looked around, anyone else want to go upstairs? I don't want to have to go downstairs and then have someone challenge me. I'll do it. Ron tried to go up, but the Griffinders stopped him. If he had a proper wand they would have let him, but his current state. They don't want another humiliation. Not that there was really a lack of people willing to try, but no one knew if Soizen's generosity was just for Potter or if everyone would go through a similar experience. Well, I'll settle for being undefeated then, Soizen nodded satisfied that no one would bother him later to get a duel, and remember that great saying when you go up to duel, constant vigilance. Thank you. He climbed down from the dueling platform and walked out in full force, only when no one saw him, the room became very animated and excited. That boy has talent, Lockhart muttered to himself, after seeing how well he performed and the attention he received. Sylvia and Hermione didn't follow him, they wanted to try to practice a bit with other people. Snape was in such a good mood that he even advised some students who were not from Slytherin House while supervising the duels afterwards, which made people suspicious if he was an imposter. As for Harry. He stood there, red-faced until he couldn't stand the looks of pity and derision from the others and left with Ron since no one dared to be the red-haired wizard's opponent with a wand that acted like a ticking time bomb. That should have cut off any chance of Dumbledore trying to set up the Golden Trio again, Soizen thought with satisfaction. Not that he had planned to, but he didn't pass up the opportunity. It would also further his position in the minds of his juniors and they would not be so easily swayed by any excuse Dumbledore might use, especially with the unity he had managed to establish in his house. I only have two weeks left before I have to leave for Bosbatons. Do I have anything left to do? I reflect. Oh, I know what else I can do. I'll leave you all another gift besides the filter of reason, he smiled at the idea that came to his mind. Heh <laughs> heh, someone's going to have a headache. Chapter 52, Opulent Christmas Soizen went home to spend Christmas with his family when the time came and left behind one last gift for his house along with stocks of Filter of Reason, a book that only Gale Gold members can access. The title? A Clemency. It always struck him as odd that a clemency was something so complicated to find and learn, 
but when one thinks that pure-blood wizards and the like surely have some accomplishments in legermancy, it all becomes clear. Would the dominance give the subjugated a tool to protect themselves from them? Next, popularize a clemency in the house. It only requires a small magical oath to prevent information leaks and other minor inconveniences. If Dumbledore then wants to use legimency on Gale Gold members, it won't be so easy. And why not give that information to everyone? Simple, Soizen had no problem helping his house, but if others want to learn, he won't deny, but they will have to pay him for it. As for worrying about the ministry's regulation of this knowledge. Well, that was what the oath he put in place was for. Christmas was livelier with Nagini in the family. Soizen got her mother some Chinese biting cabbage seeds, Nagini got some books about the detective writers she liked that she couldn't read when she was in the jungle. In Hermione's case, he sent her a book about house elves and a letter where he spoke in praise of those who worked in the Hogwarts kitchens. That's right, he would take advantage of her absence to avoid Hermione's protest phase for house elf rights. May she go wild while she's gone and be calm when she returns. He sent Sylvia some unusual woods so she could carve them to her liking along with a letter warning her of Hermione's possible actions regarding house elves, so she could psyche herself up in time. Would he grudge her for making him endure this phase of Hermione's life without him? Nah. He sent Hagrid a large cloak made of mink fur, extra large so that the half-giant could perform his duties in cold weather. Pomona got some sacks of dragon dung for the plants, McGonagall a set of enchanted needles with Quidditch motifs, and Flittick got a teapot that can heat and cool tea at will. Snape was sent a voucher to have a new set of robes made, as the potions master had his current one somewhat damaged due to accidents constantly occurring in his lessons. Dumbledore received a pair of thick woolen socks in the motif of the ice cream king from Adventure Time. Just to throw him off the scent. It's not like I'm hinting at anything, not at all. Some French and Bulgarian recipe books for the Hogwarts kitchen. He even sent a set of cat care books to Argus Filch along with some cans of gourmet cat food for Norris. He also sent some gifts for Luna, Ginny, the Weasley twins, Neville, etc. That were primarily some knickknacks or useful tools for their newfound hobbies. He didn't send anything to the likes of Potter and Ron. But, he did send a gift to Olympe Maxime, the headmistress of Beaux Batons and Chloe, his future charms teacher. It's always nice to have a little something for the person in charge who is going to be looking after you in a foreign country for practically half a year. As for the gift, it was some sets of magical soaps that she had specially prepared. Unexpectedly, the next morning she received a couple of letters from France where the headmistress thanked her for the gift and commented that she hoped she had a pleasant exchange while Chloe also thanked her, but asked if she had some strawberry or currant scented versions. Well, it looks like they took the bait. How was she going to continue her business without the consent of the people in charge of the place? He had month's supply of magic soap with him along with his other products. Two days later, Nagini took him to Diagon Alley and presented him with the premises cleaned, disinfected, with no parasites or beasts behind the walls. All looking as if it was newly built. After an in-depth chat in which Nagini revealed her newly gained administrative and business knowledge, they established a rough idea of their inventory for sale. Dot. Buena Vista Potion Magical Soaps Filter of Reason Crazy Rubik's Cube They would stock a little bit of everything and seeing how sales flowed, they would make adjustments as they saw fit. The filter of reason therefore, was to be hidden until two weeks before Valentine's Day and then aggressively promoted with a catchy slogan. Death to Amortentia. It will be a hit. Did the rats find anything about the werewolf? Soizen asked Nagini when they were alone in the store, after dismissing those who transported the new furniture and used a levitation spell to move them to their designated place. If there was no change, Lupin would be teaching at Hogwarts next year and the only time he would be able to attempt a move would be during the summer, which might already be too late. Who says move, he means turn Snape loose on the place and let him do his thing. There have been sightings, but he seems to be quite practiced at hiding and doesn't stay in one place for too long, Nagini shook her head as she moved a bookshelf with her wand. Frankly, I see little chance of us getting reliable or useful information before next school year if we employ these people. I see, although it wasn't ideal, 
maybe he could think of something during his teaching at Hogwarts. Remember there was that one night he forgot to take his Matalobo's potion and went mad, then eliminating him in self-defense wouldn't be outrageous, would it? But. Lycanthropy was a contagious thing in that form and Soizen might be getting a lot better at magical fighting, but he didn't have the confidence to take on a rampaging bloody werewolf. It would be unacceptable for him to be infected. Maybe I should try setting up a trap. Or ask Snape to add some slow-acting poison, the kind that only kills a year later with no possible salvation. Do you want me to take action personally? Nagini asked him suddenly. Soizen turned around with a surprised expression and stood still looking at her for a few seconds, before slowly shaking his head and continuing to move the furniture. It's not worth it. Soizen might be thinking of avenging Lily, but he wouldn't risk his people for it. He could wait and adopt new plans or approaches, but not revive the dead. He still had time. You can read my work first and more by joining my Patreon. Link in my profile. Chapter 53 Chloe can. By the time Soizen needed to resume her magical studies after the holidays were over, the store in Diagon Alley was up and running under the name Golden Wind after its successful opening. Nagini would be in charge of the store during her absence and would start looking for or building the greenhouses they would need once Pomona was finished with the study of the plants she was given. It was also explained to him the possibility of starting to produce a muggle version of butterbeer and they needed to prepare for that. Although he was somewhat excited about the exchange, he couldn't help but think that the organization was not very professional. Why was that? According to what he was told, he would travel via flu to the nearest town to Bozbaton's palace, after which Chloe would pick him up to take him to the magic school. Well, you'd think that would be logical. But. No one told him the full plan. That he would first have to go to Hogwarts a day before to get the artifact from Dumbledore to solve the language problem. After which he needed to go to the British Ministry to sign some papers, from where he would travel with Red Flu to the French Ministry and finally arrive at the assigned village. No doubt he was not informed correctly on purpose. Hogwarts is clearly connected to the Flu network and he doesn't believe that Bozbatons doesn't have at least one entrance to the Flu network, is it necessary to go round in circles? Can't we just be honest and straightforward? Bloody magical politicians and their magical politics about traveling to other places while burning in spontaneous green fire. They take all the fun out of it. At the very least, he was accompanied through all the hustle and bustle. He thought Sinistra would accompany him once he left Hogwarts, but Professor Flittick decided to impose this duty on himself and be able to see his friend if only for a little while. So two hours later, they finally made it out of the green flames at their destination. It turns out that when they ask you to let them examine your wand and you say you don't use one at the ministries, they think you're lying and insist on searching you. Again, what the heck do they examine wands for? I mean, they could give you one to make the pass and keep three more in your belt. It wasn't all bad though, Soizen listened as everyone spoke in French and after activating Dumbledore's artifact in the form of a white leather bracelet. He managed to understand everything they were saying and held a smooth conversation as he ordered a drink while they waited for the Bozbaton's charms teacher to arrive. Flittick. A lady in her forties, dressed in a cream-colored suit with her hair pulled back in a ponytail, approached their table. Chloe. Long time no see, Flittick returned the greeting and after exchanging a few pleasantries, quickly introduced the third member of the table, this is Soizen Galegold, the student I spoke of in my letters and the one who will be doing the school exchange. Soizen, this is Miss Chloe Can, a talented witch and the Bozbaton's charms teacher who will be in your charge during this period of time. A pleasure to meet you, Professor Chloe, Soizen greeted. Oh, so you're the one who thought of those interesting magic formulas, I'm already looking forward to getting to it later. And again, thanks for the Christmas present, Chloe said with a smile. I'm glad she liked it. Now, we should be leaving shortly. Although the students don't return until tomorrow, I think it's necessary to use as much time as possible to help you familiarize yourself with the new place so that you can integrate quickly, said Chloe as she turned and gave an apologetic look. We can try to organize a colleague's meeting during the summer, it's been years since we've all met at the same time. Of course. Flittick nodded sympathetically, it would certainly be rewarding and I'm sure we'd have a lot to catch up on. 
I'll be in charge of making my famous cupcakes by then. I'm already looking forward to it. Even with the supposed rush, they were still talking for 15 minutes before actually saying goodbye and leaving. Soizen had to maintain a polite smile throughout, being patient without interrupting the conversation. He sighed inwardly, since he couldn't bring Rada with him or he would have taken her out to play while he waited. Apparently Bozbatons doesn't agree to have a pet Scarbato in their palace, too many shiny things that can disappear. So Soizen had no choice but to leave Rada with An Aninta. Sorry for the delay, although we usually exchange letters by owl, being able to talk face to face is something completely different. Commented Chloe as she guided Soizen through the alleys, luckily, I was able to park nearby and it won't take us too long to get to Bozbatons. Here we are. An inconspicuous but wide square revealed itself to Soizen's eyes, who, looking left and right, found nothing to hop on. Chloe reached out and retracted her hand and opened a door in the air in front of her. Come on, get in quickly, the charms teacher urged. When Soizen entered, she identified the interior as that of a horse-drawn carriage. Disappointment charms? He asked even though he knew the answer. This is the carriage used by Bozbaton staff to stock up on provisions from time to time. It has a convenient space spread out undetectably in the trunk, but for some reason, they never thought to use another one in the passenger area, Chloe explained as she climbed in as well and closed the door behind her. They weren't too cramped, there was enough room for four people to sit comfortably, just a little smaller than the compartments in the carriages on the train to Hogwarts. Chloe tapped the roof twice and the carriage jolted, giving away its setting. Let's do a quick run-through of the general idea for this exchange and if you have any questions, wait until I'm done to raise them, shall we? Yes, teacher. Charming, I think we'll get along just fine, nodded Chloe as she looked at her hair that she let grow out over the holidays, however, remind me later to help you get a haircut. At Bose Batons we pay attention to grooming and unless you want to wear a bun during lessons to keep your hair long, it's best to go neatly trimmed. I'll fix it right away. Soizen had no objection and with a thought, the hair was shortened, darkened and moved, adopting a neat, sleek hairstyle. Metamorphomagus. Funny, I haven't met one in a while, Chloe looked at the new hairstyle and nodded in satisfaction, that's it, keep it that way or similar for the rest of the school year. Okay, here's the plan, once you leave your things in your assigned dormitory, I will show you Bozbatons to orient you and at the same time, every time we visit a subject classroom. You will be tested in that subject to get an idea of the level you are at, as we need to know that to organize everything to give you your timetable tomorrow. Twice a week I will join you in the afternoon to help you with any doubts or problems you may have, be it in school, studies, or personal projects. I will also accompany you outside every month to show you the most famous and interesting places, I assure you it is not something you want to miss. After discussing it with the director, we agree that you can do small business at school, but you must present a list of products that must be approved by us. Chapter 54, Bose Batons Through the carriage window, Soizen could see a beautiful castle surrounded by gardens almost as incredible as the one at home and some animated magical fountains. The difference in style between this place and Hogwarts is too brutal. Our school has quite a cultural variety as it accepts students from France, Spain, Portugal, Luxembourg, Belgium and the Netherlands. Although I don't think it's necessary to mention it, we have strong sanctions against all kinds of discriminations and I hope I won't hear anything about it from you, said Chloe with a warning look. Soizen shrugged, he didn't feel disgusted by a person's origin, it is usually more usual to judge him by his attitude towards himself and his own. By the way, although most of the school is available to students, you must remember that you can't access the stables, the teacher's tower or the kitchens. Is it a problem if I walk around the school? Soizen asked. And why would you do that? Exercise, I like to keep fit, he commented. Her mothers were quite worried that she wouldn't get used to the foreign food or get carried away by the new atmosphere, so they were quite clear that she couldn't leave her healthy habits behind. I see. In fact, you seem to be rather fitter compared to other students your age, Chloe nodded in understanding, but no, you can't leave Bozbatons for exercise. You can do it in the large gardens we have or go to the student gym, so maybe you can form some friendships along the way. Do you have a student gym? 
Soizen looked away from the window and looked at Chloe in surprise. Why didn't Hogwarts have something similar? There are plenty of empty places that could be used for that. And those British wizards are heavy on their arses with the food they swallow. Of course. Our students like to stay at their ideal weight, so we have some facilities to burn fat at a slow and steady pace. Suddenly, Soizen wasn't quite sure if the so-called gym would meet his expectations. No matter, he could transform some weights if necessary. The carriage landed and it only took ten minutes from the village, whatever that was. Welcome to Beau's Batons. Chloe said theatrically before letting out a giggle and motioning for him to follow them, our headmistress wanted to greet you, but I'm afraid if she hasn't arrived yet it means she's too busy. Follow me and we'll start the tour right away. Where exactly will I be staying? Soizen asked as they walked through the garden and smelled the scent of grass and flowers, I mean, I'm not classified in any of the three houses you have here. Don't worry, it's not the first time we've done a school exchange and we have room set up for it. They just needed a bit of dusting making them presentable after so many years, modernizing the furniture a bit, etc. I think you would like its location, it's near the greenhouse where the wood nymphs sleep. Oh. Soizen's gaze immediately became interested, I understand that the wood nymphs sing during the students' meals, and they are quite pleasant to listen to. In fact, their singing not only helps to get rid of sleep and fatigue, but leaves the mind in a clear and receptive state. You must remember that when nymphs start singing during the meal, it is forbidden to speak, not even a whisper. If they are offended, it can take up to a week for them to sing again in the worst case. I take note of that, Soizen assured. He didn't plan to upset the whole school just because he couldn't hold his tongue for a few minutes. Besides, they really like music and singing. As long as you have confidence in your voice or musical talent, you can go and visit them in the greenhouse to listen to you. If they like you, you may be in for a surprise. What if they don't like you? It's more fun. Chloe laughed as if she remembered something. If you just waste their time or they dislike your piece, they'll spit out a sap that makes all your skin turn green for three days, implying to anyone who sees you your failure. And there's no known cure. I see, sounds interesting. By the way, you can only try again once your skin returns to normal. Otherwise, if they spit sap on you again while you're still green, you can become temporarily deaf or mute for two weeks. Soizen followed Chloe through the halls of Beau's batons and looked around intrigued. The floors were made of perfectly level marble so polished it looked like a mirror, the paintings returned the greeting politely or gave little nuggets of wisdom. The windows let in a generous amount of light that warmly illuminated the place and at no point did they get lost on their way. Hogwarts definitely needs updating, Soizen thought at the stark contrast. Hogwarts hardly changed in a thousand years and it's clear that it has parts that clearly need updating, repairing or replacing. But until he reaches the fifth year, he will not be able to claim the castle as his own, assume full authority or make substantial changes. Frankly, the supposed four founders did a pretty shoddy job with everything Syrah gave them. The only salvageable parts were a few places like the Room of Requirement. This will be your room, said Chloe, snapping him out of his thoughts. Before Soizen stood the stone statue of a water nymph. The statue looked at Soizen with a charming smile and pushed aside her long hair, revealing the door to her quarters. This place is very suitable, Soizen said, pleased with what he saw. A large oak bed, a couple of well-kept closets, a private bathroom with shower included, a desk with an assortment of ink and blank scrolls ready to be used, a corner for the pet or owl, a window to ventilate the place and let in enough natural light. All that would be missing would be a small kitchen with a pantry to make it look like a bachelor pad. Besides, even if the place wasn't decent, he could always go and sleep in the room he has in his own trunk. In fact maybe he would do them sometime, for a bit of a change of scenery. I'm glad you like it, leave what you must leave here and we'll continue the tour of the school. We'll go through the wood nymph's greenhouse and then take our first test in the charms classroom, which happens to be the closest one. Chloe seemed calm, but she was a little excited inside. From the letters she exchanged with Flittick, it seems that Soizen was monstrously talented in potions and transformations, but still not bad at charms and the other subjects. If she wasn't so busy later due to preparations for lessons starting tomorrow, 
once she finished the tour she would ask him to bring up the project she needed his help on. It sounded like such an interesting idea. Chapter 55, Wooden Nymphs The Wood Nymphs greenhouse was a bit different than Soizen expected. He had a preconceived idea that it would be similar to the greenhouses at Hogwarts, but even before he stepped inside, he knew he was wrong. The exterior showed that it was built with a mixture of darkened wooden beams, stone that conveyed history, and light windows with stained glass that had motifs of plants or nymphs dancing in different poses. The nymphs live here all year round and don't even need to go out for food, as the school makes sure they are always well supplied and all their needs are met, Chloe explained as she pushed open the doors and they entered. It was warmer inside than she had expected, although it didn't quite reach tropical weather. You could see at a glance that it had also been expanded and was the size of a medium-sized hill, with the green grass acting as a carpet, small streams with water flowing with a cheerful stream, trees of all kinds, some with fruit and some in bloom. Remember to follow this stone path if you ever come to try to play or sing for them. Sometimes wood nymphs take a nap on the grass and because of their colors they are hard to distinguish, Chloe added as she stopped him when he wanted to get closer to examine the trees in more detail, we don't want to step on any by accident. Yes, teacher, Soizen nodded, she really didn't want to accidentally hurt anyone. They followed the stone path and as they went along, Soizen began to see the recognizable wood nymphs. Their skin was a vivid green color identical to grass but with a more bark-like texture that gave them a touch of elegance, they had pupil-less eyes of a soft orange that reflected what they looked at like tiny mirrors. The unfurled wings would be reminiscent of a dragonfly's and although most of them looked identical, you could see that each of them had a totally different tribal body paint. Teacher, are there no male wood nymphs? Soizen asked, somewhat puzzled. Although they all had female figures and wore no clothes or leaves, the features were sufficiently softened so as not to make anyone seeing them for the first time uncomfortable. Wood nymphs are only born female, Chloe had heard that question for many years, they are born from a mother tree through nutrient harvesting and environmental magic. She pointed to a tiny white bark tree with blue leaves in the distance, from which hung three green fruits, I must warn you that only the headmistress is authorized to go near there, never try to go near the mother tree. They only walked a few short minutes before the stone path ended and they reached what looked like a circular gazebo. The surrounding area was densely packed with nymphs who watched them curiously, but none entered the stone area. Won't they try to get closer? Soizen could see that they could hardly contain themselves. It is tradition, Chloe explained with a smile as she waved to the nymphs around her and they waved back enthusiastically, we do not leave the stone path and this is the place where the peace must be performed. In return, they will judge but they will not invade the space of the one who comes to try to impress them. Since we have come, we need to play something or we will come out green, Chloe raised her wand and muttering a spell that Soizen heard and identified as the concert spell. Began to wave the wand like a master musician and began to play the flutes, play the violins and the piano to play pleasant music. It was not complex or long, but it enhanced the mood. The nymphs froze as they began to listen to the music with attention and interested or serious expressions, after which they began to sway to the music. They ended up clapping, laughing and whistling once Chloe's music was silenced. Chloe gave them a small bow and turned to look at Soizen. This is one of their favorite pieces and as you can see, they didn't leave me green, she pointed to her uncolored skin, they usually only listen to it once a year, as it's the one we use to appease them when we bring in the freshmen. You know what they say, listening too many times to the same music makes it lose its magic. How smart are wood nymphs? Soizen asked while also clapping politely. Oh, they understand everything we say as if they had the mind of a twelve-year-old girl, but they can't answer us. They only part their lips to eat or sing, he pushed Soizen to the stone path and they left the greenhouse while the nymphs followed them and dismissed them at the entrance with gestures. It's been a very stimulating visit, said Soizen remembering the interior that seemed like a world of its own, we don't have anything like it at Hogwarts. The most remotely similar is the Forbidden Forest, but it has a number of magical beasts that are too unpleasant or dangerous. Naturally, Chloe puffed out her chest with pride, we are one of only three schools in the world to have such a relationship with a magical beast. Surprising, Soizen didn't ask what other schools were, as that might imply she was making comparisons and wouldn't be very nice to hear. 
Let's go next to the charms classroom to test you, Chloe hurried him on, wanting to see how close to the truth Flitik's praise was. Soizen shrugged and followed her, though personally he would have liked to stay a little longer in the wood nymph greenhouse. It reminded him of House Commander had various ecosystems in his suitcase. Although he didn't have the need to have something similar, learning a little about it couldn't hurt. The charms classroom was unexpectedly similar to Flitik's, almost an exact copy except for the stacked books where the half-blood professor went upstairs to give lessons. When Chloe saw the obvious question in Soizen's expression, she explained that on one of the few visits she had made to Hogwarts school, she had been enchanted by the simplicity and clean layout of that classroom and recreated it at Bosbatons. Soizen's test began and Chloe asked her to do some basic incantations to test her basics. She then went on to name different incantations with increasing difficulty and year taught. Levitation enchantment, amplifying enchantment, anti-opening enchantments, enchantment to create water, stun enchantment, protection enchantment, red spark enchantments, placement enchantment, etc. Chloe went from nodding to smiling as Soizen met her expectations, before breaking into a sweat while maintaining a stiff smile. She gave thanks that the transfer student took her request seriously and would not examine her closely as she cast the incantations. I thought Flitik would send me a promising student, but this. I mentally reflect, it's like asking for some coal for warmth in winter and having them cast dragon's breath at point-blank range in response. Fortunately, there are still things I can teach her, but I have to tell the headmistress the situation later. Professor. Soizen sensed there was something wrong with Chloe when she stopped telling him to cast spells. She was able to cast all but a few that could only be learned by the end of fourth year that she hadn't had time to delve into. Your performance should be enough to pass the test, right? You have an excellent level of charms, don't worry, now I have a precise idea of where to start. Let's get to know the rest of the teachers for the subjects you should be tested in, the sooner we finish, the better for everyone. Soizen sighed in relief and followed her. At the end of the day, he returned to his new dormitory and collapsed on the bed. He passed all the tests and tomorrow morning he would be provided with his schedule, depending on which subject he needed to learn with which year. Meanwhile, in Headmistress Maxime's office. Principal, I think we have a bit of a problem. Chloe and the other teachers looked at the semi-giant headmistress nervously. Chapter 56, Is There Any Error? The Bosbaton students returned to school once the holidays were over and were greeted with a surprise that had been kept hidden from everyone. They had an exchange student. This piqued the interest of many, as these things are usually done during the beginning of the school year and not when they are halfway through. He was introduced during the welcome banquet and their beloved principal provided some details to satiate their appetites for gossip. Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valrisalis Male, second-year Hogwarts student. Single. Unaffiliated with any of the three Bosbatons houses. Would be allowed to have a small store to subsidize his expenses during his stay. His products have been reviewed and approved by the headmistress herself, giving some examples as a free promotion in thanks for Soizen's Christmas gift. After finishing the banquet, Soizen had the feeling that he became the newly arrived animal from the zoo. All the female students were looking at him intently and he had to try to carry on multiple conversations while keeping his manners. Why don't you have a wand? Where are you sleeping? What kind of girl do you like? When do you open your store? What conditioner do you use for your hair? By the time she managed to placate and run away thanks to a distraction, she realized that it wasn't that the school only had a majority of female students, rather there were almost no boys. Soizen was looking around and counted on the fingers of one hand the number of male students, all of whom seemed to be doing their best not to stand out. And he didn't even use all the fingers on his hand. There you are, Soizen, Chloe approached him with a teasing smile, I saw that you were being very popular and I didn't want to bother you while socializing, now that you're free, here, this is your study schedule. Thank you, teacher, Soizen nodded and examined the timetable she took from Chloe's hand, raising an eyebrow when she saw some inconsistencies, are there any mistakes? No, these are your lessons based on your performance, Chloe assured her. Transformations, fourth year timetable. Potions, fifth year timetable. Charms, fourth year schedule. Flying. Herbology. 
But it's not possible, Soizen wasn't criticizing the level of teaching he was assigned, since almost everyone seemed to agree with his own opinion, teacher, several lessons happened simultaneously in two different places. I can't split myself in two. Don't worry, we thought of everything, Chloe reached out and handed him a pendant, do you know what this is? A spinning time. Soizen was genuinely and completely dumbfounded as he felt the artifact in his hand, aren't they supposed to be highly regulated? Exactly, Chloe nodded and explained the reason he was given one, we could put you in some lower year classes, but that would leave you with half the time with nothing else to learn. So after discussing for a long time in the evening, a consensus was reached that you would be loaned this time turner until you leave school. Normally we will try to find some alternative, but the results of your tests were strong enough. And the fact that you will manage to do everything without a wand was even more spectacular, the headmistress almost didn't believe them when they presented her with the report. How exactly does it work? I don't want to make a mistake when it comes to timing, although Soizen remembered a bit of what they explained in the book when Hermione received one, it was better to ask for precise instructions and hear the precautions firsthand. Chloe explained how it worked, what to avoid doing and reminded him that the time limit of this time turner was only three hours due to its age. He also could not share with anyone its existence, he was not to lose it, etc. Soizen listened seriously and regretted a little not being able to disassemble the time turner to study the mechanism of time magic. But it's not like he was really losing anything either, he had already obtained something that would allow him to have three additional hours of study every day. Well, that's all you need to keep in mind, said Chloe, remember to find me today when you finish your lessons so I can start helping you with that project of yours. Now go on, your transformations class is about to start. Even if you can't earn points, it's better not to make a bad impression on the first day. Soizen said goodbye and took a few seconds to get his bearings, remembering where he took the transformations test yesterday. Thanks to the directions of a couple of paintings along the way, he made it in time by the skin of his teeth. I'm sorry, I still couldn't memorize all the places, although he wasn't late, he felt the urge to put on a buffer when he noticed that everyone else was present and seemed to be waiting for him. He's not late, Mr. Galegold, the transformations teacher, Madame Amelie nodded and waved him through as the students looked at each other, confused by the situation. Wasn't he a second-year student? This was the lesson for fourth years. Amelie was quick to remove the doubt from their minds. Our exchange student was tested upon arrival and has been assigned lessons that are deemed most appropriate to squeeze out his potential. She explained as she swept her gaze around the classroom and pointed to an empty seat at one of the double desks, Mr. Galegold, please take a seat and we can begin today's lesson. Feel free to raise your hand at the end of the lesson if you have any questions. Yes, teacher, Soizen saw the empty seat and walked over to it, sitting down and greeting the student next to her by nodding her head as she turned her attention back to Amelie. Strange, he had a feeling he had seen the girl sitting next to him somewhere and didn't remember where it was, how was that possible if he didn't know anyone from Beaux Batons? What Soizen didn't know was that her casual and polite gesture, made everyone present speechless. That was because the person who had no one by his side, was known to have a powerful charm thanks to the quarter vela blood that ran through his veins, Fleur Delacour. But the exchange student seemed immune to Vila charm. If the students and teacher Amelie were open-mouthed, Fleur was in complete shock at the indifference Soizen showed to her. Chapter 57, Not Charming Enough When Soizen heard between whispers that the person next to him was Fleur Delacour herself, his first thought was that they were deliberately trying to trick him to play a prank on him as a newcomer. Isn't Fleur supposed to have Vila blood and be very charming? Isn't she supposed to be a fatal attraction, especially to those of the opposite gender, to the point of reducing them to drooling idiots? No matter how Soizen thought about what he had just seen, she seemed like an ordinary girl like any other in the classroom. She had nothing special from his point of view other than perhaps, being somewhat too proud, as her nose was much more turned up than he would see on anyone else. Maybe her charm didn't mature for another year or two. Yes, it sure was that. But it wasn't the first time reality had deviated from what he knew from his memories, so he quickly lost interest in Fleur and waited for the lesson to begin eagerly. She was also not a character that would leave much of an impression on him other than participating in the Triwizard Tournament and later marrying Charlie Weasley. 
using her as a model to promote his products. No way. Leaving aside whether she was willing to work for someone younger than herself, the Vila charm is only effective in person, so it wasn't functional in billboards or newspaper ads. Given this, it was better to hire someone who better fit the image Soizen wanted to convey. When Amelie saw that Soizen was not reduced to a slimy idiot by being near Fleur, she pushed her astonishment down in coughing a few times to shake the rest of the students out of their stupor, began the lesson she had prepared for today. They didn't start studying any new transformations, he always used the first day after returning from the holidays to go over what had already been taught so that the students could dive back into their lessons, catching up on practice. Soizen performed without a problem and proved she had the level to be in the fourth-year lessons with the others, but was somewhat uncomfortable with the gaze she felt continually on her side and occasionally from different directions. By the time the bell rang announcing the end of the lesson, the students left the classroom and Soizen stayed behind to talk to Amelie. Yes, Mr. Gale Gold. Professor Amelie, I know there are few male students in the school, but everyone's behavior at the moment is too anomalous. Is it because I don't use any wands or is there something I'm missing that I should know about? Soizen had to pretend not to know Fleur's background before asking, as it would have been very strange if she didn't want to know more after what happened. Before answering that question, tell me, did you feel any different after taking a seat? Amelie wanted to confirm that the exchange student was indeed immune to the Vila charm. Should I feel anything? Soizen put on an expression of utter incomprehension and turned to look at where he was sitting just a few seconds ago, did the seats include some heating charm or something that I didn't feel? No, don't worry, Soizen's answer really confirmed his suspicions, you see, the thing is. He explained Fleur's ancestry and its effects on others. Soizen fell silent and looked at Amelie steadily. Are you sure there's no mistake? She really looks like an ordinary child like any other. Amelie grimaced when she heard Soizen's statement, she forgot for a moment that the student in front of her was too young and had not yet discovered the attractiveness of the opposite, otherwise, if her lesson partners heard what she said they would be very offended. That meant that her words were her honest thoughts. We are sure. In any case, you should hurry to your next lesson, she commented while with her hand she made discreet gestures that were understood as activating the time turner, remember to use it in discreet places, Amelie wiped the board with a wave of her wand and left the room. Soizen was about to follow her, but after taking two steps, he had a strange feeling and cast the incantation to become invisible before going through the doors. It turned out that Fleur along with some of the students now were waiting for him outside, forming a semicircle as if it was an ambush. Soizen hurried to use the path Amelie opened between the girls and was able to escape from whatever that situation was. I have to learn the battle transition when I can, he thought as he wiped away imaginary sweat as he remembered how Mortifages and Order of the Phoenix members flew using clouds of dark smoke or light. Sure he could make his own version with some study, but right now he had too much on his plate with research and projects going on. He would have to settle for invisibility for a while, until I passed the novelty. Was it rude to keep the ladies waiting? No, from his point of view, it was impolite to corner him like that. He never understood why the girls had to go in a group, like a herd of creatures looking for prey or a school of fish wanting to intimidate others. Is it so hard to have a sincere face-to-face -face conversation without bodyguards or followers? After finding a secluded garden, Soizen maintained his invisible state and used the time-turner to attend the next lesson. Just like in the movie, it seemed that it was the others who moved backwards while he was motionless. I'd better make the most of my stay in this place as much as possible. Two months later. Soizen's presence brought an air of novelty to the school, as it was highly unusual for a younger student to attend different lessons in different upper years. His small store, located in one of the empty classrooms on the east side of the school with set hours for weekends, was moderately successful, with his biggest sales being magical hygiene products along with some music boxes. Professor Chloe helped him a lot with the bottlenecks he encountered and he was confident he could finish the spell within the next two months or less if he managed to fix some problems he didn't consider before, which resulted in him having green skin for several days. The potions professor, Simon, was seen much more often in the library as he consulted various advanced potions books while pulling his hair, muttering under his breath. 
They had watched as he debated with Soizen about distilling potions and as the professor ran out of answers to many of the questions he posed to him. It was even rumored that they heard him cry on occasion, feeling that his standards as a potions teacher were a joke. Headmistress Maxime had to step up and convince him. The students discovered that looking for Soizen in groups would make him impossible to locate, but they could find him as long as there were no more than three of them, so they chalked it up to him being shy. Little did they know that he simply got headaches when so many people asked him questions at once, he was not antisocial. The most outrageous thing was that Fleur seemed to have established some sort of misunderstanding with him, after everyone at school knew he was immune to the Vila charm. It was as if she was relieved that he wasn't affected by it, but at the same time she was offended that he didn't find her charming. Her behavior was too contradictory and annoying. So apart from the time when they coincided for lessons and during the opening of her store, Fleur could hardly ever find Soizen. She even went to complain to Chloe, because she felt she was avoiding her on purpose. Girl, not that you're imagining it, I'm actively avoiding you until you decide on an attitude. Either you're happy or upset. Don't bother me until you make a decision. Naturally Chloe went to ask Soizen what was going on and explained the erratic behavior Fleur was having towards him, expressing her dissatisfaction and incomprehension. Heck, he even made some friendships during these two months, it was clear that the problem wasn't coming from him. On another note, Soizen corresponded with his home and friends at Hogwarts. He learned that the Diagon Alley store had already begun to turn a profit thanks to Valentine's Day sales, that Potter was being constantly attacked by an unknown house elf who kept telling him he was in danger. And that both Hermione and Sylvia managed to keep the hall under wraps and made good progress on the training sheet he left them. She also received some letters from Ginny and Luna. The first one updated her on events related to House Gale Gold how the members' acclimacy practice was going and how effective the reason filters she left behind were. No one in the house was a victim of amortentia. Luna for her part, asked about the Hofurin and how Hermione was scandalized by the house elves. Phew, looks like she really dodged a bullet there. Chapter 58, The Birth of a New Spell Another two months passed and Soizen had already used up most of the time he was supposed to spend at Beaux-Batons, enjoying some sightseeing in France during Professor Chloe's monthly guides. He was currently holed up in the expanded trunk so that no one would disturb him during his day off, he even closed the store today. Because he was about to complete one of the two projects that had been taking most of his time and effort this year. The photons of light must be arranged according to the magical function of the number 7 as the vibration of the air occurs synchronously, when the flow of magic is reversed clockwise twice so that the extension. He carefully examined every detail. And it all adds up to one again. Did I do it? I did it. Soizen dropped all pretense and began to laugh like the villain in a movie who just brought a monster back to life. Control yourself. He took several deep breaths, until the trembling in his hands disappeared. There is still the final and final test, he carefully memorized the details of the whole spell until he was sure he had everything in his mind without error, to the wood nymph's hothouse. He got out of the trunk, shrunk and stowed it before leaving the dormitory and walked to his goal in less than two minutes, entering through the doors of the greenhouse under the gaze of several students. Soizen is going to try again. I've never seen anyone being so persistent with the nymphs. I know, I think half the time he's been here he's been green. Do you think he'll fail again? The students did not rush to judgment. By now, they were all clear about Soizen's abilities and each time he visited the greenhouse, he spent more time in it before going all green. Last week there were rumors that he almost made it and today he had a very determined and confident look on his face, as if it was impossible for him to fail. Shall we go in and see? Proposed a third-year student tentatively. Forget it, if we go in, we'll have to play or sing something, a fourth-year student shook her head, none of us are good at singing or music, we'll come out green and it will look ugly. Let's wait and see, we may have a surprise, said a fifth-year student with a sly smile on her face. What do you know, Bridget? The fourth-year student looked at her suspiciously. Well. It's possible or not, that when Professor Chloe was evaluating the last exam she gave us and I was helping her on the side. She let slip some secret due to fatigue and a serious lack of coffee, 
Bridget looked at them with an air of smugness, making it clear that she knew something they didn't. Come on, let it out. Aren't we all good sisters? Mm. I wonder. Damn it. Okay, if you know anything worthwhile, I'll give you the limited edition Starry Night Effect Dark Lipstick I got at Soizen's store. So it was you who took the last one. Said the student next to her with a shocked and betrayed face, you told me they were out of stock. Well, after I took mine they were sold out, yes. Treat. Bridget didn't want him to back down, so she quickly said what she knew, Professor Chloe mentioned that Soizen was working on a spell for the last few months and that if it was successful. She would use it on the last day of school as a first as a thank you for taking care of him this half year. What kind of spell? I don't know, some advanced use of light and sound. Professor Chloe came to her senses at the best part and refused to say anything more Bridget shrugged. Ugh, now I'm even more curious than before. And there's still a month to go before the end of the school year. Carla, remember that favor you owed me when I introduced you to Sergio? Well, get in there and tell us what Soizen is doing. What? No. I don't want to end up green, I'm meeting him tomorrow to study in the library and I don't want to show up in front of him looking like that. Wait, did you hear that? Interrupted the third year student. They stopped talking and listened, something was going on in the greenhouse and the stained glass windows emitted a dim light. Are the nymphs singing? Did he make it? It doesn't sound quite right, they don't usually sound like that when we hear them in the mornings. No, I. I think they're crying and clapping at the same time. The doors to the greenhouse opened at that moment and Soizen stepped out from inside, nodding in satisfaction as he gazed proudly at his non-greenish skin. Behind him and as the doors closed, they saw the excited nymphs with tears in their eyes. A resounding success. He raised his fist in happiness and noticed the look in the eyes of the students next to him, giving them a little theatrical bow. He gave them a playful wink and walked off with a firm step. Knowing that the spell worked without a problem, he had to practice it until he mastered it to perfection. That smile, that confidence, those sparkling golden eyes, that self-assurance. Bridget, why is your face red? Me? You should look in a mirror. Stop it, both of you. He's just a second grader, how can he make you behave like this? Look who's talking. You're redder than any of us. I just suddenly realized that the atmosphere was too warm. Where is your shame? Soizen, unaware of the repercussions of his cheerful actions, returned to the bedroom and noted the successful outcome. Now, what should I call this spell? He reflected. He needed to give it a name that was not ordinary, full of elegance and clearly magical. I've got it, let's call this spell, True Illusion, he wrote down in the blank space on the parchment. He stared at the name and felt satisfied, it gave him good vibes. He opened his left hand, gathering particles of light and forming the illusion of a miniature willow tree swaying in the wind, accompanied by the sound of leaves moving. If one examined the illusion carefully, one might notice that inside the willow egg one could hear the song of wood nymphs. I didn't expect to get the first song of a newborn as a reward, but it will be very useful to me. I only need one last ingredient to finish my other project. Chapter 59, Centennial Curiosity Perinel had been in excellent spirits for the past three months, which also lifted her husband's spirits after the loss of one of his greatest achievements, the Philosopher's Stone. No matter how Dumbledore would explain it, it was a fact that he had been entrusted with something priceless and had been unable to keep the stone safe. This caused Nicholas to fall out with the Hogwarts headmaster and his mood was not good for a long time. Death is just another adventure. They said that so that headmaster wouldn't come back to bother them anymore, if they really didn't care about dying, they wouldn't have lived more than 600 years. It was just that with their accumulated experience, they knew how to handle their emotions better than others. So why was Perinel so cheerful? It all started during one of her sneaky visits to Bosbatons, where she liked to visit the fountain where she and her husband met, admiring the garden around her and feeling the gentle breeze caress her century-old face. The fountain was famous for a few decades, but nowadays hardly anyone went to that secluded and quiet corner, so she considered it a bit like her own place to have tea with some sweets. 
what a surprise when he saw a student there so early in the morning. Not only that, he was one of the few male students. If there was one thing that age had failed to erode in her, it was curiosity, so she stood still in an inconspicuous spot and watched what the student wanted to do there. She watched as he pulled out some vials and took water samples from the fountain, then pulled out a microscope and examined some drops under it. From the frown, it appeared that he didn't find whatever it was he was looking for. After looking around again and thinking he was alone, he held up one of the vials he had just filled and examined it close to his eyes. Why was he doing that? If she could see anything, she would have looked at it with the microscope. It was then that Perinel witnessed the student's eyes turn wonderfully golden and understood what he was doing, he was looking for some reaction of the water to the magic. But after several minutes, there was no reaction and the young man wore a disappointed expression as his eyes returned to normal. He lowered his head, perhaps pondering if there was something he missed or thinking what to do now that he had his results, but what followed was completely disconcerting. She put away the vials and microscope and pulled out. A jar of jam and a spoon. From the color, I'd say it was orange or tangerine, she couldn't be entirely sure since the smell didn't reach her that far. Maybe she just wanted to cover up her disappointment with food, but it had been a long time since she had found anyone who liked sweet enough to eat the marmalade directly with a spoon. The student carefully scooped up some jam with the spoon and instead of eating it as he expected, he took out two other spoons and filled them as well, after which he seemed to wait for something as he looked around with the three pieces of cutlery in his hand. His expression was strange, like a fisherman waiting patiently for a fish to bite. One minute passed after another and Perinelle was in no hurry, she made a small stool appear and sat down while contemplating the young man, trying to guess what he wanted to do. Half an hour later, she saw something she did not expect at all. Three small yellow-skinned fairies with two small horns peeking out from their shoulders and purple-blue wings came out from among the vegetation, sniffing the air as if following a trail and spotted the student and the spoons in his hand. They began circling around the young man and were gradually reducing their distance from him, being cautious. The student did not move once other than to blink and wait. When those strange fairies he had never seen in all his long life seemed to understand that there was no danger, they approached the spoons full of jam and began to eat it with their hands showing an expression of delight. After they finished eating, the student opened the palm of his free hand and the fairies passed over it, while the horns on their shoulders came off and fell exactly in the center of the outstretched palm. A total of six horns. That seemed to end whatever was going on and the fairies left, hiding again in the vegetation. The student looked at the small horns in his hand and after a few minutes observing what he got, he closed his fist and tucked them away somewhere in his tunic. Perinelle came out of her stupor and could no longer contain her curiosity, she made the stool disappear and walked towards the student who seemed about to leave her appearance caused the young man to look at her in surprise. I have to admit that I didn't expect to see something so curious so early in the morning, a polite and reliable way to open a conversation was always to comment on recent events, what are the names of those lovely creatures? My friend calls them Hafurin, replied the young man, regaining his composure, and although he tried to hide it, his experienced eyes could see how he was more relaxed at the question, apparently, they love tangerine marmalade. The student's answer made Perinelle smile a little wider. She was now sure that she had not been recognized and it seemed that the boy was more interested in hiding whatever he did with the water from the fountain, than his interaction with the magical creatures. In fact, how come she didn't know that fairies like these lived in this place after all the time she spent here? Although come to think of it, he never came with tangerine marmalade. He had a greater penchant for chocolate. Having managed to break the ice, Perinelle struck up a conversation with the young man and they talked for a long time. It was rare to meet someone who didn't recognize her at a glance as the wife of the famous alchemist and she intended to make the most of it. Right now, she was just an elderly witch named B who came to visit her old school to reminisce about the past. Being someone who had lived for so long, she controlled the conversation without the other party noticing and found out some very interesting things. Enough, at the very least, to keep him entertained. Later, she managed to convince the boy without any trouble to see each other twice a month. It was a nice feeling, interacting without politics or hidden agendas. Just an older person and someone from the new generation exchanging views and experiences. 
Perinelle asked him questions like what he thought about alchemy a habit that stuck with him because of her husband, the statute of secrecy, squibs, house elves, magic itself, etc. And she must admit that his answers were to her liking or surprised her. For example, the student explained how he believed alchemy had great potential, but it did not appeal to him and he preferred potions, a field in his opinion with the same potential that little seemed to understand. In his words, even if Flamel himself invited me to be his student, I would refuse. The most surprising thing of all. She knew she wasn't bluffing, she really meant what she meant. I've been very busy this week, so as of tomorrow normality resumes with all my fanfics and as usual, you have the original and advanced version on my Patreon. Chapter 60, Healthy Competition, Better Than Crazy Soizen was working out in the Beaux Batons gym, having just finished his encounter with a nice old lady named B with whom he hit it off in unexpected circumstances. Because of the situation with his mother's families, he never met his soon-to-be grandparents, so perhaps that was why he got along with her so easily. He had a feeling that this was how having a grandmother must have felt. He met her at the fountain that was rumored to enhance appearance, but after studying her, he found nothing to back up those rumors. Bored, he was testing for the third time whether Hofurin really existed and to his surprise, they turned out to be very real. He had to make a great effort to appear calm, as he didn't want to have to try again. Although his heart jumped to his throat when he was discovered, it seems he only saw the fairies and not how he examined the water. That would have been very embarrassing. Conversations with the old woman were interesting to say the least, as she seemed well versed in many events, knew details of historical characters that were unheard of, and possessed an enormous amount of knowledge. I suspected that she might be one of the librarians, as despite her many visits to the library, she still did not know all the staff. The first time he got green skin for failing, he hesitated whether to skip meeting her, but the thought of standing an old woman up and imagining her waiting alone while looking around with a sad look on her face made his conscience nudge him to go. What's the worst that could happen? At most, it would bring joy to an old person. It would be a good deed. For his peace of mind, apart from showing an amused expression for the first few seconds when he saw her green skin, he acted for the rest of the encounter as if nothing had happened. No doubt aware of the reason for her condition. And that was exactly why, when she managed to finish her spell, she was the first person he showed it to, with nothing less than a few animated episodes of Tom and Jerry along with some episodes of Mr. Bean, which, by the way, he loved. Later, he wrote to Professor Flittick to give him the good news that he had managed to finish the spell and showed it to Chloe, who was amazed at the result. After all, although she had seen the theory behind the spell and assisted in its completion, Soizen did not stamp any of the key nodes and she was unable to use the spell. Still, this didn't stop her from grabbing him by the wrist and dragging him literally to the headmistress's office, where she had to demonstrate the full spell again. It should be noted that Soizen was not comfortable talking to the half-giant headmistress, having someone looking down on him from above made him feel inexplicably annoyed. This did not happen with Hagrid, perhaps because of their friendship. Maxime offered to help him register that new spell, but he had to tactfully turn her down several times. This wasn't like the patents he had for his potions, this spell was something that like his future animagus form, would act somewhat like an ace in the hole under certain circumstances. Imagine someone sees a fireball coming at them, their instinct would be to dodge or intercept. But what if that fireball is an illusion? It looks like one and sounds like one, but in reality it is not harmful in the least, like a hologram. Later, that same person sees another fireball coming at him and now knows it's an illusion, so he doesn't defend himself and is seriously injured by a real one. When again another day he sees a fireball, he won't know if it will hurt him or is a hoax. In other words, make others doubt where the border of reality and illusion is. Currently his true illusion was in its one. Zero version, since he was only playing with vision and hearing. But he intended to keep improving, eventually affecting several more senses. Feeling heat and cold. The movement of the wind on the skin. To give him a shadow. Give him a body like a solid light construct, like a Patronus. There were too many things he could still add to perfect the spell. To keep Maxime from bringing it up again, he explained how he planned to use the spell on a large scale in a scoop for the entire school. 
After hearing his plan, the headmistress agreed, but demanded that she must preview the show to give her approval. Chloe did not hesitate to enter the discussion at that time and asked to be a witness as well, in order to look for possible flaws in the spell as she put it. Soizen had no choice but to agree and the next morning, with her magical reserves full, she met with the headmistress and the charms teacher in a closed classroom isolated from prying eyes and ears, where she used the spell for the second time with all her might. The result? Madame Maxime and Chloe gave their full approval in tears, completely moved by the little show he showed them. Soizen didn't know where to put his hands or look when he saw the two women in front of him crying like little girls. He thought the wood nymph's reaction was because of what the creatures themselves were like. Perhaps he did not choose properly. He simply projected a little snippet he really liked from a series, he didn't expect it to turn out so. Tearful. When he brought up whether he should think of something else, he got a death stare that caused him to shrug his head between his shoulders. Damn it, how can they change their mood so quickly? Just a moment ago they were acting like their husbands had died. Wait, neither of them was a married woman. In short, they made it clear that she had to wear the same thing she showed them, as they felt it would give a very positive message to all the students. In addition, Chloe made sure to make a note to put extra tissues on the tables for when the day came, ensuring that everyone could wipe away tears. Here you are, Soizen, she heard suddenly, causing her to almost drop the weights in her hands and drop them on her foot. By Merlin's socks. Soizen complained, dropping the weights on the floor and turning around to see who startled him, I've told you several times not to do that, Fleur. It's dangerous. For better or worse, Miss Delacour seemed to reach some sort of consensus with herself and ended up establishing with Soizen a sort of competitive relationship, which was more pleasant compared to her previous crazy behavior. Something similar to what happened to her with Hermione in the past, only Fleur was more insistent. It was not only about competing with grades in magic lessons, but also with creativity in dueling lessons, stamina in gym exercises, etc. Who would have expected this witch to be so determined to excel? Maybe that's why she was chosen by the chalice at the time, she was determined to better herself. Too bad for her, she picked a bad opponent. She didn't know how many times they had faced each other, she only knew that Fleur's scoreboard never scored any points in her favor. Chapter 61, Tears of Bosbatons His time at Bosbatons came to an end sooner than he expected, it seems that he was actually so immersed in his daily events that the time flew by. To be honest, Soizen enjoyed the experience and learned a lot from the teachers. Furthermore, he was looking forward to returning home so he could begin the animagus ritual described in the family book he found. There were only two things that were bothering him, and that was that he could not find the final ingredient for the other project he had been researching or the battle transition spell he had intended to master and modify. Perhaps Nagini could help him, but that was something he could ask once he returned home. And speaking of Nagini, as he informed him in the letters, Lupin seemed to vanish into thin air. Soizen was pretty sure he must be Dumbledore's hand behind the scenes. It looked like he would really need to activate Plan C. With cyanide. He sent a pair of Hoffuren horns to Luna by Owl, who thanked him cheerfully. Ginny practically became his manager in his absence and apart from a couple of minor problems, all went well while he was away from Hogwarts. Although it seems he still hadn't reconciled with Percy and Ron, as neither took the initiative to apologize, perhaps believing that if they let enough time pass everything would go back to the way it was. Bad idea. Sylvia was successful in creating a muggle version of butterbeer and just needed to tweak the formula so that it would be made in large quantities. Nagini already bought a warehouse under her orders to install the machinery with which they would prepare the first bottles, the goal being to start selling them in the summer while they are ice cold. But, something happened with Hermione. Her suspicions were confirmed when she wrote him several letters complaining that Harry and Ron have been approaching her during the last few weeks to ask her to help with schoolwork. All due to suggestions from the teachers, who were no doubt unknowingly guided by Dumbledore. He really had intended to form the Golden Trio, eh? But despite the inconvenience, he learned something interesting. Apparently, Potter complained during one of the meals about how someone withdrew half of his inheritance from Gringotts, which shouldn't be possible. When he sent a letter to the bank to find out what happened, their only response was that everything proceeded correctly, 
but they did not reveal the identity of the other party. Well, that would be Lily's share that he transferred some time ago. It seems that the bank delayed the notice as long as possible, but now that the summer vacations were approaching and there was a chance that he might visit the bank, they had to go through the formalities. Oh, but on the bright side, Hermione's impulse for house elves wore very thin. Sure, she still had a strong opinion of her own regarding the situation they were in and their history, but at the very least she wouldn't try to impose on the others. Soizen had to say goodbye to B, but promised to write to her from time to time. He was currently in the Bosbaton's dining hall, where the last dinner of the school year was being held and the winner of the equivalent of the House Cup was being announced. He didn't pay much attention to which of the three won, he was feasting on a French strawberry and cream-based dessert whose name he didn't know, but he'd be sure to find out before he left. Last but not least, Headmistress Maxime was finishing her long farewell speech and it was time for Soizen to enter the scene, this year we have enjoyed the company of a Hogwarts exchange student who brought us new perspectives. Friendships and views of magic, Mr. Soizen Gail Gold Evans Valris Aulis. She motioned for Soizen to approach her at the podium, not only that, during his stay with us, he completed a new spell that gained the approval of the wood nymphs and which he is willing to show us all for the first time. The students applauded and stopped when Maxime raised her hand, everyone, pay attention and be quiet. Let me tell you a story, Soizen looked around to heighten the anticipation a bit, and with a gesture, Chloe pulled the curtains across the windows, darkening the dining room a bit. It all began with despair and pain, Soizen's voice echoed through the place and drew everyone's gaze as he began his performance and walked towards the small empty square in the center of it all. With the sound of footsteps pounding on wood luring and setting the atmosphere, the inhabitants of the town of Martel, which had fallen into ruin, created dolls to forget those days of hardship, if only for a moment. Dolls that could dance and sing, she raised her hands as an orchestra master would, and under the surprised gaze of everyone, her eyes lit up and turned golden as beautiful multicolored strands of light sprang from her hands. And, many hundreds of years later, even though the town had fallen into ruins and there was no one left to listen, there was still one doll that continued to move. The strands of light weaved together and revealed to all a single scene in grey, where what looked like the silhouette of a beautiful puppet stood motionless as it sang without a sound, even as the surroundings deteriorated with the passage of time. One day, a lonely boy came to Martel. In the ruined village where he had arrived, there was no living being left, so he would die if he stayed there without help. And suddenly, a shadow covered him and he looked up. The scene changed and they saw a boy, breathing heavily, tired and probably hungry, fall on his face and hold his small body in his hands. Hey, boy, would you like to hear a song? The puppet looked at the boy in the middle of the night. It had been five hundred years since Martel had been destroyed and he was not the first person to enter the village. Five more people arrived before him and all of them attacked the puppet when he asked them if they wanted to listen to a song. They all saw that the beautiful puppet had been damaged. His hair was disheveled, the left side of his face was cracked from a blow and his clothes were torn. The puppet believed that the boy would do the same and, if he did not accept his offer, he would kill him. Just as he had done with the previous five. Some students noticed that the puppet's hand was moving strangely and felt uncomfortable. Was something really going to happen to such a small child? It was a doll created by humans and its existence is based on moving for humans, said Soizen as he continued to explain in his magically amplified voice, which seemed to have gained magnetism. Please let me sing for you. Said the puppet. Miss Ghost, said the boy as he looked at the puppet in surprise, will you sing for me? So far no one has ever done anything like that for me. The boy cried with joy and stood before the broken puppet. Please sing for me, Miss Ghost. They watched as the scene changed, to some later time, just as the boy was helping the puppet mend its hair. The clothes had been mended and his damaged eye was bandaged. You look beautiful, Lala. Said the boy. Lala. The puppet looked at the boy blankly. Do you mind if I call you that, Miss Ghost? Several more scenes followed, showing how they spent decades together as the boy grew up and the puppet happily accompanied him. They watched as the boy grew into a man, began to cough, became sick and weak with age. They could swear they heard his heartbeat become softer and softer. 
A final scene unfolded before them all as the light construction ceased to be grey and took on vivid colours, so real that it was hard to distinguish illusion from reality. In the ruins of Martel and under the moonlight, two silhouettes stood there with no one else around them. A man lying face down in the ashen sand, dressed in a dingy grey robe with his hood up to hide his upper face in the gloom. Next to him, a puppet with long blonde hair with its left eye covered by bandages was also lying on the sand. The man was trembling and tried to stretch out his arm to reach the puppet, which was still out of reach. La la la. The man tried to say, his voice cracking. The puppet seemed to respond to the voice and began to move. The movement was stiff and stopped momentarily several times, it had a conspicuous hole in its chest that wasn't there before, right where the heart should be located. He turned and looked at the man with his light blue right eye. Mr. Human. She asked mechanically, devoid of the apparent humanity in memories she had lived through all that time with the person next to her. She made them feel their hearts crack with anguish. Would you like to hear a song? Mr. Human. The puppet began to approach the man on all fours. I'm a doll, I can sing. Mr. Human. The man lifted his cocked head as best he could with his meager strength to look the doll in the face, as if trying to burn her image into his mind, and tears began to slide down. Lala. I love you. The man lowered his head and kept silent, without moving any more. The doll raised her hand and caressed the man's hood, as if comforting a small child. Do you want to sleep for a while? In that case, I'll sing you a lullaby so you'll have a good sleep. The puppet put the man's head on his thighs to make him more comfortable and, raising his head slightly, began to sing. Lacrimosa dies illa. Qua resurgit ex favela. Judicandus homo reus. Huic ergo pars, deus. Pi Jesu, domini. The puppet sang for three days and three nights, until the man resting next to it passed away, after which he remained silently inert in the same posture. Thank you they suddenly heard faintly, like a breeze whispering in their ear, for letting me sing to the end. Now the promise has been fulfilled. The students and teachers opened their eyes wide as it seemed to them that, for an instant, the puppet had smiled with its lost humanity regained and just as that instant passed, the puppet fell limply to the ground. They never found the sound of wood crashing against cold stone so heartbreaking. But they all noticed, that despite losing any magic to sustain it, its legs remained motionless and did not disturb the man's eternal sleep. The illusion before their eyes slowly faded away like a memory becoming blurred. Oh, it wasn't that it became blurry, they were all crying. Chapter 62, End of Second Year Soizen left Bozbatons in a hurry without even waiting for the banquet to end, running away from the crying and furious students led by Fleur who are chasing him to force him to change Lala's tragic fate. Even the professors joined the impromptu chase. He ran through the corridors of the school under a barrage of lights shooting from the students' wands, with the aim of a stormtrooper. Meanwhile, in the now empty dining hall. You can come out now, commented Chloe after wiping her tears as she laid the damp handkerchief on the table, they're all gone. She and Headmistress Maxime were the only ones left behind, knowing the backup plan Soizen devised just in case although they never believed he would actually use it. I told you I wasn't exaggerating, Soizen commented as he cancelled the invisibility, unable to help but let out a sigh of relief at his own caution, come on, I have to get out of here as soon as possible. What they were all chasing at the moment was nothing less than another illusion, which should fool them until he left the interior of the school and dissipated. Madame Maxime pushed caressed the petals of a flower on a painting beside him in a specific order and a secret passage was revealed. I trust you have all your things, Chloe wanted to confirm. Of course, Soizen was not so innocent, he was sure that there were already students waiting for him in the place that was his residence. Come on, I will allow the use of the flu network due to the unique circumstances, commented Maxime as she closed the secret passage that should lead to her office behind her, did you think about my proposal? I appreciate your interest, but I'm not transferring schools, Soizen replied, Hogwarts may have a lot of things to improve, but my family is too historically involved. A real pity, Maxime appreciated talent and Soizen showed a potential that few wizards his age were capable of achieving. More importantly, 
He was not satisfied even with that and was hardworking, in that case, let me give you a souvenir of your time here. They reached his office and Maxime, apparently prepared for his refusal, handed him a plant that was carefully wrapped in a completely black cloth. This is it. Soizen was quite familiar with Bozbaton's plants, but he couldn't recognize the scent of this particular one. A blue moon lily with twin flowers born during the last eclipse, Maxime explained as she took the pot by the fireplace and lowered it to Soizen's height. I understand that you were searching unsuccessfully for this during the last three outings with Chloe to the local magical market, and it just so happened that a friend of mine in Barcelona had one that matched your conditions. Soizen looked open-mouthed at the headmistress, alternating between the covered plant in her hands and her. Is she serious? Not that she didn't take her word for it, but any potions master knows how incredibly difficult it is to obtain this plant, whose magical effects can only be achieved if it is born naturally without the slightest intervention. Just send me one of those limited edition packs of swan-shaped, floral-scented magic soaps, Maxime downplayed the matter and then muttered under his breath so Chloe couldn't hear him, make them bigger for that, the regular ones are running out too fast. Soizen promised without even hesitating, he had been searching like crazy for this plant and exchanging it for a batch of cosmetic products the size of a half-giant was a bargain with a capital letter. What's more, he promised her that from now on, her orders at the store would be custom-sized, free of charge. It's nothing more than using Ingorjo just before packing the product and I didn't want to owe such a big favor. Satisfied by his response, she placed the flu powders within reach, of which Soizen took a handful. Thank you once again for your hospitality and guidance, he said looking at Chloe and the headmistress. He stepped into the fireplace and just before throwing the powders, his hand stopped abruptly as he felt his illusion dissipate sooner than expected as he turned a corner. His eyes lit up and he looked at the two women in front of him. See you in two years, he said mysteriously, before disappearing in a green flare saying his destination. When the flames died out, there was no one in the fireplace and Maxime shared a look of incomprehension with Chloe. What did he mean by that? They both thought at the same time. Soizen had to repeat the process in reverse when he left France. Passing through both ministries, before appearing at the leaky cauldron and calling the night bus to take him back to the village of Lacac, where he had to walk on foot to his home under Fidelius. Given his hasty departure from Bozbatons, he arrived two hours earlier than planned and wanted to surprise the family. I'm home. She shouted once she closed the front door. Poof! With the sound of a bottle being uncorked, Nagini appeared behind Soizen and pointed her wand at him. Only when she confirmed the bond they shared as a totem guardian an instant later, she withdrew it and smiled at Soizen. Ah you've come at a bad time, he said as he put the wand away, your mother's left a few minutes ago and won't be back for another half hour. Anything I should know? Soizen asked. Well, I guess you shouldn't, but there's no point now, Nagini shrugged and revealed what was going on, they wanted to give you a surprise party for your return and they went to get a cake, one made by professionals, they said. Damn it, Soizen considered for a moment, should I go back to wait and act like I just arrived? Do you think your mothers will buy your performance? Instead of answering, Nagini offered a counter-question. Damn it, Soizen repeated, not expecting his surprise to spoil the other surprise, ideas. You could hide in the cake. Soizen waited for Nagini to tell him she was joking, but she didn't. Nagini, he called as he walked over and looked her in the eyes, being more specific, how big of a cake did they plan on bringing? I don't know, they said something about starting to try different flavors of wedding cakes. Damn it. Chapter 63, Black Egg In the end, Anne and Inta returned with the cake and after securing it in the kitchen, were surprised by a clever and unexpected entrance involving Rada, four pine cones, a rake and multicolored paper confetti. Half an hour later of scolding and hugging. Oh, come on, and didn't quite believe how her ingenious escape from Bose Batons happened, it couldn't have been such a sad story, come on, show us. Another time, Illusion asks for a lot of magic and I already did it once today. But I can show you something simpler, he lied without blinking. He preferred to spend their reunion in a happy way and didn't like to see tears on the faces of his mothers. Is it necessary to remember how the garden they have now was formed? All right, let's go, Inta hurried him along, 
wanting to see how realistic the illusion he could make it. Soizen pressed his palms together and his eyes lit up. As he opened them, a small door appeared and several fairies began to parade and dance around the room. To be more specific, they were the Hofjurin that Soizen met at the Bozbatan's fountain and now he was using their appearance because being small, he doesn't need to invest a lot of magic. How cute! Inta exclaimed. She tried to touch one, but her hand passed through without causing a ripple. Nagini was much more surprised than the mothers, for in her magical sense the illusions felt like real fairies, emitting the same magical signature. If it weren't for details like them having no shadows, she really would have concluded that they were real. How complicated was a magic that generated an illusion not only capable of fooling a person's senses, but also the senses of a wizard or witch. After several minutes, Soizen felt that enough was enough and cancelled the illusion. They split the cake and as they ate with forks, like civilized people, Soizen explained everything he had experienced at Bozbatons. How he wandered through the French magical markets. How he made the potions teacher cry unintentionally. How he met an old woman named B. How he challenged the wood nymphs and triumphed. The years with you are never quiet, no matter what school you're in, was the sharp remark she received from both of her mothers. And you didn't bring souvenirs. Soizen rolled her eyes as she took out the things she prepared in advance. An elegant full-length wall mirror, a book on French recipes, a fully gilded mini water fountain and some herbs to transplant in the garden. Happy? He asked amused after giving them the souvenirs. It's always better to keep us happy, son, they commented jokingly. The family scarb was happily playing with his new shiny treasure. By the way, Nagini, remind me later to talk to you, said Soizen as he stood up. Understood. After catching up with the family, Soizen went into his suitcase and taking headmistress Maxime's gift, hurried to his personal potions preparation room. Out of politeness, he had not examined the state of the flower in front of the half-giant, but now he could no longer restrain himself. Just as I thought, the lily is about to lose its prime, I'd better hurry, he said to himself after checking the flower. While the materials he prepared and preserved properly needed to be added in their original state, the blue lunar lily with twin flowers born during the last eclipse was not the same case. He needed to distill a special liquid from the flower that would concentrate its essence and remove impurities. He cleaned the lily of all its soil using cold water, separated the flowers, stem and roots before processing them. He examined the cauldron which he brought to a boil and when it reached the right temperature, he added one of the two flowers in the center of the liquid, sprinkled the powdered root in the outer circle of the cauldron and used the stem to stir clockwise seven times. Now he had to wait for the color of the liquid to change to a fluorescent blue, like the moon in the starry sky. In the meantime, he took the remaining lily flower from the table and put it in his mouth, chewing it into a paste. The moment the liquid changed color, he spit it in and turned up the heat. Curiously, although steam continued to rise from the cauldron, the liquid did not bubble from boiling at any point, like a calm lake similar to a mirror without a ripple. Soizen hardly blinked during the whole process, for he had only one specimen and therefore one chance to succeed. An hour later, he was holding a sealed vial whose contents were barely a few drops after the reduction of the mixture. Now comes the tricky part, but first let's clean up this mess, he muttered after carefully setting the vial on a shelf and beginning to thoroughly clean all his potion equipment. He pulled out the ingredients and examined them one by one to make sure everything was okay. Perfect, no problems or unforeseen events, he nodded in satisfaction before getting back to work. He poured the ink from the thousand-year-old black lake squid into the cauldron and left it at a lukewarm temperature, before adding a few drops of his own blood and the dragon eggshells ground into powder, courtesy of Norberta. The liquid in the cauldron showed signs of gelling, but Soizen interrupted the reaction by adding the house elf tears and the specially processed leech juice obtained. The liquid began to flicker and alternate between various colors and without wasting time, he added five small spoonfuls of elixir of visa supplied by the philosopher's stone and a pair of hofurin horns of the same origin. The cauldron began to shake as the liquid showed a strong reaction to the new additions and began to shrink in on itself, taking the shape of an ostrich egg with spirals on its surface reminiscent of a certain painting by Vincent van Gogh, The Starry Night. 
Look it up on Google if you don't know which picture it is, it helps to visualize it. Just as the egg finished forming, Soizen hurriedly dumped in the lily preparation, causing the swirls on the surface to light up. When he was sure that the egg had absorbed the entire concentrate, he carefully removed the last component, the first song of a wood nymph. The egg began to beat and spin on itself to the rhythm of the song and the spirals seemed to come to life. The moment the chant ended and faded away, the egg cracked and a dark substance spurted from within. Soizen took a deep breath and with a decisive movement, he cut his palm and brought it close to the dark substance, which, as if it had heard his thoughts, turned into extremely thin threads and entered through the wound in his hand, entering Soizen's body until it could no longer be seen. A strong dizziness overcame him and before he could react, he collapsed on his back on the floor. Chapter 64 Paper Wizard No, thanks. Soizen woke up at the turn of three hours and had to reorient himself for a moment, before remembering what happened. He looked at the palm where he cut himself and saw that the wound was gone. Well, I'm still alive, so it looks like I wasn't too far wrong, he laughed at himself. He got up and after making sure his legs were not weak, he left the potions preparation room and walked to a full-length mirror he had in another room and took off most of his clothes. No obvious mutations, extra horns or even a second head or tail, he sighed in relief as he saw that he looked the same as before, let's test the results. Pulling out the same knife he cut himself with, he pointed it at his forearm and struck decisively. Clank! A metallic sound rang out and Soizen opened his eyes to confirm the result. Instead of the bleeding wound he should have, he saw how his skin had darkened and hardened, stopping the attack completely. Nano machines, son, Soizen said in a strange voice. This was the result of his latest research. Wizards could brag all they wanted, but it was a fact that if they couldn't cast magic in time, they were no different from muggles. Even though he was armed all the time because he didn't have the need for a wand to use magic, you never knew when he might suffer a sneak attack that he couldn't react to. So, Soizen thought it was urgent to correct this loophole as soon as possible. Drawing inspiration from things like One Piece's Armored Hockey, Naruto's Black Zetsu, Metal Gear's Senator Armstrong and Marvel's Venom along with all his knowledge of magic, he designed a unique potion for himself. Of course, the potion had severe limitations. For example, he couldn't cover himself like a symbiote suit or pull tentacles out of his body. The most he would mainly achieve with the potion was a substantial increase in his physique, better regeneration in case he was injured to increase his survival and lastly, the defensive ability he had just tested. Right now, he could only defend himself unconsciously and his self-control was non-existent, but once he practiced and became familiar with his new physique, he could assume a form similar to Virgo's with his entire body imbued with Busashoku Haki. The price for this improvement was a 5 kg increase in his weight permanently and a large increase in his appetite should his new regenerative factor come into play, which was understandable, as it was to replenish the nutrients invested in the process. I still don't know if there are any other effects, but at least I got the results I wanted, he thought as he went back to getting dressed now calmer, have the clothes gotten any smaller. He stopped and felt that something was not right. After looking at himself in the mirror again, he realized what was happening. I seem to have grown a bit, probably due to the potion stimulation of my body. I didn't think of that and now I'll need new robes to go to Hogwarts, Soizen covered his face with his hand, he was sure that when An Aninta saw him, they would tell him to go on a shopping spree to get new clothes. Despite having adjustable enchanted clothes. Never mind, it's nice to spend time with the family after so long. I should get to bed, Tomorrow I'll talk to Nagini about battle transition magic, my intention to become an animagus and will go out so I can see the store with my own eyes. I hope she already has what I asked for ready for the summer. Maybe I should also go down to the family chamber at Gringotts, he thought after suddenly feeling mentally fatigued, mm. I'll probably be meeting the girls this summer as well and I need to see if I can materialize my Patronus before I get on the locomotive, I'll have to organize my schedule well. I should also meet up with Snape to discuss Lupin's potion, when did I become so busy? He rubbed his growling stomach, he didn't know how long he was unconscious, but judging by his hunger, it must have been a few hours at least. He got out of the suitcase with his clothes a little tight and went to the kitchen to check the hours. Mm, for hours left until everyone gets up, 
he reflected as he glanced at the clock on the wall. It wasn't worth eating when there was so little time left for breakfast, so he drank a glass of water and went to bed. When she woke up, she stretched her arms and went downstairs for breakfast. As she expected, they were all surprised by her growth spurt during the night and agreed to go to Diagon Alley in the afternoon. Nagini escorted Soizen to her room and heeded her master's words. I see, Nagini nodded after hearing everything, indeed, the battle transition can be useful to you, but I didn't comment on it because wizards and witches usually come into contact with it once they are old enough to learn apparate. But they are rarely interested, because it is too much work for those with little talent, which is usually the majority, she explained, as for your intention to become an animagus, the truth is that I can't help you as much as you think. My condition was due to my status from birth as a maledictus, which is fundamentally different from how an animagus is formed, despite the apparent similarities. While I can now be considered an animagus thanks to you, I did not go through the ritual process or take the potion in the original form. I will only be able to help you familiarize yourself with shape-shifting once you finish the whole process. Actually, I didn't think of that, Soizen frowned at his misunderstanding. How confident are you? Becoming an animagus, more in a different form as your book says called a superior animagus, is not simple. I have no doubt about it, Soizen said confidently. During his time at Bozbatons, he studied deeply the book left behind by Frustran Galegold. Whether it was the preparation of the modified potion, the altered song in the heart, or any other factor, he had it all perfectly memorized and understood. In fact, the only reasons he didn't leave the potion prepared beforehand was because buying the ingredients in Diagon Alley would be cheaper, plus he'd rather have a freshly brewed potion. Granted, it was filthy rich, but that's no justification for throwing money away for no reason. And what do you have to do? More or less the same thing someone else would do, but following slightly stricter pauses. I have to put the mandrake leaf in my mouth, but I must at midnight and for exactly four weeks. During this time, use the altered spell on my heart three times a day precisely eight hours apart. Once the period with the mandrake leaf is over, I need to take the altered potion that must have been struck by lightning from a storm within seven minutes and take shelter under the shade of the branches of a tree. The time frame for taking the potion is too tight and I don't remember the last step being in the process, Nagini commented. The rest was as Soizen said, somewhat strict with the timings, but it could be done with a little care with no problems. It's no problem really, we'll just look for a stormy area for you to apparate us there and after burying the potion, we'll use a lightning rod to accelerate the strike. Then we can apparate somewhere else, like a forest, and I'll take the potion while you keep an eye on the surroundings. A lightning rod? Clever, why hasn't anyone thought of this before? Nagini asked, surprised at the convenience of the idea revealed. The lightning rod is a muggle invention, draw your own conclusions. Chapter 65, Magic Idol, Nico Ravenheart During the afternoon in Diagon Alley and while Inta and and debated what might look best on her, Soizen was updated by Nagini on the extent of Pomona's research, the store's accounting and the production of muggle butterbeer. Which she intended to start selling this summer not only to muggles, but also to wizards during an event that needed to go through a little-known department of the ministry. The Department of Magical Entertainment Events, known as MME. The same department that is in charge of the Quidditch Cup, and that no one else seems to remember when it doesn't happen, is also in charge of other events like handling parties, circuses, and so on. Basically, you go to them if you want to use magic to perform a show and get paid for it. They check if it is justifiable to charge for what you do and they are pretty strict, because once they give the go-ahead, they can't cancel it as it becomes a kind of protected magic culture to call it that way. Well, we already know that magic laws are a tremendous mess. I mean, they don't even ask for a minimum age. As long as it's a new kind of show, it can be considered. Hours later, when their hands were full of bags of clothes, their mothers reluctantly decided that it must be enough for the time being. And neither Soizen nor Nagini mentioned the extended space they had with them, they wanted to go home once and for all. Fortunately, Nagini was able to distract them long enough for Soizen to slip away to acquire a fresh mandrake leaf. So fresh, that he plucked and cleaned it himself before placing it in his mouth in the same spot, beginning to recite the modified spell against his heart. It was so bitter. 
and the leaf was not small, so it had quite an aftertaste. He just needed to be careful when eating or sleeping not to swallow it by accident. Besides, it would delay the visit to Gringotts until he became a senior in Imagus. Can you imagine going with the subway carriages at full speed and the leaf in your mouth? If I ever got the food out due to motion sickness, I'd need to start all over again. Oh, of course any in-person meetings with her friends were also vetoed until then. If Hermione found out that he became an animagus and didn't register with the ministry, he knew she wouldn't rat him out to anyone, but it would be a needle she could constantly poke him with. A week later, he met Professor Snape at an agreed location and they discussed Lupin. Snape confirmed that the werewolf was selected for the vacant defense against the Dark Arts teaching position by Dumbledore, so he would have to spend the next school year preparing the potion that Mangy Dog needed. Also, because of the headmaster's presence, he couldn't poison or weaken the potion to avoid putting the students at risk. He was really frustrated. It was then that Soizen explained the idea he thought of to get back at Lupin. Snape listened carefully and his eyes widened, surprised at his favorite student's flexibility of thought. Not that he said it out loud, of course. Soizen's idea was brilliant and simultaneously simple. He still had to alter the potion, but what he had to do was to find a completely different effect. He had to deliver the potion long enough for a certain substance to be generated in the werewolf's body, neither too strong nor too mild, so that when Lupin left, the components that had been accumulated and suppressed by the potion would burst all at once without warning or symptoms and he would die without time to react or call for help. The most surprising part? The components of the potion that would cause death would disappear shortly after death naturally, giving the impression that Lupin died from a sneaky curse or a strange disease. The thought of having Remus take a sip of his death each time he gave him the potion made Snape's mood much improved and he asked how Soizen was handling the animagus process, since as a potion's master, he caught the smell of the mandrick leaf in his mouth. Soizen didn't explain anything about following a different method and merely commented that he was trying out of pure interest, if he didn't succeed, he wasn't going to obsess over it either. Snape reminded him of some important points to remember when creating the animagus potion, which he had no doubt he had the ability to make. Grateful for his advice, Soizen invited him to the event he was planning to hold, but after hearing what it consisted of, Snape shook his head. It wasn't the kind of event he liked to attend, preferring to spend that time researching potions. He didn't turn down the few bottles of his new butterbeer, though. A week later, while Soizen was practicing his Patronus, Nagini approached him with a letter from the ministry, approving his form of entertainment and enclosing a license to prove it. Satisfied that the bureaucratic process wasn't too slow, he planned to start publicizing his event and use the rumors to let everyone know it was going to happen. He even wrote to all his friends as someone else who heard the rumors and told them he got some tickets for them. He sent tickets to Luna, Sylvia, Hermione, Ginny, the Weasley twins, etc. And all they had to do was make it known and attend if they wanted to. Also, the tickets had their names magically engraved on them, so there was no such thing as reselling or giving their ticket to others if they couldn't go. Five days later, at exactly six o'clock in the evening, an appealing music began to play and caught the attention of everyone in the streets. Following the melody, they came to an open square where some plays were usually held, but which today was dazzling with a stage and several striking and interesting posters. By the time people gathered and wondered what was going on, the particles of light gathered on the stage forming a figure and the event Soizen prepared without time for anyone to get ready began, the magical idol. Taking advantage of his illusion magic, the music tips he asked Professor Flittick for earlier and in drawing inspiration from K-pop groups along with the idea behind Hatsune Miku. He created a magical idol for wizards and witches, whether young or teenagers, called Nico Ravenheart. Her form was that of a beautiful, somewhat curvy and perky teenage witch who had raven wings coming out of her waist. For songs and visual effects, she replicated and modified songs like Paripi Kome Dance, Gokura Kujodo, Strawberry Monster, Fut Han and many more. But one of the ones that drove those who attended the event the most crazy was Yuta's new genesis, the rhythmic movements and illusions of different colored water fish flying above the people was simply spectacular. More so considering that if they stretched out their hand, they could feel the water on their fingers. Forty minutes later, the show ended as mysteriously as it began, 
the stage disappeared in a burst of lights and in its place appeared several stands with Nico Ravenheart merchandise. The wizards and witches, stupefied for a few seconds, rushed to buy as soon as their minds processed what happened. It was predictable that within hours, everyone would know what had just happened in Diagon Alley. And while Soizen's onlookers and friends were in such high spirits, Soizen was on his knees on the floor, breathing heavily as Nagini gave him a potion meant to speed up the recovery of magical power. The illusion on this scale already drained him of a good portion of his magic reserves, but he had to get greedy and try to also alter the organoleptic sensations of those who touched the flying fish illusions. But seeing how successful he was, he didn't regret it one bit, it was good training to improve his control. What he didn't expect was that the next morning the prophet would also mention his performance. Chapter 66, A Revolutionary Beast Nico Ravenheart New star or cheap imitation? You're the cheap imitation. Soizen spat as he glared in annoyance at the article about his illusions performance the next day, written by none other than the infamous Rita Skeeter. It was nothing more than a bunch of unsubstantiated claims and general criticisms meant to stir up the hornet's nest as the unscrupulous journalist liked to do, seeking unhealthy attention, did you find who I asked you to? Yes, attorney Ted Tonks accepted the case to sue the prophet for malicious libel and also Rita Skeeter for an additional 66 counts, under the request of Nico Ravenhart's representative. Nagini assured her, amazed at the number of charges and legal technicalities her master found to teach Rita a lesson, the trial is scheduled for two weeks from now and I gave her the Felix Felici's vial. Well, if she doesn't behave, we will expose her directly as an unregistered animagus. Said Soizen leaving the paper on the table without feeling the slightest sympathy for this leech or sorrow that the lawyer would use such a valuable potion on the very day of the trial. If he were ever personally victimized by this witch and wanted to write about him, who knows what he would write about his family, past or present. By then, the exposure of his secret as an animagus would be the last thing he should worry about. Standing aside, how was the reception yesterday? We ran out of stock in less than half an hour and had to use the option to receive orders, mostly t-shirts. Posters and pins for the most part, Nagini informed him as she handed him the paper with the summary the figures were moderately successful, because despite their quality, their price is higher. It doesn't matter, the figure was exclusive to this debut and I won't make it again. I will bring out the others and start a collecting fever, Soizen replied as his eyes went line by line. Do you intend to do another concert soon? No, I'm going to take the mystery route. There will only be clues using crow feathers as to where the concerts will be and I will do two of them every month until the school year starts, using the hunger market. How are the cards I asked for going? Nico Ravenheart's exclusive animated cards will begin to be attached to some of the products in the store in a week. There are seven levels of rarity and each has a higher level of detail as you designed. It's just that the wizards who make the cards are exhausted from making so many in such a short time. Give them a bonus and hire more people, just make sure the quality is maintained and there are no defects. When everything is ready, I want Nico Ravenheart's raven writing pens to be promoted along with the magic soap. Soizen replied as he finished reading everything, the muggle butterbeer hasn't sold too well, but that's to be expected, they're too used to the magic version. No matter, any surplus will go to the muggle market. Since chocolate cards existed, Soizen saw no reason not to have cards of the magical idol he made, thus increasing his popularity and fame. The rarer cards even taught you the dance steps to a particular song as you cheered, a bit of law just dance. As for its design, it was inspired by popular games like UGO, Magic, Hearthstone, etc. Only instead of beasts, spells and items, the different cards are dance steps, songs and different outfits. He received letters from Ginny and company, where they excitedly explained the concert, lamenting that Soizen had a bad stomach and missed it. What face will they make when they find out that he is the creator of Nico Ravenheart? Let's see how long it takes them to find out. He had to refuse her request to meet under the excuse of being busy with business and gave a different date to meet, one several days after the transformation. Also, to her surprise, she received a letter from Hagrid. She knew it was from him just from seeing it, as there is no one else who uses letters four times the normal size. Oh. What's wrong? 
Soizen read the letter with so much interest that Nagini couldn't help but come closer and take a look at it. That's right, maybe Hagrid didn't realize it, but this will give a big boost to the magical world, Soizen smiled, he wants to meet at the Leaky Cauldron in two hours. Couldn't he have picked a cleaner place? Nagini complained. Well, he seems pretty excited in the letter, so I guess he just wrote the first place that came to mind. I just hope he knows how to be quiet. Didn't you have a magical contract for that? He's a half-giant, it's not clear to me that restrictive magic affects him as much as it does others, he waved his hand, in any case, let's hurry. Although I don't like the hygiene of that place either, it's better to be early and book a room so we can talk in private. And that's exactly what they did. After their arrival at the Leaky Cauldron, they spoke to Tom and asked for a room key. After ordering a drink each, they sat down at the table without touching said drinks. They couldn't help it, they saw with their own eyes how they were washed down and it takes away any appetite or thirst. Hagrid seemed to have a similar idea to theirs, as he also arrived in anticipation with a fur coat and greeted them with obvious good humor. But before he could begin to talk out of his elbows, Soizen pushed him into the room they reserved and once inside, he and Nagini threw up enough shields so as not to be spied upon. Hagrid looked impressed at the safeguards around him. Was so much secrecy necessary for an adorable, defenseless little critter? Well, Hagrid. What are you waiting for? Show us. Hagrid forgot about the protections and remembered what he came for. It wasn't easy and I had to be very convincing, to get the necessary creature crossings. But I did it. He put the leather sack on the floor and reached in, rummaging around. Frankly, I must say that if it wasn't for your idea, your book, your money and everything else, I wouldn't have had a clear path to follow. I got it. Hagrid pulled out his clenched fist and opened his palm upward to reveal several small snails resting next to a larger one. Have you tried them? Soizen asked. I wanted to, but I have very few and I don't want to spoil the surprise, Hagrid scratched his beard helplessly. He really held back a lot. Nagini, Soizen and Hagrid each took a snail and left the large snail on the table to test them together. Several minutes later, the initial tests were successful. It's a success. Soizen exclaimed as he looked at Hagrid and promised, Don't worry, Hagrid, I assure you, people will love these little guys. And when they do, more and more people will understand how cool magical creatures are. Who knows, maybe you'll become the inspiration for the next commander. Oh, you're exaggerating, Hagrid blushed like an apple. Chapter 67, Superior Animagus Soizen was very pleased with Hagrid's work, so he gave him what he promised. Fifty thousand galleons. A VIP pass for a tour of the dragon shrines of the world. This way, he'd get to see Norberta and other dragons. Hagrid spat out the drink that somehow found its way into his hand despite the numerous protections in the room because that was ten times more than what was spoken for. And where did that pass come from? But under Soizen's insistence and silver tongue, Hagrid could only agree through tears of emotion. When was the last time he felt so valued? This will be the best summer of his life. Soizen took Hagrid's snails and listened carefully to how they were to care for them, how to raise them, feed them seeds from the fire bush, etc. But at the end of the day, they are still snails and don't demand too much. Tom and the patrons of the Leaky Cauldron looked quizzically at the group coming down from the second floor. A half-giant who was crying but had a happy expression, a boy wizard who was smiling but for some reason seemed intimidating to them, and a beautiful lady who maintained a stoic but satisfied expression. By Merlin's beard, what happened in that room? It was a topic of conversation for weeks, until the prophet announced a certain escape from Azkaban. Why was Soizen so excited? Why it turns out that under the guidance he gave him in first year. Hagrid managed to recreate the Den Den Mushi. At least, the two basic ones out of the nine or ten variants he remembered. But they were the ones he wanted the most. The one used for calling and the one used for projecting images. Magic and technology interfere with each other, so it would be a waste of time for him to spend decades researching whether it is possible to fix it, so instead, he uses a magical beast that can replace those machines. 
they could put the Den Den Mushi on a bracelet to work as a watch and would only need the larger one to act as an antenna, allowing people to communicate without barriers. The call number was changed to an equally unique magic signature, so choosing multiple people is not a problem. They even mimicked the features of their owners. The one Hagrid kept had a beard that commanded respect. The only pity was that he now only had a few at his disposal, so for the next year, he would focus on multiplying them as much as possible. Before returning home, he stopped by an herbalist's shop and bought a large quantity of firebush seeds along with a special bag to carry them in. Nagini, we don't need to wait for Pomona's results, start acquiring greenhouses right away and personnel to manage them. There is no limit to the purchase price. I want us to be one of the largest producers of firebush seeds before Hogwarts is over. I'll see to it, Nagini understood the logic behind what he saw. Once the snails and soizen's hands become popular in all the magical communities, the demand for those seeds will reach the skies. What better time to establish a recognized brand? The days go by. How are you feeling, nervous? Nagini asked as Soizen paced around the room. I can't help it, Soizen sighed. He was about to make the final pass and they had already found a stormy area several miles away, so they could apparate there whenever they wanted. There were only a few minutes left to recite the last spell and after that, he would have exactly seven minutes to drink the lightning-struck potion. I don't think anything I say will help you relax, so go on, Nagini scoffed. How funny. Soizen kept spinning around as he examined the clock and when the minute hand reached the exact time, he repeated the spell and Nagini took his hand to appear in the storm. Soizen blasted the ground to dig quickly and left the vial with the blood-like potion in the hole, capping it with a spell and throwing a lightning rod right on top of it. Watch out! Nagini raised a shield just in time to protect them from the lightning that struck the lightning rod. That was fast, with a wave of his wand, he threw the lightning rod away and levitated the vial, which was now bubbling and changing color, before operating away from the storm. Drink quickly, I'll keep an eye on the surroundings, Nagini urged Soizen to drink, as there were only three minutes left. The young wizard did not hesitate, uncapped the potion and drank it in one gulp after spitting out the mandrick leaf that had been in his mouth for four weeks. Damn, it's burning. He complained as he took in cold air and cooled his tongue, apparently the lightning heated the mixture when it struck as well as changing its properties. He approached the shade of the largest tree and lay down under its shade. At first he felt nothing but burning in his stomach, which soon began to spread through his extremities and soon, he felt like his body was on fire. For a second. She really was on fire. Nagini held back her urge to go help as Soizen began to scream in pain and writhe, she merely made sure he didn't leave the shade of the tree. The flames surrounding it were unnatural and the tree didn't even show signs of burning, giving away that it appeared to be part of the higher animagus process. Apparently, his ancestor had neglected to note in the book that his last step hurt like hell. No wonder no one besides the family wanted to use this method. Crazy old man. Three long hours in which Soizen didn't stop screaming for a second passed, and his body began to change as the flames gradually died down. Nagini was the first person to see Soizen's higher animagus form, after which, she burst out laughing so hard that she fell backwards while holding her stomach. Chapter 68, Chamber Number 1 I said I'm sorry, okay? Nagini apologized for the third time since he finished the ritual and saw Soizen's superior animagus form. You were laughing at me. For twenty minutes. Sojin's expression was dark, he still seemed to hear the unbridled laughter in his ears like a ghost taunting him, and you still have that smile on your face. Can you blame me? Nagini raised her hands in surrender but without managing to remove the smile from her lips what did he expect me to do after seeing that? Soizen narrowed his eyes and stared at her. Deep down he knew he couldn't really blame her, since he hadn't expected to transform into something like that either. But there was one thing he knew with absolute certainty, when she died, she would find a way to see the late frustrant Gale Gold. He was going to beat the crap out of him. Who writes such a complete process and forgets to write down the last detail? And if I told him it was an insignificant and irrelevant detail? Another beating. He would show her how much love he feels for his ancestors, using his fists full of love. 
Even Garp will awaken an inferiority complex at the sight of her blows. Don't say anything to anyone, got it? Soizen averted his gaze and continued walking. Look at the bright side of the situation, it didn't take you long to master the shape-shifting and you achieved some unexpected benefits. Isn't that enough to consider it worth it? Nagini tried to console him, but the fact that he still smiled every time he thought of that form didn't exactly help. No, Soizen denied, remaining stubborn. Now you're just in a bad mood, Nagini shook his head sideways, well, it's still better than becoming a runespore or an acromantula. Can we stop talking about this? Soizen pleaded in a sad voice as he lowered his head dejectedly. Nagini kept quiet, implying that it was okay to close the matter. I wanted to meet the girls tomorrow, but they're all busy, so we'll take the day to go to Gringotts and go down to the vault. I'm curious what's inside, other than tons of money. I'm sure Gornick will be happy to take a long two-hour trip down to chamber number one, Nagini laughed, since you'll be going down there, maybe you can find out the details of the house you inherited, it could become the summer residence or something else. Don't you intend to accompany me? I can't leave the store unattended for too long, that would be counterproductive and could harm your interests, Nagini explained as she caressed the choker on her neck, besides, it's your family chamber, I don't think anyone besides you can even enter it. The older a family is, the more they make sure that their secrets are only known to their lineage and no one else. Two hours riding around in those hellish carriages to wait for who knows how long without seeing anything in another two hours on the way back. Doused with magic water to reveal impostors, see tortured and blind dragons. No thanks. I guess you're right, Soizen sighed, realizing how uncomfortable the trip would be. He won't even be able to converse, as Gornick will have to pay attention to the tracks, the speed, and try not to get lost on a road that hasn't been used for like a thousand years. Great, now he's worrying about the condition of the road. What if any of the tracks have broken down or broken? How often do they do maintenance on these places? Or do they use metal enchanted by themselves to avoid these problems? So many questions. The next morning, Soizen stood before the doors of Gringotts and his entrance was like that of just another customer throughout the day. It only took a few minutes for Gornick to come personally to attend to him. Air Galegold, I hear you intend for me to escort you to the family chamber today. He asked politely even though he knew the answer by the way he was unconsciously rubbing his hands together. Indeed, I do intend to go down to the chamber, Soizen confirmed, given all the time that has passed since it was last opened, is it possible that there might be a problem on the way? We are experts not only in making our famous silver, but also in the maintenance of all kinds of gears used in our work. Gringotts always does his duty. Always with due commission, right? Naturally. Soizen experienced the famous ride on the Gringotts rails and it turned out to be exciting, actually. It was like riding a roller coaster whose general tendency was to go down at high speeds, but it took surprise curves and other detours that defied the laws of physics. As they went down, the various safety measures flashed before Soizen's eyes. He was not at all comfortable seeing how one of them was a tortured dragon trained to identify the sound of a bell with pain, causing him to move out of the way out of sheer fear. Three hours later. Due to a single mistake in one division, they had to make a long turn on the rails and it took them an additional hour to reach their destination. Wow. Soizen did not immediately get off his transport, but looked with interest at his family's chamber. A colossal stalactite with several gold veins descended from the ceiling and by carving into the stone itself, a five-meter-high door with vivid, golden images stood imposingly. If one paid attention, one could observe tiny gears and mechanical parts protruding discreetly in different parts that originally appeared to be merely aesthetic. A circular platform of fuchsia marble with lines of white was the only ground to step on to approach and reach the doors. Curiously, Soizen could not see that the place looked abandoned for a thousand years, since despite the atmosphere, there was not a single speck of dust anywhere, as if it had been thoroughly cleaned minutes before his arrival. I'll wait here, Gornick informed him as he stared intently at the streaks of gold and the stalactite, which seemed to flow like liquid gold, check Gringotts' records and well, I'd better not go near the door. Soizen nodded and approached the entrance to the chamber. How does it open? He turned and asked. There is a small slot five feet high in the center of the door, 
that's all I know, Gornick replied. Soizen searched carefully and found the mentioned slot. He stared at it for a few seconds, being sure that the size looked familiar. Is it possible? He looked away from the door and looked at his ring. With a thought, it transformed into a gold dagger and after comparing sizes, he was sure that the blade would fit perfectly with the slot. And he was right, the moment he stabbed the door, the gears began to turn, slowly at first until they sped up and a passage was revealed through which an adult person could enter. Indeed, my mother's dagger was the key, Soizen nodded, happy that he had not forgotten something so important. He entered the chamber through what seemed like a thin film of cold water as the doors behind him closed and the intense light inside caused his eyes to take a moment to adjust. It's about time. It's been a millennium of boredom. May I ask what took you so long? Chapter 69, The Purpose of the Blood Ritual The sudden voice made Soizen startle and unconsciously all his skin darkened, while his eyes lit up like gold as he charged his magic to react to whatever was about to happen. What are you doing? He heard again. Soizen's eyes looked around, but all he saw were rivers of gold coins flowing, literally. Some ancient-looking statues, books kept in glass cases, wooden chests, shelves with silver goblets and other treasures. Well, don't you intend to introduce yourself? The manners of today's youth. Soizen at last located the source of the voice, a statue made of gold and laid with precious gems of an old man with a rather strange beard, divided into three sections. Shouldn't you introduce yourself first? Soizen didn't even think about his answer, it just came right out. The golden statue frowned at Soizen's response, but rather than angry, his expression was thoughtful. Do you really not know who I am? Asked the statue. Didn't your parents tell you? What's more, why didn't anyone come for so long? I don't know who you are, my mother died, I don't know who my biological father is, and I think I'm the only Gale Gold left. Besides, it took about a thousand years in my mother's womb before anyone found me. That shouldn't be possible. How did you? Wait, did you say a thousand years? The statue latched on to the available information instead of the absent one, Em, mm, you actually look a lot like little Syra, the statue looked him up and down and commented faintly. It was my mother, Soizen nodded. The situation is not right, the statue muttered as it looked at a shelf with oil lamps, only one of which was lit at the moment, to think it has come to this, a single lamp of life. I hoped I'd never have to see this, the statue let go a heavy sigh as she pointed her finger at an artifact beside her, boy, see that silver blade? Drop a drop of blood on it. Soizen stood still looking at it for a moment, but did as he asked. After dropping the blood on the silver sheet, the blood was swallowed and the statue's eyes lit up for a few seconds as it trembled. I see, a temple to motherhood. Poor Syra, she really was such a sweet girl, the statue nodded sadly, so this is all that has happened since then, what a tragedy. Thank you for clearing up my doubts, Soizen. Ha! Huh. This silver blade is used to communicate memories through the blood connection, the statue explained to the confused look of the young mage. This made Soizen petrified. You don't have to worry, kid, the statue assured him as he waved his hand, worried about the extra memories you have. That's not even a rarity in the family. What do you mean? This time he was genuinely confused. I think I should introduce myself before proceeding, the statue bowed in ancient custom, as she placed her right hand over her heart, my name is Karako. I was, am, and will be, the embodied heir of the Gale Gold lineage. A pleasure to meet you, heir. Likewise, I suppose. As you know, the Gale Gold family went through a dark time when they were forced to perform a huge blood ritual out of desperation. If I'm not mistaken, the rest of the world still doesn't know what the effect of the ritual was and that's good for us. But, it seems that the real motive for the attack on the family was not revealed either. Wasn't it jealousy and greed? Soizen asked. No doubt jealousy was very much involved, Karako nodded in agreement, but greed was just something that came up later. You see, far from what the more paranoid families may think, in reality the goal of the ritual was extremely simple and straightforward. To ensure the continuation of the Gale Gold lineage, in the full sense of the intention. I don't understand. 
Yes, I think you need some more context, the statue took a few seconds to organize the words in her mind, let's start with the real reason for the attack. If we were to use a hierarchy in the world based on magic, then at the bottom would be the common animals. They would be followed by muggles, plants or magical creatures, and on top of everything else, wizards. Soizen nodded, understanding the big picture. Now, what if wizards were not the top of that pyramid? Kurako asked. What if there was something, or rather, someone above the wizards? A step further up the ladder of magic, the next step in evolution we might say. You mean the Gale Gold managed to reach the next step and the mages attacked them out of jealousy and fear? Even Soizen found it hard to believe what the statue was saying. The Gale Gold are the best of the best, blessed with intelligence, a more than desirable attractiveness, a talent for magic and a good eye for business. This alone already makes many look upon them with jealousy, but at best, it would win them some trouble. Now, what if the magicians discovered that they are no longer, nor can they, call themselves the superior beings they think they are? That someone will be above them just by being born. I think I see where this is going. Yeah, it's not that hard, is it? The statue chuckled grumpily, perhaps wizards are a much smaller number compared to muggles, but the gale gold were also few compared to wizards back then. So relying on numbers. You know how it went. And what do you mean by the intent of the ritual? You see, just as if you use a human sacrifice instead of an animal, you get much more magic as a comparison, the fact that so many Gale Gold died only served to enhance a blood ritual like never before. And who do you think the family made the pact with? Soizen shrugged, he didn't have much knowledge of sacrificial magic. The world. It was with the whole world that a pact was made, irrevocable and perpetual. After the blood ritual, the lineage of the Gale Gold will never disappear. But, there could be many loopholes in such a pact if someone else made it, but as a Gale Gold, how could we allow that? What kind of loopholes? For example, it could satisfy the pact by causing the bloodline to believe itself to be Muggle after a few generations, merging with the general population. Or it could leave only a single survivor per generation who would have a crazy night to leave offspring before perishing by some unfortunate event. But we weren't going to allow something like that. Chapter 70, Golden Statue Kurako spent the next 40 minutes explaining the intricate details of the blood ritual, how they made sure the family was always involved in the magic, that they would not lack money and more. And due to the excess of sacrificial magic, we also achieved some occasional blessings, such as gaining some unusual insights. It could be a vision of the future, magic from other worlds, etc. So your memories of a different timeline, natural acclimacy, or your ability as a shapeshifter, actually, is something you got thanks to your lineage. Any additional blessings I should know about? Since you are the sole survivor, it could be said that all blessings are centered on you. Only when you start leaving offspring will the blessings start to be distributed among all the members. Speaking of which, I remember we had a lot of engagement debts in the family, you should consider settling some to have several wives and revive the Gale Gold lineage with vigor. I think having eight wives giving birth to thirty to fifty children should be the minimum. Please don't start with that too, Soy's inside as he rubbed the bridge of his nose, my mothers already seem to have a strange idea of me in that regard. I don't understand you. You're a Gale Gold. So-called pure-blood families should be killing each other to get a betrothal with you. Kurako exclaimed, in fact, some of these engagement debts were obtained this way. And why is that? Because no matter what your spouse's family is, the offspring is always a gale gold. Their blood integrates and reinforces ours, never the other way around. Can we talk about something other than that? Soizen begged, crying without tears. Her hormones hadn't even been awakened yet, so her interest in that area was rather meager. That's okay, though in my day, it wasn't uncommon to have some commitments at your age. How long have you been here anyway? Soizen made an abrupt change of subject to close the continuation in that direction, and you said you were the Gale Gold inheritance. I was born approximately five years after the blood ritual, at the hands of one of your ancestors, Kurako explained as he gestured around him. You can consider me somewhat similar to the animated portraits of the headmasters at Hogwarts, only I am older and my creation was infinitely more complex. 
All the family's knowledge, research and information is condensed in me. And how is it that you have not degraded after so long? One only had to look back to see that even the most enduring enchantment eventually wore out under the yoke of time. Oh, right. According to the statue, your family was the exception. Thanks to money. Whenever I start to decay, I just need to reach over to these rivers of galleons beside me and pull out a handful of coins to eat them. In this way, I restore the lost material and using the remnants of magic they contain due to close contact with wizards and witches, I can also sustain my existence. Soizen did not expect it to work this way at all. He suspected that perhaps this was an intricate and complex network of high-level alchemical formations. But eating a few galleons is enough. He was disappointed, but at the same time impressed by the simplicity of the solution. Actually, there are some things I want to tell you about, even if I've already seen them through the blood, said Karako. What is it about? Starting with the most recent, I think your superior animagus form is quite adequate, he congratulated. Soizen's face darkened. Why couldn't he stop talking about it? Don't be like that. You could have gotten a lot worse. In my opinion, maybe it's not something as cool as a kid your age would expect, like becoming a dragon or something, but it's undeniable that you've benefited. Aren't your illusions much stronger now? No. Soizen wasn't sure. After adapting to his new form, he didn't use too much magic and Nagini commented something similar. Personally, he didn't really feel any difference. I guess Frustran left the notes half finished again. Karako let out an exaggerated sigh, he assured you, that boy always had his mind in three different places at once. Listen, the higher animagus form not only allows you to assume the form of a magical creature, but you also get some feedback from it. Why do you think it hurts so much? What kind of feedback? It can be a physical trait, a talent, a magical ability, etc. Kirako shrugged, I remember one of the most prominent ones was when Vagarad Galegold obtained the animagic form of a Chilin and with it, the ability to look into a person's soul to see if they have a pure heart. That's a pretty powerful ability. Yeah, too bad he went crazy the following week. Seeing the darkness in the people around him didn't sit too well with him, Karako told him, shaking her head sadly, that's why I say your form is so fitting, you got enough of a boost, but within your control. Power can be a good thing, air, but power without control is not a desirable thing. Okay, I'll try the illusions later, but I still think that form is not really the one I should have gotten, Soizen weakly protested. The statue laughed at the childish attitude. While he could understand why it complained, it was really just a difference in perspective. Many others would have been proud to get that shape. Now, I'm quite happy to see that the family's spirit of inquiry is still alive, but you should have done more testing before using that potion on yourself. While it came out as expected, let me warn you that it was a success partially obtained thanks to your blessings. Otherwise and looking at the formula you used, it is possible that you would have lost an arm. Do you have a way to prevent my eyes from turning gold when I use magic? Soizen suddenly realized that if this statue had been in the family for so long, he should be able to solve his problem that prevented him from using magic discreetly. Karako looked at him for a moment, this boy is not at all subtle in changing the subject. I'm afraid not, he shook his head, you see, that's one of our shortcomings after taking the next step up the magic ladder. Some didn't like it either and tried inventing eye drops, wearing contact lenses or glasses and even more extreme measures, but regardless of their efforts, golden eyes is a trait that always runs in the family. I see, Soizen had to resign himself to not being able to use sneaky magic apparently. Perhaps this will lift your spirits. You're researching how to cure the condition your current mothers who are called squibs have, aren't you? Do you know anything about it? Soizen looked seriously at the golden statue. You're not the first in the family to research it, Karako smiled. Chapter 71, Third Year, Let's Go There Gornick was drooling as he looked at a fold-out page from the latest issue of Pointy, Golden Beauties magazine. Minutes passed and he had already been waiting for four hours for Air Gale Gold to emerge from the chamber, so a little wholesome, eye-pleasing entertainment was in order. He was just about to turn to the next page, 
when he heard the large door to chamber number one open and hurried to stow the magazine in the secret compartment that all carriages have, initially intended for storing emergency rations. As he turned to look, the golden glow that filtered from between the doors left him momentarily blinded and excited. Suddenly, he felt that the magazine was not so pleasing to the eye. We can go, he heard as the jolt in the carriage indicated that Soizen had climbed into his seat. Gornick blinked several times as he tried to regain his sight and only after he did so after a couple of minutes did they begin their return trip. Although Gornick was extremely curious about the contents of the vault, as a Gringotts professional, he maintained a trained and proper attitude. Soizen was seriously pondering everything he heard from Karako. He handed her the results of his predecessor's research regarding the squib's condition and after reading them, he knew that decades of effort were saved. The squib condition was treatable. The only drawback was that although his ancestors managed to devise a preliminary formula, it was no longer valid, because many of the ingredients used were extinct, so he needed to recreate a version using modern magical ingredients. But the important thing is that he now had a clear path to follow. What's more, if he succeeded, he might even be able to create a 2.0 version for muggles to become wizards. But since he wouldn't make any profit from it and he knew how the wizarding community would react to losing the exclusivity of the magic that makes them special. What happened to his family in the past is a good example and a little doubt whether he should take revenge for something that happened so long ago was on his mind. Leaving aside this matter, Karako also shared with him a lot of family research, but they were barely a drop in the ocean. The statue feared that giving him everything all at once would end up frying his brain. So she only provided him with what she felt was adequate to keep him occupied at his current level and in line with what he might need, without holding anything back from him. He didn't forget to ask about the house and land he inherited, but Karako made it clear that he had better not think about the house until he graduated from Hogwarts and refused to elaborate. Finally, she gave him a strange luminescent green concoction to drink that seemed to contain silver dust floating inside. It had a strange blue cheese cucumber aftertaste and its function was to fix the hidden defects in her body due to her mother's long gestation. After he finished drinking it, it was as if several weights spread throughout his body had been removed and he felt much lighter and more energetic. Even his magic reserve became bigger and purer. He benefited greatly from the visit to the family chamber and now regrets very much that he didn't go down last year. From now on, he would make sure to go down once a year at least. Not only to keep Karako abreast of what is going on in the world in his life, but also to slowly inherit the treasure of his family's knowledge. Back home. Soizen, are you all right? Inta asked him once she saw him enter the dining room. I think so, why? Soizen answered while examining himself. I don't know, you look a little different, reflected Inta, without being able to point out that he was out of place. And observed him as well but found nothing out of place. Only Nagini noticed the change and was making great efforts to contain her reaction in front of the family. Leaving aside the abrupt increase in magic she could sense in her master, she couldn't understand how the quality of magic could have changed so much. If she wanted to get a tenth of that improvement, she would need to focus on casting high-intensity magic every day for the next twenty years. What kind of opportunities did she find in the Gringotts vault? I'm fine, Mom, Soizen assured her, in fact, she had never felt better, Nagini, let's start today's practice, she asked eager to see and control her new levels of magic. Nagini saw Soizen's excitement and concern and said goodbye to Anne and Inta to go to the usual place. Several minutes later. Enough. Nagini said as she caught her breath a little, don't you think you're a little too excited today? She complained. Before she could dominate Soizen without too much effort and patiently teach him, but now the magical intensity of the spells aimed at her were no joke and she had to take it all more seriously, exhausting her. Ah! Soizen was just warming up and the sudden interruption threw him out of his rhythm, what do you mean, we're just getting started. Nagini held her palm to her face, she didn't know what had happened to Soizen, but he was in an overly excited state right now, like a sugar and coffee high, most likely a temporary side effect of his sudden improvement. Let's change the focus of the practice, try using the Patronus next, Nagini immediately tried to take advantage of the situation and wanted to help Soizen overcome his inability to form a corporeal Patronus. 
Perhaps his current state would stimulate him enough to achieve this. Soizen wanted to keep casting high-intensity spells like Bombarda, which he found unexpectedly stimulating today, but he listened to Nagini and tried to change his approach. Expecto Patronum It took him four days to lose that overspell state and return to normal. During the rest of the summer, he learned Nagini's battle transition and had several encounters with Sylvia, as Hermione and her family went on vacation to France and could only exchange letters. She also did some Nico Ravenheart gig and although she didn't win the lawsuit against the profit jury corruption be damned, Rita Skeever's case was supported by countless victims and she almost lost her job. In the end, she was forced to take a magical oath never to smear Nico Ravenheart again. And how could Rita agree to that? Let's just say the Ravenheart fans were very deterring with their looks. Now Soizen was waiting at the Nine End Station as he contemplated the locomotive in front of him. A generous donation was received this summer to refurbish the machinery and bring it up to speed, with a few additional surprises. Once he met up with Sylvia, Hermione, Luna and Ginny, they boarded the engine and found a carriage as they waited for the journey to begin for Soizen's third year at the school. He had to try very hard not to laugh at the sight of them all wearing Nico Ravenheart shirts. Chapter 72, Courage The express left the station and started its journey to Hogwarts Station. What's with the grin? Hermione's sharp gaze caught Soizen's reaction. Nothing, I see you really like Ravenheart, being the only one who didn't share his costume with those present, he pointed out without much concern. That's great. Sylvia nodded as she spoke excitedly, no one knows where it came from, but now everyone knows about it. What's your favorite song? Mine is Dance of the Red Crows. I like Moon Without Bones, said Hermione. Clouds of Tears, added Ginny. I think Flowers of Stone is fine, Luna voiced her opinion, what about you, Soizen? For a moment, he considered teasing them and saying he didn't like Ravenheart, but seeing the looks on their faces, he had a feeling that doing so wouldn't end well for him, so he compromised. I prefer rainbow flying fish, they say if you're lucky you can touch them. The girls nodded, agreeing that it was indeed one of the best he had. Once the topic was on, they all started talking about Ravenheart and Soizen would only give a few comments every now and then, preferring to listen to the opinions of the others for references and possible improvements. I guess there must not be too much left, he thought as he saw the outside beginning to darken. Suddenly, Mulan's song with courage began to play over the express speakers. Isn't that Ravenheart's song Great Typhoon? Ginny asked in surprise. Soizen frowned, this was the alarm he set for when the temperature drop was unnatural. That meant the Dementors were about to enter the Hogwarts Express. Not on his watch. He pressed the button on a den den mushy he had under his sleeve and several screens in each carriage unfolded, revealing an animated Fallout style movie. Greetings, young witches and wizards. If you are watching this, it means you are about to be attacked by dark creatures, but fear not. See the crystal ball that has risen in the middle of your carriage? You only need to inject magic into it and it will generate a protective shield with everyone's combined effort. The animation showed how the magic went into the ball, surrounded the train and shut out the evil cartoon creatures, remember to add as much magic as possible until help arrives or you escape the danger zone. Have a good day. The young wizards and witches were dumbfounded and stared at the ball in the middle of the wagon. It was then that they realized that the cold around them did not seem natural and hurried to put magic on the ball. Outside the express, the Dementors were about to enter to inspect the carriages and sneakily steal some delicious happiness, when a shield appeared and drove them backwards. At first, the shield appeared to be wavy and not too consistent, but seconds later, a cocoon of light formed completely around the train that never stopped and kept moving forward. The Dementors were annoyed and started banging on the shield, wanting to claim something from that young meal. Wow, Fallout's animation came again along with his characteristic voice, looks like the dark creatures aren't happy and want to come in. But we won't let them, will we? Please increase the magic you bring and the counterattack mode will be activated. The prefects were going through the carriages, urging the young wizards and witches to inject as much magic as they could without holding back a bit. You could tell they were sweating from how fast they were visiting each wagon. 
Soizen and her friends were contributing as much as they could and soon another piece of music began to play as several light figures formed outside and began to fight off the Dementors, managing to send most of them fleeing and completely destroying a few. The music was Digimon's brave heart and the figures could only be recognized by Soizen through the window as Angeman, Angewoman, Anubismon, Pegasusmon, Nefertman, Seraphimon, Ophanimon, Lusmon, and Mastamon. One of the surprises he installed in the modernization of the Hogwarts locomotive that could only be sustained due to the magic of all the wizards and witches inside it for a short period of time. It turns out that as long as the locomotive exerting traction was not affected, it was not a problem to modify the wagons with some magic. Mulan's song was to inspire the passengers, dispelling their fear so that when they subsequently injected magic into the defense system, it would have a Patronus-like effect capable of damaging Dementors to some extent. You could say it was a counter-attack mode that relied on quantity versus quality, but it couldn't get any better with the size of the transport and the short time. And it was working pretty well. I just hoped the Dementors didn't come back later, I had serious doubts that the little wizards would be able to activate the defensive measures a couple of times due to the extremely high magic consumption. Were those Dementors? Ginny was looking through the window blankly, aren't they under ministry control and far away guarding Azkaban? How could they appear here at this time? It must be because of mad serious Black's escape, Sylvia frowned, but sending Dementors where the students are. What if they don't have competent auras available or what? What if they give a student a kiss? Luna was pale and silent, but it was certainly a much better outcome than when she was directly exposed to the presence of the Dementors. Meanwhile, Hermione and Sylvia were a bit calmer as Soizen had them learn the Patronus charm by chance. Take some, Soizen brought out some chocolate bonbons eat some and you'll feel better, my mom said it was a good way to recover after being around one of those things. The girls accepted the chocolate and ate it in silence. Soizen, why don't you look so upset? Hermione commented after several bites. Don't you remember who taught you the Patronus? Soizen raised his eyebrow and improvised an excuse, I was not only injecting magic into the ball, but I also added the Patronus mist as a reinforcement. I guess that's why I'm not as affected. Hermione nodded, considering that what Soizen was saying was logical. It's just that neither Sylvia nor she thought of doing that during the crisis. Once the Dementors disappeared from the vicinity, the Digimon figures turned into streams of light that joined the shield, which held firm for another minute until the students believed it was safe and they could cut off the supply of magic. It looks like this year is going to get off to a bumpy start. Chapter 73, Which Electives to Take Why wasn't I notified of the new defensive measure on the Hogwarts Express? By now, the aura in charge of inspecting the carriages was fuming out of his ears. His only job was to make sure the Dementors didn't go too far overboard during their search with the students, and suddenly, he has to deal with the Dementors coming to him aggrieved and accusing him of leading them into a trap. Sir, the measures were only implemented this month and were not expected to be activated so soon, explained a subordinate who had to endure the wrath of his superior without protesting. They were only supposed to be activated in case of an attack to ensure the safety of passengers and staff. Perhaps if we had informed the passengers of the search in advance, they would not have activated the defenses when they panicked. Someone is going to have to take responsibility for what happened and it won't be me. Cried the Auror. It's never you, thought the subordinate as he rolled his eyes inwardly. How else did someone so incompetent manage to climb so high in the ministry? The carriages picked up all the students at the station without exception, including the first years who would not be able to make the traditional route because of the storm and the disturbed Dementors in the surrounding area. They were still talking about the attack and how they managed to defend themselves with great success, feeling very curious about what kind of creatures were protecting them. In the great dining hall, the sorting ceremony took place and Soizen heard some familiar names like Ramil de Vane and Astoria Greengro. His house received a few more students and at the end of dinner, he should lead them as in other years. It was announced that Hagrid would be taking over care of magical creatures this year, which he was already expecting when he saw that he had to get a copy of the monstrous Book of Monsters. It was entertaining to watch Sylvia run around the store as she ran away from the book when they went to get it, while he held another copy and stroked her spine to make her behave meekly. Coincidentally, they ran into Neville who also came looking for the same book, 
resulting in the end in both Neville and the bookseller crying. Should he have told the salesman how to calm the book? Nah, I'm sure it would be fine. Some exercise is always healthy. And remember not to give the Dementors any reason to attack you. It is not in their nature to forgive, Dumbledore finished his speech as Soizen rambled on. What lessons did he have this year? According to the letter he received they would be, potions, herbology, defense against the dark arts, transformations, history of magic, astronomy, charms, and he was to choose two or more electives. The possibilities were, divination, arithmancy, ancient runes, care of magical creatures and muggle studies. Divination was ruled out at the first second, if Professor Trelawney used her gift on him, who knows what would happen. To her. Arithmancy could prove very useful for her research, so no doubt she was the first to be selected. Ancient runes was ruled out, she already proved long ago that she is not very talented in that field and it would divide her attention too much. Care of magical creatures might be okay and was somewhat practical outdoors, but she should approach Hagrid to get an idea of what creatures he would use for his lessons other than Buckbeak, the hippogriff. And perhaps persuade him to remove some from the list. Muggle studies was a waste of time for anyone who wasn't a pure blood, not to mention how seriously out of date his information was. It looks like he'll have to stick with arithmancy and care of magical creatures. In two years she'll have to take the Timos and in seventh year it'll be the Ecstasises, she'd better make sure she's up to date with everything she needs to. Wait, wasn't this the year Hermione would be getting her time turner? Hmm, she should check to see if either of the two electives she's interested in overlap with the regular lessons. If so, she'll also apply for a time turner. Or perhaps you could share Hermione's, which knowing her, she will undoubtedly take as much as she can. He recalled that she was attending Hagrid's class during the Hippogriff attack on Malfoy, so he just needed to additionally confirm whether she would be taking arithmancy. He already had experience handling a time turner, so it shouldn't be inconvenient. After finishing dinner and guiding the newcomers to the common room, explaining the rules and the characteristics of his house, Soizen soon went to bed alone. This year, considering the presence of the Dementors and Sirius, he didn't risk bringing Rada with him to keep him company. The next morning, he went to find Hermione during lunch and after whispering the reason to her, they went to find Professor McGonagall in her office. How did you learn of the existence of the Time Turner, Mr. Gale Gold? McGonagall asked after listening to them. Because I used one during my time at Bose Batons, there was little point in making excuses, so Soizen told the truth, I just want permission to use it with Hermione to attend my electives. Since coincidentally, she will also be attending them and it won't be necessary to ask for an additional time turner. In fact, I believe we were informed of something like that, McGonagall suddenly remembered that they were indeed notified of Soizen's responsible use of such a device, fine, I'll allow it. But you know the rules. No one will know for me, teacher, Soizen nodded. Hermione also did a good job of keeping the secret that he remembered, Ron's reactions to her sudden appearance were hilarious during the movie and now he could be a part of that. He did a schedule check and aside from arithmancy, he really didn't need to use the time turner for anything else. Thanks to taking lessons with Gryffindor since first year, finding a time to sneak off with Hermione would be very easy. Not only that, he gave Hermione some tips on how to avoid some of the drawbacks of using a time turner, which he discovered from experience during his time at the French school. This included especially nutritious meals to compensate for the overexertion of the body in setting limits for adequate sleep, without affecting studies. Although Hermione was somewhat reluctant to such limits, she decided to listen to the voice of experience and trust her best friend to optimize her study time as much as possible. Especially when she heard that her grades might be affected. And so, the first week at Hogwarts passed without incident despite the decadent presence of the dark creatures roaming the castle grounds. It was only after the teacher's meeting, during the phase when they were discussing observations about the students, that Professor Sinistra caught the attention of the other teachers. We have a problem with Mr. Gale Gold. Chapter 74, Opposite Effect The teachers exchanged glances and had a bad premonition after hearing Sinistra's words, as if something inside their memory stirred. Why did the situation seem so similar? Can you be more specific? I have observed nothing out of the ordinary in him during my lessons in the greenhouses, in fact, 
he is performing remarkably well. I think many here will agree with me that there are few who can keep up with them among their year mates. Miss Granger, Mr. Longbottom. The teachers nodded, realizing that Neville's mention on this occasion was solely due to his talent in herbology, which seemed to overshadow any others he might have as for the other lessons. Is he that good? Hagrid asked with curious eyes. Because his lessons needed to employ magical creatures. He still wouldn't start his first lesson for another two days because of his preparations and he was attending this teacher's meeting for the first time to try to better understand how to teach a class and seek inspiration. Sure, Hagrid would get visits from Soizen during his time at Hogwarts, but they usually talk about topics that pique his interest such as his ideas of hybridization, strange animals and something Soizen called animal biology. The few times his studies came up in conversation, he mentioned that it wasn't bad. In fact, the problem is that he is too much, commented Sinistra as she rubbed her eyebrows somewhat exasperated and amused, I think the idea of sending him to Bozbatons the year before, might have backfired on all of us. I agree with what Sinistra said, sighed McGonagall as she recalled the first lessons of this school year, while Mr. Galegold has made great progress in his studies during his time there, it has also caused the opposite effect that we had hoped for. Instead of getting the other students to close the gap with him while he was getting a pleasant experience, we have only succeeded in making the difference between them even more marked. I can give an example from just this morning, commented Professor Flittick as he took the floor, today I taught the knot tying incantation. While most struggled to get the piece of rope in front of them to tie the simplest knot, Mr. Galegold gave an exemplary demonstration of thirteen much more complex sailor knots. While I could see that he was trying to prove himself, I fear he was unaware of the blow he struck to the spirit of the other students by doing so. You can't blame one outstanding student for the lack of determination of the others, Snape burst out, rushing to Soizen's defense, I hope you're not thinking of another school exchange for each remaining year. Castello Bruxo, Ilvermorny, Durmstrang, Mahudakoro. He mentioned several of the possible schools with his talent and mind, the only thing that will be achieved will be to accentuate the difference even more and we can't send him every year to a different place, it's not good for him. Severus is right, nodded McGonagall earnestly once the crux of the problem was pointed out, instead of trying to comfort most of the students, we should find a way to encourage them and stimulate their competitive spirit. Otherwise, it will look like we are blaming Mr. Galegold for standing out above the rest. So what do we do? I suggested moving up a year, but both he and Dumbledore denied that possibility. He wants to graduate with his friends. What if we made a personalized curriculum for him? Lupin kept quiet during the whole meeting, but felt that this was the ideal moment to intervene, I did a small test on the first day to see the general level of the students taking into account their previous teachers. And what was the result? I have a lot of work ahead of me, Lupin grimaced as he recalled some of the answers he read, generally speaking, their first-year knowledge is half-baked and it seems they learned almost nothing during their second year. I have too much to make up for. There are only a few students with adequate knowledge like. Lupin tried to remember, but he was still memorizing the names of the students and had to take out a parchment to review, Hermione, Tracy, Sylvia. He mentioned seven names and they were all from students that the professors knew were above average. What about Soizen? I'm sorry, I met Mr. Galegold, he shrugged at McGonagall's look and apologized. He still had to get used to the idea that he was going to be a teacher in front of the students. To be honest, he has a very solid knowledge spanning up to fourth-year defense against the dark arts and maybe a little beyond, said Lupin who still remembers the astonishment he felt. And that said I'm still not clear on his level of spell casting, but from what Mr. Flittick has mentioned and what I heard from an event at the dueling club, it seems he should have no problems in that area. Even more surprising, considering he doesn't even use a wand. But if we do that, we'll most likely run out of anything to teach him after his fifth year that was McGonagall's concern. While it was great to have such an outstanding student, if the teachers couldn't teach him anything in his final two years it would be very embarrassing for it, the school, and bad for the student. What if we ask him to act as a teacher's aide? Flittick proposed, maybe we'll awaken his interest in teaching and he'll start helping the other students, that would be a great help for everyone. I don't think it will work, I heard he made the potions teacher at Bozbaton's cry. He seems to lack patience in dealing with those who are not on the same level as him in their interests. 
I have a few suggestions that I think might fix the situation, Snape raised his hand to get everyone's attention, however, it will take some effort and preparations. I think any idea is a good one to hear at this time, Pomona said. Snape explained what his idea was and the professors listened attentively, ending up somewhat surprised by the route of thought their potions professor had. Actually, it's not a bad idea reflected Professor Sinistra while drumming her fingers on the dark mahogany table and not only Mr. Gale Gold would benefit, other students might also be interested. It could become a recurring tradition. But as Severus mentioned, the idea requires preparing everything in advance and it is not guaranteed to be successful, McGonagall frowned, because as deputy headmistress. She was aware of how complicated the matter could be, I will need to consult the headmaster to get him to approve the idea and I will only be able to start during the Christmas vacations. Don't worry, Minerva. We have all this year and two more ahead of us to make this work, Flitta consoled, I and the others will ask around, I'm sure we can find a way to make it happen. Chapter 75, Think Fast Soizen was a bit nervous as he walked down the hill to what would be Hagrid's first class, where he would introduce the hippogriff Buckbeak that Malfoy would later stupidly provoke. And the reason he was nervous was because he intended to steal Harry's position and be the one to befriend the hippogriff. Maybe he could even fly. I think this is the first time I've ever disliked a book. Apart from Lockhart's, I mean, Hermione wasn't too keen on the monstrous monster book and its strong character that drove it to bite its reader, although at least it didn't happen to me the same way it did to Sylvia. Don't mention it, she almost threw her copy at me to teach me a lesson, smiled Soizen, too bad for her. I know the trick of the book, she said while showing her copy that wasn't tied with a string and was behaving meekly, to the complete bewilderment of all the other Gryffindor and Slytherin students. How did you do that? Ron asked, not understanding how he had managed to calm the paper beast. Just pet its back, how else? Replied Soizen with an expression that implied it was common sense and questioned his sanity. Ron wanted to respond, but was at a loss for words, so he shut his mouth and turned away from them with Harry as he tried to sneakily follow that advice. It's exactly as you said. Guys, open the book to page 49 Hagrid listened to Soizen's explanation and was glad that at least one of his students could understand the playful instinct of the book he personally selected five points for Gale Gold. I wish I'd known that sooner, Neville muttered as he picked himself up off the floor after an attack from his book startled him. Hello, Hagrid, ouch, Soizen was elbowed in the ribs by Hermione. You should call him Professor. It's okay, it's okay, Soizen rubbed the bruised area, feeling aggrieved. Wouldn't it have been enough to tug the sleeve of her robe discreetly? When did this girl become so violent? Don't tell me that the homework she left them during the second year hardened her character. Welcome everyone to your first care of magical creatures lesson. Hagrid clapped his hands and began reciting what he had been rehearsing on his horse all afternoon yesterday. A tip courtesy of the professors, wait here while I go find today's creature, form a group over there, that's it. Hagrid was glad he didn't stutter this time and went to fetch the surprise he had specially prepared to make a good first impression. Soizen watched as Malfoy pulled the Dementor prank on Potter and was almost tempted to create an illusory Dementor to pee his pants. But, since that might cause the lesson to be cancelled, he decided to restrain himself and keep it down to mere harmless teasing. Unlike the original timeline, this time it was Ron who pulled Potter away from the conflict and not Hermione, who just rolled her eyes at the chosen boy's gullibility. A temperature drop hadn't even happened. How could the Dementors be around? No wonder his grades were almost as bad as Ron's, he wasted all his time on Quidditch and didn't study hard enough for sure. Ahem. Hagrid caught everyone's attention with a throat clearing, ta terroran. A grey feathered hippogriff approached and entered the vision of all the students, causing them to take two steps back unconsciously. Well, all except Soizen who actually took them forward to get a better look. Isn't it beautiful? Hagrid asked with his trademark grin that came out whenever he dealt with creatures as he tossed a ferret-shaped snack to the hippogriff, say hello to Buckbeak. Hagrid, what creature is that? Ron asked. Soizen turned and frowned when he saw that Hermione didn't hit Ron. This is discrimination. Because he got hit for casually addressing his friend and Ron didn't get hit? This, Ron, is a hippogriff. Hagrid was unaware of Soizen's injustice and explained earnestly in a deeper voice, 
what you should know about them is that they are proud creatures. They are easily offended and they should not be bothered, because it might be the last thing they would do, he looked at everyone and seeing that he had their attention, he nodded happily and clapped his hands together, good. Who wants to say hello? Neville immediately took cover behind the stone just like in the movie, while the rest of the students backed away, except for Potter, who stood there stiff as a scarecrow. Seeing how Hagrid was about to turn his head and mistake Potter's lack of action for volunteerism, he stepped forward. I will, Hagrid, as he walked past without looking at Potter, who realized at the last second that they had all left him in silent sacrifice were it not for Soizen's appearance. He was about to thank him, but realizing that he didn't do it for him, he wisely kept quiet as he stepped back to join the rest of the students. Hermione for her part, couldn't believe her friend had the courage to approach such a dangerous creature. That's right, Soizen, very good. Hagrid forgot professional courtesy and spoke as he was always accustomed to, approach it slowly and lean in, then wait to see if it responds. If he does, you can touch him. If not, we'll improvise something. Soizen gave an old-fashioned bow and waited. Buckbeak looked at him carefully and unlike what would have happened with Potter, where he sensed hesitation and fear, with Soizen he sensed only sincerity and trust, so he did not feel provoked or upset. Approvingly, Buckbeak bowed his head as well. Very well done, I'm impressed, Hagrid tossed another ferret to Buckbeak for good behavior, the first time people take on a hippogriff they almost never get such an excellent result. Ten points for Gale Gold. Soizen kept his place after straightening up. Now you can go over and pet him, Hagrid confirmed. Soizen, with a firm but careful and respectful step, approached the hippogriff, who was looking at him intently. Slowly, slowly. That's it, Soizen, that speed is perfect, Hagrid commented, ready to intervene if necessary. When Soizen got within two meters, he stopped and, without Hagrid's instructions, let the hippogriff take the initiative to approach him. When his hand stroked the plumage on its head, it felt nice and soft. Apparently the hippogriff had taken a bath before the lesson, because he wasn't dirty in the least. Well, except for the traces of ferret in its beak. Well done, Hagrid started clapping and the others joined in his applause, well, it looks like he'll let you ride him. That would be great, Soizen replied. But instead of letting Hagrid pull him up like a dummy, he took the initiative himself and jumped gently behind the wings, being careful not to pluck any feathers as he knew he wouldn't like it. And with a swipe of Hagrid's butt, the hippogriff took off and took to the sky with its rider under the astonished gaze of the entire class. Applying a few simple spells to stay in place and avoid the pressure of the wind, Soizen enjoyed the flight immensely. On the spur of the moment, his eyes turned golden and the hippogriff's wings left a trail of rainbows in their wake. Passing over the trees and above Hogwarts, performing a low flight almost touching the nearby river. Everyone outside the castle or looking out their windows could see a strange, twisted and beautiful rainbow. It almost made you want to go kart racing on top of the rainbow. With a whistle from Hagrid, Buckbeak returned to the ground where they were giving the lesson and landed with a trot. Soizen dismounted with a leap and his tousled hair was fixed without touching it. It was a great experience, Hagrid, he said still feeling the high, we'll have to do it again another day. Oh, please. In the midst of the excitement, Malfoy stood up with a jealous face. How am I doing on my first day? Hagrid asked in a low voice. Perfect, Professor, Soizen guided him as he laughed. You're not that dangerous, are you? Filthy beast, at some point, the Slytherin student was approaching the hippogriff recklessly. Soizen didn't hesitate for a second, under the astonished gaze of the students and Hagrid, he not only cast a Petrificus Totalus on Malfoy, but using the expel charm, threw him backwards with a blue light to land in a large thorn hedge that cushioned the blow. Buckbeak alternated his gaze between Malfoy and Soizen, calming himself as he saw that someone he recognized had defended his honor without the need for his intervention. Also, just to be sure, Soizen threw two ferrets at him as appeasement, which earned him a retort of satisfaction as he nuzzled his beak. Thanks for letting me know, Hagrid, it would have been unfortunate if Buckbeak got sick after eating Malfoy, commented Soizen, who looked very intimidating at the moment despite the smile on his expression. Did I say that? Hagrid looked at him with a blank mind, but seeing the way he looked at him, 
he understood that he was trying to get him out of a predicament, I mean, of course. Children, remember not to act like Malfoy. He was the perfect example of what not to do in front of a hippogriff. End of lesson. Chapter 76, A Lesson in Humility. The third-year students discussed the events of Hagrid's class during lunchtime, while the students at Hogwarts finally learned the origin of the strange rainbow. The question on everyone's mind was, how did he do it? It should be noted that currently only the students of Bose Batons, her academic staff and her family knew of her ability to generate illusions. It would be no fun to spoil the surprise, so he explained the principle of refraction of light in water droplets and fooled everyone with an ingenious use of the Aguamenti spell. Although Luna seemed more interested in believing that she had discovered a new power of the hippogriffs to bring joy to the world. Soizen shrugged and ate his salad with garlic croutons, he was in the mood for something more spicy today after the excitement of the flight. Which was interesting, because he really wasn't much of a fan of broom flying and since learning and modifying the battle transition, he didn't need it anymore. But for some reason, letting Buckbeak take him flying really amused him. Maybe it's because he didn't have to worry about controlling the flight and just had to enjoy the experience. Malfoy had an expression as if someone had slapped him in front of everyone as a fellow Slytherin, whose name Soizen couldn't remember, helped him remove the thorns from his face with small tweezers. Should I tell her that there's an easy potion to brew that fixes that painlessly and quickly? Nah, who knows if he's using this event to hit on her. He seems to be being very careful. He wasn't going to blow his chance, it wasn't that bad. Wasn't he? What's going on at the Gryffindor table? Ginny asked as she noticed a commotion near them, having already proudly assumed her identity as a Gale Goldhouse student. Soizen looked away from the salad to see what event happened next. As it should be soon when Seamus Finnegan came running in with a copy of the Prophet shouting that they saw Sirius Black in a village near Hogwarts, though he never managed to remember which village in question. Strange, he didn't see Seamus anywhere. Isn't that your brother, Ginny? Palmasers, one of the new first-year students, asked, and the one next to him must be Potter, he added. I think they're arguing over a package Harry received, commented Luna, who was watching the scene through a hole in her French toast but I don't see why they're arguing with Hermione. Soizen connected the dots immediately. Third year. Package. Hermione. If she wasn't mistaken, Harry should have received a new broom with no return address and Hermione was worried about that, as perhaps it was Sirius sending a cursed object and she wanted Professor McGonagall to requisition it for close examination. A valid concern indeed, but the two Quidditch idiots seemed unable to conceive that something related to their favorite sport could have been tampered with malicious intent by someone who wouldn't even deign to leave their name on an anonymous gift. Now, Soizen had a serious doubt because the information in his head seemed a bit fuzzy. Shouldn't the package have arrived after the Dementor attack on the Quidditch pitch? By then, Potter's broom should have been destroyed by the Boxing Willow. Or is that one of the butterfly effects of his actions? As expected, when the head of the Lion House came over to see what the fuss was about, Hermione didn't hold back and told her her concerns, resulting in the temporary seizure of the broom. It was only when McGonagall left, that Harry directed an angry look at Hermione and Ron even added several hurtful words, which caused Hermione to leave in tears. Fortunately, instead of running to the toilets for a possible troll attack, she ran into Sylvia on her escape and after giving the idiot duo a death glare, she took her to comfort her at the table at home. They've seen black. Seamus burst in at that moment, holding the newspaper in his hand, but Soizen paid no attention to him and was thinking of other things. His gaze slowly shifted to the Weasley twins, who, as their eyes met, greeted him cheerfully. He walked over to them and they whispered so no one would hear them. Ten minutes later, Soizen handed them some sickles as well as a marble and the twins left with a smile anyone would recognize. How about playing a harmless little prank on Potter and Ron to teach them a lesson in humility? The marble he gave the twins is made of polished salt crystal and contains small coordinates to make it easier for him to know where to project the illusion. Too bad it can barely withstand thirty minutes before it disintegrates and scatters in the wind, leaving no trace but a faint smell of burnt salt. The twins only needed to accomplish two things. Put the marble under Ron's mattress and make sure the other roommates were not present during the prank. 
That is, they needed Neville and company to suffer a classic Weasley prank that would keep them out of the dormitory for the night. Later that same night. I still can't believe Hermione wasn't able to shut her big mouth, Ron complained. That was the latest model. Who's going to waste time and money making a move like that? I'm telling you, Harry. That girl's a weirdo. Harry nodded absently as he lay down on his bed. Where are the others? He asked as he realized it was just the two of them in the bedroom. My brothers played pranks on the others and you'll have to spend the night with Madame Pomfrey until all the feathers fall out of their bodies, laughed Ron. In Soizen's room. I suppose they should be in bed by now, he said to himself as he stared at the geared clock from which purple smoke was billowing. He opened the Marauder's map and after folding a few pages, confirmed that they were both alone in the dormitory, in their respective beds. I've had all day to think of the perfect lesson for both of them, inspired by one of our upcoming lessons no less, fortunately for Potter and Ron, it wasn't vindictive at all. Not in the least. It's time to go out and play, Pennywise. Chapter 77, Not as Professional as Expected The next morning, a rumor that would become a historical stain on Gryffindor House spread through Hogwarts school like a fire in a dry meadow. Like a deadly sandstorm in the middle of the desert. Harry Potter, the boy who lived. He wet his bed. So did his best friend, Ron Weasley. All due to what they both attest denying the peeing part with a suspiciously red face, was actually the fault of a new ghost that appeared at Hogwarts. He was evil and a real madman. After hearing the students talk about it, Peeves wondered if after so long after his birth, a little brother was formed for him. The newcomer seemed to have so much potential. He felt proud and decided to go a whole day without cracking jokes as a celebration. Then he could do double tomorrow. He had to show how things were done around here. The ghost searched for the supposed rookie, but denied finding anything about it. The Weasley twins were impressed by Soizen's prank and secretly pulled out the list of people we should avoid playing pranks on for our own good, climbing his name into a higher position. Ginny and Luna were eyeing Soizen suspiciously, as they saw how he approached the Weasley twins yesterday. And not only them, both Hermione and Sylvia also found the events too much of a coincidence. So when they thought who could be the hand in the shadows, they unconsciously looked at Soizen. And after seeing two more people already suspecting their friend who was acting as if it had nothing to do with him, they had a confirmation in their hearts. Later they had defense against the dark arts class with Master Lupin and after walking in and seeing a mirrored cabinet in the classroom, Soizen knew that they would be coming into contact with the Bogget today. He approached Hermione and Sylvia secretly warning them. And where would he stand? Naturally, somewhere behind Potter, when the lesson would be interrupted by the appearance of. Wait a minute. With the shield he used on the express to Hogwarts, the Dementors never had such close contact with Potter. Would his Bogget still transform into a Dementor or would it be something else? The only reason he didn't leave was that Lupin already saw him and believed for sure that the lesson would be interrupted when it was Potter's turn. I mean, what kind of idiot lets others know publicly what their deepest fear is? Anyone with a modicum of bad intentions would undoubtedly end up using it to their advantage in the future. Not to mention the poor execution of the lesson, which should have been done privately to respect the students. But what could one expect from someone like Lupin, especially after relieving what he did in the past? Instead, he played music as if it was a circus show. Really pathetic. He was determined, if Potter's Bogget wasn't a Dementor and Lupin didn't cancel the lesson, he would get out of the row and refuse to face the creature. Even if it cost him points for not cooperating with the teacher, he didn't care. Besides, to be on the safe side, he would leave a few students between him and Potter. Neville, Ron, Parvati, etc. They all started cheering with laughter, seeming to forget that they would have to deal with the abrupt change in mood when it was their turn, resulting in something counterproductive. Another poor approach by Lupin to the lesson. And Potter's turn came. When the clown in the box saw his new prey, he began to change and revealed. A Hogwarts expulsion letter. Damn it! This is sadder than when New Scamander faced a Bogget in Dumbledore's class and the creature turned into an office desk, littered with papers with lots of boring documents stacked in towers. But it made sense, 
What would Potter do if he was kicked out of his favorite place for the past three years? Maybe he thought he should go back to the Desleys and give up magic. Ridiculous, Potter said, turning the expulsion letter into a ticket to the circus. Soizen watched as Lupin seemed to breathe easy, believing that no one would notice him. It seems that even with the defense he set up, something must have happened to affect Potter in the express carriage, though surely not with as much force since the Bogget did not assume the form of the Dementor. That would explain why, despite avoiding the Dementor's entrance, Malfoy still taunted Potter in care of magical creatures. He may not have fainted, but it wasn't impossible for him to end up dazed or even vomiting. It seems that some plot issues are immovable. With a single thought, he took advantage of the fact that no one was paying attention to him and turned invisible. Then she approached her two friends carefully so as not to alert anyone and whispered something in their ears. Sylvia nodded imperceptibly, while Hermione hesitated and shook her head. She was not prepared to fool a teacher in the middle of a lesson, more so when for the first time she seemed to be someone competent. Soizen could deduce her reasoning, but if Lupin was someone that good, he would have been able to detect two of his students disappearing into thin air. Interesting tidbit, it turns out that Hermione Granger's greatest fear was several stone headstones with her parents' names on them. Soizen and Sylvia's names were also on them. It was awkward but understandable to those who saw it, no one laughed because the loss of family was something no one wanted. Simultaneously, Hermione regretted not choosing to skip the lesson for the first time in her life. A little later, the lesson ended without incident and everyone left the classroom excitedly commenting on how great the new teacher was. Sylvia and Soizen shook their heads silently, while Hermione inwardly questioned Lupin's qualifications for not being able to count how many students faced the bogget. She also realized that what her friend said was true, this was not a lesson that should happen in other people's eyes. Perhaps it was partly to Soizen's credit, since knowing Lupin's nature, he made sure to back up his disillusionment charm with others such as silencing sounds, eliminating smells, or hiding his shadow. He just had to be careful not to move too fast or bump into anything, as he couldn't become intangible. Even if somehow Lupin noticed, he could use an illusion to fake the results. Chapter 78, Hogsmeade Soizen was discussing with Sylvia and Hermione their project of gloves, hats and other protective accessories. Yes, the same ones the Weasley twins were supposed to invent later and sell to the ministry. But it was no longer necessary, not with him investing in his prank business. After meeting, they shared the results of their respective approaches and managed to prepare several prototypes. Naturally, Soizen guaranteed a fair share for her two friends and after managing to work out a few minor bugs, they were put up for sale in the store Soizen had in Diagon Alley. Later, Nagini would be in charge of setting up a small factory to produce them and contacting the ministry to suggest they equip them on their oars. The only tricky part was the unique way to weave the magic into the protection so that it could not be copied, would maintain its strength when needed but be consumable to ensure continued sales. By the way, in an hour you will be picking up the permits to go to Hogsmeade. Have you thought about where to go, Soizen? Hermione and I are going to Madame Pewdiepie's tea room. Soizen was silent for a moment, looking at them before answering. In fact, I have plans to explore the surroundings a bit, he said vaguely, implying that he would accompany them on this occasion, maybe I'll visit Honeydukes. No way was she going to enter that place. Oh, okay, Sylvia nodded, would you mind getting some chocolate frogs for me? And some jelly slugs for me, Hermione added. Frogs and slugs, eh, Soizen rubbed his chin with his hand, maybe I should see if they have any snake-shaped candy, to make the whole group, he muttered to himself. What group are you talking about? Sylvia asked. It doesn't matter. Oh. And later I want to go to the Feather House, said Hermione, I hear they have quite a selection. Maybe they have some of the Ravenheart feathers that have been advertised recently. They won't have them, Soizen unconsciously denied. Aware of his slip, he added hastily, I mean, I didn't hear anyone from higher years say they have them. Besides, the feathers there are quite expensive. A single black and gold feather can cost you fifteen sickles and two nuts. Never mind, I'll entertain myself by looking at feathers, Hermione shrugged. She still wanted to try to see if she could find something from Ravenheart by chance. 
I want to go to Dervish and Banjas, said Sylvia as they got up and left, I understand it's a store where they repair and sell magical instruments like the snitching scope. Maybe I can find something interesting or they'll agree to teach me a trick or two of the trade. Soizen, for his part, intended to examine the shrieking house before Black arrived and used it as a hideout. One of the measures he took into consideration for the future was to name the common rat with the severed finger Peter Pettigrew before giving Ron the switch. In this way, his name could be seen on the map just as it could be seen on any other name, such as Hermione's pet Crookshanks. The scene where Potter couldn't go to Hogsmeade because he didn't have the clearance went without incident and Soizen knew it wouldn't be long before he tried to sneak off with the invisibility cloak the substitute he left him, rather. There he would be stopped by the Weasley twins when they saw his footsteps in the snow, who would probably tell him the hunchback witch's secret passage, since Soizen was holding the marauder's map and it couldn't be trespassed. I was considering whether to use Potter's performance in the original story, where he reminds Lupin after being caught by Snape, that the map doesn't work and you see someone's name dead. I would just need to tweak things a bit. For example, if he couldn't retrieve the marauder's map from Lupin's hands by following that plan, he had to make sure it was destroyed so it wouldn't be used against him. Perhaps set up some sort of magical time trial that if not deactivated within a specific period of time, the map would burst into flames, being reduced to ashes, impossible to repair or recover. But that would only serve to prove that Black was indeed mad. Snape already started preparing the potion for Lupin and Soizen knew he was following his idea. So as soon as he leaves school and is not supplied with Snape's potion. Poof. Goodbye, Lupin. Hogsmeade Village actually isn't very big from her perspective once she entered it, it has three bridges connecting the entrances in different direction. The streets are arranged according to chaos in the purest wizarding style and the main streets passed by the three broomsticks, Zonko's Joke Store, Honey Dukes and other well-known ones. She parted from her friends, but didn't go straight to the Shrieking House, but actually scouted the place to get a rough idea of what things she might get during outings over the next few years. If he found an empty storefront, perhaps he could even set up a branch of his store. Though on second thought, if he did that he would need to find someone else to run the place. Nagini was busy enough at the moment and couldn't be split in two. As she turned one of the corners, she bumped into a Hufflepuff student and knocked him to the ground. I'm sorry, are you alright? He asked as he held out his hand to help him up. Yes, my fault, I shouldn't be going so fast on these streets said the student as he rubbed his chest, which hurt from the impact, what's your head made of? He asked as he held his hand and stood up, looking behind him for a moment, it looks like I ran into an iron lamppost. I work out, Soizen shrugged with a smile. He wasn't going to tell her it was the unconscious result of a potion he made and still didn't control, he was unlucky, again, sorry about that. I'm Soizen Gale Gold Evans Valris Aulis, he said as he extended his hand, this time as a greeting. Cedric Diggory, the student introduced himself as he shook his hand, I remember you, you were the one who founded the fifth house at Hogwarts upon your arrival. We talked about it for weeks, you can always learn something new from history. You already seemed familiar to me, I heard a lot about you from the students in your house. According to Sylvia, you are one of the best Hufflepuffs of the last decades. It won't be that much, Cedric dismissed humbly, actually, she talks about you all the time too. I don't doubt it, Soizen replied, leaving Cedric speechless with his cheeky response, what? I'm someone great, it's normal for her to talk about me. Besides, we're business partners and best friends. It's good, you're confident, I can't deny that. You on the other hand, you look like you just ran out of one of your worst nightmares, said Soizen as he looked at Cedric's somewhat unkempt hair from running, let me guess, you're being chased by some girls. How did you know? Cedric turned around startled, thinking they had spotted him and were coming up behind him without him noticing. I had my suspicions, but that reaction confirms it. I was going to explore the surroundings a bit and I could use a guide, what do you say? Soizen proposed, wanting to take the opportunity to befriend the future participant of the Triwizard Tournament. Chapter 79, The House of Screams Unexpectedly for Soizen, it turns out that he hit it off with Cedric once they started talking about herbology. While Cedric was surprised at Soizen's obvious lack of interest in Quidditch, it didn't stop him from talking about some related topics somewhere in between, 
such as growing trees for broom wood. The Dementors are a nightmare, complained Cedric much later, when they were more familiar with each other, if it wasn't for the strange shield that was installed this year, who knows what traumas some of the students would have suffered. The ones traveling with me were crying for several minutes until I managed to calm them down. I can get an idea, Soizen said, remembering Luna's state when the danger passed, I've always wondered why they don't give euphoric potions to the prisoners in Azkaban. Not only would that serve as punishment for those cruel wizards and witches, but it would also keep the Dementors so happy they wouldn't want to leave. That's a brilliant and chilling idea, Cedric shuddered at the possible scene, do you always have such creative ideas? Believe me, you haven't seen a fraction of what I'm capable of. Cedric was quite enthusiastic as a guide, especially since he was about to be caught by another group of female admirers and Soizen averted tragedy with his disillusionment charm, causing them to pass him without seeing him. Although he had some knowledge of how to cast it, it wasn't as good and certainly not as fast. It's a pity you're not interested in Quidditch, with your reflexes, I'm sure you'd make a good seeker or hitter, he lamented. Come on, if half of what I've heard about you is true, then I think that if the Triwizard Tournament were to be held again in the future, you would definitely be chosen as Hogwarts representative. Do you really think so? Cedric looked at him in surprise, because that meant that the goblet considered him eligible out of all Hogwarts students. Of course, if it's ever held, I'll bet on you. Literally. You know the Weasley twins, don't you? I'm sure they'll open a betting booth, right after they try to become contestants. Ha ha. Yes, that would be quite like them, Cedric nodded, and why didn't you think of yourself? Sylvia mentions that you are more than capable, he asked curiously. After all, what wizard doesn't dream of the honor of being champion? Seeing how the ministry is working these years, I'm sure they would establish something like a minimum age to participate, because of the mortal danger and all that. Can you imagine first year students being chosen? It would be suicide for them, he shook his head, I'd rather set up a parade with tournament souvenirs and make some money. When the time comes, I'll look for you to authorize me to make some dolls and pins with your image on them. In fact, it is likely that they will take some action, Cedric found the explanation reasonable and logical, Sylvia wasn't joking that you like to make money either, he laughed. Make young wizards who can't even cast a light charm fight in tests of magical skill, courage and knowledge. The tournament would last a short time, perhaps fifteen minutes to be generous. And that's if we count the time for the opening and closing speeches. What can I say, business runs through my veins, Soizen joked. Thank you for guiding me, Cedric. Let's say goodbye here. Don't you want me to walk you back to Hogwarts? I'm not going back, he pointed to the battered house on the other side of the broken fence, I'm going to the shrieking house to have a look around, curiosity, if you know what I mean. You shouldn't, Cedric frowned, what if Black's hiding there? Soizen restrained himself from looking at him like a three-headed parrot. How the hell had he come up with that and how could he have gotten it so right? Relax, the paper saw him still far away and I don't intend to stay long. Just long enough to rule out the rumors. The Dementors are still running around here and I happen to have some practice with the Patronus spell. Soizen raised his finger in rebuttal, but on second thought, it didn't really matter if he came. As he stated just three seconds ago, he just wanted to get an idea of the interior layout for later. And he really didn't know if those Dementors would dare to come near. All right, let's go then. They both entered the shrieking house and Soizen wasted no time, he quickly examined the interior. The ceiling was in disrepair, the wood creaked under his feet and there were cobwebs. He took note of what should be the entrance under the boxing willow, located the room where Sirius should hide later and set a simple alarm spell to know when there was movement in the place. Also, to prevent him from jumping for some wild animal, he set it to react only to human presences or proportions exceeding five feet in height. Meanwhile, Cedric was trying to contain the urge to cough due to the large amount of dust in the environment. In less than three minutes, they were outside, once again stepping on the earth outside and breathing in the fresh air. That was exciting, but not very enlightening, said Cedric, who was still a bit startled to enter a place like this, the place is pretty run down, but there are no ghosts or screams. It seems that rumors are just rumors. Yes, it was really disappointing, said Soizen, 
satisfied that nothing went wrong. I promised Sylvia and a friend of mine that I would go to Honey Dukes to get some candy. I'll go there and then I'll go back to the castle, are you in? I think I'll pass, Cedric waved his hands after thinking about it for a few moments, Honey Dukes is a place where the chances of finding some fans is too high, I think I'll go straight back. Nice to meet you, Soizen, keep me posted if you do anything interesting. You too, Cedric. Count on it, Soizen dismissed as he headed back to Hogsmeade. On his way to Honeydukes, he spotted the infamous Hogshead Tavern, which should be being run by Albus Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth. He stared at the place for a few seconds before continuing on his way. There was nothing interesting there, except for the passageway behind Ariana's painting connecting to the Hall of Ministers. Besides, the place was worse in hygiene even than the leaky cauldron, a pigsty that he wasn't quite clear how it was still operating when the three broomsticks was operating just a few streets away and Miss Rosmerda was attracting almost every customer. After locating the candy store, he grabbed some chocolate frogs and some jelly slugs, before going to the cashier to pay. Do you have any snake-shaped sweets? Chapter 80, Smelly Night Time passed at Hogwarts and one day a commotion was heard from the castle cadres, who seemed to be searching for something. It turns out that the fat lady, who guarded the entrance to the Gryffindor common room, was attacked by Sirius Black. The tears in the painting, as if left by the paws of a beast, made the lady flee and she hid in a different painting, behind a large cow. That same night, all the students had to sleep in the great dining hall. Soizen looked at the storm outside and frowned. Why did he have to practice the weather change spell precisely today? Rain wouldn't make it hard for him to sleep, in fact, he liked listening to it. But thunder was so annoying. Too bad he was still halfway to mastering the spell and couldn't go out to reduce the intensity under the watchful eye of the masters. Having the Dementors swarming around outside, excited as they searched for their target, didn't help. Also, do you have any idea how many students snore? I could hear Ron Weasley from the other end of the great dining hall. So, ignoring the envious look from the others, he transformed his sleeping bag and those of the students in his house, into a simple but comfortable single bed and erected a small magical field to prevent annoying noises. Unpleasant smells and nightly flatulence, regulate the temperature so they wouldn't get cold and set up an alarm line for their safety. The only ones who were able to enjoy similar treatment were Sylvia, Hermione, Neville, Cedric, the Weasley twins and in short, their closest friends from school. Although some protested that he should do the same for everyone and be fair, he shut them up with the excuse that he doesn't have that much magic for the whole school. A clear lie, but the others did not know that and could not refute. Following the logic they were taught in school, it would indeed be exhausting and impossible for a third-year wizard to perform so many complex transformations at once, even if they were to last only a single night. Professor McGonagall nodded proudly in secret at the sight of Soizen's brilliant application of transformation and Professor Flittick did not hide his thumbs up at the brilliant display of convenient incantations. Sinistra was very pleased to see the togetherness in her house and Headmaster Dumbledore simply smiled, as he copied the idea of setting up alarm lines that night. Finally, before going to bed, Soizen made several wooden scarabs with a simple function, to turn their heads towards the nearest or loudest noise. While it seemed silly, in the eyes of the others, it would appear that he was setting up lookouts and those who wanted to try to play some pranks that night, were forced to give up on the idea. Naturally the teachers saw through the trick, but said nothing as it played into everyone's hands. The next morning, many woke up with dark circles under their eyes and bloodshot eyes, looking with great envy at the sheltered bed Soizen made. Who thought that making a dinner of spicy bean burritos, kale with blue cheese and broccoli au gratin with mushrooms was a good idea. The atmosphere in the great dining hall was so stuffy that the teachers lit all the good morning night candles and opened the windows, but no one was hungry for lunch after such an experience. Not even Ron had an appetite and that's saying a lot. Wait, actually, Soizen and company ate quietly inside their containment camps. They were never so happy to establish friendship with him. The morning had a depressing atmosphere from the bad night and the denial of lunch, but the Dementors finished their search to no avail and castle activities had to resume as usual. And to top it all off, everyone was in for a surprise when Snape took over as defense against the Dark Arts teacher that day. 
Turn to page 394, Snape ordered after unfolding a projector screen. Excuse me, sir, where is Professor Lupin? Potter was unable to keep his mouth shut and had to question why Snape was there at that moment. That doesn't interest you, does it, Potter? Snape looked at him with indifferent eyes and moved to the side of the projector, let's go to page 394, he repeated, tapping his wand on the projector and it turned on, much to Soizen's bewilderment. Wasn't technology not supposed to be functional in the presence of magic? Wait. The night bus, the Ministry of Magic phone booths, Mr. Weasley's car, the school gramophone during future dance practice. Could it really be that it's not that it doesn't work, but that they haven't studied how it would work? In other words, the claim that technology and magic were not compatible was false. It's just that because of their feeling of superiority or lack of convenience, there don't seem to be wizards or witches trying to improve in that field except for some accidental results. Wouldn't that mean that his huge investment for the appearance of Den Den Mushy was a waste due to a misunderstanding? He had to check this matter later for himself, it seems that the facts of the magic world are not as firm and unquestionable as he thought from the beginning. Werewolves? He heard Ron ask, snapping him out of his musings. But, Professor, we were just starting with the red hats, commented the very shrewd Hermione inevitably, which Ron looked at in surprise not knowing when she got there, the night beasts come later. Silence, Snape paid no attention to the small protest and went on with his idea of teaching about werewolves, who knows the difference between an animagus and a werewolf. Hermione raised her hand, eager to answer. Mr. Gale Gold. Snape didn't even turn around and pointed precisely to where Soizen was sitting, who didn't even raise his arm. An animagus is a wizard who chooses to become an animal, whereas a werewolf does not. He transforms with the full moon and his consciousness fades, he could kill his best friend and only responds to the call of his own. Also, in that state, he can infect others with the same condition and would feel no remorse for them. Malfoy tried to joke by howling, but curiously, no sound came out of his throat as Soizen pointed his hand under the desk at him. A proper explanation, Snape ignored Malfoy's panicked face, who was trying to speak despite his sudden suspicious muteness, but seeing as the others have no idea. He paused, glancing at Hermione, I want from the others two parchments by Monday about werewolves, with emphasis on how to recognize them. We're playing Quidditch tomorrow. Potter protested, as if that was a reasonable and logical excuse for ignoring the assigned homework. Naturally, Snape dismissed him with obvious contempt for his lack of brains. The term lycanthropy has its origins in. Snape continued the lesson. Meanwhile, Soizen suddenly remembered that indeed, tomorrow was when the Dementors would attack the Quidditch pitch during Gryffindor's clash against Hufflepuff. Should he go and cheer Cedric on, or just protect his own house? Chapter 81, Match Interrupted Perhaps because Soizen was not paying attention to the Quidditch, he was really unaware that the match was going to take place so soon. The effects of his weather manipulation spell were still present and resulted in the storm being worse than in the original story. Is that an umbrella flying through the clouds? Soizen asked as he squinted his eyes. Are you really paying more attention to a stray umbrella blown by the wind than to the game? Hermione rolled her eyes at him. I can't help it, he defended himself, the only part one saw entertaining, was when that beater's broom suddenly caught fire from the lightning strike, Soizen shrugged noncommittally. Quidditch was a boring and stupid game. And he would defend his opinion against the magical world if he had to. Several people around her joined Hermione in rolling their eyes. If it weren't for the field Soizen set up in the stands to shelter them from the rain and cold, they might have protested slightly, but no one wanted to get wet in the storm that was falling as the pitcher's revenge. Yes, Soizen found it rather strange that the teachers did not put up some protection to avoid catching cold in the rain, but who is he to judge them? Could it be that they need to feel the wind in their beards and the drops of water on their faces for a more authentic experience, who knows? Although it should be noted, the fact that the rest of the spectators were using umbrellas and raincoats to protect themselves from the big storm instead of using simple wand-waving spells was even stranger. Sometimes he questioned whether they really were wizards. Harry has seen the snitch. Shouted someone from Gryffindor who was standing a few feet away from the Soizen barrier, braving the rain. 
Yes, he could see as Potter and the Hufflepuff Seeker were heading off the pitch in a certain direction, clearly chasing something very specific. Soizen found it interesting to watch as the snitch received an electric shock, causing the Hufflepuff Seeker to fall without the Golden Sphere actually being affected. This left only Potter chasing it at high altitude. His thoughts were interrupted when he heard the glass of water he was holding, driven by a single purpose, suddenly begin to freeze despite the protection he set up. They're here, she thought. And sure enough, after only a couple of minutes, he watched as Potter fell from the sky from a height of forty meters without a broom as the Dementors rushed after him. Dumbledore could not stand to watch and raised his right hand pointing at the fainted boy. Arrest momentum. Potter began to fall more slowly and managed to land like a feather on the ground, without too many injuries. The teachers began to evacuate and protect the panicked students while the Dementors stole some happiness there and there. Hermione. Soizen called, Sylvia. This is the moment, if any Dementors approach, use the Patronus without hesitation. Remember, happy thoughts. Hermione and Sylvia exchanged glances as they took out their wands, which Soizen insisted they bring just in case. Thank goodness they listened to him. Raising their wands, a silvery mist covered their positions as they signaled the others to approach them. The teachers, recognizing the Patronus, indicated to go there and helped reinforce the silver mist dome with their own Patronus. Within minutes, the students were all under the dome and the Dementors were trying to get in. The teachers were worried because they needed to focus on keeping up the defense and not letting them in, so they couldn't go on the offensive. Give them some room. Soizen shouted around them, I need a three by five space to try to chase these creatures away. Hearing him, the students quickly gave him some space by squeezing together as they looked at him with interest. Soizen pulled a potion from his sleeve, gulped it down, put the bottle away, and as he watched the Dementors through the dome. The same silvery mist that formed the dome over their head sprouted from his hands, only instead of joining the defense, it formed a solid construct of light the size of a horse. Hey, Dementors! He shouted at them as he held his creation, say hello to my little friend. Visual Aid Image What followed next was a hellish noise as Soizen mowed down the dark creatures with a Patronus in the form of a continuously rotating heavy Gatling machine gun. Under the cadence of happy fire and bullets, the Dementors didn't know what to do until they saw the damage he could cause and retreated within minutes, understanding the gravity of the threat in front of them. Sixty Dementors burst onto the Quidditch pitch and only twenty-three managed to get out of there. What the heck, since when did those little morsels become so ferocious? And if the Dementors were speechless, the students and teachers who saw Soizen's counterattack were dumbfounded at the ferocity of the little wizard. Seeing the Dementors leave, Soizen immediately dispelled the Patronus and sat on the floor, sweating profusely. He had mastered the Patronus solidly during his accelerated state when he left the family vault at Gringotts and could alter the form rather than just settling for a fixed construct. Using his happy memories plus a potion whose function was to amplify that happiness, he now felt as if he had just run three marathons in a row and passed right out. How was he to know that each bullet had such a large consumption? Adding that consumption to the rate of fire? It seems he didn't properly calculate the backlash he would receive this time. Fortunately, he was surrounded by friends and teachers, so he wasn't too worried about the Dementors suddenly returning to take advantage of his weakened state. But before he passed out, he mentally cursed Dumbledore. Why the devils didn't he cast his Phoenix Patronus? Did he want to assess how people would act in a crisis situation for the future? You old bastard! Chapter 82, Is That All? Waking up was not very pleasant, if I had to say how he felt then it would be a terrible hangover, even though he never had one. Not only that, but he had apparently spent almost a week asleep and was the only one left in the infirmary still affected by the events of the Quidditch match. And when he woke up, the first thing he had to do was to face Hermione's questioning, about how he did what he did. She and Sylvia practiced the Patronus, but it was nowhere near as powerful as his. Fortunately, Sylvia placated Hermione and for that she earned a grateful look from Soizen. Right now she was in no mood to discuss anything. Pomfrey ordered him to rest for three more days and Soizen was bored during his entire absence, since apart from drinking bad-tasting potions, sleeping, eating and getting up to go to the bathroom, 
he couldn't do much else. He wasn't even allowed to read a book. Come on. When he left the infirmary, students were looking at him and whispering around him, which he didn't find too pleasant. Little did he know that after the performance on the Quidditch pitch, he earned a good portion of fame. The reason? Among other things, it turns out that the ministry wanted to burst into Hogwarts asking him for explanations about the destroyed Dementors. Not only imposing a hefty fine that would have ruined even a pure-blood family, but they even considered that he was purposely attacking the ministry and wanted to take him to Azkaban for a month as a lesson. Dumbledore was not very happy about the actions of the Dementors and the Ministry of Magic Horrors ended up walking out of Hogwarts, as if they had been set on fire on their backsides. Soizen sighed in relief that the charges were dropped quickly after that. It would have been a pain in the ass to deal with the Ministry because of the stupid decision of some incompetent superiors who overestimated themselves. If he really had been forced, he would cash in on the debts and favors the Gale Gold family had on the pure blood families to force them to act. He would have to think of some measure to stop the ministry from trying to overstep its bounds, perhaps he could talk to Gringotts to see if he could cripple the British wizarding economy in case of emergency. No way would I go to Azkaban for political idiots. Fortunately for the Ministry of Magic, he was not a vindictive person. Over the next few months, Soizen was forced by Hermione and Sylvia, to teach them more things to defend themselves in their secret place. The teachers handed him a completely different level of homework compared to his peers and it was no longer necessary for the others to feel small. Soizen was delighted to be able to accelerate his studies, unaware of how the teachers were sweating to be able to prepare his additional assignments. Minerva, you have to succeed. They thought with an aching heart. During one of her moments of study, she was alerted to the magic she left behind in the shrieking house. He didn't even remember it until it jumped out. I think I should prepare myself, he muttered. In the end, he decided not to use Lupin or the Marauder's map. The map was too useful and risking losing it just to increase Sirius Black's desperation wasn't worth it, no matter how good it might sound. Convenient time jump. Things didn't go exactly as they should, but everything turned out as he wanted it to. By levitating a piece of stinky cheese, it was a simple matter to make Scabbers run off into boxing willow range while Soizen remained hidden. Sirius appeared in his unimagic black dog form, mistaking himself for the grim and dragged Ron into the hole in the willow. Potter, unsurprisingly, chased him without thinking for a single second, only he didn't pay attention to why the willow didn't attack him. Why should it when he went into a lethargic state with a simple sleep spell? Currently, Sirius snatched Potter's wand normal, being the difference of an adult and a barely teenager and was spouting his monologue about how he was innocent. Blah, blah, blah. Snape appeared and with a wave of his wand, disarmed Sirius and looked at him triumphantly. What he didn't notice, was that the wand that went flying, ended up at Potter's feet and picking it up before anyone noticed, he knocked Snape out to try to find out the whole truth of what happened to his parents. Now, Hermione wasn't in the room and no one mentioned the Marauder's map. All thanks to Soizen's interference in the plot. But, now is when he intervenes again. This is all very interesting, he echoed in the room, startling Ron, Potter and Black, who looked around trying to locate the source of the voice without success. Potter saw a red light and the wand he held trembling shot out for the third time in the last few minutes. You have a weak grip, Potter, Soizen cancelled his spells and appeared before everyone as if out of nowhere, while holding the wand that at this rate would be known as the flying wand. What are you doing here? Asked Ron. Is it true what you said? Soizen ignored Ron completely and looked at Sirius. Ron's rat is Peter. Who the hell are you? Black raised his guard at the sight of a stranger. The one who can give you a chance to prove if you're just mad or if you're telling the truth, Soizen wasn't going to be polite to Black, no. Freeze he noticed how Potter seemed to want to tackle him to get his wand back, so he cast a simple spell to glue his feet to the ground, again, is it true what you said? I ask Black. Of course it is. Sirius said, thinking he could clear his name. That's not possible. Ron protested. Scabbers has been in my family for. Twelve years. A curiously long life for a common field rat, Black burst out, he's missing a finger isn't he? Ron was in denial. 
Scabbers had been his best friend since he was little, they ate, slept and showered together. He also told him all his secrets, complaints and hidden fantasies. Didn't that mean? And all they found on Peter Pettigrew was. Potter finished. A finger. That's right, the bastard cut it off to frame me and fake his death. Sirius shouted as he snatched the rat from Ron. Show him, Soizen held out Potter's wand, if it's true, do the Animagus counterspell and reveal Peter. But I warn you, if you try to trick us and I'll put you out of action and hand you over to the Dementors. Sirius had not the slightest doubt in taking the wand, he waved it several times at the fleeing rat on top of the piano in the room. The counter spell hit the rat and... Nothing happened. Well, that settles it, said Soizen, trying to contain a huge grin, you're crazy in nothing more. Chapter 83, Surprise During the Banquet Was it hard to get the unconscious Ron, Potter, Sirius and Snape out of the shrieking house? Not really, he just tossed them like potato sacks into his extended trunk with a levitation charm and walked out. Because Ron, Potter and Sirius were unconscious. Soizen did. Sirius became a little frantic at his failure and as for the other two, he didn't feel like explaining himself at all at the moment. Now what he wanted to do was to hand the criminal over to the ministry to collect the reward and subsequently he would let Potter and Ron out. Was it strange that even in this situation he would think of benefiting? He didn't think so. He woke Snape up and after learning the situation, he started complaining that both son and father were ungrateful. He really didn't expect Potter to attack him treacherously. When he heard the part about collecting the bounty, Snape stepped forward and asked Soizen to let him kill Sirius with his bare hands. He wouldn't feel at ease if he didn't do it himself. Soizen shrugged and pulled the unconscious Sirius out, handing him over to Snape, under the condition that he must appear to have died in battle and must emphasize later that he proved an invaluable aid in successfully capturing the criminal. Snape had no reason to refuse and although he had many plans for Black, he understood that he could not really take the liberty of carrying them out. As Snape fulfilled another revenge on his list, Soizen reinforced the days in Potter and Ron. He couldn't tolerate them waking up at this point or before he decided to release them. What if they rummaged through his precious trunk? Besides, the surrogate rat with the severed finger was released after giving him a small wound to attract predators in the area and give him a poison that would act in less than 12 hours as a safety backup. He didn't remember if legimency could be done on an animal and the rat's memories could jeopardize his alibi. Even if the rat wasn't devoured tonight, he wouldn't see the dawn when the matter of Black's capture broke out. The only part that was currently bothering Soizen was that this was also the night when Lupin forgot to take his potion. But he suspected the reason for the oversight was that he ran off to meet Sirius at that time, so if there was no problem, he should be going through his change after keeping control with the potion at Hogwarts like the other times. Still, the fact that Sirius was able to enter the school to attack the fat lady no doubt had a hand in it. Just to be sure, he didn't let his guard down until he and Snape returned to the school, full of battle wounds caused by the confrontation against Sirius that Snape very professionally, as a qualified spy that he was, had carefully placed to make them believable. Are we worried about Ron and Harry telling another version? Perhaps it would if Snape didn't know the memory spell. It only takes one small, insignificant change, where instead of easily knocking Sirius out, Soizen and the criminal start fighting and a couple of stray spells knock them out early on. Later, they can tell that Snape regained consciousness from the commotion of the confrontation and helped. Snape notified Dumbledore of the criminal's defeat and in less than half an hour, Sirius' body was taken away by the Ministry. While they took down statements and found Potter and Ron unconscious in an abandoned room, where they were left by the professor for their safety. Dumbledore had a feeling that something didn't add up, but he didn't distrust his best spy and the wound Soizen showed in the infirmary support the story. Harry wasn't hurt either beyond a few scratches and Weasley couldn't believe that a madman would escape from Azkaban in order to finish off his pet rat. Which, by the way, he never saw again. And so Sirius Black maintained his reputation as a madman and traitor until the end of his days. Lupin seemed calm, but Soizen noted his subtle reaction when Black's death was reported. 
The following defense against the dark arts lessons were depressing for lack of a better word and near the end of the year, Soizen was awarded a third-class Merlin medal for helping to keep the magical community safe and bringing several novel products to market. And what did Soizen do when he learned of the strange appointment, which was clearly a sham to bury the matter once and for all? He went to celebrate by taking a long walk on the back of Buckbeak, with whom he made good friends throughout the year. It turns out that Hagrid would sometimes be gone for a couple of days when he didn't have lessons to stock up for lessons and Soizen would look after the hippogriff. The fact that he was careful and the creature would remember how he defended his honor helped greatly. It was safe to say that if Hagrid at any time needed to get rid of the hippogriff, Soizen would gladly adopt it as a mount of his own. Leaving aside their unexpected friendship of the year, a small party was also held in the Gale Gold Common Room to honor the hero who saved Potter from a madman. No, seriously, no one seemed to remember that Ron was there too. It was funny. Now, Soizen thought of doing something to liven up the castle to celebrate that the Dementors were finally withdrawn and visited Dumbledore in secret accompanied by Snape. After talking secrets for an hour, he left the headmaster's office with the necessary clearance. On the last day of Hogwarts, at the farewell meal, Dumbledore gave a speech as he does every year, where he emphasizes being united and how proud he was of how the students managed to carry on even with the dangers that lurked. But as he finished, raven feathers began to rain down on the great dining hall to everyone's bewilderment. And in closing, said Dumbledore once everyone had eaten and the tables had suddenly vanished, I think, everyone deserves a little celebration to let off some steam and lift their spirits. Ladies and gentlemen. He was silent for a moment as he raised his hands and proclaimed loudly, Nico Ravenheart. It wasn't until particles of light formed the illusory figure they all knew and began to sing and dance under the visual effects, that their minds understood what was happening and the students went wild. Everyone excitedly sang along in unison to familiar Ravenheart songs as they appeared, the boys tried to act cool, the girls cried with excitement and at some point that Soizen didn't know when or how it happened. Professor Flittick could be seen waving glow sticks with the spirit and energetic movements of an accomplished K-pop fan. The party went on for quite a while, until the last song played and Ravenheart vanished into thin air with a burst of fireworks. They may have started this year on very dark notes, but they ended on happy notes. Let's go, today I am asking for power stones for a change, let's see how many come out. Chapter 84, The Order of the Hippogriff My legs feel like they're on fire. Complained Sylvia as she took a seat in the Hogwarts Express carriage, waiting for it to get underway to return home. Hermione nodded, silently voicing the same complaint. After Nico Ravenheart's unexpected concert, everyone expended the energy for the whole day at once and were exhausted. Although they were carried by the Thestrals' carriages to the station, the short stretch they had to walk proved torturous for their legs. Soizen was rubbing his legs as well, but it was pure theater as his situation was more akin to magical exhaustion than physical. If it weren't for the energy drink he had asked the house elves to prepare for him, he thought he might fall asleep for the entire journey back. At least you don't look as bad as Professor Lupin, Hermione commented. I know. Did you see how pale he looked when he came out of the great hall? Maybe the music was too loud for his ears, said Soizen, what with being a werewolf and all. Professor Lupin was a werewolf? shouted Sylvia with horror in her voice. Didn't you notice the coincidences after Snape made us study werewolves? Soizen raised an eyebrow somewhat surprised at how no one seemed to connect the dots conveniently, Hermione, tell me that's not your case too. Actually, I noticed that too, Hermione said as she nodded doubtfully, it's just that he seemed to have control over himself and I didn't see the need to say so. After all, if he was kicked out too soon, we'd be without a defense against the dark arts teacher for the rest of the term. How desperate must the headmaster be to find a teacher for this position that he was forced to hire a werewolf? It would have been enough if he forgot to take his potion just once and a disgrace could have happened in the school. He put us all in danger. At the end Sylvia was clearly angry. I agree with you, said Soizen, making it clear that he did not like this year's choice of teacher. It's just that in her case, it was more of a personal grudge. Werewolves are victims and we shouldn't judge them by their condition. Hermione protested, not believing what she was hearing from her two best friends. It's not about your condition, Hermione. 
It's about the risk of exposing children to a person who could easily infect them. Not only that, with the discrimination in the magical world, do you really think a werewolf received the education and training to become a teacher at Hogwarts? Soizen pointed out, taking the conversation to a more moral point of view and forcing Hermione to remember the obvious flaws in his teaching methods during classes, in my opinion, it's impossible that Dumbledore couldn't have found more qualified teachers than Lupin. I think he was only hired as a favor on a personal level. That. In fact, it's a possibility. Hermione frowned as she realized that the teacher they had this year might have been chosen because of connections and not because he was properly qualified for the position. Hey, Soizen. I've been thinking. Sylvia spoke about something that had been rattling around in her head for the past few months, your studies are quite a bit further along and during your time at Bosbatons, you received proper defense against the dark arts lessons, right? So, do you think you could bring us up to speed? Honestly, I think our training in this subject has been abysmal these past three years and if we then get bad grades, we'll get blamed on top of it. That's a great idea. Hermione clapped her hands at the idea of spending the summer learning defense against the dark arts properly, we could invite Ginny, Luna, Neville and the others to form a study group. I think we could all help each other out. I'm fine with teaching Neville in the same year. But don't you think Ginny and the others are younger and would rather be on vacation during the summer? Soizen asked, not everyone likes to learn and practice constantly like we do. He didn't mind doing a study group to solidify his knowledge and teach, but he didn't want too many people because it would be too much work and he wouldn't have time for his research. This summer he wanted to work on finding multiple substitutes for the potion that could solve his mother's squib condition and keep multiplying the number of den den mushy in his possession. I didn't think of that, Hermione's mood cooled a little, but we could send them some letters by Owl to ask their opinion. Or we could leave the carriage and look for them now to avoid having to exchange letters for days to synchronize with each other, said Soizen, how about this? You two go find who you think would be worth joining and I'll figure out what we could do while we're at it. Just keep the curious and nosy people from coming. Sylvia and Hermione exchanged glances and agreed. They weren't too many people either and if they squeezed a bit in the carriage, they could discuss the matter without any problems. Twenty minutes later. Sylvia, Hermione, Neville, Luna, Ginny, Cedric and an additional girl sat in the same carriage as Soizen. And you are. Soizen asked as he isolated the carriage from the outside. I'm Cho Chang from Ravenclaw, the girl introduced herself with a nervous smile, I saw you perform against the Dementors in the Quidditch match and it was impressive. After we told Cedric about the idea, he thought she might be interested, introduced Sylvia to ease the tension, I also know her a bit and I think there shouldn't be any problem, she's quite intelligent and sensible. Too bad we don't have anyone from Slytherin or we could have people in every house, thought Soizen without saying anything out loud. Well, I think you should all have a rough idea of why we're here. My friend suggested that given the very lousy curriculum for the last three years of defense against the dark arts at Hogwarts, I could put together a study group to address this knowledge gap. As some of you may know, I went to Bosbatons for a period of time and received real and more advanced lessons. People from younger years like Ginny and Luna could take advantage to get a head start on their peers while others older than us, like Cedric, could help us catch up. He explained and seeing that everyone was paying attention, he continued, so while Sylvia and Hermione went to look for you, I thought a bit and I think we could set up a sort of secret order to support each other. Like a club? Luna asked. No, nothing like a club. An order, Soizen remarked, a club is a group that anyone can join, there is little commitment and it can grow so big that it will be difficult to manage. What I thought of is an order where the entry of each member is strictly controlled, needing the unanimous approval of all by an anonymous vote to accept new members. Something we can be a part of even after we graduate from Hogwarts and perhaps an additional reason to hold meetings to catch up. Everyone exchanged opinions and it seemed like a very interesting idea. Elitist enough to be mysterious, but not so rigid as to divide it into ranks. They discussed some details and at the end, Soizen gave the summary. Since we are all in agreement, then it shall be so, we will call ourselves the Order of the Hippogriff and the few rules are as follows. He went over the few rules that should be enough to keep the order running. Lastly, we will make the magical pact. All agreed. 
And by the time the Hogwarts Express arrived at King's Cross Station, the Order of the Hippogriff had been officially founded. Chapter 85, Only One He wasn't going to lie, Soizen was inspired by the Order of the Phoenix to set up his own order with people who were trustworthy to a certain extent. It's just that there was no stupid philosophy like sparing the lives of dark wizards and murderers, no way. The rules of the Order of the Hippogriff were simple and magically binding from the moment you became a part. For example, the first rule of the Order was that no one could talk about the Order with non-members. Literally. They were incapable of leaking information associated with the Order on a voluntary basis. Where they would meet, who were members, what they had done, teach others what they had learned without permission, etc. They could not gesture words, write, gesture, or take advantage of any loopholes. They couldn't even teach memories of anything related to the order. She still remembered how Cho Chang's best friend, Marietta Edgecombe, would betray Dumbledore's army two years later and her only punishment was a curse that filled her face with pimples that formed the word Delatora. Soizen was not going to be so innocent and directly denied the possibility of any leaks in a spectacularly thorough manner. The second rule, was that all members had to be proficient at some level with the practice of occlumency. Ideally, strong enough to resist Veritasarum. Yes, Soizen continued to spread this magic to all his acquaintances and members without fear. The third rule, they could not join another order. Clubs, gatherings of friends, family reunions, study groups, and so on. Even something like Dumbledore's army was okay since it was temporary. Who was he to stop them from showing off, but no order? Soizen refused to let the members he taught and trained, his people in a way, end up being used by Dumbledore by inviting them into the Order of the Phoenix. No way. If they were so short of staff, let them put an ad in the paper. As for the rest of the rules, they were to cover fairly specific and unlikely scenarios. Besides, it's not like they lost anyone when they formed the Order of the Hippogriff either. Let's do a review of the current members. Cedric was dead by then mental note, save him from his death when he competes in the next school year's tournament. Ginny was underage and they didn't accept her, much to their own frustration. They also didn't accept Ron and Potter for not being old enough, so Hermione can't count either as well as Luna. And I was pretty sure Cho Chang, Sylvia and Neville weren't part of the Order of the Phoenix either. The only pity was that the Weasley twins were not interested in the summer study group and missed out on the Order's membership and founding, as they were more interested in researching pranks to expand the catalogue of their future store. A pity, because their inventiveness would have been most welcome. But. He also knew that the twins were quite rebellious, so he could only console himself with the thought that he had prevented future leaks by some creative way that he probably hadn't thought of yet. Did he mention the tattoo? All members had an H engraved on the right thumb with some incantations he learned from the library and upon greeting a person in the order, the tattoos would react and visibly reveal themselves. The rest of the time they are invisible and undetectable. A countermeasure to the Multijugos potion and the Imperious curse, as the reaction will warn that the member is being controlled by someone by alternating between a hot and cold sensation. Even in the event that someone discovered them, they could argue that the H of Hogwarts and that they had it made as a small tribute to their alma mater. They didn't need to confess that the H actually came from Hippogriff. Wow, only now did Soizen realize that he got maybe a little paranoid about this whole having his own order thing. Did he overreact? Nah, these things are better to have from the beginning to avoid unpleasantness. They all went back to their respective carriages so they could have some personal space and Soizen asked Ginny to stay for a moment. What's up? Asked the youngest of the Weasley family. Although we have agreed on a date and place, I will need some props so that we can make better progress in practice. Your brothers happen to be handymen, so take this scroll and ask them to do what's inside by then and bring it with you when we meet. Tell them I'll pay for everything, so they should do a good job, Soizen handed a scroll to Ginny where some wooden dummies, dartboards, and more were listed, you know what to do if the others in your family ask. Ginny nodded and walked away. Don't you think I should be the one doing these things? Sylvia asked, a little annoyed at giving that job to others. No, you, as well as Hermione, should prepare for the first lesson of the order. I think from Hermione's expression, she has a pretty good idea what it will be about. 
you're going to test everyone, aren't you? Although it sounded like a question, it bordered on a statement. Bingo. Soizen confirmed without letting them waste any more time speculating, theory aside, I want to see everyone's true practical level. To be honest, I only expect a challenge from you two and from Cedric. Really? Neville is too nervous in these situations. Both Ginny and Luna are still learning how to cast spells well, while Cho seems like the type who would rather talk than wave her wand to settle an argument, Soizen explained, maybe I'm wrong though, you should never let your guard down, you know. Constant vigilance.